everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Escape, brought to you by your Richfield gasoline dealer and the Richfield Oil Corporation of New York. Marketers of Richfield gasolines with xylene, rich lube, all-weather motor oil, and other famous petroleum products. Look for the Richfield Eagle on the cream and blue pumps. Tonight, we escape to India. And the story of a man trapped in his bed by a crate. The most deadly, poisonous snake in the world. As Raoul Dahl tells it in his terrifying story... Poison. Listen, it's an awful good story, but to get the point, you got to understand about two things. What kind of a guy Harry Pope was and what kind of a snake a crate is. First, the crate. You spell it K-R-A-I-T. They're in India, the crates are. Little snakes, sometimes not more than three or four inches long. You have to look real careful if you're going to see one at all. Really almost like a worm except that it's the most poisonous snake in the world. It can bite faster than a bumblebee, and when it does, you go up like a firecracker, swell up like a hot water bottle, and in fly the angels. Crate. Tiny little snake. Now about Harry. Harry Pope. Funny guy. He had it in for anybody who wasn't American, who didn't speak his language. He called them foreigners. He called them that army word, gook. Didn't matter if they were French, Italian, or Japanese. Gook. Foreigner, he'd say kind of buggy on the subject. Funny guy. Well, Harry and me, we got sent out to Bombay on this construction job, and that's where the trouble started. You see, except for the two of us, the crew was made up of local boys, Hindus and Muslims, 40 of them. Harry was like a cat in a room full of dogs, had his back up every minute. After a month or so, it began to wear him out. Got so his appetite wasn't right. He was smoking three and four packs a day, and he wasn't getting his sleep. I used to try to straighten him out. Used to tell him he was wrong. No, Woody, there's no use talking to you. Listen, Harry, they're all good boys. Why don't you take it easy? Woody, you and I are good friends, but a lot of things you just don't understand. You ought to take it easy, Harry. They're all human beings, just like you and me. They're gooks, Woody. Foreigners. Look it. Think about it this way. How'd you like your sister to marry one of them? I haven't got a sister, and anyway, you've asked me that before. Yeah, you see? You won't even make the effort to understand. That's how it was with Harry, and you know about the crate. Now about what happened. It was June of last year. It was hot and sticky, even though the sun was down. I was putting on a clean shirt to go out. Uh, Oh, man, I'm really beat tonight. What's with you, Woody? What's a clean shirt for? Going out. What do you got, a date? No, I uh, thought I'd stop off at Dr. Ganderby's. He promised he'd show me the photos he made down in the leper colony. Ganderby? Yeah. These photos are supposed to be pretty interesting stuff. Well, how about it, Harry? Would you like to come along? Gandaba? He's a Hindu. A gook. Foreigner. I don't want to spend no evening with a gook. Shoot, not old Harry. So I went off to the doctor's, and Harry went to bed with the detective story. I had a very interesting evening. Later, old Harry was plenty sorry that he stayed home. I didn't leave the doctors until around midnight, and when I drove back through the sleeping city, it was very quiet and dark. I thought about the pictures of the lepers I'd seen. I remember thinking, I hope Harry's awake, because I'd like to tell him about those pictures. And when I got home, I was glad to see the light in his room was still burning. Harry, you up? I didn't get an answer. Probably fell asleep reading. Harry! You awake, Harry? Shh. Woody. Yeah. Harry, boy, what's the matter, kid? Shh. Stop, Woody. Take off your shoes. I couldn't tell what was the matter, but I knew he was serious, whatever it was about, so I did what he wanted. He was in bed, under his netting, with a reading light on, his book on the floor. He lay quite still, and the sheet came halfway up his chest. 
He was wearing those corny pajamas of his with the big checks all over him. And the pajamas were soaked in the sweat that was rolling off his face. He lay like a corpse, flat on his back with his hands lying dead on the bed. His hands, even the backs of them, were sweating. His eyes looked like he was watching somebody saw his leg off. Woody, what's the matter, boy? It's a crate. Crate? Where? For man's sake. Where? Where's the crate? In here. Under the netting? No. Under the sheet. Where did it bite you? It hasn't. Yet. Where under the sheet? I know my better. Holy son. You can wake it up if you don't cut out that yellow. How'd it get in there? I don't know. Came up under the net, I guess. Or it's been in the bed all day. Is it a big one? No. Craig don't have to be big. Looked about three or four inches. Come along my side. I didn't move. It went under the sheet. In one of them folds. One of them wrinkles there over my belly. How long ago did it come? Hours. Hours and hours and days and weeks. Woody, I've been waiting a year for you to get home. You must be sleeping in there, huh? Yeah. I think it is. Why, now listen, Harry. Maybe it'll wake up and go away. Go home or something, huh? I can't wait, Woody. I've been lying here scared I'd move something and wake it up. Yeah, you're scared and it'll bite. I've been lying here scared to death I'd cough. All right, don't you worry about a thing, Harry. I know just what to do. Where you going, Woody? Don't leave me. The thing was to be ready to cauterize the bite right away. I'd heard about one method. I went out to the kitchen. And I got a whole fistful of those big kitchen matches and I took them back to the bedroom. Arranged them all with the heads together. Held them like you'd hold a torch. What are you going to do? What are the matches for? Now listen, Harry. Here's how it goes. These will cauterize, see? So we count three, flip back the sheaf, and you jump out of bed. Now you follow me? You're out of your No, no, listen, Harry. If the crate bites you, I strike the bundle and press it against the spot and it burns out the poison, see? Well, the matches... Get away from me. You bubble-headed maniac. No, Harry, I'm only trying to... Listen, Woody, take your matches and your bright ideas and get the heck out of here. Call the doctor. The doctor? I never thought of that. Shh. Now get to it. Okay, Harry. Who do you want? Ganderby or Forsyth? Forsyth. Things are bad enough for that. You've got to bring that gook in here. I dug through the telephone book and I found Dr. Matson B. Forsyth's number and I dialed it. Yeah, let me speak to the doctor. It's very urgent. Who is calling, please? Arthur Woods. Who? Woods. Arthur Woods. Spell, please. Woods. W. W. O. 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 You have already said O. I have already written O. Have the kindness to give me the next letter, please. O. It's O after O. Please? Look, my name is Woods. Spell. W O O D W O O Aha D S Woods Woods W O O D S Mr. Woods That's right, that's just right now. Let me speak to the doctor, please. Sorry, Doctor Nottin. Call tomorrow. Across the room, Harry lay very still, sweating, trying to keep every muscle relaxed. His face was beginning to twitch a little. I was scared. If that twitch should spread, I called the doctor's house again. Please, I do not understand. Look, I said if you don't tell me where the doctor is, I'm going to come over there and pull your arms off, and then I'm going to take you by the neck of... The doctor is at the club, please. What club? The country club. Ring 673. Harry lay very still, fighting the twitches, trying to keep from jumping out of his skin while I waited for the bartender at the club to locate Dr. Forsyth. After about five minutes and nothing, I got this. Are you there? Listen, doctor, you got to get over here right away. This is Arthur Woods and my partner. He's got a snake in the bed with him. Doctor? <coughs> uh, would you mind repeating that, old boy? I said snake. He's got a snake in the bed with him. Snake? Oh, jolly, jolly. I say, who is this? Is this Captain Smart speaking? Please, doctor, you got to get over here right away. It's urgent. Spies, you can't. You don't fool me. Not for an instant, you don't. Oh, please, you doctor. <laughs> Snake in bed. <laughs> Listen, is this Dr. Forsyth speaking? I say, of course not. It's Colonel Harcourt. Oh, well, let me speak to the doctor, please. Oh, but you can't, old fellow. 
Why not? Why, he jolly well passed out, don't you know? Passed out? Like a mackerel. <laughs> Snake in the... Yeah. Listen, Harry. You gotta forget all this prejudice stuff. Gander buys your only chance. No. No, he... He's a gook. He went to Oxford, Harry. He's a gook. It's him or the undertaker. He's a gook. I'm going to call him, Harry. All right. Go ahead, call him. But he's a gook. I called him. When I mentioned Crate, he was quiet for a good ten seconds, and then he said he'd be right over. And he was within five minutes. He was wearing felt slippers, and he moved silently into the bedroom. He was carrying his black satchel and... When I saw the lamplight glinting softly in his steel rimmed spectacles, saw his wise, gentle eyes, his bald brown head, I thought to myself, why, he looks just like Mahatma Gandhi. He looked silently at Harry and smiled encouragingly. Harry looked at him, looked at me, and looked away. Now, first we must very carefully remove the netting from about the bed. Mr. Pope, I want you to pay no attention to us. You are to concentrate on being very quiet, on letting the little snake sleep. It is a very little snake, and it, it is very tired. You must tell yourself this, and you must believe it is necessary for it to sleep. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Wood, help me lift the netting very slowly. Uh, up. Uh, up. Good, good. What are you going to do for me? Think about the little snake. What do you think I'm thinking about? What are you going to do for me? The snake. It is here. It's in one of those folds over his abdomen, doctor. Uh, now we all know where it is. Pretend you are the mother of the little snake. You are keeping it warm. It, it is sleeping. That is good. Just so as it don't wake up and won't breakfast. You joke? That is good. I wish I was back home in the good old USA. Now then, what are you going to do, Doctor? I have a serum here. You will inject it into the blood of Mr. Pope. Then, as he puts it, the little snake may breakfast to his heart's content without harm to... without harm to Mama. His hands were brown and slender and astonishingly deft. He poked the hypodermic into a capsule of thick yellowish stuff, the serum, and then with infinite care he drew the plunger slowly and steadily upward. The glistening chamber filled. He withdrew the needle, laid the hypodermic down, and then with all the gentleness in the world, he began to fold back Harry's sleeve. It was as though he were folding rare old lace. He inched the sleeve carefully, under and up Harry's arm until the vein came into view. I'm going to fasten the tourniquet on your arm now. It will be just above the elbow. Do not move your arm. Do not twitch your muscle. Gently, gently he tightened the rubber tourniquet and Harry's arm began to flush dark. The vein began to swell blue and tight. Harry kept his eyes on the ceiling. Now I'm going to insert the needle in the vein. You must not react. By that I mean you must not tend your abdominal muscles. Believe me, Mr. Pope, this will not hurt very carefully, he placed the syringe almost flat against the arm, slid the needle in sideways through the skin and into the blue vein, slid it slowly but so firmly that it went in smooth, smooth as a knife going into a cheese. Doc, shh, shh. you're good, aren't you, Doc? You must believe that. <laughs> you're going to let me die, are you, Doc? I'm your friend. You must believe that. Are you, Doc? You won't let me die. No, no, I will not let you die. Now, be still and think about that. With all the care in the world as he had pushed the needle into the vein, now he pressed the plunger down, pressed the serum through the needle and into Harry Pope's body. I watched Harry. His eyes were on the wise, gentle face of Dr. Ganderby. His eyes wanted desperately to believe what Ganderby had told him. Now the hypodermic was empty, and slowly it was withdrawn. And then slowly the deft, graceful little hands loosened the rubber tourniquet. And then Ganderby looked up, met Harry's eyes, and smiled. Harry tried to smile back, but the smile jumped and twitched and died. You got taken care of me, huh, Doc? Yes, my son. Now you must be still while the serum is pumped through your body. Be very still 
and be very assured I'm your friend. Oh. The serum will save you. You will escape harm. He beckoned to me and I followed him out of the room and out onto the dark porch. The air was heavy and hot. Ganderby stared out at the blackness, drummed his fingers softly on the rail. Your... Your friend is in grave danger. Yeah. But the serum. You gave him the serum. I gave him the serum. It... It isn't any good. It is the finest known to medical science. And it is worthless. To most of us, science is something strange and mysterious. We think of magic medicines and supersonic planes. But here's a scientific achievement that's as real as your car and as near as your Richfield dealer. It's xylene, one of the highest Ananoc gasoline components ever discovered by scientific research. And xylene can benefit you today because every gallon of Richfield gasoline now contains xylene. Xylene to give your car that smooth, knockless power that eats up the miles. Xylene for that swift, eager response you need in traffic. Furthermore, there's a Richfield gasoline to fit your motor. Your Richfield dealer offers two great Richfield gasolines, both with xylene. Get Richfield high octane at regular price for the average motor. Or Richfield ethyl. Ethyl at its best for top results in highest compression motors. Get Richfield gasoline tomorrow. Stop where you see the Richfield Eagle on the cream and blue pumps. And now we return you to... Escape. So there it was. Harry Pope, the man who had been an enemy of anyone and everyone who didn't come from his country or speak his language, was now halfway through death's door. And his only hope lay in a Dr. Ganderby of another race, another creed, another country, and another color. Now, for the first time in his life, Harry had made a gesture of friendship toward a person of another race. First time. And it seemed to me the last. No, my friend. The serum is worthless. So what can we do then? The snake is bound to wake sooner or later. Harry will move. He won't be able to help himself. And the snake will strike. We must think. Yeah. Look, I'll shoot it. I can hold the gun low and flat so that even if I hit Harry, it won't be a penetrating wound. I'll blow the snake sheet and I'll clear the bed, huh? But you don't even know which of the many folds and creases in that sheet is the harbor of the snake. Yeah. You might shoot the air. Yeah. You would most certainly wake the snake then. No, we can't do that. I... I think... I think I have a solution, Mr. Wood. Yeah? We will... We will anesthetize the snake. Yes. We will use... Nitrous oxide, or ether, or chloroform. I think the last. Chloroform, yes. We put the snake out right while he's lying on Harry, is that the idea? That is it, Mr. Woods. Now, if you will please drive quickly down to my house, my boy will show you where I keep my supplies. The chloroform is in a bottle with an orange label. Orange label. Yes, bring it back as quickly as you can. I will stay with Mr. Pope and try to keep him assured. Uh, He seems to like you. We all like the doctor when we are sick. I drove it as fast as I could. The houseboy at the doctor's thought I was a madman at first, but then he decided in my favor, showed me where the stuff was. I found the bottle with the orange label, smelled it to make sure, and then took off back to the house. I eased the car up the driveway and tiptoed into the bedroom. You're my friend, doctor? Uh, my pal? Yes, I am your friend, and I am not going to let any harm come to you. Uh-oh. Here's Willie. He's my friend, too, Doc. Here's the stuff, Doctor. Him. Willie, I've been an awful dope all my life. You know that, Willie? Uh, it's okay, Harry. You're going to be okay from now on. The Doc here. My friend here. I didn't like him when he first came into the room. Why? Because he wasn't an American or even an Englishman. What do you know about that, huh? He's my friend. Oh, it's okay, Harry. You're going to be okay now, boy. I've been a prize dope. Mr. Woods, you'll have to help me. Right. He pulled a prescription pad out of his case, tore the cardboard backing off, and twisted it into a neat little funnel. He laid this on the edge of the bed. And then he took the piece of hollow rubber tubing which had been used as a tourniquet, and he began to slide it into the sheet. It went in where the sheet ended, across Harry's chest, and he slid it down. He slid it slowly, so slowly that although I was watching it, I didn't see it move. Hours seemed to crawl by. 
The tube inched invisibly on and down, down and down, past the unseen buttons of his jacket, past the unseen cord to his trousers, and then it stopped. Ganderby had sent it by a route which did not cross any of the creases in the sheet. He was being very careful not to prod the snake with it. He was sweating too now, sweating and biting his lip with his teeth. Funny, I remember now, one was gold. I remember staring at it while he inched that tube. Now the funnel. I fit it into the end of the tube and we are ready. Mr. Pope, this is going to be very cold. The evaporation of the chloroform will cause a sharp lowering of the temperature. You must be prepared for this. Mm. It will take rather a long time. Another factor for which you must prepare yourself. The snake is a reptile, and reptiles do not react quickly to the anesthetics which are intended for the use of warm-blooded animals. Mm. Bear these things in mind. Are you ready? Sure. Friend. He opened the bottle and began to drip the stuff into the funnel. Slowly, very slowly, drop by drop, the clear liquid entered the tube and traveled a long, dark route to Harry Pope's stomach, where the crate lay sleeping. Drop by drop, a pale, swirling vapor hung over the funnel. Down there on the sheet, where the tube ended, a wet gray patch began to spread, the chloroform spreading and evaporating, spreading and evaporating. The room began to reek of it. And I remembered other places and other times, hospitals, operations, the death of loved ones smell of chloroform. Mm. Harry began to twitch now. His nose, he mm. seemed to be in agony. Woody. Harry, what is it? Uh, I think I'm gonna sneeze. Don't do it, boy. Hang on, Harry. Mm. You gotta hang on. Don't. Ganderby looked at Harry's face. He reached up, pressed his knuckle against some nerve on Harry's upper lip, and the agonized look vanished. The relentless dripping of the chloroform continued. Harry was getting cold. I could see goose flesh along his arms, across the top of his chest where the jacket was open. Ganderby looked at this and stopped pouring. That is enough. I think our little friend should be thoroughly unconscious now. Mr. Pope, you must remain very still. We are going to remove the sheet now. Anything you say, Doctor. Mr. Woods, you take the other side. We will have to do this ever so carefully. We each took a side of the hymn. I watched Ganderbein did everything that he did. Harry's arms were still flat on the bed, pointing toward his feet. We inched the sheet under and free of these. It was rough, because we had to do it without disturbing the main area of the sheet. When it was free of his arms, we began to raise it slowly, gathering the material in our hands as we progressed ever so slowly down Harry's chest. We reached the end of his jacket. No sign of the snake. My hands were beginning to shake. Ganderby paused while I turned my head away for air. The odor of chloroform was stifling. And then we went on. Slowly, thread by thread. Raising the sheet and easing it away. Down past the cord of his pajamas. And down and down. And still no sign of the snake. I'd stopped looking for it by now. I was concentrating on keeping my arms from shaking. And then, quite suddenly, we were done. Ganderby dropped the sheet on the floor. Harry lay on his back, not moving but watching us with wide, terrorized eyes. Ganderby squinted at both sides of Harry, at his legs. Where is it? It is not as you suppose on the outside of your pajama pants. It must be up one of the legs. (laughs) (laughs) Harry, no! 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 I don't see it. Kick those tatters of cloth, the remains of his pants. Yeah. No, nothing. The bed. Under the bed? Yeah. Look nothing. at me, Harry. Harry, move your feet. No, there's nothing. <clears throat> Mr. Pope, are you, are you quite certain you saw a snake? Sometimes when we are very tired, we find our autosuggestive faculties run a, a bit out of hand. Are you calling me a liar? Why, no, no. I merely say that the autosuggestive are faculties... You? Are you telling me I'm a liar? Harry... Why, you lousy little quack! Call me alive! You stinking little Hindu witch doctor with your fancy pants talk! Harry! Come in here sticking me full of your cheap, no good medicine! Harry, go! Pour that freezing cold up all over Harry, me. take it easy! Harry's your friend! My friend! That little hunk of foreign trash, my friend! Why, where I come from, where you guys live, Kaki, like him for busboys. You make a mistake. You are wrong. Yeah, I for busboys, for waiters, for nothing. You're a foreigner. You're a gook. You're a nothing. 
boy, I want to beat you to a bloody pulp. You and your chloroform, you! You and your stuff about friendship and mama snake. And I must make out like I like you. I'll to split your head wide open, you gooks! You gooks, you gooks, you gooks! Please, doctor, forgive him. He's been under a great strain. He doesn't mean it. A great strain, yes. He needs a good... holiday. Good night, Mr. Woods. That's all. I couldn't tell this if old Harry was still alive. Poor old Harry. He didn't die in India. He died in Chicago. In the loop. Got run over by a taxi cab. The driver was third generation Irish. A real hundred percent white American. Maybe that means something. I don't know. Poor old Harry. Believe it or not, but the very life of your car depends on oil. Without oil, your motor would grind itself to pieces in a matter of minutes. That's why you need an oil that stands up under every driving condition. That's why you need Rich Lube All-Weather Motor Oil. Rich Lube is refined 100% from the finest Pennsylvania crude oil ever discovered. That's your guarantee that Rich Lube won't burn up even under the terrific heat of hard summer driving. Its tough, long-lasting oil film is your faithful watchdog. It protects your motor every mile you drive. You can depend on it. Moreover, Rich Lube motor oil combats carbon and other harmful deposits by its special cleansing action. It cleans as it lubricates your motor. Keep your motor young. Keep your motor clean. See your Richfield gasoline dealer tomorrow. Ask him to change your oil to Rich Lube all-weather motor oil. Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson. And tonight is presented Poison by Roll Dahl and adapted for radio by James Poe. Featured in tonight's cast were Jack Webb as Woody, Bill Conrad as Harry, Jane Novello as Gandabai, and Charlie Long as the houseboy. Special music arranged and played by Ivan Dittmars. Next week. You are lost in the headhunter territory of New Guinea, fighting your way through the swamps in search of gold. With you is a giant brute of a man and his beautiful wife who doesn't care which of you is killed or who kills him, and from whose evil treachery there is no escape. Next week at this time, the Richfield Oil Corporation of New York invites you to escape with an exciting story of evil and violence in the deadly swamps of New Guinea, as Jules Archer tells it in Two Came Back. Goodbye then until the same time next week when once again we offer you Escape. Tom Hanlon speaking over CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Escape! Brought to you by your Richfield Gasoline Dealer and the Richfield Oil Corporation of New York. Marketers of Richfield Gasolines, Motor Oils, and other petroleum products. Look for the Richfield Eagle on the cream and blue puffs. Tonight, we escape to the headhunter backcountry on the island of New Guinea and the story of two men trapped there with a beautiful but treacherous woman. As Jules Archer tells it in, two came back. Suppose this big guy, six foot five, grabs your hand and says, You're my pal, Johnny. There's a million dollar jackpot and I'm cutting you in. 
And suppose this blonde number, all curves and green eyes, leans up soft and murmurs. Mm. Johnny, you're bad. Like me. I like you bad. Like me. And suppose this blonde number, all curves and green eyes, waits until his big back is turned and then leans up again. Mm. It can get to be a problem, you know what I mean? A problem. By the time we'd passed over the Golden Gate and were headed out over the Pacific to the west, I could see this business of Gabe and Lily and me was strictly for the squirrels, and I wanted no part of it. There was no backing out now. I'd tried that for a week before takeoff, and it hadn't worked. Johnny, don't talk crazy. You're my friend, aren't you? Aren't you? Sure, Gabe, sure I'm your friend, but I don't want to go, that's all. Oh, you gotta go, Johnny. It's a million-dollar strike, I tell you. Oh, and after what you've done for me, I gotta let you in. I gotta. You really ought to come, Johnny. Well, I don't know. But I did know. I knew that million dollar strike or no million dollar strike, this was the time for me, John Walker, to stay home. You see, it was all because this pal, this, this Gabe, had been my sergeant on New Guinea. We were doing guerrilla mop-up work. Rugged duty, what with the Japs scattered all over thousands of miles of interior and all. When Gabe disappeared, his plane vanished. We all figured the guy had caught one and was dead. The lieutenant reported him missing in action. We forgot about him. Then one morning, about three weeks later, he shows. Not a scratch, not a word about where he's been or why or what. I'll leave her off for shipping him back to Guam for a desertion trial, but Gabe being a real rough soldier and all... Being the kind of guy we needed bad right then, they decided to chuck the book for the time being and keep him on. It was, like I say, guerrilla mop-up work. And a couple of nights later, we were heading down this trail when a machine gun nest went off right in our face. We all hit the ground, excepting Gabe. He dropped to one knee and sprayed the trees with his browning. A big guy, he stood out like a pinwheel on the 4th of July. Yep, Gabe caught one. I saw the BAR fall out of his hands and down he went. I wriggled through the kunai grass and onto the jungle trail and got him by his collar and... Now, why go into it? I was a hero, I guess. I saved his life. And what did it get me? Uh, baby. Trouble. It was in the spring of 47 that Gabe's letters finally caught up with me. I was in New York then. He was in Frisco. At first, I thought it was, well, just the old hoorah, but I was his buddy for keeps because I'd saved his life. But one of the letters had a plane ticket and a C-note along with a line about, I'm going to let you in on something big if you'll just come out to the coast. So I thought, huh, maybe the guy's got something. I caught the plane, and the next day I found myself walking down this empty street in Frisco with an address in my hand. And a real funny feeling in my head that I ought to turn around and go back home. Looking for somebody? Yeah. Who? Oh, it doesn't matter. I, I see I got the wrong address. Uh -huh. Hey, that's a... That's a, a real slick house coat you got on it. This? Oh, no. It's just an old thing, you know. Well, on you, it, it looks like a million bucks. Yeah? Yeah. Um, uh, what address was it you were looking for? Oh, oh, 403. This is 403. Yeah? Yeah. You, does uh, Gabor Krilovich live here? My husband. Uh. Uh-huh. Gabe! Ah! Uh. For you, a man. Yes? What does he want? I can't imagine. Well, why did he... Oh, Johnny! Hey, Gabe. Oh, Johnny, boy. So you got here, huh? Sure. Oh, gee, am I glad to see you. Gabe, you're looking good. Hey, so are you. So are you. Look uh, at that guy. Is this the Johnny you've been talking so much about? Yeah, Lily, this is Johnny. Johnny, meet Lily. Lily, Johnny. Hey, hey uh, didn't know I got married, did you, guy? Uh, no, no, Gabe. No, I, I, I didn't know you'd. 
got married. Yeah. Not a bad little dish for a big slob like me, huh? <laughs> Congratulations. Shall we come in out of this doorway? Yeah, let's do that. Oh, Johnny, 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 you you guy. <laughs> you know, Johnny saved my life, honey. Did I tell you? A million times. And that's how I met Lily. Well, that night we sat up talking until the sun came up. I was wondering just what she was trying to pull. Marrying this bow hunkers with his big feet and dirty undershirt and all when he hauled out the little leather bag and dumped the contents all over the table. Hey, what do you think of this, Johnny? Gabe. Gabe, that gold? <laughs> That's just samples. Where that came from, there's enough more to make us all millionaires, Johnny. You're kidding. No, no. Hey, remember in New Guinea when I went AWOL? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was just before Johnny saved my life, honey. Did I ever tell you about Johnny saving my life? Yeah, Gabe, I Gabe, I'm... about the gold, huh? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, when I went AWOL, I, well, I thought I'd just do a little fishing or something. You know, I was kind of tired of the war. You understand? Yeah, I understand. Gabe. So I took off into the hills. Oh, Johnny, that is some country. Believe me, wild but pretty, real pretty. And what sunsets? You never saw such sunsets. Gabe, sunset, Gabe, huh? the gold. Oh, yeah. Well, I, uh, I seen this quartz stuff up there in the hills, and some of it was glittery. And, well, this is it. I made me a map when I came back down. I can find it again without any trouble. That is, I mean, we can find it. You and me? And Lily, the three of us. Lily wouldn't want to miss all that adventure, would you, baby? I should say not. Uh, ain't she cute? Ain't she? You know, every time I look at her, Johnny, I wonder, now why would a cute little dish like that marry a big slob like me? Because you're so manly, sweetmeats. Sweetmeats? <laughs> Did you hear that, Johnny? Ain't she the limit? Sweetmeats, me! <laughs> Well, it didn't take any great genius to figure that she'd smell money when she married him. It also didn't take any great genius to figure that Lily was going to disrupt some harmony. Uh, I've never seen myself as a wife stealer, you know. So by the time that Gabe had bought all the stuff for the trip, I was ready to duck out, money or no. But Gabe, Gabe wouldn't hear of it. And, well, you know how it is when you put things off. All of a sudden, I wake up to realize that we're flying over the Golden Gate and on out west over the Pacific. And I thought, oh, this is no good. And you know something? I was right. San Francisco to Honolulu. From Honolulu to Guam. From Guam to Moresby. And all the time, she's leaning up against me with perfume and all, and those big green eyes. Morris B. to Salamaua. Salamaua to Weewak. And Gabe has given me the happy stuff about how glad he is his best friend and his wife like each other so much. Then down, down over the palm groves, the native lacatoys, seagull thatched huts, down, and there we were. New Guinea. Gold. Trouble. Yeah, going up the Pacific River, eh, mates? Yeah. Oh, uh, you better give us a couple of pounds of that powdered milk there. Pacific River. <laughs> That's a rum country that another patrol officer got done in up there last week. Uh, done in? Oh, hey, how about some forty-five ammunition? Aren't you, are? Yes, done in. Hey, Dunters. Gabe, you didn't tell me there were headhunters. Huh? Oh, don't you worry, honey. <laughs> you got me and Johnny to look out for you. Well, it's no bloody business of mine, mate. Here. This the ammo you want? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Right. No bloody business of mine, but I wouldn't take a woman up into that country. Might make it worse. Worse? What's worse than getting your head hung up on a pole? Gabe, I want to go home. Oh, now, don't you worry, honey. Of course, a woman would be a prize up there, lady. I mean, they wouldn't kill her. Odds are they'd make a queen out of her. Wouldn't touch her, just... Worshipper like. That's good? Well, that's up to you. Well, I don't like it. An hour later, packs bulging with supplies, we were off on the trail that wound up over the Purple Mountains, the Prince Alexander Range, and on toward Mai Mai. 
Gabe carried the heavy float boat bag topped with a thick duffel of provisions. I followed, carrying two packs, one on top of the other. Lily brought up the rear, carrying a light pack of clothing. Mostly her own. It was rough going that first day. Gabe didn't seem to mind. But me, my feet started to cave in after the first ten miles. It was all right with me when Lily squawked. Gabe! What? Let's stop. Well, it's only 3.30, huh? Let's stop, Gabe. Uh, another couple of hours, we can be over the first mountain. Manana, Gabe. My back is breaking. Okay, honey. He lowered his big pack. <laughs> And then took off into the jungle. Hey, where are you going? We'll need some firewood. Oh. Oh, Johnny. I'm tired. Yeah, me too. Oh. Oh, it feels good to get those off. Oh, whoever heard of carrying two packs at once? Good old Gabe. Yeah. Yeah. Come here, Johnny. Uh, what do you want? I know what you think about me, Johnny. You think I'm bad. It's only because I'm bored. Unhappy and bored. I could be a one-man woman, Johnny. No. I'm glad to hear about For it. For the right man, Johnny. Sure. For you, Johnny. I mean, Gabe would think it's such a hot idea. Maybe he wouldn't have to, Johnny. Meaning? Maybe after we get the gold, he'll fall off a cliff. Or he gets eaten up by a tiger or is stepped on by an elephant. There's no elephants and no guinea. Don't be dull, Johnny. I gotta be, Lily. I gotta be. You're real poison. Oh, Johnny. You're real bad poison. Mm -hmm. I'm bad. So are you, Johnny. Yeah. <laughs> You know, that looks real funny. Lipstick in a jungle. You think so? Mm. <laughs> looks even funnier on you. You open the door there, baby. <laughs> Here comes Gabe. I forgot my gun. Always like to carry a gun in the jungle. Never know when you're gonna run into a snake. Huh, Johnny? Yeah. Yeah, that's right, Gabe. Yeah. You never, never know. For years, scientists have been improving your car's performance by making gasoline better and better. But there's one discovery scientists have made that's different from all the rest. It's a gasoline component called xylene. Xylene is one of the highest Adenoc gasoline components ever discovered. And today, every gallon of Richfield gasoline contains this super component xylene. Xylene in Richfield gasoline gives higher than ever Adenoc performance. You get that eager pickup in traffic. That surging power that puts you out in front every time. What's more, you have a choice of two great Richfield gasolines with xylene. Your Richfield dealer offers Richfield High Octane at regular price for the average motor. Or Richfield Ethyl. Ethyl at its best for knockless performance in the highest compression motors. Test Richfield gasoline with xylene in your car for just one week. We know what your choice will be. Tomorrow, stop where you see the Richfield Eagle on the cream and blue pumps. And now, we return you to... Escape. it was. A lady wanted me to kill her husband and live a life of pleasure on our ill-gotten gains. Very dramatic situation, except for a minor point. She had figured that I shouldn't kill him until after he'd found the gold mine. And another minor point being that I was his best friend. But you know how it is. Life. Best friends always kill best friends. Oh, sure. But while this sordid drama on real, we had to hike through that lousy jungle. Hike and hike and hike and my feet were killing me. The sixth day was the worst one of the trip. 
we were wading through mangrove swamps thick with huge, thirsty leeches. There were giant mosquitoes that swarmed around us in clouds, and every time I slapped one, I killed ten. Oh, sure, we had mosquito lotion. They loved it. Gabe? What? What are we going to get to the river, Gabe? After a while, honey. After a while. After a while turned out to be nine days more. Then we reached the Sepik. A sluggish, muddy river winding like a serpent through huge, green-furred mountain ranges. And now we ride. We blew up the collapse of a boat, loaded all of our stuff aboard, and shoved off. I took the bow, gave the stern, Lily set amidships on a pile of sacks. Easy, Gabe, will you? This baby was designed for two people, not three. We're drawing a lot of water. Don't worry, Johnny. This is flood season. And with flood season, the water's high. We can carry three, but later it won't work. Then it'll be only two. Yeah, but we'll be back before then. Sure, Johnny. From time to time when we camped, Lily would give me the business. She didn't seem to care whether Gabe caught on or not. I cared. I cared a whole lot. And Gabe, I didn't know yet what it was that he was feeling. You saved my life, Johnny. I owe you a lot. Maybe that's what it was. But one afternoon, we camped early and went for a swim. I was paddling around. Water felt good. Gabe and Lily got out and were drying off when all of a sudden... I looked up. It was Gabe. He was standing on the bank, not 20 feet away, with his 45 pointed right at me. I dove. I dove as deep as I could. I could still hear him shoot I stayed down until I thought my lungs were going to pop. I surfaced. Gabe was waving at me and yelling. Come out, Johnny. Come out. You're, you're crazy, Gabe. Don't shoot anymore. I'm not shooting at you. Come out. So I came out. Then I looked around. And there, a few feet beyond where I'd been, was a tremendous crocodile with blood streaming out of him. When you dove, I thought sure he had you. Yeah. Why'd you die? I... I don't know. I must have lost my head. Gabe saved your life, Johnny. Yeah. yeah. I guess that uh, evens us up, huh? Yeah, I guess so, Gabe. No, I don't know your thing. That's right. <laughs> but you're still my pal, huh, Johnny? Well, you figure that one. We kept on going until we came to a place where a narrow, rocky tributary came boiling down a big mountain and into the Pacific. This is where we started walking again. The goal was up that fast little creek, and we could never paddle against that current. So we folded the boat, shouldered it and the packs, and started climbing. For a day and a half, we scrambled up that mountain by the fast little stream. Then we came to a wall of gray and white rock. Gabe said, this is where the goal is. And he was right. Holy schmagoli, that goal. Sure, we had to work to get it out of the rock. Well, in six days, we took out nearly half a million bucks worth. We could have taken more, but the stuff was heavy, you know. No, you don't know. You've never seen that much pure gold. So just take my word for it. Six days later, we started down the mountain. Then, when we made camp by the river that night, Lily waited until Gabe was sound asleep. Johnny. Yeah? Now, Johnny. Now what? Now you can kill him. Oh, go away, will you? I want my sleep. Do it now, Johnny. Look, baby, I don't want to kill anybody. I'm a rich man. Will you get smart? Smart? You get smart, Johnny. What do you mean by that? Three ways isn't good enough on the split. I want it two ways. Oh, nuts. And if you will kill him, I'll get him to kill you. After all, Johnny, you're the serpent in our happy marriage. Shut up, will you? Listen. I don't hear anything except the water. Yeah. Well, a minute ago, you couldn't hear that for Gabe snoring. They came in the morning. While we were loading up, they came out of nowhere. Get down! What's that? Elves! We couldn't see them, but we could tell from the arrows where they were. We laid low and tried to make every shot count. 
It wasn't long before we saw they really meant business. They weren't going to go away. Johnny! Yeah! We haven't got enough ammunition to last more than ten minutes at this rate. Oh, that's just great! Can you keep them off that long? Why? Why? What are you going to do? I'm going to... I'm going to get down to the stream and load up the boat. You're crazy, Jerry! You can't make it down that stream! Sure we can! You'd better end up with your head on a pole. Okay, Jerry! All right. Now, cover me. Here I shot you and Lily come back. All right! Longest ten minutes of my life. Lily lay there beside me. She was plenty scared, and she had every right to be. Those arrows were ugly. Big and jagged and sharp. Johnny. Johnny, those arrows are getting closer. Ah, will you stop jiggling my arm? I, I can't help it. Look, how am I going to shoot if you jiggle my arm? Suppose they get Gabe. That'll be tough. Yeah. How come you worry about Gabe at a time like this? Gabe, Schmabe, I'm worried about the gold. Oh, you dear sweet girl. Will you stop jiggling my arm? So sorry. Three minutes. Four. Five. I kept firing. Have you any idea what you're shooting at? Shut up. I mean it. You just put it at the grass and go bang. Will you shut up? Oh, I should have stood in Frisco. You should have stood in Frisco. Oh, don't talk. Just keep shooting. How can I keep shooting when you keep jiggling my arm? A nasty little thought crawled in my mind. Here I was up to my ankles and arrows, and there was Gabe with a boat, half a million bucks, and a downhill ride to freedom. Just suppose... Just suppose... Lily must have gotten the same idea. I, uh, I'm going to go help Gabe, Johnny. He may need help. Stay here. No. Goodbye, Johnny. Why did I stay? I don't know. I lay there and kept shooting and kept thinking, oh, you sucker, they'll go off with oxen. But I stayed. Came ten minutes, I heard it. Gabe signaled. The boat was already in the water, all loaded to go. Gabe faced the jungle, his automatic ready. Lily was crouching on the sand. Good boy, Johnny. Thanks. You all set? Yeah. There's one thing I didn't count on. What's that? With all this gold in the boat, it'll only carry two people now. Okay, Gabe, okay, I get it. Only one thing. Leave me your gun and ammo, will you? I want to die hard. Wait a minute, Johnny. Wait a minute. Maybe we ought to ask Lily who she thinks ought to stay. Maybe she'd rather I stay. No, Gabe. How about it, Lily? Who do you want to stay? That's a tough question. I know. You both got guns. Why don't you fight a duel for it? It'll only take a second, and the winner gets me and the gold. The one who stays behind will be dead, so he won't have to be tortured by headhunters. Oh, she's pretty cute, huh, Johnny? Oh, yes, indeed. Get in the boat, Johnny. No, Gabe, look, go. You go. Look, now's your chance for a clean start with Get in the boat, Johnny, or I'll kill you. You sure this is how you want it, Gabe? This is how I want it. Yeah. Yeah, that's it, Johnny. Now you all set? Yeah, Gabe. I'm all set. I hope you can get us down, Johnny. It's an awful fast stream. Don't you worry about it, Lily. Why not? Because it works this way. If either Johnny or me stays here, he gets tortured and then gets his head cut off. If you stay here, you can be a queen. You can live. They won't even touch you. You'll rule a whole tribe all by yourself. Gabe! What are you talking about? Stay away from the boat, Lil. No, Gabe, let her get in, will you? I'll get out. Sit down, Johnny, or I'll Come on! Sit down, I said. Gabe! Johnny saved my life once. And you... All you did was try to get him to kill me. Anyhow, I'm the only man who can get this boat down the rapids. And for that, I need Johnny. All right. Go. Get out, both of you. I'll be a queen. And I'll love it. And I'll be worth millions. Millions! Yeah. Yeah, I knew you'd say it, Lily. I knew you'd understand! (laughs) Here's an amazing fact for every motorist. The film of oil in your motor is often no thicker than a spider's web. But that thin film is all that saves your motor from destruction. That's why it's important for you to use the best motor oil you can get. We suggest Rich Lube, all-weather motor oil. Rich Lube is refined 100% from the finest Pennsylvania crude obtainable. Rich Lube protects your motor with a tough, elastic oil film that holds its body even under the terrific heat of summer driving. At the same time, 
It draws excess heat away from moving engine parts. Moreover, Rich Lube, the Pennsylvania premium motor oil, contains special chemicals that clean your motor of harmful deposits as you drive. Yes, it cleans as it lubricates. So keep your motor clean. Keep your motor young. See your Richfield gasoline dealer tomorrow. Ask him to change your oil to Rich Lube all-weather motor oil. Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson. And tonight has presented Two Came Back by Jules Archer. Adapted for radio by Savage Dollar. Featured in tonight's cast were Joan Banks as Lily, Stacey Harris as Johnny, Paul Fries as Gabe, and Ben Wright as the traitor. Special music arranged and played by Ivan Dittmars. Next week. You are lost in the wildest mountains of Idaho, surrounded by a raging forest fire which is swiftly bringing a horrible death closer and closer to you. A death from which there is no escape. Next week at this time, the Richfield Oil Corporation of New York invites you to escape with an exciting story of love and murder in the wilds of Idaho, as Anthony Ellis tells it in The Red Forest. Be listening. Goodbye then, until the same time next week when once again we offer you Escape. Tom Hanlon speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Escape! The Battle of Man Against the Elements, The Man Against Man. Thirty minutes of flight into the world of action and danger, where every minute is a call to adventure. These are the moments when a life hangs on the twist of a chance. The moments of... Escape. Escape to the wildest mountains of Idaho, and the story of love and murder in the midst of a raging forest fire, as Anthony Ellis tells it in The Red Forest. <laughs> it had taken me five years, three months, and four days. It had carried me across 21 states. And then in the Clearwater country of Idaho, I'd found it. That was in the afternoon. The trail had led from a lumber town along a washboard road and into the forest. I'm no woodsman, but in the daylight, I found the place. And then I started back to the car. But something was different. Maybe the late sun red through the trees, maybe tall shadows. There wasn't a trail anymore, only streams where there hadn't been before trees that were the same, but weren't. And sounds, sounds that were fun when you were a kid on a hike, but now scared you. I used my last cigarette three or four hours before, and it was then that I, that I started to run. Run. And the fear grows until you want to scream and want the ground to open up for you, warm and safe. But it didn't. And now, there was only the dry whirring of a rattlesnake, coiled inches away from me. No! I lived then, maybe because the snake was more afraid of something else than me. It didn't strike, just slithered away and became the pattern of the leaves. It was nearly dark when I found the road. I'd come to it about a half a mile below where I'd parked the car. A half hour later, on the outskirts of the little town, my headlights picked up a girl standing on the side of the road. She carried a cheap paper suitcase, and she was thumbing a ride. I stopped. Can I get a ride, mister? Why, sure. Ah, here. I'll put your case in the back. There we go. Hey, I'm lucky. Not many cars on the road tonight. Uh-huh. Been walking long? Uh-huh. I'm on my way to Missoula. 
My last try dropped me a mile or so back. Yeah? You live around here? No. No. I, I don't guess you'd be going as far as Missoula. Well, sure. Gee, that's swell. <laughs> I got a job there starting tomorrow. Kind of broke, if you know what I mean. Buses cost money. Yeah, I know what you mean. Mind if I smoke? No, 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 of course not. Go right ahead. Hey, your face. What? You, you've been hurt. You're all scratched up. Oh, well, uh, I, I was hunting. I got lost just the other side of town. Uh, if you want to take a nap, it's okay. We've got about a hundred miles to go. Guess I look pooped, huh? Yeah. I'm not kidding. I am. Say you're all right, mister. I'll take you up on it. Some guys, the minute you get in, want more than the bus fare. I can see you're not that kind. You'll be safe. I'll wake you when we're at the city limit. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Oh. <laughs> Gee, it's nice out here. It's kind of lonely. It smells good. I wonder what that is. Over there. What? The sky. Bright light, see? I don't know. Gee. Could almost be Seattle. I'm a long way off. I had a boyfriend. He used to take me driving at night. When we came back, you could see a glow. Just like that. Oh. I saw that glow in the sky. It was on our right. And as the road twisted through the trees, it fell behind us and to our left and circled into the straight ahead. The girl had fallen asleep very quickly. I saw her face in the light from the dash. Thin, pretty, peaceful. And it was about 15 minutes after I picked her up that I saw the lights on the road. And then closer, the figures waving. Hey, they're all ready. I, I just got to sleep. No, there's something wrong. There's a cop coming this way. Uh, what's the trouble? Plenty. We want you, mister. Want me? Yeah. Forest fire. Bad one. We've got to have every man we can find. Uh, someone else in the car with you? I, yes, a girl. Good, she can help. Uh, look, I, I'd like to very Here's much. Here's the forest ranger. He'll explain. Well, I'm awfully sorry, but you see, I'm on my way to Missoula. Not and... tonight. I got authority to do this, mister. I'm sorry, but we need you. Well, I... Now, you I... couldn't get much further anyway. The road's cut off. Mountain's going up like a torch. If it's spread, there's three towns going too. Come on, I got some clothes and boots for you. Hey, what about me? I gotta get to Missoula. I got a job in the morning. Sorry, sister. You got a job serving coffee here. You cops. Five dollars a day. A day? Or a longer, it depends. Come on, let's go. There was nothing else to do, so I got into the clothes the ranger gave me, then stood around and waited. I wasn't tired anymore, just scared. Scared of going into that forest again. The wind came up a bit, and with it, the smell. Smell of burning. Smell of death. A long way off, but closer than the glow had been, we could see flickering against the sky. And it was in a lot of places. Suddenly, it was too warm and too quiet. All right, you guys. The telephone's burnt out. I made contact with a short wave set. Hey, you, mister. What? What's your name? Uh, Pendell. Pendell? Yeah. You ever use one of these? Walkie-talkie? Well, sure, I was in the signal corps. Okay, and you'll carry it. Now, listen. This is bad. Real bad. The fire's got behind us. We can't get any more men through for several hours. They've got to come around from the other side, and that's 30 miles. What's the use, then? Let's get out. Hey, crowbar. Yeah? I'm putting you in charge. You know what to do. Get in as close as you can to the river and set a backfire. Sure. I got to stick here with the transmitter. You take the walkie-talkie, and I'll let you know what's happening. Sure, you stay here with the pretty girl. We go and get fried. Shut up, Pat. Hey, Hanson, you'll have to go with them. Three's not enough. Sure. Well, the cops could have do some work for a change. You better take along some food and a thermos. Come on, step on it. Too bad we haven't got to try. A couple of sandwiches I made up. Here. <laughs> Thank you. This sure is something, isn't it? Yeah. You scared? Scared? Why? Your face is white. You scared? I'm from the city. I know what you mean. Those trees give me the willies, too. Dark. Sure. That's it. You'll be all right. Listen, kid. 
If uh, anything happens, you take my car. Here are the keys. What do you mean? If I don't come back, keep the car. You kidding? You're coming back. Yeah, sure. So long. Hey, my name's Jan. What's yours? Wally. You be careful, Wally. We went into the forest. Men with spades. Men against fire and terror. There was the man they called Fat, 300 pounds of ungainly body, topped by a tiny and almost disgustingly childlike face. There was Crowbar, a big, dark man, quiet and filled with the knowledge of the woods. Hanson, the state trooper, thin and wiry, his natty khaki shirt stained with sweat and dirt. And me. We'd gone about a mile when we first heard it. It came in gusts with the wind high above us. Wait a minute. Holy... Shut up. Let's get out of here. About uh, three miles away. I, I figure coming fast. We're about that far from the river, aren't we? Yeah. Listen, you guys, if it's across the river, we're sunk. Let's get out. Hey, Wally. Yeah. Get the ranger. Tell him it's coming this way pretty fast. Right. Look, look, sparks up there. See? Sure, up at sparks, fire. You Hello. Chicken? Oh, lay off. Hello. Pendell calling row. Pendell calling row. Over. We're still about three miles from the river. We can hear it. Over. You can't set a backfire now. Wind's changed. You better come back. Over. Right. Well, he says go back. That's okay with me, boy. Come on. Gee, listen to that. I wanted to run again. That same feeling I'd known before. The fear all around us, closing in and down. There was no sky above, only blackness tinged with red, pressing. And behind the living forest, running, overtaking, and passing us. When we reached the road again, the sound was steady. I had a strange feeling of relief when I saw the forest ranger and the girl, Jan. It was like coming home. I think it was then that I stopped being afraid. Come on, Ro, we can't do no good now. Yeah, you're not kidding. We gotta try and join up with the others. What do you mean? Well, the fire's on three sides of us. That means we head southeast. Well, can we take the road back? Nope. There are 200 men trying to keep a path open for us. We've got to make five miles in a hurry. Bad as that. Yeah, worse. If we don't get there in time and they can't make a fire break, we're going to be smack in the middle and there's not going to be any way out. Our country faces a critical problem, excessive hoarding and purchasing by thoughtless people. Panic buying is senseless buying. It helps no one and creates situations which are as dangerous as they are unnecessary. The American Grocery Manufacturers Association reports that we have a surplus of 450 million bushels of grain. Stocks of lard are 189 million pounds above what we had last year. Production of vegetable oils is above the average of the last 10 years. Quantities of fresh and canned vegetables are 10% above normal. Supplies of sugar are 950,000 tons above last year's figure. There's a surplus of eggs growing at the rate of 15 million dozen every month. The only shortages are temporary local shortages, so don't help to create them. The good citizen is the thoughtful consumer. Buy what you need, don't deny yourself the things to which you're accustomed, but don't take somebody else's share. You'll buy what you need... If you need what you buy, the size of your shopping bag is the test of your allegiance to your country. Now we return you to... Escape. We didn't carry anything but canteens. It was hot, and because it was hot, it made you thirsty even when you didn't need water. The going was rough, and we could only head in what we thought was the general direction of safety. It was at the ridge that... We lost the first man. <coughs> the wind's changing again, Crowbar. Uh, which way? I can't tell. It's haywire with this fire. Do we go straight ahead? Might as well. Oh, wait a minute. See that ridge? <laughs> yeah. Now, why don't I get up there? Shouldn't take more than ten minutes, and I'll be able to get a better look. Give me the flash, and I'll signal to you. I don't know. We haven't got much of a start. Ours behind us, and a lot faster. It's better than walking toward it. Remember, it's on three sides. Okay. You make it fast, Cobar. Sure. Good luck. Thanks. What do we do? Just sit and wait? Yeah, that's right. Listen, you're the ranger. Why don't you go? 
What'd you send Crowbar for? He's fought fires before and he knows. He's a better man to climb up there. He's faster than me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> hey, kid. Kid, are you okay? Sure, Wally. Just fine. Guess I'm not used to walking, though. These high heels don't help. Yeah. Take it easy, huh? My feet feel like they did once at a dance I went to. Some big lunk climbed all over me. Guess you won't have a job in Missoula, huh? If I get out of this, that's all I care about. Yeah, it's tough. I'm scared. Give me a hand, will you? She held onto my hand tight. It wasn't the darkness that frightened her now. There wasn't darkness anymore, but a yellowish red light that came from everywhere. It was another kind of fear. Fear of something you, you could see, hear, and with every minute feel more and more. I only waited there ten minutes, eleven, twelve, and then... Did you hear something? Yeah. It seemed to come from over there. From the ridge, maybe? Maybe. Listen, you, you think something got crowbar? A lion or something? I'll go up. No, Fendel. What do you mean, no? No time. We waited too long now. Oh, but he may be hurt. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> It'll take you longer than it took crowbar to get there. Now, come on. Uh, you couldn't find him in the dark? Who says he's hurt anyway? We'll move on and he'll catch up. I say we go after him. <laughs> Not me. I'll put it to a vote, but hurry up now. Hanson. We go on. All right, Pat. <laughs> Let's get out of here. And I say go on. That leaves you messing. I'm staying with Wally. All right. I'll go with you. We never saw Crowbar again. Maybe a lion got him. Maybe he got lost. We never saw him again. The ranger went ahead, finding trails somehow, keeping us moving. We began to climb, and after a while, we were on another ridge. For the first time, we could see the fire. It stretched out for miles like a huge red sea. It was all around us. Oh, gee, Wally. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. Well, it hurt much. I don't know. Hey, 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 take a breather. I'm going to try the walkie-talkie again. He's not scared, is he? I guess not. Is that because he's a ranger? Or because he's very brave? You're a funny girl. No, I'm not. Hey, give me a kiss, will you? Sure. Why did you want me to do that? I don't know. You're a nice fella. I miss you. Listen, Jana. Oh. I want to tell you something. What? <laughs> if we get out, maybe. Yeah. Look, I'm, I'm all right. I mean, we could have fun together. I know. I, uh... I did something wrong once. I I killed a man. Why? He framed me. Got, <laughs> got me put away for something I didn't do. We were driving in the east and ran over a woman. He was at the wheel, but <laughs> he took a powder and left me. But you didn't do it? That's what I say, but I had been <laughs> drinking and went to sleep. When I woke up, I was behind the wheel. He put me there. That's how the cops found me. I got five years. Oh, I was married. My wife killed herself. Ashamed, I guess. I lost my job and my friends. I swore I'd get my pal, and I did. He was a louse. He knew I was after him and ran, but I caught, <coughs> caught up with him. I don't care. Don't you? I, I don't know why I told you that. Maybe because if we do get out... You... Sure. I know. I know. It's okay. Come on, Pendell. The ranger's moving off. It was the state trooper, Hanson. I wondered how much he'd heard, but there wasn't any time to worry then. Roe thought he'd seen a break in the fire, and we headed for it. When we got down in the trees again, I began to get a feeling that I'd been there before. It was nothing I could recognize, just a feeling. And then a couple of hundred yards that long, I knew why. Hey, hold up! There's a shack! Looks like someone's living there. <laughs> Better have a look. Door's open. Hey. It's a man. All right, give me a hand. Sure. <laughs> hey, he's being shot. Yeah. 
A few hours ago, from the looks of it. <laughs> you think the man who did this might have started it? What do you mean? A fire. It started a few miles north of here. We figured somebody got careless with a match. Uh, maybe the killer running away. <laughs> I'd like to get the fellow that did that. Maybe I will. Yeah, me too. Well, we can't do anything here. Come on. From there on, nobody talked. It was hard enough to lift your feet. Jan was nearly through, and I half carried him. If Roe knew where he was leading us, he didn't say. We followed and knew that sooner or later we'd stop because we were too tired to go on. That was the first. Hey, listen, fellas. Wait. Wait a minute. Oh, you got to go on. There's still a chance. No, the best. Just, just for a minute. No. Get up. Please, please, one minute. That's all. Get up. No, I can't. No, I can't. Okay, you stay. No, no. Well, then, come on. But I can't. I can't. I'm sorry. You catch up to us and stay on the ground. No, no. All right, come on, Jay. Is it going to leave me? No, we have to. No, please don't leave me. I'm coming. Can we help him? Oh, we're almost dead ourselves. I don't know whether it was because none of us liked him or because we knew that we couldn't do anything. It's funny how you can lose a man and know he's going to die and put him right out of your mind. Perhaps we wanted to live so badly, we figured the fire would take time out from us to attend to him. Hanson was next. I'm, I'm finished. No, you're not. Just a bit more to go. We can still get through. No. No, you go ahead. Save the girl. I'm sorry. I, I... Go on. Maybe I can catch up. I, I got a rest. You, Wally, uh, do me a favor. <laughs> what? I lost my gun somewhere. Know what I mean? It'll be quicker that way. You got one? Yeah. Here. Thanks. One bullet fired, huh? That's all I wanted to know. Okay, Pindell. I've had enough rest. I can keep up with you now. Feel a little safer with this army. Go ahead. So he knew. I didn't care now. I was too tired to care. If he wanted to play cop, that was his business. Sure, the man in the shack was Lenny Gillen. Sure, I'd kill him. It was my match on that last cigarette when I was lost that must have started this fire, but it wasn't important anymore. Right now, I wanted to get Jan out of it. Get myself out. What was that? <laughs> it's behind us. It sounded like Hanson. All right. Come on. Watch the ravine. No, he must have fallen. We can to help him. No time. Good, you. We didn't help Pat. Why him? I don't know. Please. All right. Stay here. Hanson. Hanson. Keep calling, Hanson. Okay. My, my leg. Can you get up? No, oh, my leg. Broken, I guess. Yeah. You know about me, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, I know. Girl knows too. I, I heard you telling her. She won't say anything. No. No, I guess not. Gillen had it coming to him. I wouldn't know. I'm a cop. Yeah. It's getting hot. Put your arm over my sh shoulder. You can't get me up there. Well, I can try. Now, come on. Come on. Hey. Oh. 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 No, no good. We can't fake I'll get the ranger. I come back. No. No time. Go on. No, I... Get out of here. No, I can't. Go on. I've got your gun. Nobody will ever know. You, you can get away with murder. Hanson, I'm sorry. Go on, get out of here. So 
somehow I made it up the trail again. I thought I heard a shot of... Maybe it was a burning tree going down. Jan was waiting for me, and we went on until the trees began to thin out, and we heard the shots of men. I didn't remember anything else because I passed out for a long time. When I woke up, Jan was sitting by my bed, and it was cool again. Hi. Huh? Oh, hi, Jan. Did they get Hanson out? No. Jan, hmm? listen to me. About what I told you back there. You know, the man I killed. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sorry. I, I mean, it was all right about him, but not Hanson, Crowbar. In fact, that was my fault, you know that. Yeah. Well... I want you to call a cop. Uh-uh. Listen, kid, I've been dreaming about it. It's no good now. Be a good kid and call a cop, will you? I don't have to. There's one outside now. What do you mean? When you passed out, I guess you were delirious or something. You told them. I told them? That's good. That's good. Oh, I'm glad. You want me to hang around? Well, I... That's up to... Up to you, I guess. I guess it is. I'll hang around. Each year, thousands of Southern Californians contribute to the pension and sick and injured funds of the Sheriff's Relief Association. You can do your share for this deserving organization by attending the Sheriff's Annual Rodeo in the Los Angeles Coliseum on August 27th. Cowboy star Roy Rogers and Trigger will head the great array of talent on this thrill-packed show. June Haver has been selected as Rodeo Queen, and Joel McRae will act as Grand Marshal. There will be exhibitions of roping and riding by champions from all over the country and a thousand other exciting events at the Sheriff's Annual Rodeo, the greatest spectacle of its kind in the world. It's at the Los Angeles Coliseum, 2.30 Sunday afternoon, August 27th. It's a treat the whole family will enjoy. And don't forget the date, Sunday, August 27th. Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson. And tonight has presented The Red Forest by Anthony Ellis. Featured in tonight's cast were Glo- Georgia Ellis as Jan, Bill Conrad as Wally, Paul Prees as Hanson, Ben Wright as Roe, Jay Novello as Fat, and Will Gear as Crowbar. Special music arranged and played by Ivan Dittmars. Next week. You're in the middle of the most barren desert of Mexico watching a wealthy Oriental voluntarily being strangled to death by the priests of his strange religion, dangerous fanatic priests, from whom there is for you also no escape. Next week at this time, CBS invites you to escape with an exciting story of a man trapped by the priests of a weird cult in the desert wastes of Mexico, as Governor Morris tells it in The Footprint. Be listening. Goodbye, then, until this same time next week, when once again we offer you Escape. For radio entertainment at its best, keep tuned to your CBS station. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! 
Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Escape, brought to you by your Richfield gasoline dealer and the Richfield Oil Corporation of New York. Marketers of Richfield gasolines with xylene, rich lube, all-weather motor oil, and other famous petroleum products. Look for the Richfield Eagle on the cream and blue pumps. Tonight, we escape with the story of the murderous priests of a weird cult hidden in the barren deserts of Mexico. As Governor Morris tells it in his famous tale, The Footprint. Here it is. Now, you see me, Bucko. Here's the Gulf of California. Yeah. And up here near the Barra de San Orgue, on the coast of Sonora, we find two bays divided by a high spit of sand with a granite pillar marking the bay to the north. Mm-hmm. It's a massive thing, that pillar. Easy to find. You can't miss it. Then, then there's 20 miles inland, due east from the pillar, and we find it. Well, find what? A Chinese pagoda. <laughs> a Chinese pagoda? <laughs> you sure it isn't a Japanese wigwam? Ah, now, boys, I know it sounds strange, but it's the truth I'm telling you. Well, how did you get this map, Mr. Mugridge? Ah, from a Chinese, God rest his heathen soul. I did him a sort of a favor once. <laughs> you did him a sort of a favor. And he tells you where to find a fortune in ruby? How come there's a Chinese pagoda full of rubies in Mexico? If you know the facts, me buckles, it wasn't the Spanish who first set foot in these shores. Huh? It was the Chinese. Uh, come on, you guys. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mortgage. We're sorry to take up your time. Oh, no, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's a nice trip on a good, sound schooner. And if you like sailing, what have you got to lose? <laughs> And there was nothing to lose except the $200 a head he charged to outfit the schooner. And that was cheap enough for a summer's cruise, and we all liked sailing. Well, we took it easy after we left San Francisco, heading around the Cape of Lua, California, hitting La Paz, and then up and across to Wymas, and on into the northern part of the Gulf. And after two weeks of searching for a pair of bays marked by a granite pillar, we finally anchored in a small inlet to look for fresh water. Yeah, the relief from constant sailing was good, Ah, oh, man. I'll draw a card, will you, Chris? <laughs> Jim, you're blitzed. <sighs> you're a lousy card player. Yeah, you're just lucky, Pinhead. And that makes 500, you owe me. Yeah. I'll pay you when we find the rubies. You dead beef. Shut up, lads. We'll find that pillar yet. Ah, oh, nuts, Margaret. We've looked into 50 of these bays. Why don't you cut out the act? What are you talking about, lad? Just come right out and say it. You cooked up this whole deal as a meal ticket. You can't see anything through those binoculars except what we've already seen a hundred times. There's not a hunk of granite in 500 miles. You know it. Well, to think the thought could enter your mind. Why, I'm as put out as any of you. But now's the time to persevere and we'll find yeah, it. Yeah, skip yeah, it. Come on, Hey, cars. hey, wait a minute. Now, there's something for you. What? There's a boat heading into the bay. Oh. We scrambled up to Margaret at the bow. Boats were rare this far up the Gulf. She was just rounding into the bay a quarter mile off. She looked like one of the fishermen we'd seen down by Weymouth, but not quite. Better one of you get the guns out of the locker. There's no use taking any chances. I'll get it. By the time Meff came back with the guns on deck, the stranger was close in shore. And as she came about, we saw him through the binoculars, seated on the open stern, holding a yellow umbrella to keep off the sun. A Chinese dressed in gleaming white. He was mountainous with fat, and his big, round, smiling face glistened with sweat. Another Chinese, stripped to the waist, came out of the big cabin, lowered a dinghy, and hopped in. The big Chinese swung his rolling fat over the rail. We watched the fat man being rowed into shore and continued watching as the dinghy skipped back to the boat which headed out to sea. Until it rounded the horn of the bay, the Chinese just stood there. Then he picked up his yellow umbrella, turned, and waddled across the beach, lumbered over a dune, and was gone. Well, what do you make of that? I don't know, I don't know, but now's the time to find out. Let's go ashore. Look at that guy's footprints. He must weigh a ton. You said it, man. Come on, boys, this way. Up the dune. Yeah, I can't run that fast this stuff. Hey, boy, boy! What's got into him? I'll get up the dune and we'll find out. Come on. <laughs> 
All me a liar. Good. Yes, sir. Call the map a phony, will you? Look, look, look. What? That's the pillar. The granite pillar. No wonder we couldn't find it. It's almost buried in the sand. Well, you look at the size of it. The ruby boys be as good as got them. What about our fat friend? Looks like he has the same thing on his mind. We follow him, me buckos. It's four with guns against a yellow umbrella. Come on, lad. It all seemed real now. It wasn't the corny gang. Somewhere in that desert was a fortune in rubies. And apparently that Chinese was leading us to it. Ahead of us, we could see the yellow umbrella bobbing in the distance. And for all his fat, he set us a murderous pace. <laughs> Why doesn't he stop? This is killing me. He will, he will, but we got to put closer to him. Save your breath. But he didn't stop. He kept it up the rest of the day. And the sun was like a red-hot iron on our backs, and the heat waves danced off the desert like crazy devils. For a while, just before the sun set, the heat threw up a mirage, and the fat bulk of the Chinese seemed to waddle through the sky. And then it was dark. And we lost him. Until... Hey, uh, look. He's coming back. What? Oh, it's yeah. a Chinese. Huh. I come back to say I go 20 miles without no stop. You like to come all the way, I say nothing. Only tell you all the way nasty sound. You go back. Wish you present halt and return journey. We're not going back. Very well. Only I experience travel and put up with no complaints. Present conversation and all good friends at end of journey. You. Uh, he means you, Johnny. What? Uh, me? You got nice, respectable face. Walk with me. Uh, okay. My name, Sang Ti. Very fine, rich Chinese merchant. Well, where do you come from? No matter. Where I go is important. Chan Chan, very fine, holy place to end days in. Holy place? Oh, yes. You see, I am dedicated to high gods by parents when very little boy. Uh-huh. They ask high gods I be given very fine, successful life. It is accomplished. Now, must pay our promises of parents to high gods. Uh, you're very lucky. Luck? <laughs> On 45th day of 45th year, I kneel before priests of high gods, pray before sacred rubies of Holy Grey Spirit, reflect on insignificance of life, and I'm soon strangled. What? Strangled? I give you honest word, being strangled at 45 is no joke. But uh, cannot break promises of dead parents. Well, maybe so, but I... I arrange for you and friends to see ceremony. It is very dignified, interesting occurrence. Uh, excuse me now. Please, I meditate. He folded his hands inside his sleeves, dropped his chin on his chest, and drew ahead. We couldn't keep up with him, and three hours later we were still following the black holes the fat Chinese's feet had left behind. It was just an hour before dawn when we finally saw it. Chan Chin. A large stone building with a few smaller ones tucked near it. How there could have been a lake in the middle of this impossible waste was beyond understanding. But there was a small one, and we ran for it. It was the sweetest sight in the world. We sucked it up with our paws and mouths, lay in it, patted it, kissed it. Oh, it was beautiful. Oh, I don't care if I ever see another French uh-huh. bathing suit again. Oh, you lovely warrior. Where do you suppose to be head, huh? What? The rubies, me buckle, the rubies. How about that big building, huh? Yeah. Looks like some sort of a heathen temple. It is temple. What? Temple of high gods. Sang Ti. Oh, again. You uh, better travelers than I expect. You look a bit, then go home. Priests say very unhealthy place for unbelievers. How many priests? Ten, ten priests. Not many, but enough. Why you come to Chen Chang? Ah, we, we heard about it through a friend. Now you see, you go before sunrise. I couldn't move another step. Why you come here? Maybe to steal very high god rubies? You leave very high god ruby box alone. You with respectable face, take friends away. I can't, Sancti. We've got to rest. You wait till after interesting occurrence of strangulation, and then you go. For a man about to meet the high gods, you're pretty calm. Oh, very miserable business. But parents make promise. What can do? It is time. Well, 
me, Buckles. As the fat heathen says, it is time. Yeah, this I gotta see. like it's coming from somewhere in front. Hey, look at that up there ahead. You see? Looks like it's suspended in midair. Holy, it's the rubies, me buckles. Gold caskets studded with them. Look at them glow. Where's the light coming from? That hole in the roof there. See? Sun's rising. Hey, now look. It's a heathen idol. And it's got a ruby box held in one of its hands. And in the other hand, a snake. A little gray enamel snake. Watch it. Somebody's coming. A row of green-robed priests, eyes closed in silent prayer, began filing into the circle of light. One of them stepped in front of the idol, held up a long gray cord as if for the idol to see. The circle of light widened, and we saw the kneeling form of Sang Ti. He wasn't smiling now. He looked sad and frightened. Hey, you know, I think he's really going to get strangled. You got me. As if he'd been waiting for a signal, the priest stepped quickly in back of Sancti, looped the cord over his neck, and jerked. No. C6, H4, add CH3, taken twice. <laughs> no, that's not pig Latin, and it's not a secret code either. It's the scientific description of xylene. Xylene is one of the highest antinoch gasoline components ever discovered by science. But here's the big news. Every drop of Richfield gasoline you buy contains xylene. Richfield gasoline contains this super antinock component to take the knock out of hill climbing. To put a new wallop in your motor. To zip you out ahead in traffic. Give you power to spare on the open road. And Richfield offers you two great gasolines to choose from. Both with xylene. Get Richfield high octane at regular price for the average motor. Or Richfield ethyl. Ethyl at its best. For smooth, knockless performance in the highest compression motors. Get Richfield gasoline with xylene tomorrow. Stop where you see the Richfield Eagle on the cream and blue pumps. And now we return you to... Escape. You got a hurt. You got the priest. A murdering hyena. Come on. Come on. Be careful. There's other priests in here somewhere. Sancti. Is he all right? No, his neck's broken. He's dead. Ah, skip the fat heathen. One of you reach for the ruby casket. I'll get him. Holy Moses, that must be worth a fortune. Look out, Meth. The snake. Uh, hmm? The snake's not part of the idol. It's alive. Oh, oh, get away. Get away. The little gray snake struck at his hand like lightning. As Meth fell, it was already on the floor racing at Margaret, who had grabbed the ruby casket. He smashed at it with his rifle butt, breaking the tail, and it slithered away under the idol. We looked at Meth. He was horrible. Purple. Like he'd been dead a week. We ran. Ran out into the desert. Wait up. Wait up, will you? <coughs> oh, I can't keep this up, me buckles. This thing is heavy. There. Let's see that casket, mortgage. <laughs> Look at him, Johnny. We're rich, you know that? We're rich. Doesn't it mean anything to you that Meth is dead? He's dead. It sure it means something, Johnny. It means you only split it three ways. Is that all you can think about? What do you want to do? Send him his oh, share? forget it, forget it, forget I said anything. Let's get out of here. Now, 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 lads, calm down. There's 20 miles of devil's playground between us and the schooner. And we got to start using our heads. Well. Yeah, settle down, Johnny. Going to be a hot day. <laughs> The 
rubies flamed in the early sun. Crisp leered at them, and Mugridge's face had a look I'd never seen before. All they meant to me was meth and that sudden horrible death. I don't remember it getting hot. It just was. Oh, it jerks I have to get that water out of the lake. You feel like going back? Well, not me. I got what I came after. Are we going the right way? Yeah. Sunsets in the west. We'll be walking right into it. How far we come? I don't know. I don't know anything except that it's hot. Here, Chris. It's your turn to carry the cask. Oh, it's a job lugging that thing. All right. Here, Johnny. No. You take the rifle. Uh, I, I'll take it for you, me bucko. Yeah. No. no, Johnny will carry it. Why, of course, me fine boy. Well, give it to me. Let's get going. I wish this thing would split three ways already. Wouldn't be so heavy. Seemed like the day was endless. The casket passed from Crisp to me and back to Mugridge. I got heavier each time. I didn't think of meth anymore. The sun burned all thought of him out of my brain. As it headed down for the horizon with maddening slowness. How much longer is it going to hang there? It's enough to drive a man crazy. Hey, let's stop. I got to stop. We can't stop. We'll never be able to get up. I'm no fat Chinese. I can't walk 20 miles without a stop. If only one of them late mirages was real. Look. Look, do you see it? Over there on the left. Yeah. Looks like somebody walking in the sky just over them dunes. Looks like one of them priests. Don't you see what it means? We saw the same thing when we were following Sang Ti. I mean, one of them priests is following us? Yes, it's the casket. He wants the casket. Now, don't get all excited. Remember, we got the gun. There's only one of the devils. Just let him show. He knows we've got a gun. He won't show while there's still sunlight. He'll wait for the darkest time. Just before the moon. Well, what could he do? I don't know what he could do, and I don't want to find out either. Johnny's right. That's when he try. Yeah. You know, I'm not as tired as I thought. We best be moving along, me buckles. Yeah. There goes the sun. We didn't run. We couldn't. Crisp was carrying the casket, and we had to stay together. All day we'd prayed for the sun to go down, and now that it had, we almost wished it was still there. The blackness was sudden and complete. We kept walking, waiting, ready for anything. But nothing happened. Yeah, the dark hour passed and the moon rose. We fooled him. Aye, it seems that we did me, Buckles. If he was there at all. He was there, all right. Those priests let us get away too easy. And look, you guys. Let's stop. I'm bushed. There's enough moonlight now to see anything. We'd be making it to the schooner tomorrow. Easy. It's my turn with the rubies. I'll stand first watch. Well, I guess it's safe. Moon's pretty bright. Oh, my bones. My muscles. We dropped where we stood. I think what woke me was the moonlight creeping under the brim of my hat. I felt cold. I sat up and saw Chris was asleep. His hat had slipped down over his face, but his fingers were still wrapped tight around the casket. I looked across the desert and froze. Just for an instant, I saw a yellow face duck back behind a low dune. When I got to where I had seen it, there was nothing, not even a mark in the sand. But I had seen a face. Margaret and Crisp were still dead asleep, only it seemed that Crisp's hat had slipped a little. And then it actually shifted, rose, and settled back. Crisp. Crisp, are you awake? What? Don't move, Crisp. It's the snake. <laughs> Kill it! Kill it! What's happened? Crisp is dead. Look at it. It was under his hat all the time. It's the little gray snake with a broken tail. That Chinese is hunting us down. Which way did it go? There. You see the track? You missed it? Yes, I missed it. 
And it's coming back. It'll keep coming back until it gets us. We've got to get in a schooner. Leave the casket, Margaret. That's what they want. Hasn't it caused enough trouble? It takes a bit of trouble to get rich, Johnny, me boy. And I don't mind it a bit. Johnny. Johnny, me buckle. I got to have one. Oh, help me, Johnny. There isn't any. We've got to get to the schooner. I know the signs, Johnny. There's water out here. Help me look. Don't, Margaret. He'll drive you so crazy. Crazy, is it? Don't call me crazy. It's you. Look over there. It's bushes. Green bushes. There's nothing, I tell you. It's just sand. Now, don't lie, Johnny. Don't lie. I'll go fetch you a drop. It'll make you feel better. You watch after the rubies, and I'll fetch you. No, come back, Margaret. We've got to go on. Stay with the rubies, Johnny. I watched him work his way over, stumbling in the sand. And then suddenly I saw it. There was something green. Margaret! Margaret, I see it! I see it too! It's water! It's water! No, no, Margaret! It's silk! Green silk! He wasn't crazy now, and neither was I. The green-robed priest rose up out of the desert, and in his hand he held the little gray snake. Margaret was running back. Then there was darkness in my eyes, and I was running, running desperately with something heavy clutched in my arms. We, we only stopped when, when it was broad daylight, and the sense of fear came to an end. Is he following? No, oh, no. That was a close one, the dirty Eden. Margaret, do you feel it? What? The breeze. Oh, it's cool. The sea breeze. It's the gulf, me buckle. We've made it. Look, I see it. The schooner. There's a whole cask of water right in deck. The tide's up. Let's get out of here. The two of us can handle the schooner, can't we? Even one. I done it many times. Johnny. Step away from the rubies, Johnny. What? Johnny, lad, you see the gun. Now step away from the rubies. Ogridge, you're kidding. You don't think I'd cut you in on a fortune in rubies for two hundred dollars, do you now? Put down the gun. I didn't plan on you getting this far. I needed the three of you to carry the box. But now the box is here aboard the schooner. So step back to the rail, Johnny. Margaret. Step back, Johnny. That's a fine boy. I realized everything now. Margaret knew that Sang T would come. He knew where the bay was in the fallen pillar. It led us like sheep. And I was going to die, too, in that desolate place. I felt the rail of the schooner against my legs. But before you go, maybe you'd like one last look at the rubies, huh? <laughs> I hold them up. Oh, ain't they beauties. <laughs> then I saw it. The little gray snake slithering across the deck behind Morgridge. But he didn't see it. Ain't they beauties, Johnny? Look at the colors. Red like blood and worth a fortune that won't be divided. Won't be divided at all. And then the snake struck. <laughs> I looked at Mogridge. His color began to change. It was horrible. Horrible. Do my knife. It was the priest standing on the deck beyond Morgridge. And in his hand was the little gray snake. He picked up the ruby box, slipped the snake inside as if it had been a rare string of pearls. And then he bowed and was gone over the schooner's rail. I saw his green robe bobbing into the desert. And the rubies flashing blood red in the sun.
don't need a fortune teller to tell you this. From now on, you'll probably have to wait longer for a new car. So don't neglect the car you've got. See to it that all points have the protection they need to save wear and breakdown in hot summer weather. And to give you that needed protection, Richfield All Point Safety Service is made to order. Richfield All Point Service gives your car the sturdy protection of Rich Lube Lithium Lubricant. The premium lubricant that's better always. You'll get expert protection for your motor, chassis, transmission, differential and wheel bearings. Lubrication that stands up under the toughest summer driving. If you have automatic transmission, you'll get top-rated Richfield automatic transmission fluid. And finally, as an extra precaution, you'll get a safety check on your battery, tires, spark plugs, and radiator. So tomorrow, stop where you'll see the Richfield Eagle on the cream and blue pumps. Get Richfield All Point Safety Service. Escape is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. And tonight has presented The Footprint by Governor Morris, adapted for radio by Richard Chandley. Featured in tonight's cast were Bill Conrad, Charles Davis, Lou Krugman, Tom Holland, and Ramsey Hill. Special music arranged and played by Ivan Dittmars. Next week... You are creeping through the dark streets of Paris in the middle of the night. Ahead of you, the Gestapo is lying in wait... And relentlessly tracking you down from behind is a murderous madman from whom there is no escape. Next week at this time, the Richfield Oil Corporation of New York invites you to escape with the most unusual story of fright and terror in occupied Paris. As Marcel Aimee tells it in his unforgettable story, Crossing Paris. Be listening. Goodbye then until this same time next week, when once again we offer you Escape. Tom Hanlon speaking over CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. It's time to escape with an exciting story of men and women whose dramatic lives will carry you beyond the horizons of the ordinary scene to a fascinating world of secret enterprise, strange experience, unforgettable adventure. The charmed world of escape. Escape with the most unusual story of suspense and terror in occupied Paris, as Marcel I may tells it in his unforgettable tale, Crossing Paris. <laughs> during the occupation by the Nazis, the filthy Bausch, you would have seen a lot of interesting things. You might even have caught a glimpse of me stealing through the streets at night as inconspicuously as possible for a man carrying a heavily loaded valise in each hand. These valises were lined inside with canvas to prevent the leakage of any telltale drops of blood. And they belonged to my employer, Monsieur Jamblier, in whose cellar the original butchering was accomplished. Quite often, I worked with an assistant carrier, usually Le Tambo. One winter afternoon, I set out to meet Le Tambo at the Café Voltaire on the Boulevard de la Bastille. The trees were bright with frost, and the day seemed dying of cold. It was nearly dark when I reached the Café Voltaire and went in. I went straight up to the bar. Get up here. What will it be? You look cold enough for a brandy. I can drink brandy in any season. So can the tumble. <laughs> yeah, this will warm your bones. 
Katambo was in. He said to tell you he isn't free tonight. Is he free? Curse him. How can he behave like that? He has no respect for his work. Respect for what work? Who is this Katambo? Respect for what work? Oh, peace, peace, monsieur. I'm talking to the bartender. It's no affair of yours. What did you use affair it is? He put his glass down and staggered up to me, fist raised. Oh. At the same moment, a huge man with a head Please. like a ram calmly stepped around from behind me, caught the drunk's chin in his big hand, and pushed him backward with a powerful thrust. I get it. I get it now. The police always travel in pairs. We're not police, you idiot. Yes, police written all over them. <laughs> well, well, then let's go, my lad. Pay for our drinks now, and we'll report to the station for duty. Pay up and let's pay off, huh? <laughs> I don't know why, but I paid. Oh, and then, oh. still laughing, the big one took me by the arm and we started Come out. On. He was a rough fellow, probably a laborer, oh, dressed man. as he was in a spotted shiny suit and a dark turtleneck sweater. Oh, the tight blonde curls that reined his huge head gave him the appearance of a great ram. When we reached the street, the night was already black with high, icy winds. Oh, that was a squalid scene. The man was drunk, but I could have handled him. I I carry a knife, you know. You didn't have to interfere. Oh, I enjoyed it. Well, anyway, you probably saved him from being cut up. But I didn't realize you were going to cut him up. My apologies, monsieur. You are a bloodthirsty brute. <laughs> uh, what do you do? Uh. Uh, what is your trade? Oh, this and that. I manage. Uh-huh. Uh, look here. You're a strong fellow, and if you're not afraid of a little risk, I can give you a job tonight at my assistant. It pays well, too. How much? Oh, 400 francs. Ah, you're on. But you don't even want to know what it is? You're an assassin. Of course not. I'm a man of honor, above all. <laughs> what difference does it make? You're an odd type. All right, then. Let's turn off here. First, we must go to the Rue Polyvo. Our work starts there. Good, good. But let's walk faster. Ugh, I'm cold. It's me, Pierre. Who's the other one? The, oh, the tambo ducked out on me tonight, so I've asked my friend Grand Gilles here to take his place. He's all right. Hurry then. You're late. We followed Monsieur Jean Blier across the cellar to a thick table where stained white cloth covered a shapeless form. He proudly removed the shroud, revealing a whole hog which had been cut neatly into a dozen portions. Then he stood back and allowed us to feast our eyes. He is a beauty. No? Ah. How much does he weigh? Two hundred pounds. That divided into four balises? Do you manage them all? Ah, it's easy to see you've never carried a hundred pounds of black market pig about Paris. You're wasting time. Hand me a valise under the table. Where, uh, where does it go tonight? To Montmartre, butcher shop, in the Rue Goulancourt, uh, number 43. And one thing now, to arrange his deliveries, he must have the meat there by 2 a.m. 2 a.m.? If you are late, he will not accept it. But, but, Mama. It's not distance for a young man like you, but... How much are you giving him? <laughs> now, Pierre, a bargain is a bargain. But, Mama, that's a different matter. You know perfectly well I can't risk keeping the pig here... And it's too late to get anybody else. To Carrying care. 200 pounds of black market meat all the way across Paris in the dead of night with the police lying in wait for us at every turn along the way. All right. All right. You'll get 50 francs more. Uh, I want respectable pay for my work. No, not just a tip. 500 then. But not a sou more. It is hard work and it involves great risk. Uh, 600 francs. Monsieur jean Tell me. Is this really number 45? Why do you ask that? <laughs> For no reason at all, because I know the answer. Monsieur Jamblier, 45 Rue Polyvo. <laughs> Who is this man, Pierre? Donkey, you, you will do me the courtesy of keeping your mouth shut. I do the talking here. 
Now, you, you agree then to 600 francs? Monsieur Jamblier, 45 rue Polyvore, my share will be a 1,000 francs. <laughs> Are you mad? Don't pay any attention to him. He's my assistant, so you just give me two times 600 francs and I'll settle with him later. All right, then. Here, take it. I can't have you here all night. Jamblier, 45 rue pour les Now my share will be 1,500 francs. Jamblier stood as if frozen, his jaws clenched. The ram was not even looking at him. But instead, he walked nonchalantly around the cellar, examining the foodstuffs stored there. He spied a string of sausage hanging on the wall, jerked it off, stuffed it into the pocket of his jacket. Then he found a large paper sack and burst it with the end of his index finger. A stream of lentils ran out through the hole and onto the floor. Monsieur Jamblier, 45 rue Bolivar, give me 2,000 francs. Or shall I wreck this place? Jamblier looked at him fearfully for a moment. Then he pulled a fat billfold from his pocket and handed two notes of 1,000 francs each to the ram, who pocketed them oh. calmly and caught a third one on the fly. <laughs> I started toward Gongzhil to make him return the money. Let him alone. I can't afford a row here. I don't want a row, but after all, he's my assistant. And this is my cellar. I paid out enough money to have peace here at least. We can settle with him later. Right now, we've got to finish packing the villages. It's late. All right, all right. You're the boss. Come on, let's get it done. I'd postpone this whole thing if I could. We went back to the table and finished wrapping and fitting the sections of pork into the valises. Gil sat across the cellar on a wine barrel, eating a thick slice of ham he'd found. When we were packed, he got up, came over to pick up his two valises. This apparent willingness seemed to impress Jamblier, and when we reached the door, he stuck a pack of cigarettes into the ram's pocket. <laughs> That's for the two of you. Uh. For the trip. Uh, cigarettes at night, a fine way to get ourselves picked up. Oh, come now, Pierre. Don't worry, sir. I have to have 2,000 francs more. Not to see. Give me 2,000 francs for heaven's sake, Jamblier! Jamblier! 2,000 francs, Jamblier! Stop it, stop it, stop it. you have the police on you! Kill you, blackmailer here. Take them and go! But shut up in the name of Mary, shut up! <laughs> open, open the door. Let's get out of here. I'll settle with you later, my fine friend. Jamblier! Jamblier, I now have to have another 2,000! <laughs> Quiet, quiet, I can't stop it. <laughs> no, now, don't you dare pull anything like that again. What's the matter with you, anyway? Do you want to go to jail? I'm warning you now. Stop chirping at me or I'll pinch your head off and let you bleed. Well, I don't want any trouble, but after all, I've given you a job. This is my work, and you should have some respect for it. Ah, that's for your job. Ah, I've got it. Yes, yes. Come on, little one. Let's get it over with, huh? Come on. Come on, I said. It's the obligation of all of us to participate in the effort being expended to protect democracy. Our national security and the current United Nations police action in Korea demands that the size of our armed forces be increased. If you're between the ages of 17 and 34, support the United Nations police action by enlisting in the United States Army or Air Force. Men are vitally needed for important jobs in all departments of the Army and Air Force. Strength is needed in the Far East. To have strength requires manpower. Young men who are eligible for selective service have the vigor and imagination that are necessary for an effective Army and Air Force. Volunteer to serve your nation. Be a part of the Army and Air Force and take part on your own team of young men. See your local recruiting sergeant and volunteer to enlist today. Do it now. Yes, if you're between 13 to 34, enlist in the Army or Air Force now. This Grand Gilles was a sinister character. He'd blackmail Jamblier out of 5,000 francs and then threaten me with I don't quite know what. Still, there was nothing to do but follow him. It was too late to get anyone else to help me carry Jamblier's black market pig to Montmartre. Besides, when I start a job, I finish it. 
A frozen wind whistled down the route forever, stiffening our fingers on the valise handles. We walked slowly with heads down. Where do we cross the river? We'll have to go up to the Ile Saint Louis. Too near the railway station down here, too many police patrols and German soldiers around here. Well, let's hurry then. My hands are turning to stone. The oily water in the Seine was black as coal, and along the banks the bare trees stood bleak and spectral. Finally, we reached the Ile Saint Louis, and with a cord turned into the first side street for a moment's respite from the paralyzing north wind. <sighs> it's a wonder that air doesn't freeze. Why in the name of heaven do you work at this job? I make my living this way. Every man to his trade. <laughs> well, it's not much fun. Plowing around in the night with valises full of lead, your face cracking with the cold, and all for the benefit of a thieving rascal like that Jamblier. You made out all right with Jamblier. Oh. Uh, you want some of it? If it had been just between you and Jamblier, all right. But I'm the one that brought you there. <laughs> In my work, I am strictly honest. Let us go. Wait just a moment. Now, tell me, how much can you get for pork in the black market? Get, uh, forget it. Seventy-five francs a pound? Forget it, I I'm tell sure you. I'm sure we could sell Jean Blier's pig at seventy-five francs a pound. That would give us thirty thousand francs. Fifteen thousand apiece of easy money. So instead of killing ourselves oh, in this... Listen, a patrol. Stand absolutely still. Oh. Now, now. Oh, my very good thing. You'd only have a cigarette and it's cool. You know, we can't smoke on you. It would help to warm it a bit. Uh. <sighs> that was close. Come on, let's get out of here. Follow me and hurry, or we'll never make it by 2 a.m. We walked along silently. The moon was still hidden, but the night had grown lighter and consequently more dangerous for us. After a block or two, I suddenly sensed. The Grand Gilles was no longer behind me, and turning, I saw him halfway across the street, headed toward a line of blue light that framed the doorway of a cafe. I'm going to get a shot of liquor! Come back here, you fool! You can't carry that stuff in there! I won't be long! He was already opening the door. Oh, curse him! No telling what he was up to now. But in any event, I couldn't leave him there with Jumblier's pork. So I crossed over and followed him inside. Several men who looked like clerks were playing cards at a table. The proprietor's wife sat knitting a sock behind the cash register and looking suspiciously at Grand Gilles, who was already standing at the bar, one foot resting on his valises. Proprietor, give us some mulled wine. This is my closing time. Give us some mulled wine. You're not running into my place with the police at your heels, are you? Give us some mulled wine. Now, now, don't cause a row with me. The mulled hour... wine, proprietor, mulled wine. Shut up, Grangie, shut up, I tell you. If you quiet down, monsieur, I'll get it for you. Uh, oh, thank you, madame. The proprietor's wife went out through a low door at the back, and Grangie turned and stared at the four clerks who had stopped their card game. You! All All right. There are four of you sitting there. You're half starved on rotten carrots and sawdust pudding. You're smoking corn silk, all of you. And there's enough good fat pork in these valises to make you rich. Well, what's to keep you from making off with it? You know well enough we're in no position to report in it. In the name of heaven, Gron, you come to your Get out of here, you filthy paupers! Get out and howl against the black market! You rebels! Scum! What good does it do to make laws if they're not respected? You're braggers, anarchists, disloyal Frenchmen, all of you. Grand Gilles, have you lost your mind? Maybe you don't care what happens to you, but I do. You don't say. You there, proprietor. Where did your lobster of a wife go? I can't wait all night. Get us some brandy. Get us some brandy, I said. One then. One, but please, no more. It's past closing time already. Ah. Ah. Here's to you, little Pierre. You who are as timid as a girl, but whose charm I cannot resist. Your valises full of pork that these cowards refuse to take. I will carry as far as Loave on foot, on my knees, for you. Here is your mulled wine, monsieur. Oh, but you have... Give it to me, madame. Give me your pitcher of mulled wine. Huh? 
She approached him with hesitation and placed the pitcher on the bar. Thank you. The ram reached out, seized it with both hands, and heaved it with all his strength against the wall, <laughs> where it was shattered on the belly of a full bar. <laughs> the unhappy couple dared not even turn their heads to ascertain the damage. Excellent, excellent. Yes. And now my valises. Come, little Pierre. I wish never to see these wretched people again. Baboons, I ignore you. I erase you from my memory forever. I followed him out, wondering how in the world I could keep this monstrous madman from getting us picked up by the police. The moon had come out now, and the center of the street looked like an arrow of brightness, while the shadows along the sidewalk offered dangerous possibilities of surprise. Grangeal threw away his cigarette as we approached the first street crossing. We had just reached the opposite curb when a man's voice rang out from the dark only three yards in front of us. Stand where you are. No tricks now. What are you carrying in those valises? Before taking that tone, you'd do well to identify yourself. It's the police. You told me well enough. The, the police? Well, I'm certainly glad we ran into you. I, uh, I've i been looking for somebody to show us how to get to the Rue Sevigny. You're going away from it. I think... You don't tell me. Did you hear that? The Rue Sevigny is behind us. Well, then we'll just have to turn back. Later, perhaps. Right now, you're going with me to the station. Oh, may we rest a moment first? We, we've walked a long way looking for the Rue Sevigny. Perhaps I can explain. No need for that. Come along now. I put my valise down anyway, thinking it would give me a chance to talk him out of this. And the ram, bending his knees slightly, put his down also, and then suddenly straightened up, smashing the gendarme on the jaw with his huge fist. The poor man doubled to his knees and fell flat. Rangel bent over him for a moment, then grabbed his hat and threw it into the middle of the street. The visor shone there in the moonlight. Well, let's go. That was smart. As soon as he comes to, he'll grab his whistle. In five minutes, all the police in the arrondissement will be after us. That would surprise me. I have his whistle in my pocket. Air raid alert. Now what will we do? We don't dare go into a shelter with this meat. I live only two blocks from here. Come on. In spite of carrying a hundred pounds apiece of that cursed pig, we ran all the way. But at last, with bursting lungs, we made it. I stopped a moment inside the door to catch my breath before climbing to the top floor where he said he lived. The ram went on ahead, and his door was open when I finally arrived. Come in, come in. I'll have a fire going in the stove in a moment. It was a large, comfortable studio. I set my releases down near the door and stood there until Grand Gilles drew a blackout curtain over the window and turned on the light. There were several easels in the room, and on a table near the window were spread out a number of drawings and paintings. Surprised. You... You're a painter? Yes, yes, I'm a painter. You did all those? I sell most of them around Montmartre. But since the German occupation, amusingly enough, not always for money... I bought her. Only last week, for example, I sold a woman wearing nothing but high heel shoes and an opera hat. And do you know what I got? A ham. Ah, but here's one I've been commissioned for that'll bring a hundred thousand francs. Do you like it? No. Because it's the portrait of a Nazi. Mm, perhaps. And because it's no good. <laughs> You're still angry with me, aren't you? I... I don't know what to think of you. Think what you like, then. I'm going to eat something. The stove had commenced to glow, so I sat down in a big easy chair next to it and soon became drowsy. It's pleasant warm. And then a bell started ringing somewhere and woke me out of a sound sleep. Roger is speaking. Ah, Susie. I'm sorry I couldn't make it. Hmm. No, Pierre Martin, I... What? No, no, you don't know him. <laughs> Pierre Martin is a little gutter rat who works in the black market. Yes. He gave me a job, the poor idiot. Oh, I had great fun, great fun. Wore dirty clothes, played the role of a tough, a Satanist, a thief. <laughs> oh, it was very amusing, I assure you. What? So that is... Oh, no. I... Slumming. He was slumming. I'll tell you all about Mocking me. Making fun of my That's work. Wonderful. Laughing to himself all the time. I'll show him. 
Pierre, Pierre, such temper, little one. Oh, now, don't be angry. You dog! And I thought you were hard up. I wanted to help you. And you, the, the gentleman, feeding himself to a taste of what I suppose you call the, the, the underworld. Like a stinking tourist. Is there a reward out for you, Pierre? It's stealing, that's what it is. You, you, you should have left the work to a man who needed it. You, you have no honor. No, no, no respect for work. You're a filthy rat. Oh, but I have, I have. Come over here. Look, I drew a portrait of you while you slept. Perhaps you will like this picture. I don't even want to look at it. What do you think I am? Me, I earn my keep. I work hard. You, you and your Nazi. Hundred thousand plant commissions, you've done everything to make trouble for me. My work is amusing, eh? Well, I'll show you what I think of you. Here, what are you up to? I ran across the room to the easel that held the portrait of the Nazi. Punched my knife into it as a cop. No, he ripped no. down. No. I was about to slash it across the middle with Brown Deal's huge body smashed his knee. I fell heavily to the floor. <laughs> he hit me by the throat. I was slowly choking my life out with his fixed fingers. I began to beat the floor and hack him with my open hand. When suddenly I struck the knife with one hand and seized it. My eyes were turning back in my head as I flashed out of this rich. Ah! Ah! He let out a howl and sat back watching the blood drip from one hand. I was too weak to move, so I lay there holding my knife over my chest, pointing it at him. Suddenly his eyes went white with insane rage. And before I could move, he threw himself on top of me again. And then rolled over in a faint moan. My knife had been driven straight into his heart. His legs twitched a little and then lay still. I looked at him unbelievingly. I had never killed. I never wanted to kill any man. And then I covered my face with my hands. Two hours later, faint with exhaustion, I had delivered all four valises to the butcher shop in Montmartre. All right, I've waited. It's all there. Of course it is. I'm a man of honor, monsieur. Mm -hmm, I can see that. You made it on time, too. But didn't you have an assistant? I understood from the It seems It seems that my assistant, monsieur, did not really need the work. I I was forced, forced to dismiss him. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, you made it. Oh, yes, I... Always finish any job I start, monsieur. It was only then that I remembered that Gangil had said my name to his girl over the phone, and that my portrait sat waiting for the police in the studio. I put the 5,000 francs which I had taken from his body into an envelope and addressed it to Jean Blier. I dropped it in the mailbox and walked slowly down to the big market of Les Halles. It was almost dawn when I reached it, and the heavily loaded pushcarts were stacked up in the side streets, smelling of green vegetables and berries. The gutters were slippery with garbage, and a lonely woman in pink satin pumps was staggering wearily through the filth at the end of an all-night south. I sat down on a curb and watched her and said to myself, We none of us do what we wish to do. Believe me. and Air Force is proud of its soldiers and airmen. Today's members of the armed forces have finer training, better equipment than ever before, and a strong, flexible defense of intelligent young men and women. We in America can maintain this effectiveness only by building strength and remaining strong. To have strength requires manpower, 
and men are vitally needed to support our forces in the Far East. You young men eligible for selective service make for the vigor, flexibility, and imagination that are necessary in an effective Army and Air Force. If you're of draft age and haven't yet received notice to report for pre-induction physical, volunteer to serve your nation now. Be a part of the Army and Air Force. Stop in at your nearest Army and Air Force recruiting station today and get the details. Volunteer your services now while you can still choose. Don't delay. Enlist today. Escape is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. And tonight has presented Crossing Paris by Marcel Aimé. Adapted for radio by John Meston and starring Jay Novella with Bill Conrad. Featured in tonight's cast were Howard McNear, Barney Phillips, Edgar Barrier, Vivi Janis, and Paul Fries. Special music was arranged and played by Ivan Dittmars. Starting next Thursday night over most of these same stations, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense, will return to the air. As its first star, Suspense presents Mr. Pat O'Brien in a thrilling story entitled True Report. Remember, radio's prize-winning mystery program, Suspense, returns to the air next Thursday night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. You, finding life pretty dull? You... Dreaming again of exotic places, wishing you were somewhere else? We offer you Escape. Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Escape with us now to a ship on the high seas and a cargo of mutinous criminals as Western Martyr tells it in his gripping story, A Sleeping Draft. That helps. But it's like I say. You can't forget. You can never forget. It's at night that you think about it. With the water outside rushing past the hull. That's when you think. Then it can never be the same. You can't trust anybody. Never. Not a soul. I can tell you, you just can't trust them. Not even yourself. What is it, mister? Mr. Finch says he's ready to board, sir. Oh, he is, eh? All right, I'm not stopping him. Uh, Sir? Yeah? He insists on bringing them aboard one at a time. What? Does he think I'm going to miss the tide? There's over 400 of them. It'll take hours. Well, that's what I said, sir, but... I'm you... captain of this blasted hulk. What she is. But I'll not be told by a slumgullion landsman what to do. Mr. Finch! Come aboard, if you please! Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I should have resigned. Stinking, filthy, poor devil cargo. Everything I cockalorum, captain? No, everything is not I cockalorum. What in blazes do you mean ordering my mate about? No offense intended. In none taken, I hope. I want those scurvy wretches aboard now. All of them. You put them below and we'll weigh anchor. One at a time, sir. One at a time. We got to search them. Why didn't you do that before you took them out of jail? There's many a slip, Captain, if you know what I mean. You'd be surprised what those swine can pick up between jail and the docks. It ain't safe. Now, we got to search them. One at a time, and that's a fact. You let me handle this, Captain. It ain't no ordinary cargo, you know. They're murdering devils. Every last one of them. The convicts came aboard, one by one. I watched them. They were going from London to a land they'd never seen. A colony at Boredom, Australia. 400. 
The sweepings and scrapings sorted out from the muck of the jails with Finch in charge of them. Oh, I've carried dirty cargoes. Dye wood, for instance, crawling with scorpions and spiders, not to mention snakes. And then there's cattle. But this, weeks and months at sea with a human cargo who'd as soon cut your throat as spit. And what made it worse was, I felt sorry for the poor beggars. I watched them come aboard until there were two left. Name? Wilkes is the name. Search him. Yeah, take your bloody hands off me. I ain't got nothing. I just stole my last part and shut your jaw. That's enough, Finch. I won't have the cat used on my ship. I'll get enough of it where they're going. You're a trusting soul you are, Captain. How would you like that between your ribs? A touch of the cat's a lot better than letting this swine bring a knife aboard, eh? Take them below. I said, all right. I don't know how they do it. Self me, I don't. You've got to watch for them knives. Next! Right. Cool. He is a terror. Look at the size of him. Dangerous swine. Three murders in Australia. Escaped. He's in for it when he gets back. Nine. Abbey. Jonathan Abbey. Abbey. Well, well. A gentleman in chimes. I'm sorry, Your Worship. Forgive us for daring to lay hands on your highness. I'm sure as how you've been wrongly accused. That's enough, Finch. Search him. Then take him below. I want Mr. Jonathan Abbey shackled. He's a prize. We mustn't let anything happen to him. From the day we left London docks, I'd taken a violent dislike to Finch. He seemed to be happiest when he was laying about with his cat on the convicts herded like sheep the low decks. He kept them quiet enough, but one night I decided to have it out with him in my cabin. Oh, I made it strong, I can tell you, so that even he could understand what I meant. You all finished, Captain? All right. Now, you hear me out. They're a bad lot. Four hundred of them. All banned for Australia, and they don't want to go. You follow me? There's that bloke, Abbey. As soon as we touch Sydney, the game's up for him. They'll hang him, sure. That doesn't mean that you have the right to make life even worse for them here. Oh, no? If I don't, where do you think we'll be? You, me, your mates, and the crew. Well, from what I've seen of them, they're not much better than what's below. You're doing a lot of jawing, mister. I am. What would you do if you were down there? I'll tell you. You'd get hold of this ship and clear out. That's what you'd do. And it'd be easy. They're locked in and we've got a guard. Ah, you don't know them like I do. There's another thing. When I searched them, there was one to five sovereigns stowed away on every man, earned or stolen. That'll come to over a thousand pounds by my figures. They're entitled to that money. It's little enough to take to a wild country. It's truth, but there's them down there what would slit the gullet of any man for two bob. <laughs> and you ask me to be dainty with them. That's the way he talked to me. You know, I can tell you I didn't feel easy anymore. I did something I hadn't done for a long time. I brought two pistols out from ship's stores and kept them under my pillow. It was when we got round the horn that the first convict died, from scurvy. We had to put him over the side, of course, and there was a lot of grousing. I went down to the hold with Finch. It was hot and stinking. Now, you let me talk to them, Captain. I'll put it to rights. You tell them it couldn't be helped. Now, don't you mind. I'll tell them. Hey, blimey, here comes the old bloody part. <laughs> oh, hey, Finch. Did you steal the clothes off the poor beggar's back before you threw them in? Man! Man, we ain't man, daddy. We're dogs, haven't you? Yeah, you want to hear me? Why don't you wait to bury poor old Smithy in the ground instead of chuck them in the sea? All right, all right, all right. We've got another two or three weeks before we reach land. I'll make a bargain with you. The next one what dies... Now that it's getting nice and hot, I'll leave him down there, and you can take care of him and mourn till we get to Australia. <laughs> How's that? How's that? Half a crown you don't keep him for three days. Ooh, that's so bloody pot. Always a nose for business. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you ain't satisfied with that, I'll see that the hatches close down tight for the rest of the voyage. And you can boil for all of me. <laughs> That seemed to settle it for a time. 
I began to see that in spite of Finch's hardness with them, the prisoners knew he was master and behaved themselves. That is, most of them did. But there were others. And that's what began the trouble. We were two days out of the Cook Islands when it happened. Yes? Captain, Captain, there's a man on deck. We brought him up from below. It's horrible. It's... Why, what's happened? One of the convicts, sir. Oh? Oh, all that blood, sir. Oh, devil. I tried to do something, but it was too late. By the time we got him up... Fight, eh? Yes, sir. Here we are, Captain. Mr. Darling ain't much of a surgeon, I must well, say. Well, I did what I could. He must have been dead before we got him up here. Why, he's... He's been cut to pieces. Not half he ain't. How did it happen? Oh, I heard him shouting. When I went down in the hole, there he was. Propped up like uh, against the bars. With his arms through, holding him up. He must have been dead. He must have been. Poor devil. Who, him? No, 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 he's dead. There's others in for it, though. What do you mean? Well, how'd you think he got cut up like that? Knives, Captain. Knives. But you searched them before they bought it. I did, and Struff, I don't know how they come to do it. Small knives, Captain. Small knives. We're getting close to Australia. That's what it is. Whoever's got them knives, he's after money. A thousand quid or more what's on this cursed ship. Well, I don't see... Oh, you're a... a trusting soul, you are, Captain. Maybe there's a dozen of them. Maybe twenty with knives. Follow me? They'll run the others and rob them blind. Gold sovereigns, Captain. You didn't forget, did you? If anybody objects, <sighs> cut him up in small pieces like him. We've got to go down there and put a stop to it. Yes, I don't think. How many guns you got aboard? Two pistols and four muskets. That's a fat lot of good. Oh, well, let's take the sweet with the sour. We can try. There's no harm in that. Mark my words, Captain. Before we get to Sydney, all of us probably will have our thro throats cut. Come on. Finch and I, with two seamen, armed ourselves and went down into the hold and stood outside the bars. The men inside were quiet. Very quiet. They just looked at us. Dark like. You, men! I'll talk to them. Now listen to me. We know some of you are carrying knives. I want you to throw them out here. Nothing further will be said about it if you do as I say. Well? Captain, dear... My porridge wasn't hot enough this morning. And please, sir, can I have sugar in it tomorrow? <laughs> that ain't the way to talk to this scum. The captain's a gentleman. I'm not. You know me, don't you? He knows you all right. You, Abby. Yes? I've a mind you're the leader down here. <laughs> Good old Abby. <laughs> I'm flattered, Mr. Finch, but you forget I'm shackled to my bunk. You saw to that. You listen to me. I'm giving you till morning to throw them knives out here. Till morning. If every blasted one ain't out of your dirty hands, I'm going to have you flogged. Every ruddy one of you. Fifty lashes. Do you hear me, Mr. Abbey? I'll think about that. <laughs> till morning. Then fifty lashes. You think about that, Mr. Abbey. I didn't think they'd give them to us that easy, Captain. There's going to be trouble, though, with this flogging. There'll be more if we don't get the knives away. Good morning, Captain Deer and Mr. Finn. You filthy scum. Where's them knives? Where well, they'll do the most good. All right, all right. I give them you a chance. I've played fair. Now... Uh, Mr. Finn, sir, uh, may I have a word with you? Oh, come to your senses, have you? Uh, been closer to the bar circles. What I've got to say, I've got to whisper. Well, what is it? What is it? Mr. Finch. Yeah. <laughs> ah, that's an hundred lashes. Wilkes, I'll take you first and handle the cat myself. Oh, no, sir. No, 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 sir. Why not take uh, him first? He won't feel it like I will. The crowd of men parted suddenly and from out of them was pushed what had once been a man. It fell against the bars. And then, no longer with the support of living arms, it slid to the deck. We looked at him, Finch and me. His life had been worth a sovereign, maybe two. 
he hadn't either now. And the knives were still in the hole with them that had killed him. Tonight, some more of radio's greatest stars check in at CBS, the star's address. The first you'll hear are Amos and Andy, who are going to be on hand with the Kingfish, Shorty the Barber, Algonquin J. Calhoun, and of course, Sapphire. Then, a little later, Red Skelton. With Joey Adams, Eve Arden, Jack Benny, and Corliss Archer already on hand, be sure you add Amos and Andy and Red Skelton to your Sunday night listening date starting tonight over most of these same CBS stations. And now, we return you to Escape. Now, as I see it, we've got to have a council of war, in a manner of speaking. I'll tell you one thing, Mr. Finch. There'll be no flogging. Ah, I can see you're a sharper, you are. No, no, that's, that's right. Too dangerous. We ain't armed for it, and they're in a nasty mood. Now, we've got to be crafty, same as them. I wish we could spill the whole lot of them overside. Lose your contract for carrying them? Not bloody likely. Now, listen here. I'll get them knives. How? It's Abby behind this. He tells them what's what. Get him out, and the others will come around. Mark my words. Are you going into the hole to get him? No, not yet, not yet. It wouldn't be safe now, not for nobody to go in there, but in four or five days... Uh, after we cut off their water and food and seal the hatch, you see what happens. They die. They'll die from the knives, then. But which do you want? They'll be begging you to take the ruddy knives in three days. And if they don't? We tell them to hand over Abby to us. But he's the one to blame for their misfortune. They'll do it. All right. If it's the only way, I'll give the order. But not just yet, Captain. We'll let them... Sit down there and wonder. Wonder what we're going to do about it. Some of them uh, may get nervous. <laughs> oh, we'll let them wonder a bit. I didn't see Finch the rest of the day. The barometer had fallen suddenly and with it came a storm. I can tell you I had my hands full for the next 24 hours. There was no time to worry about what was going on in the hold of the ship that I... I didn't think they'd have much stomach for knifing each other and killing. I was wrong. The next morning at breakfast, Finch didn't turn up. He didn't turn up at all. We searched the whole ship. And then I went down into the hold. And that's where he was. And he hadn't died quickly. Someone had held him against the bars. And the others had... He hadn't died quickly. Good morning, Captain. Present for you. Who did this? Who did it? I wouldn't waste sleep mourning him, Captain. He was a bully, and no better than us, except that he was outside. Abby, I thought you were shackled. I was, but Mr. Finch kindly supplied the key to unfasten me. You're going to pay for this, <laughs> all of you. Now, where are the knives? <laughs> They're in here, you, Captain. How'd you like to come in and get them? <laughs> You'll pay for this! You're repeating yourself, Captain. Good morning. That blasted convict had dismissed me. Like I was a clerk in an office. And there wasn't anything I could do about it. With Finch out of the way, I knew I was an easy mark. It was the nights that got on my nerves. I could hear things happening. Lots of things. And it was awful. Those devils with the knives. And each morning we'd have to pull out six or a dozen, all cut about and bleeding. And most of them died. Those with the knives were getting money. Money they sold from the victims. I began to be afraid of my crewmen. One would take a bribe and let that murdering crowd out. I walked around with two pistols in my jacket all the time. And then, late one afternoon, something very bad happened. I was standing by the wheel. Captain! Captain! You hear, Bruce? He got out, sir. Got out? Who? Who? 
like the big one. Heavy. Hey, two of us were standing guard. We heard a scream. It was Abby. He said he'd been stabbed. Uh, Benson here opened the grill to get him in. Abby bashed him on the head in bolt. What about the others? I'd got the grill closed in time. They're safe enough. He must be somewhere on the ship, sir. Unless he went overboard. No, not that one. He's up to mischief. You take one of my pistols, mister. Aye, sir. You, Boson, pass out the muskets. I want every inch of this ship searched. If he puts up a fight, shoot him. Do you hear me? Shoot him. The night comes quickly in seven parts. Did you ever try to search a ship at night with lanterns? It's not easy. Too many shadows, too many sounds which could be rats or a murderer who's bigger than what you are and could choke your life out in half a minute. We couldn't find him, but he was somewhere aboard, waiting his time. Because we were short-handed, what with the crew searching, I stood a watch. And I thought about that man who Finch said had committed three murders in Australia. Don't turn around, Captain. Huh? It's only a little knife. Don't move. What do you want? A talk. I've nothing to say to the likes of you. That may be. But I have an offer to make you. An offer? It's not safe here. One of your men will be along. Can we go to your cabin? Do you think I'd trust a man like you? Alone? You make it difficult for me. If someone comes, I may have to cut your throat. I'd as soon have it cut on deck. And what do you want? All right. You know what I'm in for when we reach Sydney. Finch told me I've no pity for you. I'm not asking for pity. I have an offer to make. And I can do no more than listen. The men below are planning to take the ship. I don't think they've got a chance, but they'll be killing. Those that have got the knives have got all the money, too. It's 1,200 pounds. I'm aware of that, mister. I can get the knives for you. Huh? All I want is the chance to get away before the ship docks. How do you know? How do I know? It's not a trick. Turn around, Captain. Huh? Here, my knife. Will that convince you? I'm unarmed. You must have a pistol. You can shoot me if you want. What makes you think that you can get the knives away from them? I can. That's all you need to know. But... But? Will you help me? How can I trust you? I don't know, Captain. Except that I, I think you do. I... I couldn't help you openly. You know that. You were put aboard as a murderer. You're in my charge, and it's my job to turn you over to the police as soon as we arrive. Then... Uh... Well, if, if you could get the knives, though, I might be able to give you a chance to clear up. That's all I want, the chance. All right. I must have a pistol. What? A pistol. You take me for a fool. No, no, it was the only way to get the knives. I give you this pistol and you shoot me down? Look, <laughs> not likely. Captain, if I'd wanted to do that, I'd have cut your throat two minutes ago. You're a murderer. I know. You can't have it. It's either them or your ship and probably your life. Well, I... You talk like a gentleman, but... Suppose you want my pistol so that you can free them. You just have to trust me as I'd trust you to give me a chance to get away. Take it. Here. What about the guards below? They'll shoot. I'll take you down. Say I caught you. How do I get out again when I've got the knives? Send word that you want to see me. All right. Captain, I'm trusting you now. I want that chance to get away. We'll talk about it if you get the knives. I'll take you below now and come back tomorrow. Keep your voice low. They think I'm tricking you into making a bargain. They think I stole the pistols. And I told them that I had to have the knives to make you believe that we wouldn't make trouble. I had said that we'd take over the ship tonight. What do you want me to do? Leave me the key to the grill. I'll slip out tonight and bring you the knives. They'll want you to let them out, too. No, I won't. I'll lock it. How do I know you will? You don't. You'll have to trust me. Do they know about this plan? All except for the fact that I'm going to lock them in once I'm out. Give me the knives now. No, 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 no. They'd know something was wrong. I'd never get out alive. Give me the key. 
All right. Here. All right. Tonight. I waited. And I can tell you that I didn't like it. The wind came up a bit and I knew that before sunrise we would be in Sydney. That is, if I should trust a murderer. At ten o'clock that night, there was a tap on my cabin door. One of your crew nearly caught me coming down here. Well, I've kept my side of the bargain. Yeah. Oh, they're all there. You needn't worry. Yeah, here's your pistol. You may need it. But, uh, thanks. Now, how do I get away? We'll be in port in about six hours if the wind holds. You stay aft in the longboat. When you hear the anchor go, drop over the side and swim for it. I'll try to anchor as close to land as possible before I take her in. If I can land without being seen, I've got some friends who will hide me. I don't want to know about it. Just remember, when the anchors lets go, that's your signal. Thank you, Captain. I trust you. And, uh, I'd like to shake hands with you. I took the hand of the murderer, and we shook hands like old friends. And then, he was gone. Two hours later, the wind went down, and in its place came fog. Thick, mucky fog. I had my hands full, not with danger from other ships and the blasted current that knocks you about off the harbor entrance. By three o'clock, the fog had shut in properly, and the blessed tide ran us all over the place. It was proper dangerous, I can tell you. We were about 15 miles offshore, and I didn't like the looks of things. There's shoals there about, and I sent the mate for it to heave the lead. I got a proper start when I heard him sing out, We'd got off course right enough, and at this rate, we'd shear the bottom clean off her. I saw it was high time to bring the ship up and wait until we could see something. Let go of the anchor! Let go of the anchor! Give her 25 fathoms to the water's head, Bunsen! Oh, sir! None too soon, sir. She was shoaling fast. Blasted current must be making five knots out to sea. Listen to her. The anchor! The anchor! Abby! I went to the longboat. It was empty. He'd heard the signal as the anchor paid out. He couldn't see in the fog and had gone overboard into a five-knot tide running straight out to sea, 15 miles from shore. He trusted me. That's why I tell you, you shouldn't trust anybody. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard sleeping at night when you hear the water outside and you think... That's when it's hard to sleep. Escape is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Today we have brought you A Sleeping Draft by Weston Martyr, adapted for radio by Anthony Ellis, with Ben Wright starred as Captain Godfrey. Featured in the cast were John Dodsworth, Bruce Payne, Anthony Barrett, John Daner, and Lou Krugman. Special music was arranged and played by Ivan Dittmars. Next week, escape with us to a train rushing through a European night and a beautiful woman who demands your help. As Anthony Ellis tells it in his exciting story, Roulette.
Escape is the first in a series of CBS features recently programmed for your Sunday afternoon listening. Later this afternoon, you'll hear Make Believe Town, a series of dramas set in Hollywood with Mr. Walter Wanger as your host. Later, you will hear on most of these same CBS stations the first Sunday broadcast of Arthur Godfrey's Digest, a half hour of the cream of wit and humor from the Redhead's weekday show on CBS. Earn Your Vacation also returns to CBS this Sunday afternoon. And starting next Sunday, Frank Sinatra checks in again at CBS, the star's address, with his new hour-long radio program, so be sure to listen for Frank Sinatra. Stay tuned now for Make Believe Town with Mr. Walter Wanger as your host, which follows over many of these same stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is CBS, where you enjoy the contented hour every Sunday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. You, finding life pretty dull, dreaming again of exotic places, wishing you were somewhere else, we offer you Escape. Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Escape with us now to a train rushing through a European night and a beautiful woman who demands your help as Anthony Ellis tells it in his exciting story, Roulette. Well, I'm afraid I'm done in, Mr. McLennan. Nay, hey, lady, let me. Oh, sir. Thanks awfully, sir, but no. Oh, shall It's against the laws of nature that the good Scot should gamble in the first place, so a few francs lent will only increase the McLennan clan's aggravation. You'll oblige me? <laughs> Very decent of you, Mr. McLennan, but I really couldn't. Will you be leaving Monte Carlo? Yes, Paris for two or three days, then the holiday's over. Oh, you have the fare. Oh, yes, thanks. Good, good. I expect to go to Paris myself in a couple of days. If you're still there, I wish you'd give me a ring. George Sank. Oh, I shall. Well, good luck at the wheel. Ah, <laughs> roulette. The game for idiots, except I cannot lose. Good luck to you, Richard. I'd been spending the summer holidays on a cycling tour of France. Father had insisted. Said it was part of my education. After three weeks, I'd seen half the cathedrals in the country and had developed a healthy loathing for bicycles as well. So, when I reached Avignon, I sold mine to a chap who was obliging enough to pay me far more than the blasted thing was worth. I knew the family at home would be terribly upset. But after all, I was 20, and I thought it was about time that they realized it. Trinity College was then two weeks away. And I decided, with the bicycle money, to have a lark in Monte Carlo. That's where I met Mr. McLennan. He was awfully decent, showed me about the place and chucked money about marvellously. I thought he was probably in some sort of black market business because he seemed quite hush-hush about everything. I had smashing luck the first two or three days at the casino and then, well, as Father always said, gambling weakens the mind as well as the purse. When I left the roulette wheel that evening, I had just enough money for fare to Paris and home. There was a breeze blowing from the Mediterranean as I walked to my hotel. Oh, it was lovely, and I didn't have a care in the world. Monsieur, hmm? please. What? Please, may I speak to you for a moment? Oh, I say. Me? Oh, I say. I must talk to you. Really? I was watching you tonight at the casino. You lost your money, didn't you? Yes, I'm afraid so. What would you say if I told you you could get it back and more? 50,000 francs. 50,000? Please, please, we cannot talk here. Is there somewhere? 
Uh, well, well, yes, yes, there's a cafe across the street. No, it's too dangerous. Somewhere that people are not. That people are not? You are at a hotel. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, but, but wouldn't that be rather, well, I mean... You must trust me. I'm in desperate danger. Please, hurry. We will go to your hotel. It was a devilish awkward situation. I mean, taking a girl to one's hotel room, it simply isn't done. And I hated to think what father would say. On the other hand, one couldn't let a lady down. Especially her. Oh, she was beautiful. She was the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen. And she was very frightened. I will have a drop of brandy, if you don't mind. Oh, no, not at all. Would you like to take your coat off? In a little while. I'm cold. Well, you'll feel better in no time. Here we are. Thank you. I say, that's quite good. It always chokes me to do that. You're being very kind, mister. Mister... Oh, I'm frightfully sorry. My name is Richard Ferris. I am Tina Vellon. Oh, what a charming name. <laughs> I mean, it, it goes, rather. It is not my true name. Uh-oh. Mr. Ferris, I do not wish to sound melodramatic, but I need help so terribly. Oh, I'm awfully sorry. Really, I am. If there's anything but that I... But there is. I must go to Ankara. Turkey? It is of the utmost importance. And there are men who will stop at nothing to prevent me. Oh, but why? I mean... I cannot tell you. Well, what about the police? I cannot go to them. There would be questions which I may not answer. Oh, I see. Mr. Ferris, when I saw you this evening at the casino, I said to myself that here was a man I could trust. He's young, English, and a gentleman. Oh, I say. But he has lost his money at roulette. I will make it a business transaction, Mr. Ferris. Take me safely to Ankara, and I will give you 50,000 francs. Well, I, I'd love to, really, but... Well, you see, next week I have to be in school. Well, that is college, uh, Trinity, uh, Cambridge, you know. Here, Mr. Ferris. Richard. Ten thousand franc. The rest at Ankara. Please. Well, it, it, it's not the money. Really? Don't you see? They might not dare if someone like you were protecting me. Well... Take the money. It is a business transaction. Take it. I beg you to do this for me. Well, I... I feel like a cad, taking money from... Well, I... I mean... She was very close to me, and I saw that she was quite a bit older than I was. Twenty-six, possibly eight. Oh, but very beautiful. I realized how serious the thing was. After all, it could mean life or death to me, too. One must be practical, so I took the money. <laughs> I packed my travelling case, and together we left the hotel. On the way to the station, I bought a pistol, as it seemed the thing to do. Tina had decided to take the train as far as Genoa, and then change for Naples, where we could catch the boat for Turkey. If someone was following us, he didn't allow himself to be seen, and we managed to find ourselves a compartment alone. Well, here we are. You comfortable? Yes, thank you. Would you be kind enough to draw the shades? Rather. I say, Miss Bellon. Please call me Tina. Tina, here. Have a look out of the window for a sec. Those two chaps standing outside. Draw the sheets, quickly. Oh, nasty looking. Are those the ones? Yes. I hoped that we could escape them. They will be on the train now. Yes, I'm afraid so. At what time do we arrive in Genoa? Mm, uh, 2.15, that's tomorrow morning. We have a ten minute wait before the Naples train leaves. I do not think that they will attempt anything while we are still in France. But once we cross the border... Look here now. You're going to be absolutely safe with me. I don't want you to worry. I, I may look young, but, I, but I've had a great deal of experience. That is, well, I, I play rugby at school and well, I can manage things perfectly. I'm sure you can, Richard. That is why I wanted you to help me. We settled down for the run to Genoa, and Tina dozed off. 
I just sat and looked at her. She was very lovely. Everything about her. I couldn't make up my mind where she came from. Oh, not that it mattered. But I wondered for a moment if Father would have approved. After all, she wasn't English. We'd been traveling for about two hours and a half when the trouble began. Yes? Mr. Ferris? Here? Who is it? May I have a word with you, please? I should say not. It would be advisable. Now hop it, or I'll ring for the conductor. Shh. This is not your concern, Mr. Ferris. We have no desire to harm you. Oh, I'll bet you haven't. Just tell the lady that it is a long way to Ankara. Have they gone? Mm. Yes, yes, I think so. They will try again. Look, it, it really isn't any of my business, I suppose, but... Well, what is it you've done? Why should they want to kill you? Let us say that... I know something that is very important. But you're so... Well, I mean... Well, how did you ever get into a muddle like this? For love, Richard. Oh. Of my country. I... I think that a man would be very fortunate if you ever loved him enough to have a look like that in your eyes. Perhaps someday I shall look at a man like that. You're sweet, Richard. Now I want you to have some rest. If anything happens, I'll wake you. Oh, I say I couldn't. Why, they may try. I don't think so. But if they do, I have this. I say, you're not afraid of anything, are you? Well, night-night. Wake me up when we get to Genoa. Rested. Hello. Anything stirring? While you slept, I have been thinking. Hmm? What? This is a great deal that I ask you to do for me. Even for 50,000 francs. Oh, but I wanted to. If you wish to turn back when we reach Genoa. Oh, I wouldn't think of it. I will not think of you as a coward. It is not your affair. And you are in danger, too. Well, as you said, it, it's a business arrangement. 50,000 francs, I'll take you to Ankara. Is it so easy to put a price on your life? No, but I I wouldn't want you to be harmed. You are a very odd young man, Richard Ferris. Oh, I'm not really so young, you know. I just looked it. Oh. Hello, we're in. Come along. We've got to get that Naples train. Now stay close behind me. No, no, thank you. Can you see them? No. Well, we'll follow the crowd. I don't think they'll try to stop us as long as we're with people. It happened very quickly. We were crossing the station to the platform where the Naples train was standing. Suddenly, from somewhere out of the crowd, a man lurched towards us. He took me unaware, and before I knew it, he was just me to the side. So sorry. How clumsy of me. Allow me to pick up your portmanteau. As he bent down, the blighter hooked an arm around my leg, and I was down. Mind your business, you fool. I will. And you, sir, mind yours. <laughs> it was a frightfully stupid thing for me to do, and obviously what they'd hoped for. In half a tick, a, a Gilbert and Sullivan constable appeared. <laughs> but there was nothing comic opera about the way he took me in charge. I was manacled and on my way to jail. And in seven minutes, the Naples train was to leave. I looked about wildly for Tina, but she was gone. And so was the man I had knocked down. CBS wishes to remind you that two of its top comedy shows have returned for another great season. The Sunday Night Amos and Andy and Red Skelton shows. Both programs are heard on most of these same CBS stations. Be listening tonight and every Sunday night this season for Red Skelton and Amos and Andy at CBS, the star's address. And now we return you to 
Escape. I was taken to a booth at the end of the station and brought before a gentleman dressed in a uniform that I judged to be at least that of a general. The arresting constable spent two minutes pouring out my crimes whilst the general, who looked like a bandit, but spoke like one of my professors, listened. So, and your name is uh, Richard Ferris? My dear sir, my passport says so. Now, can't I pay the fine? It's ever so urgent that I catch the Naples train. Ah, you English. What would you do if there was no prayer to go? I hardly see that it concerns you. You are not serious, my young friend. This is a serious matter. One cannot stride around Genoa striking innocent citizens. Innocent? Well, I'll be blowed. He asked for it. Now, why wasn't he arrested, I should like to know? Yours was the offense for striking without provocation. Without? <laughs> All right, then. All right. I I'm sorry. I was wrong. Quite wrong. But the train... Now, now, let me pay the fine. Anything. Please, I must catch that train. What? You must consider the magnitude of the offense. Don't you understand? It's a matter of life and death. Life and death? Well, not exactly. You, you see, it's my wife. Yes, yes, my wife. Oh, we're on our honeymoon. But why did you not tell me this before? It makes a difference. Well, in two minutes it won't. Not if I miss the train. Fifty lire, fine. And a warning. Fifty lire. Well, how much is that in francs? Uh, Frank, let me see. The rate of exchange oh, well, well, now... Here, here you are. Five hundred. That should manage. And thanks, thanks most awfully. You're very kind. It must have been enough because they didn't shoot at me as I ran back down the station and to the Naples train platform. I looked at the station clock. One minute. I, I didn't want to take a chance of getting aboard, and yet Tina might have. I dashed to the waiting room, and as I did so, I saw the two men through the window. They were pacing up and down inside, back and forth before a door. It was the ladies' lounge. Devilish clever girl. I should have known she would manage it, And at that moment, as the whistle blew, she ran out. Tina! Tina, this way! Richard! Don't be afraid. They won't dare. You see, they've slowed down already. They're pretending not to see us. Hurry up. Any carriage will do. We'll find our own once we're aboard. Richard, you would have been better off with the police. Oh, not me. Ah, there we are. Look at your friends. Yes. But I'm afraid we haven't got rid of them so easily. <laughs> How did you manage to get away from the police? Oh, it was simple. I said we were on our honeymoon. Oh. <laughs> now that you are here, I'm glad. Well, I, I couldn't let you down, you know. I mean, well, I'm awfully keen about you, you see. I understand. And I want to tell you something, because I trust you. Yes. If I do not reach Ankara, it is possible that you will. Oh, no, you mustn't even think of that. They will try to stop us again. Possibly before we get to Naples, but most certainly on the boat. Perhaps they will not succeed, but if I cannot, I want you to take a message for me. I don't know. Count on me. You must go to the Ministry of War. There is a man there named Wadis. Tell him you come from me. Yes. Tell him that the blow must fall no later than the ninth. The place will be wrestling you. Only that? Richie, what I have told you is the information that can mean death for both of us. Ah, and that's why they want to stop you, because of that message. A message which means defeat for our enemies. What bounders? I mean the chap sending someone like you to do their dirty work. Well, why couldn't you write or send a cable? There are people in our government who are not to be trusted. If the message fell into the wrong hands... Uh, yes, yes, I see. Now you know. By Joe, you really are... You're... Quite a girl. And you, Richard, are quite a man. It was somewhere between Campiglia and Grosetta that the emergency cord was pulled and the train came to a stop. I looked through a crack in the drawn shade. It was dark outside, but a hundred yards away, I could see the headlights of a car and moving toward the train, three or four bouncing darts of torch beams. What is it? Can you see anything? Yeah, I'm afraid so. Uh, we're in for it. But you think we are... Wait. Signor, this is the conductor. Open, please. Oh, we'll have to use the window. Come on. Signor! I'll go first, and you jump. I'll catch you. 
Why do? Jump! The seals, the car over there. There's a switch light. Duck down. Now, those bushes, down the lines. Try not to make any noise. Oh, let's torn it. Come on, run! As we ran, I heard a voice shouting for us to stop, and another telling them not to shoot. But that was strange, and I wondered why they wanted us alive. We kept going until we found a dirt road about a quarter of a mile away. It was very dark, but through some trees I saw a glimmer of light that looked like a house. We stumbled across a field to it. It is going to be difficult. They must know the country. Well, uh, if I can rouse someone at that farm, I'll get our bearings. Is it wise? There's no other way. You might find a car there. Wait. Wait a moment. What's the matter? I thought I heard. There. You see. Coming up the road. Like hounds and hares, eh? Well, they can't drive across the fields. Come on. Would it be wiser if we parted? One of us would have a chance to get through. Not yet. Oh, blast. They must have seen us. Are you all right? Yes. Oh, if we could just get a car. Look. Hmm? Behind us, torches. Three, four, five. Yeah. Possibly one stay behind in the car. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Your friends have got quite an army. What are we going to do? I don't know. Yet. See, Cosaboli, Cosaboli. We need help. Have you got a car? Uh, no capisco, signore, no. Oh, all these foreigners. Look, do you see this? A gun. Bang, bang. Do you understand? Ma, 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 madonna mia. Now look, you say nothing. You haven't seen us. The cosa? He doesn't understand. Well, he knows what a gun is. That's all that matters. Come on. We'll stay behind this door. If he makes a sound... You there. Quiet. Say nothing. Shh. We may have to use guns, Tina. I'm ready. <laughs> oh, the idiot. Why doesn't he open it? Open. Open. Yes, yes, that's right. There uh, be a jere, senor. Yeah, come off where do a omene. Is this to qualche persona? Uh, due persone? No, no, non sono stanno qui, no. Una signora e un signore inglese. No, no, nessuno. Non ha spie. Può avere sua permissione di cercare? Ma me l'ha dato, non sono nessuno, signore. Forse sono là. Vuole io cercare? Eh, sicuro, sì, sì. Grazie, buona notte. E buona notte, signore. Buona notte. Oh, good chap. Thanks. Here you are. I, I hope we didn't inconvenience you. Ma cosa fa? Andate via per piacere. Tina, Tina, have a look through the curtains, will you? I can see two. No, three of them. Moving on. Now, the others may have gone to the back. Signor. Si. Do you own a car? Ma cosa? Non capisco, oh, signore. Oh, I just wanted my Latin. Uh, a car. Oh, did you follow? No, signore, no, no capisco. They're gone. I can't see them now. Well, we better make a run for it. If we can reach their car before they do, we might have a chance. I say, blow out the lamp before I open the door, will you? We mustn't attract any attention here. Yeah, that's it. Well, off we go. Now remember, no sound, signor. Bang, bang, if you do. Molto bene, signore. Si, si. You ready? Yes. Right. It was as easy as pie. They must have believed the old boy's story because as Tina and I doubled back across the meadow, we saw a couple of torches bobbing about near the barn. A question now seemed to be, did they have a man guarding the car? We came to the road and stopped. There, I see one. Watch. You can make out the cigarette. He's leaning against the mudguard. Mm, yes. Now, oh, stay here, Tina. Uh, 
Uncle. <sighs> it's all right, Tina. Put him to sleep. Hop in. Yes. Put up your hands, Paddy <gasps> boy, and you too, miss. We want to have a little talk with you both. The searchlight had been switched on and was blinding, but I could hear well enough, and I knew that voice. It was Mr. McClennan, my friend in Monte Carlo. Mr. McClennan. Well, now I understood why they'd let us escape from the farmhouse so easily. You haven't been in the business as long as I have, Richard. I knew the old man was lying about not seeing you, and I expected you tried to get a motor. You did. Well, what do you intend to do? Ask the young lady. She knows. Oh, it's going to be that, eh? You should have known better. But I'm sorry you got yourself concerned in the matter. I rather liked you. Look here. I've got some money. Why not let her go? You can hold me. Oh, you are a very young man, aren't you? We're not interested in you, Richard. It's the girl we're after. I suppose she's told you, though. Told me? Of course she has. Oh, what a scoundrel you are. A renegade Englishman. <laughs> what difference does it make to you whose side you're on? You're being paid... Well, we'll pay you too. Man, man, you don't understand. It matters a great deal whose side I'm on. She told you to take a message to the man in the Ministry of War if she didn't get through. No. What's his name? This is Absolute Tommy Rot. Oh, what a porridge head. Ask your friend where she comes from. It doesn't make the slightest difference. No? Then let me tell you. She's Romanian. Maria Olescu. We've been after her for three years. You're the one who's working for the wrong side. Poor chap you bashed on the head is a Turkish military agent. So were the men on the train. Do you expect me to believe that? I don't care whether you do or not. Then here, have a look at my card, if you like. Alistair McLennan. Military intelligence. British warden. Well? It's a fraud. A fraud. <laughs> Why do you think we didn't have the police stop you both in Genoa? We couldn't, because this thing you've got by the tail is too big. It mustn't get out. You know what war is, Richard. Do you expect me to answer that? If your message gets through, we may have one. Very soon. Our department thinks that this girl has the word for the assassination of someone in Turkey very high up. You have that message too, haven't you? Haven't you? Tina? It's all true, Richard. Everything that he says. It's too late now, anyway. I'm sorry. But, Tina, you mean... You mean that all this time... What was the message? Well, I... I was supposed to contact a man named Bardiz and, and say that the blow must fall no later than the night. The place will be... Resoline. Ah. He did not know, Mr. McLennan. Please, believe me. I told him that you were trying to prevent me from reaching Ankara. He didn't know. And I'll take your word for it. But we'll have to hold him until after the ninth, just to be on the safe side. I say, Mr. McLennan, mm -hmm. you must think I'm an awful fool. Oh, no, no, laddie boy. Just awfully young. Next time you'll know better than to help a beautiful woman in distress. They took us back to Paris. And during the whole journey, Tina didn't speak a word. Just looked out of the window. I thought of my family, of Trinity College and England. But none of them seemed particularly important now. Only she seemed important. And I wondered what would become of her. And then, as they took Tina away, she turned to me and smiled. It was a smile that I'd seen only once before when she spoke of love of her country. But this time, she was looking at me. Escape is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Today we have brought you Roulette by Anthony Ellis, with Terry Kilburn starred as Richard. Featured in the cast were John Daner, Alberto Maureen, Georgia Ellis, Lou Krugman, and Edgar Barrier. Special music was arranged and played by Ivan Dittmar. Next week, escape with us to a puppet kingdom in the heart of the Belgian Congo. 
and a man who challenged that kingdom because of a dream. Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy check in at CBS, the star's address, tonight, bringing with them their very special guest, Jane Wyman. Stay tuned now for Make Believe Town, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. James Matthews speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. You, finding life pretty dull, dreaming again of exotic places, wishing you were somewhere else, we offer you Escape. Escape. Designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Escape with us now to a puppet kingdom in the heart of the Belgian Congo and a man who challenged that kingdom because of dream. As Gil Dowd and Anthony Ellis tell it in their most unusual story, The Power of Hammer. Play it again. Oh, Sam, I have played it for you ten times already. It's a jukebox, isn't it? I'm paying. Play it again. I like it. So, I play it again. <sighs> we hear something else now. You Mister, I like that song. Get some water. That's better. Felt good when I hit it. Hurt my hand now. That's all right. Lousy whiskey. Lousy bar. Lousy conga. I must be drunk. Must be, I am. Kerrigan, you're drunk. I like that song. Wish I was back in the States. Wish I could see Alice. Alice. Gotta get out of here. Hey! Uh, yes, Sam. Here's for your broken table. Here's for your whiskey. That enough? Oh, it's all right. It's not your fault. I have another mule train for you next time you come to Monaco. Where do we go from here, boys? Where do we go from here? Hey, Sam, where do you go, you strong man? You stay with me on. We have good time. Cigarette. Ah. Hey, dog. You got a friend for me? <laughs> yeah. Mr. Kerrigan? Ah, uh, sure. You will come with us, please? What for? The inspector will tell you. Come with us, please. Inspector Farnack? Oh, yes. You can wait outside. Come in, Mr. Kerrigan. Sit down, please. 
What's the charge? No charge, Mr. Kerrigan. Government business. I have received a cable ordering me to extradite a man named Benjamin Hammer. Have you ever heard of him? No. We believe that he is somewhere in this territory, possibly west of Muyumba, across the Rwalaba River. Uh Uh-huh. Fifteen years ago, he embezzled money in Brussels and, incidentally, killed a man. Took a long time to get him. But we think we have now. Have you heard of a white man who calls himself a king and has made himself responsible for several thousand Bahuto tribesmen? I've heard rumors. That man may be Benjamin Hammer. I want you to take me into his kingdom. Across the Lualaba? Not me. Kerrigan, you are the only guide in the Belgian Congo who is familiar with that country. Surely you have taken hunting parties in there before? That's right, and I'm not going back. You will be well paid? Not well enough. Sorry. Just a moment. As a guide and a hunter, Mr. Kerrigan, you realize that you are licensed by the government, and here... I am the government. So I moved to another territory. This lousy Congo is all the same. You are an alien, my friend. And without my help, it may be difficult to obtain a license anywhere. Look, Inspector. This is for your own good. It's bad in there. Real bad. You mean the natives? Yeah. You wouldn't get ten miles beyond the river. I am aware of the hostility of the natives, Mr. Kerrigan. This is my territory. But we won't be going in alone. Oh? There'll be 40 of us. Your Bantu boys? And two machine guns. <laughs> this is funny. You're blackmailing me. Not at all. You will be paid. That's what I mean. Okay, it's your funeral. Stinking, polluted Lua Lava River, Flarnak. There's your jungle. I recognize it, Mr. Kerrigan. I have been here before. You've been to Mayumba, but you haven't gone across the river. We shall unload the trucks now and leave tomorrow at dawn. The Bantus have instructions not to fraternize with the villagers, and I wish you two to remain silent about our mission. Sure, but you listen tonight. You'll hear the drums talking. There's no such word as secret here. One more thing, Kerrigan. As long as you are in the employ of the Belgian government... You will try to remain sober. Sergeant Lavat, yes, sir. Unload the trucks and put the guard about them. Careful of their bucks. Sure. Be careful of everything. Unload the trucks. Post the guard. Careful. Careful. If you really want to be careful, go back to Manono, boy. Back to Manono. But you won't go back, you fat little fernac. And you may lose more than your weight. My Yumba. All the villages at night. Hot. Stink. Never sleep. <laughs> Wonder if Fernax listening. Wonder if he's awake. You hear the drums, Fernax? Did you ever hear a drum talking? Well, I did. <laughs> Many soldiers with guns crossing the river before the sun and come to the kingdom of Hammer. Can you hear that, Fernax? <laughs> I better have a drink. Maybe sleep. They cut on these photos, sir. Very good. And the Kerrigan and I will take the point. Instruct the men to maintain two pace intervals. And by this way, take cover. Yeah. 
Were you asleep? No, just last smoke. Mr. Kerrigan, one of my Bantu sergeants says that he understands the language of the drums. Wouldn't be surprised. He says that they are telling the king that we are coming. I figures. The king's name is Hammer. And I guess you were right. I think that you have known that all the time. You were too anxious to stop us from coming here. You've got a suspicious mind, Fernak. I told you why I didn't want to guide you. It's dangerous. You don't know what you're getting into. You better go back to your desk and your rubber stamp. I have brought my stamp with me. The seal of the Belgian government. I am that government. On the other side of the river, maybe, but not here. There's a king by the name of Hammer. I have got 40 trained soldiers. What if his men are more loyal than your tame Bantos? At the pace we set today, how long do you think it will take us? Oh, with luck, four more days, maybe five. Remember, I've never been here before. So you said. Good night, Mr. Carey. Hey, Farnack. Yes? I wouldn't move around too much in the dark. Don't be afraid, Mr. Carey. We are well guarded. I posted six men with our machine guns. Okay, I won't be afraid. See what happened? No. Their funeral, not mine. Inspector! Inspector! What is this, sir? They said, please, they are dead. All of them. Machine gun scum. What? Show me. This way, sir. Lucky it wasn't you, fat little Fernak. I told you it was dangerous. You wouldn't listen, would you? Hope you haven't had breakfast yet. You won't like what you see. Better go back. Back to Manono for you, boy. Kerrigan! 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 What's the matter? The sentries. Dead, huh? You look a little green. You are possibly more used to it than I am, Mr. Kerrigan. They were beheaded. The machine guns were stolen. Can I turn back? No. I want you to take a searching party. I give you ten men. <laughs> Search for what? But you're a hunter. You can follow tracks. Sure I can. And you know what I'll find? Not your machine guns. Six heads stuck up on poles. That's what they did it for, to warn us off. They could have wiped out the whole camp if they wanted. You better go home, Fernak. We go on. Sergeant Robert. Yes, sir. On the column as quickly as possible. We're moving on. <laughs> Should have gone back that first morning. You've got guts, though. You'll need them. We'll get there, all right. They haven't hit a white man. Hammer's saving something special for us. Something special for me. You all right, Fernak? Yes. How many this time? I don't know. Sergeant? Yes, sir. Casualties? Yes, sir, sir. That leaves three Bantus, you, Labat, and me. What's the matter? You ready to turn around now? I want to get Hammer. If I do go back, it will only be to get 200 men. Forget it. This was the last attack. How do you know? Are you kidding? Why should he be afraid of you now? He's left us three Bantus for porters. How do you expect to drag him back to Monono with an army like that? He'll let us in, all right. Let's get moving. changed since the last time. Clearing, stockade, house. There's the room. The night I can't forget. Sam. Sam, don't go away unless you take me with you. I can't stand him. Oh, Sam, take me back. I want to be with you. You should have thought of that before. You wanted Ben. You got him. I wonder what you're like now. I'm afraid of him. Sam Kerrigan scared. <laughs> You're scared. You're scared. You were right, Alice. I was afraid. I still am. 
now I'm back. My name is Benjamin Hammer. You are Inspector... Ah, uh, yes. The message of the drums was unable to cope with the name. Mr. Carrigan. Hello, Ben. I'm surprised to see you. I thought I made it clear at our last meeting that I should kill you if you returned. You had your chance. Why didn't you? I don't understand. Skip it. Benjamin Hummer, I have here a warrant for your arrest on a charge of embezzlement and murder to which will be added responsibility for the death of 37 government soldiers. Responsibility? Your responsibility, Inspector, not mine. You should have known better than to enter Bahutu country. Kerrigan knows how savage the natives are, didn't he tell you? I suppose not. Mr. Kerrigan is a deceitful man. You mustn't trust him. I don't. Well... Before you drag me off to my doom, I should imagine that a bath and a cooling drink would be in order. Come along. You too, Sergeant. I want you to meet my wife. My men will take care of your bantus. Little fat man. You're not afraid of him. Are you crazy? How are you going to do it? How do you arrest a king? Hot bath. Cool drink. Supper. And any hour, any day he wanted. Goodbye, Sergeant Labatt. Goodbye, Inspector Governmental Fernak. Goodbye, Kerrigan. Alice. Waiting like a wife at the door. Alice. I've made you smile. Warm. Red. I know those arms. I know you, Alice. Soft, dark, gardenias. Fighting? Who are you looking at? You're looking at me. My dear, I should like you to meet Inspector Fernack. He's come to arrest me. How do you do? Madame. And Sergeant... Uh, Labat. Labat. Sergeant? Mr. Kerrigan, you know... Don't you? Yes, sir. Now run along and prepare food for our guests. Yes, sir. Inspector, I have prepared a room for you and the sergeant at the end of the corridor. Kerrigan, I don't imagine you mind going back into your old room, filled with memories, eh? Show them the way, will you? I don't mind. When you've had your baths and feel up to it, we'll take supper on the veranda. Why did you say you'd never been here before? What does it matter? You knew he was wanted, didn't you? No. To me, he was a guy who paid well for trade goods and told me to keep my mouth shut about his setup. I did because it was good business. How long have you known him? Five years. Six. Haven't been here for over a year, though. Why did he speak of killing you if you returned? That's none of your business. I'll make it my business when we return to Manono. Yeah, you do that, Fernak, when we get back. Go to bed, Kerrigan. What for? She calls him Sir. Sir. He treated her like one of the Bahutu's servants. Doesn't eat at the table. Slave? When did that happen? A year ago after he found out about us, sure. Wonder if she's with him now. Have a drink. What's the use? Where are you? Where are you? Wish I hadn't done that. Alice? No. Little fat Fernak. Fernak. No, don't touch me. Alice, Alice. No, you mustn't. I can't stand being touched. You don't know what it's been like with him since you left. 
Oh, why didn't you take me with you then? You know why. He would have had his natives on us before we'd gone a mile. But why did he let me go? Don't you know? So that he could do what he's done to me. So that I could think about you outside, alive, and want you. So that he could do these things that I can't tell. Look at me. It would have been better for both of us if we would tried to run away and he'd killed us. Oh, it doesn't matter now. Yes, it does. We'll try it. Come with me. No, I couldn't go with you now. There might be a chance. Does he know you're here? I suppose so. He knows everything about me. He left you your guns, didn't he? Yeah, he would. You know that. I want you to give me yours. I can't do that. I've got to kill him. I've waited a year for the chance. It's made me want to live, to kill him. He's been so sure, so safe, because he's so strong. But with a gun, I can kill him. I'll show him he's not a god. I'll show the natives he's not a god. Give me the gun. No. You loved me once. If you still do, do as I ask. I still do. That's why I want to take you away. You're afraid. You're still afraid. Give me the gun. I've got to. I've got to. Alice, no. Alice. No. Don't touch me. I can't stand you. Filthy. Dirty. Hold her. No, don't touch. Another night, though, yes. Gardenias. Waiting a year. Waiting. Not for Sam. Not for Sam. Waiting for a gun. Don't go. Don't go. Don't go. Alice, I've got to think. There may be a way. I'll talk to Fernak. We'll figure out something. Maybe tomorrow. He'll kill you all tomorrow. Alice! How does she know we die tomorrow? Leave me alone. I want to talk to you. Get out of here, Fernak. Leave me alone. What did she tell you? Nothing. You're lying. Get out! What did she tell you? Why did he leave us with our guns? Why have we still got our guns? Because that's the way he is. So we shoot him. How do you want to die after? It won't be easy like being shot. I've seen what the Bahudus can do to you. He knows I've seen it. I do not want to die, Mr. Kerrigan, but the Belgian government has seen fit to name me as its representative. If I am unable to arrest Hammer and take him back for trial, I shall have to shoot him here. You wouldn't have a chance. You've seen his guards of honor. He's their god, the immortal king, Ben Hammer. That's how he rules them. They think he can't be hurt and he can't. Mr. Kerrigan, knowing this about him, why did you come back? Don't you remember you blackmailed me into it? I don't believe that. It was the wife, wasn't it? Yeah. The wife. I guess I would have come back someday anyhow. It's strange, Mr. Kerrigan. We seem to have parallel missions. Mine to take him out, yours to take her. Yeah. Too bad, isn't it? Coffee, Inspector? No, thank you. Sergeant? Uh, no. I don't want any more. Well, then breakfast is finished. Mr. Hammer, I think the time has now come to start back for Manolo. <laughs> you know I rather admire you. You must realize your position here, and yet with stubborn zeal you persist with this farce and... Uh, please, don't touch your gun. It's all right, Egale. I don't want to see you killed that way. I have other plans. Then I have nothing to lose. As you wish, Inspector. Draw your gun. That's better. It is difficult to set in motion your own execution, isn't it? Mr. Carrigan knows that. Come, we'll go out on the veranda. I want to show you something. These natives you see are the chieftains of my kingdom. I call them together to witness my decree. Hear me, wise Bahutus. These two white men in uniform have been sent to dethrone me by a government that thinks itself stronger than I, your king. Igali, seize them. Get your hands off me, you my reply to this insolence is to return them to the country in humiliation, bound and across the back of an ox. What about me, Ben? I have something to say about this. You, Kerrigan? 
Oh, yes, you have a gun. No, no, let him, Megale, let him. I know Mr. Kerrigan. Do you, Ben? Are you sure? Tell your men to release the inspector and the sergeant. And if I don't? I'll give you 30 seconds, and if you don't, I'll shoot you. You'd like to kill me because of her, wouldn't you? But it wouldn't do you any good now. She wanted to do that. Go ahead. Shoot. Shall I tell you what they'll do to you then? They'll stake you naked to the ground and smear honey over you. Then the ants will come. First one, then two, then more. Your hand shaking, Kerrigan. And when the ants are nearly finished, you'll be screaming then. They'll take sharp little sticks and they'll... Hold on! Hold on! Yo, Egali. Let them go. Don't look at me. Look at them. They aren't doing anything. Just watching. King. King. You stand up. Him not stand up. Him not dead. He say he cannot die. No man kill him. He tell us when he come here. He show us. He drink poison from our arrows. He was no god, Igali. He was no king. He's dead. Go look at him. He no god. He no king. He dead. Sam, uh, for yourself, you've come back. Yeah. I uh, didn't forget your song. You've come back so soon. Uh, I play you another, you like. Okay. Friend. You're still afraid. Give me the gun. I've got to. I've got to. Alice, did you try anyway without a gun? You knew he was stronger than you. You were lying there broken. I touched you. Don't touch me. I can't stand you. Or did Hammer kill you because you came to see me? But it wasn't me, was it? It was the gun you wanted. A year ago, I should have killed him then. Why didn't you take me with you then? Why didn't you take me with you then? Uh, you like the song, Sam? Sure. Fine. Uh, can I bring you something? Yeah. A bottle. I'm going to get drunk if you don't mind. <laughs> Escape is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Today, we have brought you The Power of Hammer by Gil Dowd and Anthony Ellis, with Harry Bartell starred as Sam. Featured in the cast were Edgar Berrier, Vivi Janice, and Stan Waxman, with Ann Morrison, Jack Crucian, Lou Krugman, and Don Diamond. The special music for Escape was arranged and played by Ivan Dittmars. Next week, escape with us to the year 100,008 and a world where beauty and terror live side by side as H.G. Wells described it in his immortal story, The Time Machine. Now that color television is definitely coming, should you buy a television set? What about your present TV set? Frank Stanton, president of the Columbia Broadcasting System, gives you answers to these and other vital questions about color television today at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 
Don't miss this informative talk about color television over most of these same CBS stations. Now, stay tuned for Make Believe Town, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is CBS, where you laugh at Jack Benny every Sunday night at the Columbia Broadcasting System. Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Escape with us now, to the year 100,080. And a world where beauty and terror live side by side. As H.G. Wells describes it in his immortal story, The Time Machine. Dudley, you must be mad. A time machine. Yes, my friend, a time machine. This, this thing? This very thing. This contraption, this framework made of quartz and bronze and ivory, with its levers and its dials and its seat in the middle, this is the result of three years' hard work. I promise you, Father, that on this machine a man can go wherever he likes in time. By working these levers, a man can choose his century, his year, his very day. Oh, really, old man. Time is only a kind of space. If we can move about in all the other dimensions of space... Why not in time, too? It's it's impossible. Out of the question. Well, what are the journeys I've already taken on this little contraption? I'm afraid you've been having a bad dream. Very well. You shall have proof, my friend. How? Just climb on, fellow. Sit in the seat beside me, face these ivory dials, and I'll take you for a little spin. Well, you... You mean right now? Right now. Or just, um... In case this thing should take off like the flying red horse... Are there any, uh... Any preparations? uh, No, Fowler, no. You won't need any luggage on this trip, not even a toothbrush. You'll be back here in my laboratory in less than a minute. All right. I'm on. Now what? Hold tight. It sways a good deal. I'd hate to lose you. (laughs) I can't be frightened, Dudley. Then you're braver than I am. Tell me, what time is it? It's, um, just 12 noon. Before we start, I want to adjust this control a bit. Is, uh, is everything shipshape? Tell me, did you notice anything just then? Only a noise, a humming noise, nothing else. And what time is it? You just asked me, old man, it's twelve. Well, that's odd. What? Well, my watch says eleven o'clock. I could have sworn it was noon a moment ago. There must be something wrong with it's it. It's only that I touched the lever to you... test it, and we've gone forward a full day. Twenty-three hours, at any rate. Yes, but, but that lady... Finished scoffing, father? Yes, Yes, I believe I have. Then hold tight. This will be the real article. I'm ready, Dudley. Good man. Well, say goodbye, Fowler. Say goodbye to 1950. He went off with a shattering jar, with the machine swaying under us. The walls of Dr. Dudley's laboratory suddenly fell away, and night was speeding after day like the flapping of a black wing. I saw the sun hopping across the sky, leaping swiftly across it every second. And every second marking a day, I saw the moon spinning through her quarters like a ball, from new to full, all in the twinkling of an eye. Trees grew and blossomed like puffs of smoke, and then passed away. And all the while we were going past her. Now our pace was a year a second, so that second by second the white snow flashed across the world, and was followed by the bright, brief spring. And still we went on, into the future. How do you feel, Paula? Very weak. Very dizzy. Oh, let go. Don't fall off. Where are we? How far have we come? We're in 100,050. And 60. And 70. That's that's enough. Stop it, Dudley. I can't stand anymore. Stop it. Fowler, you all right? Yes, I... I 
believe so. No broken bones. What happened? Not sure. Must have stopped too suddenly. Where are we, Dudley? Look around for yourself. A wide lawn. Beautiful, vast garden. No, I, I meant geographically. Just where we were when we started, where my laboratory stood. And the year, Dudley? What is the year now? 100,080. It seemed absolutely incredible. A dream. The pleasant one. For the garden in which we found ourselves was beautiful and summery. With an unexpected perfume about it, almost like platine. At some distance, we could see a large and imposing building, and everything was, was quiet and peaceful, but almost too much so. And the sense of strangeness, of incredible strangeness, sent a shiver up my spine. One hundred thousand and eighty. Father, do you want to go back? Yeah, yes, I rather think I do. Let's go back. <coughs> Dudley. From over there, in the bushes. It sounded human. Come on. Yeah. Hey, it's a child. Seems to be a very small girl. There's been a beast here of some kind struggle with a look yeah. at the marks in her eyes. Now, my dear, you'll be all right now. You won't be harmed. And of course, you won't understand English. Motioning us to go with her. Yeah. What about the animal? Did you see it? No, not a glimpse. Too fast for us. Perhaps we'd better go back, Dudley. The girl seems to be all right now. Leave her like this? Yes, yes, I've had enough. Well, they haven't, old man, because they're here, all around us. They had crept up on soundless feet to surround us, the little people of this era. And the girl we'd saved was not a child, but a full-grown woman. Well, they all stood four feet high, dressed in simple tunics, beautiful creatures, but terribly frail, with a plump, soft kind of frailty. They were like eerie figures in a dream, and all we could hear was the rustling of their clothes as they surged happily around us, their faces wreathed in smiles. Why, why, they're not savage at all. They're very loving and gentle little people. Yes. There's something terribly wrong with them. How do you mean? They seem to have the minds of five-year-olds. Well, how do you expect them to be? Far ahead of us, of course, incredibly ahead of us in knowledge and in science. Look at them children. But they seem happy in this huge garden of theirs. Uh, Dudley, <laughs> I've changed my mind. Let's stay. Maybe we shall enjoy spending a few days with our little friends. The little people led us home into their valley. They lived in colossal buildings, sleeping all together in one huge hall, eating in another, playing and frolicking together in the sunshine. And we lived with them for days in utter contentment. One afternoon, Dudley and I walked along the banks of the great river. Little people all wear the same clothes, the same soft, hairless skin, same feminine roundness of limbs. Yes. I wonder if it's because they're vegetarians. They're vegetarians because they have to be. You haven't run across any horses or dogs, cattle of any kind, have you? No, now that you mention it. With good reason. All extinct by now. Just as the dinosaur is with us. Dudley... There's something strange here, something hidden away and silent here in the year 100,080. Felt the same way. I've taken the precaution of removing the control levers of the time machine, putting a master padlock on the main switches. Oh. Don't much fancy the idea of someone riding away with it into another century and leaving us here for the rest of our lives. Uh, Dudley, do you know where we are? Uh, yes, this is where we landed. I thought so, but I wasn't sure. But... What did you ask? What's happened to the machine? What? But it, they've taken it away. They've stolen it. This is where it was? It's right here. Look! Follow the tracks. Here where they dragged it. Over here, yeah. come along. Down this path. Look. Right there. The monument. There's a brass doors in the base. Uh, oh, they're locked. The machine. It must be in there. Yes. Inside. We must get it. Break down the door. How? How can we? Here. Use the ladders. All right, that's right. It's, more. No, it's, it's no good, Dudley. They're solid. We'll never break through. Never? No. Never? We can't you mean break through here. Stay here. All our lives. You may never go home again. Fred, it must <laughs> open the machine. Oh, no. Try machine. <laughs> Oh, 
We were caught in the year 100,018. The time machine was gone. The brass doors of the monument held. Our retreat was cut off. The thin line by which we could make our way back home, back to our own time and our own people, back to 1950. We had no way of communicating with the little people, asking what they had done with the machine. There was nothing hostile in their attitude. They were more like simple, wandering children. Only one, the young woman, Weena, whose life we had saved on our first day, had become really friendly. She went with us wherever we walked, brought us presents of garlands, of flowers, slept near us at night in the hall, and we, in turn, had taught her a few words of English. Now we redoubled our efforts, like men racing against a clock, so that we might speak to her and discover the secret of our immense loss. We were talking to her one night after the others had gone to sleep. No, not these, Dudley. No. How can you be so sure your people didn't steal the machine? Aren't there any thieves among them? Are they all perfect? Mm-hmm. No, no, not so loud, Dudley. You'll oh. wake them. Sign, she doesn't understand. The thief must be sleeping somewhere in this hall. Weena, they take machine. No, Dudley, no. Who, then, who? Uh, we, we are our friends. Yes. We must have machine. Yes, Dudley. Yes. Who took machine? Other people, not yours? Other? Um, what about those doors, Weena? Uh, doors open? No, no. Weena, machine in in there must open. No, no, not open. Oh, all right, my dear. Go to sleep, get some rest. Yes, Daddy. to become of us, Fowler. Are we caught here in this century? We spend our lives with the little people in their secret. We'll go back to the monument tomorrow. We'll find a way of breaking in. Good night, Dudley. Dudley. Uh, Did you just... (coughs) There it was again. What? Something on my face. Cold, filthy to the touch. On my face and in my hair, as cold as death. Dudley! You're right. There's something in here with us. (laughs) Smells of the grave. What was it? I don't know. But look at them. Look at the little people. They're all awake. It's as though they've been stampeded. Let's get out of here. I want some fresh air. We went quickly through the hall and outside, away from the frantic rustling of the little people. The moon was full, just overhead, and it was close to dawning. There was a faint sound speeding close behind us, and we turned, our nerves ragged, our muscles tensed. But it was only Weena coming swiftly to join us. Honey. I'm afraid. There is dark. something. What do you mean, Weena? Dark? What? Dark thing. Dark place. Night. Why should they be afraid of the night, Dudley? It's not the night alone. Dark place. That's our cube. Perhaps it's something underground. It was another day. We had wandered into a lovely wooded place about a mile from the community. And suddenly Weena screamed. Ah, Father! And we stopped short. A pair of glaring eyes were fixed upon us. As we stood there, petrified, the thing, a little ape-like figure, rushed across our path and disappeared in the clearing about 30 yards away. What was it? I couldn't see it too well. It seemed to be a dull white with white hair on its head and down its back. It looked like a small ape. It was running on all fours, or with its arms held very low. Weena, Weena, what was it? Morlocks. They, Morlocks. Who are the Morlocks? What are they? Weena, tell me. No, no. Let's go over there and see where it disappeared. Come along, Father. In the clearing, we found a round, well-like opening. Dudley and I leaned over and looked down a deep shaft. A small white creature was retreating down a ladder in the well. Like a human spider, its large, bright eyes watching me as it went swiftly down. Then it disappeared in the shaft. Fowler, did you see it? Like an ape? Yes, but also like a man. So there are two species of men in this world. Yes, the little people above the ground and this obscene thing, this bleached monster below. That white look, common to animals that live in the dark. Like huge rats, like worms that are cold to the touch. I know, because they've touched Father, me. Father, you can feel the air being sucked down into this shaft. Yes. The earth must be tunneled enormously here under our feet. These monsters must live in the tunnels. I think we know now who stole our time machine. Yes. Then, then we'll go down and have a look. No, no, not go. Why not, not go. Weena? Morlocks, you never come back. We must have our machine, my dear. You wait for us here. No, no. 
And so we went down, our heels ringing on the small metallic bars that were meant for creatures so much smaller than us. Down we climbed, down, down, ever in darkness. Down, it seemed, into the center of the earth, into the core of the world. How much longer? Well, no, until we reach bottom. Uh, Can't be much further. Do you hear that? Like machinery. We're almost there. Well, thank heaven for that. Uh, All right, Father, I'm on the bottom. Come along, just a few more steps. Now, give me your hand, Father. Uh, Good. Good. We're here. He's in the land of the Morlocks. You have a match? Uh, yeah, yes, yes, here. There must be a large vaulted cavern at the end of this passage. Uh, what do you uh, suppose they'll do if they catch us? I've no idea. Better take care not to be caught. Ah, another match. That, that throbbing noise. Probably their ventilating system pumping the air down. There must be thousands upon thousands of these Morlocks living under the earth. We haven't seen any yet, except for our friend who came down ahead of us. Why, why do you suppose they wanted our time machine? I think they wanted us, not the machine. And we've come to them. We must. It's our only chance. Fowler, if that noise does come from air pumps... Yeah? Why is it so stuffy here, so oppressive? Dudley, that smell. Blood. Light another match. <clears throat> Dudley, look. Straight ahead. On the white metal table. Set for a meal. Yes. With a small haunch. Meat. We know that the cattle are extinct. Then... What do they feed on, these Morlocks? Don't you know? Yes, I know. Oh, another match? Yes. Oh, Dudley, I have no more. I'll use that last match. Oh. All right, we'll have to go back there. We know the secret now, anyway. These Morlocks living here, underground, are the masters of this age. And our friends up above... Fatted cattle, fed by the Morlocks, clothed, supplied, and housed until the day when, when they're cut out of the herd and brought underground as food. This is the future you're looking at. This is what we men of the 20th century shall come to. Dudley! What is it? Cut those hands? Cold him. Take one of these letters. Yes. Use it as a weapon. Lash out. <laughs> Against this wall, Fowler, here beside me. They're moving in. Fight them! We went back in that evil darkness, fighting every step as we went. My side, back to those projecting bars, kicking and clawing ourselves loose from their pallid, grasping hands. And climbing up again, up toward daylight and freedom. Away from their stench and the eagerness of their icy hands. And they did not follow... For daylight was their enemy and their great fear. And we lived among the lush gardens of the little people like prisoners, like men without reprieve, like men who are dead, though they still walk the earth. For the time machine was locked away behind great brass doors, and we knew we could never force them open. Then one day... Weena told us of an old building, an ancient sagging structure that had survived through many ages and was filled with many curious objects. A museum, that's what it must be, a museum, Fowler. Perhaps from some earlier time. I'm in no mood to go looking at a museum, don't you see? Specimens hermetically sealed in museums. Perhaps there are things, weapons, machinery, something we can use. Yes, yes, of course. If we could find some dynamite or gunpowder or something. We could blast those doors, we could get in. Um, Where is this place, Weena? This, This old building that no one ever goes near? I take you. It's not far. A chance, old man. A slim one, but a chance nonetheless. All day we wandered through the great ruined halls. 
The building had been deserted, unused for perhaps a century. The childlike men of that time had long since ceased to care about anything but their own personal comforts. It was late afternoon and growing dark when we came upon the chemical section. We had found nothing useful to us until then, and now came the worst disappointment of all. And it's dust. All of it. Been dust for centuries. Another dead end. Ah, it's hopeless. We were out of our heads to hope that nitrates would retain their form for a hundred thousand years. We go now? There's nothing here? Oh, wait just a moment. Something in this case. Well, you can break it with your lever. Stand back a little. All right. <laughs> Box of matches. Hermetically sealed. Oh, wait, let me see. Well, they're perfect. But they're not even damp. What shall we do with them? Burn down those brass doors? Well, you'd better keep them. You can't tell. Oh, them. What? On the floor, you see them? Yeah. Small, narrow footprints leading away into the darkness at the end of this gallery. Dudley! Uh, we'd better go. Pick Green up and carry it. We'll have to run for it. Yeah. Now, don't be frightened, my dear. It'll be all right. Go on, run! We came out of the gloom of that place into the deeper gloom of dusk. And suddenly we saw. We were trapped. All around us were the Morlocks. They were there by the thousands. Surrounding us and coming closer in the long, even line of deathly fight, their eyes blinking in the half light, their tiny mouths alive with appetite. Allah, the matches! I have them dipped like a fire from here. Oh, Hurry, man, the forest is dry. Oh, Hurry, oh, We'll oh, have an inferno here in a minute. Our little friends don't like light or heat. The fire leaped high to the heavens and the countryside was ablaze. The Morlocks turned in fear, blinded by the glare. Some of them blundered into the middle of the raging flames, and the rest faded away like a fog. Dudley had left a narrow passageway for our retreat, and we fled down a long corridor of leaping flames and blistering heat. We fled to safety toward the community of the little people. As we ran, we passed a huge monument with its great bronze doors that were locked tight in our time machine. And suddenly, in the glare of the distant fires, we saw something that stopped us short. They're open! Follow the doors! They're open! No! No, not go in. Dudley, no. It's a trap. They're there waiting for us inside. Waiting or not, we're going in. Dudley, it's suicide. It'll take me one minute to screw the levers on again, then I touch them and we're away. All right, I'll try to give you your one Good minute. boy. No, no, go. Not leave me. No, you, you, my dear, you hold tight around my neck. You're coming home with us, all right? Uh, all right, let's go. We're in. A look, the machine, oh. they haven't harmed it. I don't see them yet. Come on, now, quickly. The door's Dudley. Uh, the clothes get in the seat. I'll be ready in a moment. I waited for the hum that would signal our departure. And there in the darkness, the Morlocks were finally upon us. Cold, persistent fingers swarmed over my body, tugging at me, sucking me away from the machine. I held tight to Weena as a man holds fast to life, tried to kick them away with my feet. Hurry, Dudley, hurry! I should have get these levers quickly or we're done! One more turn, and it's there, follow, we're away, we're gone! Yes. Yes, we made it. Oh. Are you all right? I'm all right, Lord. And Wena? Wena isn't with us. What happened? They tore her from my hands at the last minute. They got her. I, I tried to save her, I, I couldn't. I still have a piece of a tunic here in my fist. A little piece of a tunic, Dudley. Nothing else. And so we came home again. Back into the very minute from which we had left. Back into 12 noon, October 22nd, 1950. We were in Dudley's laboratory again. Motionless, sitting on the ridiculous contraption which he has called a time machine. Was it all a dream? Did any of it happen? Could any of it happen? Oh, of course not. How stupid. Then what of this? What of this little piece of thin green silk I hold in my hand? Uh, 
Escape is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Today, we have brought you The Time Machine by H.G. Wells, adapted for radio by Irving Ravitch, and starring John Daner as Fowler and Larry Dobkin as Dudley, with Georgia Ellis as Weena. The special music for Escape was arranged and played by Ivan Dittmars. Next week, escape with us to a small fishing boat off the California coast and a night of terror and death at the hands of a brilliant madman as Bud A. Nelson tells it in his exciting story, Seven Hours to Freedom. You, finding life rather dull, dreaming again of exotic places, wishing you were somewhere else, we offer you Escape. Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Escape with us now to a small fishing boat off the California coast and a night of terror and death at the hands of a brilliant madman as Bud A. Nelson tells it in his exciting story, Seven Hours to Freedom. The Pacific Ocean off the coast of Southern California usually thought of as calm and peaceful, where there's very little danger. But don't take the Pacific for granted, or you'll be writing your name in foam and throwing it into the wind. There can be trouble out there, all kinds of trouble. The winter months are the lean ones along the coast. Lou and I scrape the bottom of the barrel to make fuel and stores for my boat, the Merry Widow. Rigging for mackerel is fishing the hard way. You've seen the mackerel fleet sneak up on the coast. Those ghostly cities of lights offshore. Guys like Lou and myself trying to make a payload with lights and stinking chum. Mashed, marinated muck you toss overboard with your bare hands to attract the fish. We were anchored alone west of Point Doom Whistle Boy, about a mile out. It was dark except for the spot we flashed on the water and the flashing of headlights on Highway 101 where it dips down to the shore to get a run for Zuma grade. There were mackerel around, and they were ready. Come on, baby. Up you come. And a boy, Lou. Keep them coming. Right. I'll move the chum out into the light. Hiya, hiya. Come on, kids. Free chow. Good, juicy, chovey face. Come and get it. Oh, boy. They're hot. Hey, Lou. They're swarming into the spot. They worked the edges, Lou. Yeah. They're about ready for the net. Oh, look at them. Three or four pounders. Show me the spot, boy. Lay it right in front of me. They're ready for the net. Ah, uh, current's offshore. Uh, drag toward me. All right. He's in tone. Oh, boy. They're hot and heavy. That net's alive. Now, fell her up. Train them. Green dynamite. Come on, kiddies. Come to pop. Oh! Eh, hey, beauties. Good boy, Lou. Keep him coming. Swamp us. That's the way it works. If you hit it, you forget the smell, the scum, the numbness in your hands, the icy water in your boots. You forget you're heaving 30 to 50 pounds on the end of an eight-foot pole. And you see dollars pile up in the bin boards on your deck. You forget everything around you until... They're gone. You notice that there is a world around you. Uh, here they go. School's out. Uh, two tons at least. Yeah. Uh, ah, looks like another wreck on Zuma grade. Yeah. Look at the headlights. People just can't pass up an accident. Must be a pretty bad one. I'll take a boat any day. Hey, let's get out of here. We can make it back in time for chow. Yeah. Six fried eggs seasoned with Tabasco sauce. 
bowl of chili and a pot of black coffee. That sounds good to me. Boy, that stuff sure gets cold. Yeah. Hey, get the anchor. Let's get out of here. Fire up. I'm for it. Okay. Run up on it. Get in. Hold it. What's the matter? Bank is bowed. Want to back down on it? Feels like rock. Uh, take a turn on the cleat. Let the swell break it loose. Hey, she's really caught fast. Uh, wait a minute, Lou. Give me some slack. I'll back off. What's wrong? I don't know. Uh, come here. What's up? Look. Company. Yeah. What the devil are those guys doing out here in a little rowboat at this hour? They're either drunk or crazy. They're sport fishermen. But I don't see any tackle. Ahoy there! Wait! Please wait! Oh, they're in trouble. Look. Guy in the stern. Hunched over. You get the boat hook, Lou. I'll rig a fender. That tide's doing more good than the oars are. These boys aren't seamen. Ah, ah. Watch the roll when he pulls you alongside. Uh, you in the bow, catch the rack. Hold yourself off. Hold it up, Jake. We have an injured man here. Lend a hand. Yeah, sure. Cal, get aboard. Ellis, help Stacy. Help him. Ed, wait. Give me your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Now, my injured friend. Uh, you and a skiff. Yeah. Hand him to me. Yeah. Uh, right here. Uh, lift him as high as you can. Now, now, slip your hand out. Okay. Yeah, you got him. Now, Lou, open the hatch to the cabin. Right. Uh, move that gear off the bunk. Unfortunate thing. Very unfortunate. Uh, now hand me the first aid kit. Now on the bulkhead behind you. Completely unnecessary. Efficient shooting, wouldn't you say? Perilously near the heart. Yeah. Fatally near. Yeah, put the kit back. It's too late. How'd this happen? Loaded gun. <laughs> yes. Loaded gun in expert hands. This may be pretty funny to you, mister, but I don't think it'll go over very big with the police. The police? No, I suppose not. Poor Stacy, his fourth and final loss. Look, mister, what's the story? Oh, that's right. <laughs> you came in at the end. Uh, but first... What? What's a gun for? Your protection and mine. Forgive me, young man, for pointing this at you. I use it only to establish command. Outside. Go on. Where? I'm getting pretty sick of your fancy yapping and no action. Yeah, master mind. You got us into this? Now I'll come up with a way out. My friends despise me, Captain. Look at them. Young Ellis. Shut there. up, Burke. I warned you. He's a coward, a thief, and a murderer who fancies himself equal to any known knife artist. You know I'll kill you, don't you, Burke? If it's the last thing I do, I'll cut that fat off of you. It will be the last thing you do, Ellis. Yeah. And Dowd there. He killed two men, wasn't it, Dowd? Two defenseless men. Feed on, you greasy slob. You're digging your grave with your tongue. And Stacy, poor dead Stacy. Keep talking, Burke. Keep flapping your big mouth while the law sets up another trap. Why don't we get rid of these two punks and get moving? Yeah, give me that gun, Burke. You ain't got the guts to do nothing. You're all talk. Give me that gun. Stay right where you are, Ellis. You two, Dowd. I supplied the intelligence that saw us this far... And I really don't need you anymore. Sit down. Both of you sit down right by that tank. Yeah, yellow bird. Plain dirty yellow. Make me sit down. Go on, Bert. Make me sit down. 
I don't want to have to fire this gun. Sound carries over water. Talk, big Burke, while you've got the gun. The only gun, Dowd. That highway is swarming with police cars now. They're saying dead or alive. The choice is up to you. Make one move toward me or these fishermen, and I make the choice. You make the choice. You chose to lead us into a trap because you didn't have the guts to shoot a measly highway cop. You got Stacy shot. You wrecked the car. Then you nearly drowned us in that leaky rowboat. You can thank me in that leaky rowboat that you're alive right now. I feel very kindly toward that rowboat. Pull it aboard. Go on, pull it aboard. You two may need it. One false move and you'll find yourselves adrift. Captain, get the anchor up. Take in what slack we can get, Lou. Line parts and parts. You will set your course by this pistol, Captain. Our destination is Mexico. A A word of warning, Captain. I seem to stand low. These fools I took through prison walls have turned against me. But I still have a pistol. How far is the international border? Seven, eight hours. I prefer seven. Seven hours to freedom. My freedom. And seven hours for us to consider your fate. You can start out to count the laughs in the Red Skelton show, but you'll wind up laughing so hard yourself, you lose the count. No question about it, Red Skelton is a very funny man with a very funny show. And this fall, you hear Red Skelton every Sunday evening on CBS. Rated to top comedian, Skelton has a special form of humor, a unique brand of madcap hilarity that leaves him gasping. You'll have a grand time. It's entertainment at its best. Be sure to listen to The Red Skelton Show every Sunday evening over most of these same CBS stations. And now, we return you to Escape. Dawn broke with the Los Angeles Harbor Light well on our stern. The Mary Widow's bow pointed at Mexican waters and the pistol in Burke's fat hand setting the course. The morning was foggy. Other things were clear. Someone along Zuma Beach would find their rowboat missing. We had a dead man in the cabin, and the lives of Lou and I hung on the whim of a fat maniac. Our only hope was a radio. I switched the frequency to Coast Guard, tripped the mic to transmit, and hoped that someone would be listening. Uh, it's more pleasant up here on the bridge, Captain. The cabin is somewhat stuffy. What's your master plan for the body? Loath, lo- loathsome things, dead man. Much as I'd like to dispose of it, we can't risk cluttering our trail. Let us hope there will be no more. There needn't be, you know, if you cooperate. Yeah. And yeah, the Merry Widow's at your disposal, Mr. Burke. As long as you hold that gun on the crew, there's no choice but to take you to Mexico. We don't have too far to go. Uh, just about due west of Long Beach, making 18 knots. You are unduly nervous, Captain. Is it the pistol? <laughs> Look at our friends huddled together down there in the stern. <laughs> uh, planning my assassination, and no doubt yours. You understand the situation, don't you? No. Then I'll tell you. This gun and I are your buffers. Your guardians against the plotters back there. In exchange for this protection, you give me transportation. In a few hours, I will be a free man and I shall go my way alone. Maybe. 
radio. The radio. I underestimated you, Captain. Very clever. Well, I tried. I assume I've been broadcasting for some time. You have. Direct to the United States Coast Guard. I bow to you. How stupid of me. And you. Up to this point, you've shown some intelligence. These heroics give me no choice. All right, go ahead and shoot. You'll pile into rocks before you hit San Diego. You'll never see Mexico. Lou's no pilot, none of you are. You're right. You are still useful. Resume your course. Look, Burke, you're supposed to be the brains of the outfit. If you're even half smart, you'll get in that skiff and head for shore. You better not be on this boat when the Coast Guard catches up with us. If you are a religious man, Captain, I would suggest that you pray they don't catch up with us. Look, mister, my advice to you is to launch that skiff and hit for the beach. You're a fool, Captain. Until your little stratagem shows tangible results, I wait. And you live. Resume your course. Newport Harbor bore off our bow, swung a beam, and slid past the stern. With it went my hopes of help from the Coast Guard out of Newport. No more stations now until San Diego. At the foot of San Clemente's red tile roofs, I saw a Santa Fe streamliner rushing north towards Los Angeles. I wished I was on it and headed in the same direction. How far are we from the border, Captain? Uh, five, six hours. Good. If the Coast Guard heard your radio, they don't seem to be rushing to your rescue. Ha! Take another look, Burke. Get ahead and bear him down. Hold your course. Don't try to attract them or you die right where you stand. You, Lou! Yeah? Stay where you are. Hold your course, Captain. Mister, that's a Coast Guard picket boat. They got guns. Ellis, down. Stand up and wave. Make it look friendly. Don't overdo it. You, Captain, wave too. Wave, wave. <laughs> Look at the fools. The friendly fools waving back. We're just friendly fishermen. They didn't even cut their speed. Two herringbone wakes met, merged playfully, overlapped, and faded. With them went my hopes of help from outside. Our only chance now is to get Burke's gun. The fish knives. But they were back on the cleaning chute, neatly racked. I turned to look. Gone. Three knives gone. My hand rested on the clutch lever, cast bronze, complete with grip and detachable. I had to get that gun. I tripped the key that locked the lever and... Come here. I want to talk to you. Got a deal. I've been expecting this. They're ready to cooperate. You, Lou, down the ladder. Just in case our good captain entertains any rash notions, you will be our hostage. Go ahead. Happy to oblige. Step right back to the little group. I watched helplessly while Lou led the way aft where two criminals sat, backs to the bait tank. They rose as Burke lurched toward them against every roll and pitch of the boat. Ellis suddenly stepped between Lou and Burke. <laughs> The pistol roared harmlessly. Burke slumped balloon-like as Dow tore the pistol from his hand. Ellis, knife in hand, kept slashing. Enough, Ellis! Lay off! No. Lay off, I said! Give me that knife! Give me that knife! Did I cut him the fat slob? He didn't believe me, eh? Huh? Look at him! Blubber! Blood and blubber! Come on, Lou! Up that ladder there to your buddy! Go on! Yes, sir. Sit down there and stay put. You buster, keep this thing moving. Which way? Like Burke said, Mexico. As long as we come this far, we go all the way. Move in. Drive in closer to shore. How close? I'll tell you how close. Hey, now, wait a minute. I'll pick out a spot to beach the skiff. Then we'll move back outside the three-mile limit until dark so that Mexican patrols can't find us. Ain't that nice. In the dark, I move in as close to shore as I can, and you go ashore in the skiff, and I head back up the coast. Just like that, huh? Well, Buster, if 
Better pick a good spot to make a landing, because you're going in with us. Going in with you? What about this boat? Leave it. The Mexican authorities... You're gonna drive this boat right up on the beach. That's what, right up on the beach. Wreck it? Look, Dowd, we draw close to ten feet of water. We'll ground a city block offshore. So what? I can swim. I got nothing to worry about. You ain't gonna need this tub no more. Look, look, Dowd. If we beach this boat, we mark the spot where you go ashore. But put in by skip and you won't attract any attention. My radio shot. It's a it's two hours run back to San Diego. I can't holler anything that'll hurt you. It ain't two hours to Mexican cops. I can't go to Mexican cops. I haven't got a clearance. I'm not going to put into a Mexican port and have my boat impounded, am I? I told you how it's going to be. As soon as the Mexican authorities find this boat with bodies on board, they'll know you boys are over the border and how you got there. Huh? Well, maybe you got something. Now, I'll talk it over with Ellis. Uh, don't try it, over. Lou. Yeah? I'm going to fake engine trouble. The master switch. One of us has to get down to the engines. The short hose on the manifold cooling system. Port engine side, salt water intake. Yeah? It's our only chance. Disconnect it. Foul the bilge pump screen. Flood the bilges? Yeah. We risk fire, but it's our only chance to frighten them guys into the skip. Cut it. He's coming back. That's the way it's going to be. Ah, Like I said first. Pile it on a beach. Now, let's go. Oh, okay. Hey, what's the matter? Are you okay up there, Doug? No, no. She just quit. No, we've been beating these engines. She's hot. Get it going. Oh, I have to get at the engines down below. Oh, no, you don't. Step on the starter. Come on, try it. It's hot, I tell you. 180 degrees. All right, look for yourself. It's 40 degrees too hot. What does that mean? It means I got to... No, go. you don't. Who? You know what to do? Yeah. Yeah, I know. Uh, check the oil filter first and the screen ahead of the pump. Uh, wait a minute, you. Okay. Try it again first. Go on. It's no use. The trouble's down the engine room. Go on, Lou. Hey, Alice. Yep. Go down in the hole with this guy. Keep an eye on him. Plenty of water. All the salt water that should be flowing through the water jackets of two big exhaust pipes pouring into the bilges. And two red-hot manifolds absorbing all the heat of the two big engines. I took a sight on the hull. Chine line, two feet above water. Bilge pumps sucking nothing but air. Ten minutes, riding six inches lower. Half hour, one foot down. Three quarters of an hour. Eighteen inches lower, water would be climbing up to drown out the batteries. Exhaust pipes, white hot. I yanked the release on the CO2 system. White clouds sizzled up from below. Fire! Fire, we're sinking! Bilge is water! Down. Coming fast, we're going down! down. What do we do, Captain? Get the skiff over the side before she explodes. Fire extinguisher, Lou! Cover me, I'm going below. Get the skiff over! Don't stand there, Doc! Down there, Jeff. Rats left us. I'll be right up. Whew. We nearly overdid it. Wood was smoldering. It's on me. Battery's wet. Inch to go. Oof. Boy, that manifold was hot. Nearly didn't make it. Look at our friends beat water. Yeah, 
This proves the story about rats and sinking ships. Now, come on, Lou. Up on the bridge. <laughs> Watch their faces now. <laughs> Drop the bilge pump back in the well? No, we need that water in the bilges. Boy, we throw a wake like a little Queen Mary. Turning up 2,800. Yeah, still a little hot. I'm on 3,000. Ah, look behind us. We're throwing a wake like a destroyer. Come on, baby. A big, big bird. 3,000. Turn. Come on, around. That's a nice, tight circle. Rough. What are you going to do? Trash him? Ah, and the last saw him with our wake. Now oh, we let Chop hit their skiff from four sides. You think they're in a southeaster? Look at Dowd, trying to get a feed on us. He's... Hey, there they go, capsize. That's just what I wanted. Yeah, but uh, hang on to the keel of the boat. All right, let him take wood for about half an hour. Brother, that water's cold. <laughs> you should know. Now, yeah, let's see if Dowd's still got a gun. I can't tell. Looks like he... He has. But he won't have for very long. His hands will get so numb, you think they're sawed off. Uh, set the bills, pump, Lou. We'll lighten the ship while we wait. Oh, and on your way back, you break out that bottle of Johnny Walker. Huh? Might as well enjoy ourselves, now that we got them guys where we want them. <laughs> I wonder about prices, Lou. Mackerel? Forty-two bucks. No, no, I didn't mean that. I meant bounty. Reward. The state of California owes us quite a little dough. Mileage. Two ton of spoiled mackerel. One radio transmitter. And four escaped convicts. Two of them on ice. Well, get the boat hook, Lou. Two live ones are ready for the gas. Escape is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Today we have brought you Seven Hours to Freedom by Bud A. Nelson, with Jack Moyle starred as Jeff. Featured in the cast were Stan Waxman, Jack Crucian, Barney Phillips, and Lou Krugman. The special music for Escape was arranged and played by Ivan Dittmars. Ladies and gentlemen, next week, Escape will present one of the most unusual and terrifying stories of recent years. The Earth Abides by George Stewart, especially adapted for radio by David Ellis. It's a story of such scope that the producers of Escape, to dramatize its full impact, are presenting it in two episodes. So listen next week when we bring you the story of a man who wakes one morning to find human life has practically vanished from the face of the earth. <laughs> CBS's lovely red-headed Saturday night comedian, Lucille Ball, pays an extra visit to CBS, the star's address, tonight. Lucille will be the special guest of Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. More famous guests, Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman, will pay one of their hilarious calls on Jack Benny. And don't forget, it's later today that Frank Sinatra starts his new Sunday afternoon series on this network over most of these same stations. Now, stay tuned for Make Believe Town, which follows immediately on most of the CBS stations. Roy Rowan speaking. This is CBS, where you spend an hour with Frank Sinatra every Sunday afternoon, the Columbia Broadcasting System. You. Finding life rather dull, dreaming again of exotic places, wishing you were somewhere else, we offer you Escape.
Today, Escape brings you one of the most unusual and terrifying stories of recent years. It is a story of such scope that the producers of Escape, in order to dramatize its full impact, will present it in two episodes. So now, with the performance of John Daner as Isherwood Williams, we bring you part one of George Stewart's powerful novel, Earth Abides. If a killing type of virus strain should suddenly arise by mutation, it could, because of the rapid transportation in which we indulge nowadays, be carried to the far corners of the earth and cause the death of millions of people. If you should awake some morning, tomorrow morning, let's say, If you should wake to a man-dead world where virtually all of human life had been dissolved from the face of the earth, leaving behind only buildings, bridges, machines, if you should awake to such a world tomorrow morning, what would you do? Where would you go? My name is Isherwood Williams. I was a student of ecology. I was in the Northern California wilderness gathering specimens of rock, plant, and animal life. I was alone and had been for a month. Climbing up to a sharp ledge one day, I felt a sudden sharp pain in my extended right hand. I withdrew it under reflex and looked up, and there, a foot above my head, I saw him, a rattler, coiled, ready to strike again. Slowly, carefully, I lowered myself and began to suck the poison from the bite. I wrapped a handkerchief about my wrist, tunicate style, and headed for my cabin. There, I broke open my snake bite outfit, cut a neat crisscross in my hand at the point of the wound, and applied the rubber suction pump. Then I lay down on my cot. I felt sick. Sick because of the poison. Sick because I was alone. I was weak. In a few moments, deep, warm... Blackness closed in about me. I don't know how long I was unconscious, but I was awakened by the door. Harry? Harry, look here. Uh, This one's still alive, I think. Hello. I'm glad you came. I'm sick. He's still alive, all right. Don't go near him. Uh, Come on, let's get out of here. Wait, wait, wait. I'm sick. Come back. Why? Why? Why, why did they leave me when they knew I was sick? What were they afraid of? I tried to stand. My knees were like sponge rubber. But finally, I was able to stumble to my chest of drawers. And then I saw the hammer, my rock hammer, resting on the top of the chest. And it suddenly became the most important thing in the world to me. If I can lift this hammer, I told myself... I will live. I wrapped my fingers about its handle, and I lifted it slowly, then let it down. I breathed a sigh of relief. I would live. In the morning, I felt better. I got up, packed the car, and headed for the nearest town, Hudsonville, about ten miles to the south. They'd take care of me in Hudsonville. Consider, if you will, the case of the rats that once inhabited Christmas Island, a small bit of tropical verdure some 200 miles south of Java. In 1903, a new disease sprang up. The rats proved universally susceptible and soon were dying by the thousands. In spite of great numbers, in spite of an abundant supply of food, in spite of a rapid breeding rate, the species is now extinct. Familiar houses, stores, taverns, but no one on the streets. A hen scratched quietly in the dust. A lonely dog was howling somewhere. I got out of the car and walked into a little restaurant. The place was empty. Hey. 
Is anybody here? Hey! Silence. Deathly silence. On the counter, I saw a newspaper. Flipped it open. The headline... Crisis. Acute. I read the story, a dispatch from Washington. The federal government is herewith suspended, as of the emergency. All officers, including those of the armed forces, will put themselves under the orders of any functioning local authority, by order of the acting president. Front page, column three. The West Oakland Hospitalization Center has been abandoned. Its functions, including burials at sea, are now concentrated at the Berkeley Center. Keep tuned to your radio. The radio. The radio in my car. I turned the dial to the most powerful station in the vicinity. Static. Nothing but static. Desperately, I twisted it from one end of the band to the other, praying for a human voice, a bar of music, anything. There wasn't a single radio station still in operation. The horn. Someone will hear the horn. I leaned back in the seat, exhausted. I sat that way for minutes before I looked at the paper again. The paper. The last sign of human life left to me. It was dated a week before. I read it through twice. Whole cities had perished. Medical centers, bodies. Doctors, nurses, burial crews hard at work, and then they too had fallen and died. The United States, the world, the stagnant flesh pool of death... Suddenly, with terror, I thought of home. I started for San Francisco. On the way, I helped myself to a tank full of gas at a station. Oddly enough, the pumps were still working. The electricity still flowed from the river-driven generators and the lights still blazed. I wondered how I had survived. Perhaps the snake venom had counteracted the virus. Perhaps the, the clean wilderness, who could save? But somewhere, someone else was alive. The men at the cabin door, there must be others, but where? I passed some cows in a pasture. Smiled to myself at the irony. The world belonged once again to the animals. Ecological observation. Pedigree means nothing now. The prize, which is life itself, will go to the keenest brain, the staunchest limb, the strongest jaw. The champion boars will die in their well-kept pens, but the shoats will roam wild. In a few generations, their legs will grow slim, their bodies thin, their tusks longer. Man? They need nothing from man. I passed four or five cars on the highway, abandoned. But farther along, I spotted another car, and there was a man inside. I stopped and got out. He had fallen over the wheel. There was a bottle beside him and the strong smell of cheap liquor. I shook him. Come on, come on. Come on, wake up. Uh-huh. Wake up, wake up. Oh, wake up, I said. Hey, come on listen, now, come on. Now, leave me alone. Now, you just leave me alone. I said wake up. Hey. What's your name? Uh, your name. Oh, what difference is it? Now, oh, come on, come on. Don't go back to sleep. What's your name? Viola. Viola's my name. Fifty-eight Barlow's in the Seattle telephone directory, and I'm the only one left. <laughs> Me, the dirtiest skunk of the lot. What am I doing alive? Answer me that. Go back to sleep, Mr. Barlow. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Here, here, here. It's free, on the house. Everything is on the house now. Have a drink. Oh, thanks. Uh, let me tell you why I'm still alive. Because I'm being punished. I'm not good enough to die. Oh, goodbye, Mr. Barlow. Uh, no, uh, hey, hey, come on back. I'll, I'll buy you a drink. <laughs> it's good. 
I'll buy a drink. Look here, I got $500. I took it from a bank yesterday. You want it here? $500. San Francisco. The mute, dead city of San Francisco. The naked forest of concrete with its empty streets. It's ghosts of newspapers blowing across alleys. I crossed the Bay Bridge, stretched over the blank water. A single car, coupe, parked in an emergency recess with its sole possessor now. The Bay Bridge. A final monument to the greatness that had been mankind. I drove the familiar route toward home. Turned right at San Lupo Drive... Pulled up in front of the house. I walked up the stairs, took out my key, and opened the door. Strange odor of musk and stale food blew out at me. Mom? Dad? Mom? I fell into a chair and cried. Observation. The desert and the wilderness began a long time ago. Men came only in the latter centuries. They camped at the springs and wore faint trails through the mesquite bushes. They laid rails, strung wire, paved long, straight roads. After a while, men were gone, leaving their small works behind them. In a thousand years, at a conservative estimate, man will be a forgotten stone in the jungle. Where would I go? I had no idea. I only knew I had to keep going. Change of place was my only comfort now, the only way I had of convincing myself that there was still life in the world. The snake bite began to hurt again. It felt good, some small sign of living flesh. I left San Francisco and started across what had once been the United States, Route 66, through the giant southwest. The towns, the empty, dead towns, the dust-blown, silent towns passed me by, one after another. Kingman, Flagstaff, Albuquerque, Oklahoma City... Just outside Guthrie, I saw a Negro tending his garden as if nothing had happened. He was afraid. He waved me on with a shotgun. In Tulsa, the sprinklers were still going in the park. I stopped. In Fayetteville, Arkansas, I heard music. Came from a little bar. Neon lit, spitting its bright invitation to the empty street. I took my hammer and went inside. The bottles were stacked neatly, bar rag over the rack, and a broken jukebox, blazing in blues and reds, singing its song to the vacant, varnished tables. Shut up. 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 I slept in the best auto courts of the most luxurious hotels. I slept and ate from the leavings of 150 million people. All the wealth of America had been bequeathed to me. All its wealth and its death. Three days later, I pulled up the Pulaski Skyway, crossed George Washington Bridge, came to Manhattan. 
the splendid, slow-decaying corpse of Fifth Avenue, the sable mink in the windows, the silly traffic lights changing color at naked intersections, Manhattan, soulless and dead. Stretched out between its rivers, the city will remain for a long time. Stone and brick, concrete and asphalt, glass. Time deals gently with them. A window pane loosens, vibrates, breaks in a gusty wind. Lightning strikes, loosens the tiles of a cornice. The shade trees on the avenues die in their shallow pockets. Bats fly from the 59th floor. City dies slowly. In the afternoon, I saw smoke from a chimney in the Bronx. I drove to the house, a small house, and knocked on the door. I heard footsteps. When the door opened, I saw a little bald man with a broad smile, holding a handful of playing cards. Milk Carson. How do you do? Come on in. You're in time for supper. Well, thanks. I just ate. Uh, this is uh, Mrs. Carson. How are you? Won't you sit down? Oh, thanks. Uh, where are you from? Uh, California. I had a relative there. We're just finishing a hand of gin. Uh, say, look here. Isn't that a beauty? Oh, the, the the television set? Yes. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's a combination radio television set radio player. I'll bet it even does the washing. It, it took us two days to get it up the steps from the radio store. I always wanted a set like that. Yes, but there's nothing on the air. Sir, always wanted a set like that. <laughs> Jen, there you are. I owe you $10,000. I'll give it to me tomorrow. There's a busted window at the Chase National. All the money you want. I carry 50000 with me all the time just to be on the safe side. Of course you can't buy anything with it now, but it sure feels nice to carry around. How about some... Salami. No, thanks. I just ate. Oh, yeah. Uh, say, do you like canasta? Uh, not much at cards. Oh, canasta, I can teach you. It's simple, like rummy, but a little different. Um, what I was wondering was, why don't you stay here? I got everything you'd want right here in the Bronx. Need a coat for the lady? Break a window at I.J. Fox? You should see some of the diamonds I got uh, Mrs. Carson at Tiffany's yesterday. Beauties. Hey, where are you going? I've got to get started. Well, where? There ain't no place to go. Lots of luck. Well, thanks, but I wish you could stay with us. No, thanks. Goodbye. Oh, the scavengers. How long would they last? Through the winter? Yeah, and it was doubtful. There'd be no central heating. Even breaking furniture in the fireplace wouldn't keep them alive. They were like highly bred spaniels or Pekingese who walked the city's streets at the end of their leashes. They would die with the city a season or two later of pneumonia or accident. The Negro in Oklahoma with his heart to the land, he would survive. Milt Carson and his new wife, no. They were waiting for death at the card table. Two weeks later, I was in San Francisco again. The streets were just as bare as when I left. The lights were still on, but dimmer now. Water flowed still from the faucets. But San Francisco had a new population, the dogs. They hunted in packs, all breeds bound together in the common search for food. Danes, Dalmatians, Scotties, toys, all of them. The dogs had taken over the city. And I decided to move back into the house because of the familiar things. Late one afternoon, I went out to look around the neighborhood. And I heard the yelping too late. As I looked around me, I saw myself being surrounded by dogs. They were hungry, ravenously hungry, and they started to close in. The car was on the street some 50 feet away. If I could make the car. The bulldog made a lunge for me. I kicked violently and started to run. They were after me, some of them running at my legs. He reached the car, opened the door, and slammed it. They climbed to the window, baring their fangs, their red tongues, wet with hunger. But I was safe. Then the night. And that night, the lights went out. The lights. The lights. Hey, the lights. What happened to the lights? I looked out over the city. It was black. Black as death. 
The age of electricity was over. Finished. There were candles. Mom kept them for ceremonial occasions in the buffet, and I found myself hoarding matches and flashlights, candles, piling them up in the corners. It was only night and day. Time had lost its meaning, and I had food and clothing. And then I had books to read. The Bible. And I read the Bible. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. There was a faint but unmistakable light burning that night a mile away in Knob Hill. I got into the car and drove to the light. I parked the car. I reached for my hammer. In the window, a shadow moved. As I approached the door, a flashlight caught me in its glare. I stopped, dead still. I waited for someone to say, put your hands up. Who are you? There was a breath of perfume. That's a nice car. I can pick up a better one on any street corner. Come on in. Thanks. How about some coffee? Yeah, sounds good. How come you didn't find me before this? Well, I just saw the light tonight. I decided to investigate. I saw your light lots of times. Oh? You live down on San Lupo Drive. Well, why didn't you come in? woman's pride. Man's supposed to come after the woman. Oh, uh-huh. that was before. There are no rules now. No, but they're habits. Aren't you black? Yeah, black's fine, fine. I don't want you to think you're the first one I've met. There were five or six others. They saw the light and they came in. They had coffee and I sent them on. What about me? I don't know you. Well, I'm clean, well-educated, healthy, young. Those are the good things. I dislike turnips, canned beans, stupid people. What's your name? You'll laugh. I would laugh. What's your name? Isherwood, my mother's maiden name. Everybody calls me Ish. Well, mine's Emma. Emma and Ish. Nobody's going to write me love songs with that combination. <laughs> no. <laughs> Don't imagine they will. I like you. Coffee will be ready in a minute. Emma, will you come and live with me? I don't know you. What is there to know? That I like you, and you like me? That we're both alone. Emma? What? Emma. <laughs> Good. Ceremony. There ought to be some kind of ceremony. Have you a Bible? Bible? On the mantle. I've never used it. I just had it. Here. Give me your hand. Now, we shall be together always. Emma was warm and understanding, a good woman, a healthy woman. Soon there was a baby to be born. I had read some books, but I couldn't read enough. I stood by her during the night and tried to help. When the morning came, we had a son, the first born since the great disaster. Then there was the matter of time. We won't need to know the exact hour. No, that's true. The clocks have stopped, but what's the difference? We eat when we're hungry, and when we're tired, we go to bed. But the months and the years. It's important to know when the year ends. Oh, that's what I've been doing out on the porch. What is that thing out there? Well, it's a transit. I set it towards the sun, and when the sun reaches the winter solstice, I know that to be the shortest day of the year. And that will be our new year. The new year's day isn't the shortest day of the year? No, well, December 21st is. And we'll make that our new year. Man's always been trying to get close to that date for the new year, but <laughs> calendar makers always went off. How long will it be? A few days. And then it'll be 1950-what? No, oh, no. That was the old calendar. This will be our year one. The year one. We must call it something. 
I know. We'll call it the year of the baby. The new life began around the simple problems of Emma, myself, and the baby. The day came when the sun reversed its path. I took my hammer and a chisel. Emma and I had found a tall, smooth rock in what had once been a small public park. In the rock, I carved the figure one. The new beginning, I said to her. The rebirth of man. In the year two... The rats came. San Francisco was overrun with them. They had broken into most of the grocery stores, torn open the cartons, gorged themselves, and gave birth to more rats. They multiplied by the hundreds and then the thousands. Rats, the carriers of deadly bubonic plague. Come quick, they're getting in! Where? Here! It shoots through the door! Now get me that kitchen chair. Hurry now, hurry. Here. Here. I'm going to the bedroom toward the baby. Now hold the chair against the opening. I'll nail it later. I rushed into the bedroom, taking my hammer with me. There were two of them, tremendous rats. I stationed myself at the crib. One came toward me, unafraid, for the fear of man had been bred out of them. And I flung the hammer at him. Ah, I missed. The rat leaped up into the crib. I threw a blanket over him and flung him to death on the floor. Then I picked up the hammer and threw it at the other one. Dead. Dead. But that was just two of them. Outside... I could hear hundreds squealing, their tiny feet scratching at the walls. How long would it be before they destroyed us? Man was gone now. This was the age of the rats. Escape is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. You have just heard part one of Earth Abides by George Stewart, specially adapted for Escape by David Ellis. John Daner was starred as Ish, with Larry Dobkin as Dr. Stanley, and Peggy Weber as M. Featured in the cast were Michael Ann Barrett, Parley Bear, Ron Brogan, Paul Fries, and Lou Krugman. The special music for Escape was arranged and played by Ivan Dittmars. Next week, Escape will bring you the second half of Earth Abides, truly one of the most gripping and terrifying novels of recent years. <laughs> This is CBS, where you spend an hour with Frank Sinatra every Sunday afternoon on the Columbia Broadcasting System. Part of the everyday routine. Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Today, with the performance of John Daner as Isherwood Williams, Escape brings you one of the most unusual and terrifying stories of recent years. George Stewart's powerful novel... Earth abides. If you should awake some morning, tomorrow morning, let's say, if you should awake to a man-dead world where virtually all of human life had been destroyed from the face of the earth, leaving behind only buildings, bridges, machines, if you should awake to such a world, Tomorrow morning, what would you do? Where would you go? This is the year three. 
My name is Isherwood Williams. Three years since I returned from the lonely mountain country of Northern California to find that mankind had virtually vanished from the earth. Some unknown virus had scourged him from his high place among animals. His great cities were tombs. His entire civilization was crumbling. I toured the emptiness that had once been called America. From the silent towers of Manhattan to the Golden Gate Bridge, I saw in all ten human beings still alive. In the fourth month after my return to San Francisco, I saw a light on Knob Hill. There I found him. He became my wife. Year one passed. We call it the year of the baby. Year two, we call it the year of the rats. Now it was year three. M, the baby, and I were struggling for existence amid the fast decaying wealth of San Francisco. Oh. All right, now be careful. Get them. Isn't it yeah. funny? It always makes me feel like I'm doing something wrong. What? Not breaking into the biggest food store on Market Street. Not wrong, Em. There's no private property anymore. This city, this grocery store, it's all ours now. But he, look. Look at this place. Yeah, the rats left their mark here, all right. There's the answer to their death. They ate all the food they could get at, and they ate each other. Oh, it's how horrible. Uh, it's a familiar pattern, and the species grows, dominates the earth for a short time, and dies. Now, come on. We'll take a look at the bottles and the canned goods. Hey, look, the labels are gone. They're eaten off. Yeah, well, we'll just have to try to guess at the contents by the shape of the can. Look at it all. Tons of it. We could live on just this forever. No, no, and we can't be scavengers forever. That's why the rats died. And we've got to grow things. We've got to bring something new into the world. Oh, come on. Let's get some of this stuff home. During that year, Em and I found whatever we needed for ourselves and the baby in the empty, silent stores of San Francisco. We lived on the spoiling supplies of a million people. One evening, just after dusk, I had suddenly noticed a strange, wavering glow in the sky over the downtown area of the city. I crawled into the window. There was a smell of smoke in the air. Fire, Em. Yes. San Francisco's on fire. Yes. Isn't there something we can do? No. <laughs> there were. Must be three square miles of flame. Oh, it started at these farms. Well, there were no oily rags in the basement. Some gasoline explosion could be any one of a thousand causes. Will it reach the house? No, I don't think so. Wind's blowing it away from us. It'll burn itself out in a day or two. Well, come away from the window. Em. Hmm? Em, do you smell gas? I don't know. It smells like it to me. Open the door to the hall. Yeah. Hey, hey. Hey, the hall is filled with it. Hey, we've got to get out of here. Gas line must have burst. One spark in this place will blow up like a bomb. Baby, I'll just save you. All right. I'll be safe on the fire escape. Hurry, right, Em. Here, here, I'll take the baby. I'll just hang on to the rail. I'll walk slowly. Come on. We started down the fire escape. In the distance, the flames were gutting the heart of the city. Parts of Chinatown were already gone. Get going down the street level, and then we started running. Any second, the spark could throw the building to dust, and we ran. Our breath tearing our throats. Back against the wall, and the shot wave. Ham, is you all right? Oh, no. Oh, my God. <laughs> It's all over. We're going to be all right. We moved to another section of town that had been spared by the fire. The days passed, the days and the weeks. Em and I were growing tired of the canned foods and bought us some fresh vegetables and fruit. But we needed a car. One day, Em and I found a Jeep in a garage. In the storeroom, I found new tires to replace the rotted ones the Jeep had been standing on. Will it work? Mm, well, after two years, hard to say. Huh? No mechanic. 
All the cars to choose from, and we picked something like this. I always wanted a convertible. Maybe a Cadillac and yeah. a Packard. It's more useful and more durable. Besides, it's all we need. All right, Em. Let's try it. Step on the starter. Mm-hmm. Not try it. Oh, come on. Come on, start, start, start. Oh. Good. Good. Come on, come on. Good. Oh, come on. He did it. One night, several months later. M shook me awake. Ish. Huh? Ish. Wake up. Mm-hmm. There's something outside moving around. Huh? Right by the window. Give me the hammer. Be careful, Ish. I'll be all right. I'll come with you. I'll stay here. I'll be right back. <laughs> Who's there? Who's there? <laughs> Girl. Come here. Oh, I won't hurt you. Come here. What are you doing? Eileen. My name is Eileen. Where are you from? Eileen. Hungry. Well, come on. Come on inside. Eileen. Eileen. Oh, I've been looking all over for you, Eileen. Where have you been? Okay, mister. You can put that hammer down. I ain't gonna hurt you. Oh, sure. Sure, well, come on inside. Em! Em, somebody's here! Yes, Eileen and me. She's my adopted daughter. About a year ago, I found her on Main Street in Los Angeles. She was starving. Can't forge for herself, Eileen can't, so I gotta take care of her. <laughs> she can't think so good. Well, how long have you been here? About two days, wandering around the city. Nice city, this San Francisco... We started to visit here when it had people. <laughs> Reckon I really could have had myself a time. I'll get you two something to eat. Well, uh, that, that's mighty nice. Oh, by the way, I sure am an impolite cuss. If my name's Ezra, I don't believe I caught yours. Uh, Isherwood. This is M. Well, well, I'm happy to know you. Eileen, looks like we've met up with some real nice people. made their home in the house next door. Now the year three has passed. We called it the year of Ezra. November, the year four. A woman came a week ago. She had dark hair, dark eyes. She was alone. Ezra has taken her for his wife. June 9th, the year 5, our second son was born this day. We named him Joey. April, year 6, two men and a woman have come. George says he's a carpenter. Harry worked in the bank. Well, he'll have to learn a trade. The woman is called Mabel. You better come with me. Oh, what's the matter? The water. It stopped running in the faucet. Well, maybe it's just a broken pipe in your place. No, I checked, and it ain't just my place. I've checked all the houses around, and there ain't any water running in any of them. Maybe it's a water main under the street. I don't think so. You know what I think? What? I think the water stopped way up in the mountains someplace. Ish. San Francisco's going dry. <laughs> He 
two weeks, not a drop of rain. Ezra, we can't go on boiling the water forever. If we're going to live, we've got to get out of here. Yeah, but there's still all them canned goods. That's what's wrong, Ezra. We've been living off the old instead of building something new. Look, we've got to forget that water ran out of faucets and vegetables come in cans. We've got to start growing things ourselves. We will when the time comes, yes. I reckon. You better come quick. What is it, Em? Eileen. What's the matter with her? She must have been drinking polluted water. Typhoid. <laughs> What does the book say, Ish? What are we going to do? Isolate the others. Mabel can nurse Eileen. What do we do for her? What's the treatment? And you can't shorten the disease, it says. All you can do is help make it less severe. Now, don't worry, Ezra. We'll do our best. I mean, she's so helpless. She don't understand. And but you move in with us. This thing spreads. It can wipe out all of us. <laughs> Another case. Who is it? George. Move him in with Eileen. Get another bed in there. You won't have to. What do you mean? Eileen's dead. This is the year of six, the year of disease and death. I went to the drugstores, walking the misty, dark streets of the city, armed with my medical text, my hammer. I raided the dusty shelves and the long, warm refrigerators of the pharmaceutical departments. The wonder drugs had long since rotted in their vials. Some sulfur was still potent, and I used it liberally. Yet case after case of typhoid broke out. Some lived, most died, including our firstborn. Our little community, upon which I had pinned the hopes of a new birth of mankind, had dwindled from twelve persons to seven. Five adults... Only two children. You've got to get some sleep, Ish. How many of us are left, then? Count them for me. Ezra, George, Mabel. Our second son, Joey, and Ezra's boy. You and I. Oh, Anne. Anne, what's the good of starting again? We're being exterminated from the earth. Every small being of us, so things can become green again. There are seven of us, Ish. Once there was only me, and once there was only you. Alone and separated. There are still seven. Oh, Em. Em, what would I do without you? Go to sleep. Well, you won't make the mistake a second time. Won't be any looking back. You'll forget the train that used to run. And the tall buildings. And the soft food. You'll go back to the earth. Back to the earth. <laughs> San Francisco, we few survivors. We packed only the essentials, the machines, the conveniences. We left to the sun and the wind. From this time on, we'd work in the soil. The decay of the old times was behind us now. We went south and east until we came to a watered land, green, with growing things. This would be our Eden. Here, without the memories of the dead people about us, we would begin mankind again. Come here, Joey. Yes, Daddy. Joey, here. Sit down here next to me. Uh-huh. I want to ask you some questions. Sure. Now, first of all, what year is this? Oh, that's an easy question. The year 15. <laughs> Joey, did you do your reading today? Sure. You like to read. Yeah. Joey, there's something I want to tell you. You know, there were once a lot of people like us on Earth. Millions. You know that, don't you? Yeah, I read about them. They could fly. That's right. Well, someday there'll be millions of people again. And they'll fly again. Years and years from now. But after I'm gone, there won't be anybody to show them the way. That's why I'm depending on you. What am I supposed to do? Learn, read, study. You're going to lead them someday, Joey, after I'm gone. Don't let them go back. You don't understand. Well, I think I do. Oh, you will. Oh, look. 
I want to show you what I made this morning. What is it? It's called a bow. Guns won't be good much longer. The powder will get rotten. Guns will get rusty. You can hunt with this. Kill animals for food. Yeah, look here, see? I carved it out of willow. Then I strung strips of calf hide from one end of the bow to the other. And now watch this. See here, this is the arrow. Right. All right, here. Like this? That's right. Now, now pull back. Hard. No, 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 no. Hard, hard. There. Now, let go. Boy, that's well. Can I take it outside and play with it? Sure, but be careful with it. Hey, Billy, look what I got. Hey, Billy. <sighs> it took thousands of years for man to pass from the spear to the bow and arrow. I've just done it in five minutes. <laughs> This is the year 19. I have gray hair. It's odd to think of myself as an old man. Well, I'm not really 51. There are 19 numbers in a smooth piece of rock in the meadow that I chipped in with my hammer and chisel. My hammer. What would I do without my hammer? Everything is going along well. Quite a farmer now. Community is growing. There are 45 of us. Strangers have drifted in. Babies born. Maybe man is something you can't quite kill off. A stranger named Charlie came in today. I don't like him. He is gruff and hard. And his eyes... I don't like his eyes. <laughs> sure. Three men at a time. Gee, Charlie, how'd you do it? I grabbed two of them and banged their heads together. They cracked like coconuts. Then the other one I knocked down and stepped on his face. Wasn't much left of him after I got through. Jeez. It's time for a bed, Joey. Oh, can't he tell one more, Dad? Maybe some other night. Okay. Good night, Dad. Good night, Charlie. Good night, Joey. Will you come tomorrow night? Maybe. <laughs> Great kid you got there. What did you do in the old times, Charlie? Oh, a lot of things. For a while, I was a stickman in Las Vegas. Used to be a fighter, too. A lot of things. You name it. You intend to stay? Sure, I intend to stay. Why not? No other place to go. This is the only good-sized group of human beings I've seen. And believe me, I've been around. Sure, I'll stay. Everybody works. That's the only way we can live. <laughs> Listen, you. If I want to stay, I'll stay, and I'll stay on my own terms. I don't ask anything from anybody. I live my own way. You better understand that right now. And you better understand something before we go any further, Charlie. I've been elected to leadership in this town, and we aren't a bunch of independent individuals doing what we please. We're a community, working together. Either you accept that, or get out. We ain't gonna get along, Mr. Isherwood Williams. Then I'm staying. Good night. I don't know. Don't go out there, yeah? Yes. Yes, he's roaring drunk. Where is he? Right outside. Yeah. What's the matter? It ain't afraid. Come on out. It's... It's don't go. Well, well, well. The great issue was. How do you show it? Down that gun, you crazy fool. Let go. Down. Let go me. You. Uh, Isher, you all right? Never mind me. Get that gun away from him. Get George. Yeah. Where's George? Bring George. Let's see George take this gun away from me. Hey, George. Come on and try to take this thing away from hey, me. Hey, what's going on here? Charlie. Give me that gun. Nobody's taking my gun away. It's mine. Charlie. Well, it's mine is mine. Stay away. Give me that gun. Stay away, George. Stay away. I told him to stay away. 
George. George. He's dead. How are you? You've done enough damage with that thing. Hand it over. There's only one answer. Death. Death. You mean kill him? Murder him? No, it's not murder, M. You, Mabel, and Ezra, and I, we're the government now. We've been elected to Council of Four. There isn't any government but us. It's, it's not a matter of punishment. It's protecting the community from a menace, and that's what Charlie is. But he was strong. All the more reason he might do it again. Afraid so, M. We can't take a chance. We're like a jury. Let's vote. We've got all the facts. The vote's been called. Any questions? Is... Is it right? Is it right to take a human life? To save many lives, yes. Em, it's got to be right. We'll take a voice vote. You first, Mabel. What do you say? Death. Ezra? Death. Em? Well, how do you vote, Em? Yeah. It's unanimous. We'll carry out the sentence tomorrow morning. The Council of Four had made its decision. This was not killing in passion or rage or hatred. This was the deliberate and sane elimination of an enemy. Early in the morning, we tied Charlie to an oak tree... Ezra took Charlie's revolver. Charlie stared at him with childish disbelief. He gasped, slumped into his ropes, his mouth red with blood, his eyes swollen in death. The power of the new state was born. Yes, Carl. New Year. Uh, here, carry my hammer for me. No, we won't hurt you. And my hammer, here. No, I don't want to. Why not? It's magic. Ma- magic? My hammer? And Fo says your hammer's magic. She says you're magic. <laughs> Carl... Uh, it's just a plain, ordinary hammer. No, no. Carl, don't be afraid. No, it's magic. You're magic. Dad. Ah, uh, hello, Joey. Carl, go and play. Sure, Dad. Goodbye, Grandfather. Joey, what's the matter with them? They say I'm magic. My, my hammer is magic. You're a legend, Dad. You're the only one left out of them all. Ezra, George, Mabel, Mother M, all gone now. Only you. A hammer's a symbol. Symbol of leadership. Yes. Yes, that's the way things happen. You're the only one that's lived through from the old times. The only one. The only one. Joey. Yes, Dad? I'm old. Very old. And I can't see very well. Did I make the numbers clearly? Yes, Dad. 48. The year 48. It's all begun again. Life. Generations and generations. Oh, M. If you could have lived to see your faith come true. And once there were only the two of us alone and separated. I want to see the old once more before I die. Just once more. The bridge. The Golden Gate Bridge. We're here, Dad. 
How? How does it look, Joey? Tell me. How does the Golden Gate Bridge look? It's old and rusty. But it, it's wonderful. It's beautiful. Yeah. Is there a car? Small car on the bridge? Yes, Dad. It's still there. Can you still see buildings across the water? Only a few, Dad. Mostly overgrown. But the hills behind the city are beautiful today. Good. Joey, Hmm? here. Here's the hammer. Yes, Dad. You're the new leader now. The hammer has always been the symbol. Pass it on to the best of them. And, uh... Joey, don't let them make her out of you. Let knowledge be the watchword. Oh, will you understand, Joey? I understand, Dad. Know the earth, Joey. Know the earth. Dad. Men go and come. But the the earth abides. just heard Earth Abides by George Stewart, especially adapted for Escape by David Ellis. John Daner was starred as Ish with Peggy Weber as M. Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape with us now to Istanbul, the nerve center of Balkan intrigue and violence, and the story of a man caught in the fatal web of the most cold-blooded political organization on Earth. As Eric Ambler tells it in his famous tale, Journey into Fear. Bonsoir, monsieur. Bonsoir. Metal had been suddenly pressed against my hand. And then it was numb. But I could feel the blood beginning to trickle through my fingers. There, there wasn't a sound. And as I crouched against the wall, I became dimly aware that the window was open and that someone was moving by it. And then my eyes, becoming used to the darkness, saw that whoever had been at the window had left by it. I reached for the light switch and found it. Their hand hurt like the very devil. Is that you, Copetin? Yes, what is it? I have only this moment come in. Uh, Where are you? I'm in my, in my hotel room. Listen, something rather stupid has happened there. Uh, there was a burglar up here. He took pot shots at me as I came in, and one of them hit me in the hand. Are you badly hurt? No, but it, it, it gave me a nasty shock. Have the police been notified? No, not yet. Good. Leave the matter to me. I will speak to a friend of mine about it. He is connected to the police and with great influence. As soon as I am finished, I shall come over. Well, there's, there's no need for that. Excuse me, my dear fellow. There is ever a need. You must stay in your room until I arrive. Well, I had no intention of going out. 
Well, if you must come over, Kopakin, please hurry. I, I, I want to get some sleep tonight. occur to you that this man was shooting to kill you and that he came here for no other purpose? Oh, that's nonsense. If the man was a thief, why should anyone wish to kill me? I'm the most harmless man alive. Are you? Remember I told you that I was going to telephone a friend of mine? Yes. We are going to see him at once. Oh, well, I'm jolly well not. I'm tired. I want to go to bed. Unfortunately, I have official instructions. A man tried to murder you tonight. Something must be done about it at once. Murder? Are you out of your mind? I am sorry, my dear fellow. I can understand your feelings. But this friend of mine is Colonel Haki. He's the head of the Turkish secret police. Oh, now, look here, Kopekin. What's this all about? I thought you were my company's Turkish representative. Now you talk about secret service and all that rubbish. Please, I cannot tell you anything more. It is to our mutual interest that we go at once to Colonel Haki. You must believe me. All this hysteria of absolutely nothing. My dear fellow, it is most certainly not nothing. Get your overcoat. It's cold out. You must realize, Mr. Graham, that an attempt was made to kill you tonight. Well, now, I don't see that at all. I mean, I disturbed a thief at his work. He fired at me and escaped. A thief? Unfortunately, no. I have a duty to do, Mr. Graham. It is to protect you. Protect me? From what? You are in the employ of Vettel's Keter and Blitz Limited, the armament manufacturer. Yes. You are, I believe, Mr. Graham, a naval ordnance expert. I'm, I'm an engineer. Naval ordnance happens to be my subject. Exactly. And your firm has contracted to do some work for my government. Certain new guns and torpedoes to rearm our naval vessels. Well, that's true. It is also true that our government stipulated that the work should be completed before spring. Yes? Exactly. Due to the international situation, we must have the equipment in our dockyard by that time. Let us suppose, then, that your thief had not merely grazed a hand, but had killed you. Well, naturally, my, my company would send another man out. Which would take time, eh, Mr. Gray? Unless, of course, there exist sketches, drawings, and all that they need to know about our ships. Oh. Uh, no. I, I mean, I was forbidden to put certain things on paper. Ah. Then, if you were to die, it would take a great deal of time for another man to accomplish what you have already done. No? And when spring comes, our Navy's strength is still precisely what it is now. Do you know, Mr. Graham? That our enemies will do anything to see that it is so? Anything, Mr. Graham. Do you understand? Oh. Quite so. I have here, Mr. Graham, a photograph of a man. I am aware you did not catch a glimpse of the assassin's face. But I want you to cast your mind back and tell me if you have ever seen him before. All right. Uh, Ah, hello. Yes. You are sure? Positive. Have a look, Copakin. He was at the cabaret you took me to tonight. I remember him at the bar. Yes, he was there. Excellent. Mm. Barnard, a hired murderer. We know him well. His price ranges from 50,000 francs upward. His employer is a man named Voroshin, who in turn is hired by his country to eliminate you. Unfortunately, we possess no photograph of him. I begin to understand. Of course you do. Now, we face the problem. You must return to England safely. But how? The train is out of the question. You wouldn't live for an hour. The aeroplane. Unfortunately, the weather here has disrupted service. There is the set rail Bante sailing for Athens tomorrow afternoon. This small boat. Hmm? And we can see that your enemies do not board her. From Athens, you can take the plane to England. Well, I, I, I don't know, Colonel. Uh, in, in view of what you've told me, perhaps I should get in touch with the British Embassy here. And what do you expect them to do? Send you home in a cruiser? No, no, my dear Mr. Graham. This is a question of time. Leaving tomorrow afternoon will land you in Athens the day after. That is how it is to be. Well, I, I seem to have no choice in the matter. I'm happy to see that you are cooperative. Return to your hotel, Mr. Graham. 
We shall see you safely aboard tomorrow. The next afternoon, Kopekin and Colonel Haki saw me aboard. As a bon voyage gift, they presented me with a bottle of Johnny Walker and a small pistol, both of which I put in my suitcase. Besides myself, there were four other passengers, all of whom Colonel Haki assured me were harmless. The gangway went down. I felt the ship sway gently, and the journey had begun. My companions were an odd assortment of continental travelers. There were the Matis who occupied the cabin next to mine, a middle-aged French couple who argued incessantly. Their voices penetrated the thin wooden bulkhead with dismaying ease. Did she start them? No, no, it is simply that they are cold. It does not matter. You think not. You may sleep as you wish, but do not complain to me about your kidneys. Cold sheets do not harm the kidneys, Sherry. We are paid for our kidneys. We are alive. Then there was a Mr. Covetli, whom I learned at the dinner table was a dealer in tobacco. A short, heavy man with a smile fixed like that of a ventriloquist doll. I go to England. Trade in tobacco is very good. England buys much tobacco from Turkey, you know. With American dollars so expensive and possibility of war, it is good business, Mr. Mati. So, uh, I arrange a good deal of transportation for tobacco companies. Ah. Uh, what company do you represent? Uh, Passar of Istanbul. Passar? I, I must I... say this, Ravioli are the last passenger was a thick, round-shouldered man with a pale face and prominent blue eyes. He introduced himself over a brandy on the lounge. My name is Haller, Dr. Fritz Haller. I'm a German, a West German. And I am on my way back to my country. Oh, have you been long in Turkey? A few weeks. I came there from Persia. Oh, oh, your yeah. oil business? Hmm? No, Mr. Kelly. Archaeology. Oh, uh, how interesting. Those were my fellow passengers. At nine o'clock that night, the cutter came out from Kanakali to take off the pilot. And with it came a telegram. It was from Kopeki in Istanbul. And it read, H requests me to inform you that Banat left for Sofia on train. All well. Safe journey to England. Best wishes. I, I thought of the pistol in my cabin and I, I laughed to myself. It was an Aegean day. Intensely colored in the sun with small pink clouds drifting in a bleached indigo sea. I lazed in my bunk. I had coffee sent in. But later, I was standing by the rail talking to the little Frenchman. Beautiful. Beautiful. Oh, my wife has no appreciation for delights such as these. Oh, what a shame. Uh, my wife, you mean? Oh, well, one cannot have everything. She is a wonderful cook. How fortunate. Yes. Oh, by the way, have you met our new passenger? New passenger? Yes, didn't you know? We stopped at the island of Lemnos during the night. He came aboard then. Uh, a Greek, I think. I hardly heard what he said. Very sociable. Because at that moment from the lounge stepped a man. Beneath the high-crowned, soft-felt hat with the pale, doughy features of a face I had seen before. A face in a photograph. A photograph that Colonel Hockey had shown me. It was the man who had tried to kill me. Why not? I heard Matisse's voice as though from a long way off. Monsieur, do you not feel well? Then I turned, and without Monsieur. looking at the man who had just come on deck, I went below. Somehow, Barnat must have learned that I was on the Sestre Levante. He had taken the train for Sofia, and then as soon as it had crossed the Greek border, left it. It was a simple thing to fly from there to Lemnos. I thought of the telegram. Oh, well. Those idiots. And I was caught. And Matt wouldn't miss twice. He was a professional murderer. I had to get help. And so I went to the purser's office. He was a precise little man who smiled when I talked to him. Look, uh, I found out there was a man on this ship who is here for the express purpose of murdering me. Indeed. And what is his name? Banat. B-A-N-A-T. He's a Romanian. He's Banat. Banat. Uh, one moment, sir. Now, look here. You don't suppose he'd give his real name, do you? Banat. 
but not no. There is no one of that name or nationality aboard. He got on during the night at the Lemnos. Oh, hell is Mr. Mavrodopoulos. He's a Greek businessman. That may be what his passport says. His real name is Barnat, and he's a Romanian. Have you proof of that? Have I proof? Now, look. If you'll just radio Colonel Haki of the Turkish police at Istanbul, he'll confirm what I say. As I say, sir, we do not have radio for that purpose. I suggest that you leave the matter until we reach Athens. But can't you understand that man intends to kill me? No, sir, I do not understand. Nobody on this ship is going to murder you. There are too many people about. Oh. You have had bad dreams. It is ridiculous. I want to see the captain. I am extremely busy, sir. If you will close the door as you leave. I was only sick with fear and anger as I left and I went back to my cabin. Well, I could still go to the captain, but I could well imagine his reaction to my story. There was no proof... And these people were loath to stir up international complications. No. I was alone with my murderer somewhere on the ship with me. And then I remembered the revolver Kopakin had given me. I'd never handled a gun before, but at least it would give me a chance. It was something. I went to my suitcase and I opened it. Well, it must be. I, and I put it in myself. Just before I got on board, it had to be there. There was nothing. Someone had been in my cabin and had taken the gun. Mr. Graham, we were all worried about you. I told them that you had the sickness. Too much sea. Oh, Peter, uh, we must have. Oh, well, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I had rather a bad headache. I hope that it is nothing serious. No, thank you, uh, Mr. Haller. Have you met uh, Mr. Marodopoulos? No. I haven't had the pleasure. This is our English friend, Mr. Graham. How do you do? Nice. The soup is nauseating, Monsieur Graham. I suggest that you do not partake of it. When this you woman... You keep on. Sorry, my dear. Uh, tell me, Monsieur Mavratopoulos, are you bound for Athens, or do we enjoy your company as far as Genoa? I go to Athens. Then perhaps I continue on. Or perhaps not. A uh, difficult decision, eh, Mr. Mavratopoulos? Yes. I notice your hand, Monsieur. This bandage. An accident? Nothing serious. A bullet wound, to be exact. Dirty little thief took a shot at me in Istanbul. Dirty little thief, huh? You must look after yourself carefully. You must be ready to shoot back next time. Oh, I shall. There's not the slightest doubt of that. To carry a pistol, huh? Naturally. That is good. <laughs> One must be so careful. You should be very careful. I don't think it's necessary. That sort of scum doesn't risk his skin with an armed man. The grin that had been on the Romanian face faded. He hadn't liked that. And then I thought of something. Banat had taken my gun. It must be somewhere in his cabin. If I could slip away for five minutes, there was still a chance. As soon as the luncheon ended, I, I excused myself and I wandered off. I could see Barnat engaged in conversation with Mati, and I prayed that it would be a long one. Barnat's cabin was strangely bare. A gray raincoat hung with a soft hat behind the door, and a battered suitcase was under the lower berth. But the gun was nowhere to be found. Nor was it anywhere in the cabin. I went to my quarters feeling helpless and needing a drink to steady my nerves. I have been waiting for you, Mr. Grant. Oh, Mr. Haller. I rather think that you have been looking for something. A gun, possibly? Would this be it? Well, I don't understand how you... Uh, no, Mr. Grant. Uh, please, don't come any closer. Uh, sit down. I came to have a little talk with you. Sit down. You know, Mr. Grant... Oh, Mavrodopoulos, or should I say Banat is quite upset as I am. 
You have caused us a great deal of trouble and money. Yes, I begin to see now. I wonder if your name happens to be Boroshin and not Haller. Oh, dear me, I had no idea that you are so well informed. Colonel Haki must have been in a very talkative mood. And did he know I was in Istanbul? I don't think so. I thought not. You see, in order to take care of you, I had to take a hand myself. Barnard was extremely careless at your hotel. When I found yesterday morning that you were to leave on this boat, I had to move very quickly. Luckily, there was a man named Halla who had booked passage with his assistant three days ago. Therefore, I took over his ticket and passport. Uh, too unfortunate. But it would have been awkward to book passage at the last minute without attracting Colonel Harker's attention. Yes, I imagine it would. But well, I'm supposing you come to the point. Certainly. It must be clear to you that we cannot allow you to return to England. The obvious method of ridding ourselves of your presence is to shoot you the moment you land. But that could become complicated. It could. The other alternative is to induce you to take a holiday for six weeks or more. I see. In other words, you hold up my return to England so that my company's work would be delayed to the point of uselessness for the Turkish government. You have a keen mind, Mr. Grant. Tonight, we reach Athens. If you like the idea, you will live to see your England again. And uh, if I refuse to take this holiday? Then things will be complicated, will they not? I think you're bluffing. Hasn't it occurred to you that I shall repeat this conversation to the captain? It has occurred to me. As a matter of fact, the purser was telling me about your little talk with him this morning. I'm afraid that the ship's officers, including the captain, have enjoyed the joke very much. They call you the mad Englishman and love. Well, Mr. Graham, which is it to be? If I take this holiday, where will it be? In a charming villa near Athens. You will enjoy all the comforts of home, I assure you. I shall give you an hour to think about it. Remember, we are not at war, Mr. Graham. You are not a soldier. In reality, you are doing your country no disservice. No one will ever know. He left me alone. It was not a pleasant choice he had given me. I knew that Bernat and he could keep their promise to kill me when I landed. And I was equally sure that the holiday of Oroshin spoke of would be a very long one. But either way, I should never return to my wife or to England. I sat for half an hour smoking and trying to think. And then I remembered. Mati. Yes? Oh, Monsieur Graham. May I speak to you for a moment? But of course. What is it? Uh, Monsieur Graham, ma chère. Uh, would you come into my cabin? Certainly. I shall be back in a moment, my dear. I, I, I need your help. I thought that you looked serious. Uh, is it money? No. No, I want you to take a message for me when we dock at Athens. A message? Monsieur Mati, you are the only man aboard I feel that I can trust. Oh, I am honored. Listen. I'm employed by a British armor manufacturer. Uh-huh. I, I'm working in joint service with the British and Turkish governments. No. When I get off the ship tonight, an attempt will be made to kill me. This is true? Yes, I'm afraid it is. What I want you to do is to go to the Turkish consulate in Athens and give him a message for me. Will you do that? Uh, I will do it. You realize the message is highly confidential. I will say nothing. Thank you. All right, then, this is it. Inform Colonel Haki, Istanbul, that Graham is forced to accompany agents Voroshin and Barnat, traveling with passports of Halle and Mavrith. Populous. Is it possible? Unfortunately, it is. Well, uh, go on. In the event of my death, please inform the British consul that these men are responsible. Oh, dear. So that is why you looked sick when I spoke of Marodopoulos this morning. Oh, no, well, why do we have to get a shoot down the filthy swine? I have my revolver. You have a gun? Uh, Here? But yes, when one target... Well, then, I... there is something else you can do for me. Huh? Let me buy your revolver. I will not sell it to you. I give it to you. Here. Oh, thank you. But, but let me help you. No, no, no. This is huh? splendid. Oh, I am grateful, Monsieur Mati. And you will take the message? It is understood. Have no fear. A half an hour later, 
I told Boroshin that I would agree to his plan. I'm sure that he didn't believe me, but nor did he know that I was armed. It was a forlorn hope. But if I was going to die, I would have the satisfaction of knowing that others would die with me. At eight o'clock, the Sestre Levante was approaching her berth. I had agreed to pass through customs and to meet Boroshin on the street. As I stood at the rail watching the key drawing closer, I saw Barnat standing to one side, hand in pocket, and a fat smile on his face. He knew that he was going to earn his fee tonight. Boroshin stepped off the ship first, turned, and waved cheerily to me. Barnat followed him, and they both disappeared into the custom shed. I walked slowly down the gangway. Mr. Cuvetli came pushing after me. Mr. Graham! Mr. Yes, what is it? Colonel Huck, you would be very angry with me if I allowed you out of my sight. Huck, I wanted to tell you before on deck, but Barnett was watching. I did not dare to say anything earlier. Your face gives away too much, Mr. Graham. You, Cuvetli, you're a Turkish agent? One of Huck's men? Yes. I nearly gave the game away when I spoke of my non-existent tobacco firm. But you would know when the Frenchman questioned me. Colonel Huck, he wanted to be sure that you caught your plane safely. That is why I was aboard. But what can we do? Together, we go through customs. And then we shall see. Customs inspection, as ever on the continent, was slow. Although I find myself wishing that it would never end. But it did. And if Giovetti had a plan, he evidently didn't feel it worth mentioning. He smiled at everyone. The plump little businessman who, to all appearances, would deal in ladies' finery rather than international intrigue. And we found ourselves, suitcases in hand, walking toward the street. Uh, so that is all right. I find this inspection so tedious. Now, look here, Kubekli. I'm, I'm extremely grateful for your presence, but what are we going to do? Boroshin and Barnata are waiting out there with a the car. They're waiting for me. I know, I know. It has all been arranged. But you mean that we walk through those doors and do nothing? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> you will see. Well, I hope you have a gun. I have. Good. So have I. Oh? Yes. Thanks to the Frenchman. There they are. Do we run for it? Go on walking, Mr. Graham. Keep your hand away from your pocket. That's it. Are you mad? They'll kill us. You, Mr. Graham, not me. Go on. Under my overcoat, there's a gun. Please do not make trouble. Go on. Oh, what a blithering idiot. You're one of them, too. We're ready, Boreshin. We've taken long enough. Hurry up. Look at the gun, Boreshin. Left hand pocket. Get in, Mr. Crab. Look out. <laughs> I remember a perfect fusillade of shots, and then something cracked me on the skull, and I was falling. It was all very dark and comfortable. Mr. Graham. Mr. Graham. Mm. Mr. Oh. Graham. Ah. He is all right. Ah. Mr. Graham. Miss Kotekin and Colonel Hockey. Mm. You are safe. Oh. Oh, good show. You've been unconscious. Oh, 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 really? Huh? You are at the airport now. You see, we found the bodies of two men in Ankara. Uh. They were archaeologists, Halar and his assistant. I realized that Boroshin and one of his men must have boarded the ship using their passport. Yes, I found that out. We flew a government plane here, Kopekin and I, to wait for you. The Greek authorities were kind enough to assist. Yeah, uh, very, very kind. Not at all. And now, my dear fellow, the plane is waiting to take you to England. We we'll see you safely aboard. Yes. Um, I say, what about Barnat and Boroshin and Kovetli? Oh, yes. It was rather unfortunate. After you fell, they tried to get away in the car. Someone hit a tire. There was a smash-up. The petrol tank exploded. <laughs> it's tragedy. Oh. Yes. Well, 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 it's very decent of you. My dear fellow, it has been a pleasure. Come along. We will help you to your plane. I am sure you're anxious to get home to England with your wife. Come along. Under the direction of Norman MacDonald, Escape has brought you Journey into Fear by Eric Embler, especially adapted for Escape by Anthony Ellis. Ben Wright was starred as Graham. Featured in the cast were Wilms Herbert, Edgar Barrier, Rolf Sedan, Ann Morrison, Jack Crucian, Lou Krugman, and Shimon Ruskin. 
The special music for Escape was composed and conducted by Ivan Dittmars. Goodbye, then, until this same time next week, when once again we offer you Escape. You, finding life rather dull, dreaming again of exotic places, wishing you were somewhere else, we offer you Escape. Escape with us now to Malaya, where a young doctor and a beautiful girl are faced with the horrors of plague and the bloody holocaust of a native revolt. As Charles Israel tells it in Funeral Fires. They were burning the dead. The column of flames sucked up against the night sky of the river town leaned against it, held. And from far away, the dirge, the Malays mourning their dead. Then, drifting down to the landing where I stood, somehow the word, always the word in Malay and Chinese and English, plague. Plague had come to Lapore. Plague. That's why I was here. All the way from Delhi, I'd come. My plague ceremony. The police lieutenant who met me at the rickety little wharf had been there for five days already. He was very young. And he didn't like his job. Rather the awful service. Don't you think so, sir? And it's going to get worse. You brought fear him, sir. That should do the trick. It should. But it's not that easy. Every time a native sees a needle, he takes off for the hills, thinks it's something to kill him quicker. Uh, not these natives, sir. There was a plague epidemic here about 15 years ago. Serum wiped it out. The natives call it foreign devil medicine, but they respect it. That's good. It'll save us some time. Oh, well, there'll be a boy here in a minute for your luggage. Good. I'm glad you finally arrived, sir. It's good to have a doctor here. No, they told me there was a doctor here. A Dr. Grimes... It says doctor on his sign, sir. Fine. Uh, need his help. I wouldn't count on it, sir. Why not? You'll see, sir. What are you talking about? Wait till you meet Dr. Grimes. If you want a bit of free advice, sir, I'd rely more on Miss Randall. Miss Randall? Who's she? An American, sir. An American? Oh, what's she doing here? I don't know, sir, but she walked in and took over the whole ruddy show. Converted an old warehouse into a hospital. Been slaving day and night. Wonderful, sir. Lieutenant! Someone's calling you, Lieutenant. He'll find me. Who? Compatriot of yours. Oh, there you are. I've looked all over town for you. Now I'd like to know who's allowed all this. You responsible for this, Lieutenant? Responsible for what, Mr. Ford? For this here funeral business. Every native in the floor down there by that fire. Is there anything wrong with that, Mr. Ford? I'll tell the world there's something wrong. My whole night, every last man, down there singing and carrying on. I'm afraid I can't stop them, Mr. Ford. You'd better stop them, Lieutenant. Get down there and send them back on the job. He can't stop them, Ford. Huh? Who are you? My name is Donovan, Dr. Mark Donovan. So your name is Donovan. So that don't give you a right... Hey, wait a minute. Holy smoke, man. You're an American. That's right. Well, now, that's different. Say, can, Doc. Holy smoke. Why didn't you say so? Ford is my moniker. That name is American as the hole in the lifesaver. Ask around, Ford. Cleveland, Ohio. Ever been to Cleveland, Doc? What are you doing in La Flora, Ford? Rubber. On a rubber plantation near here. Bless the love. It's an old shebang. And you know why, Doc? Because it's run by an American, that's why. 
Efficiency. Say, uh, hey, Doc, you'll get my men back to work, won't you? I'm here to wipe out plague in the four, Ford. Oh, sure, Doc. That's what I mean. Wipe out the plague. We'll show them, Doc. And if you need help, you can count on Oscar R. Ford. Remember that, Doc. Yeah. I'll call you when I need you. Uh, Lieutenant? Uh, yes, sir? I'll be going over to the hospital. Right there, sir. Straight down this road, sir. You can't miss it. Thanks. I'll let you know when we're ready to set up our serum station. Right you are, sir. I left him standing there with Ford and walked through the town. Everywhere I turned, I brushed against death. Got into my nostrils, crept into the lining of my clothes. The deserted streets shrieked of it, so did a ravaged face seen through the door of a straw hut. Plague. And only the serum I brought with me could stop it. I walked into the warehouse that had been converted into a hospital. Rows of people lying on the wooden floor, hundreds of them, the dying and the dead. Then I saw her, the lieutenant's girl, on her knees beside a dying man. She looked up at me. Hand me that cloth, please. Uh, uh, this one? No, not that one. There, in the basin. Bring out the water first. Miss Randall? Yes? What do you want? My name is Mark Donovan. I just come in from Delhi. That's fine. I'm busy. I'm a doctor. Did you bring the serum with you? Yes. Well, get it and get to work. Miss Randall, I'm in charge here now. I'm sorry. It's just that I'm tired. I know. I, uh, I need your help. We're going to set up a serum station. It's about time. When do we start? As soon as we can get organized. Good. Oh, by the way, Miss Randall, is Dr. Grimes around? The rum pot? The, the resident medical officer. Look, if you want to find Grimes, there's only one gin parlor in Lapore. They call it the Nine Dragons. He'll be there. Thanks. Miss Randall? Yes? Get yourself some sleep, huh? Sure, Doctor. As soon as they stop dying. Hey, you there, boy. You seen Dr. Grimes? Oh, Dr. Grimes, sir. You will find him there, sir. At that corner uh, table. Oh, thanks. He is so far, Dr. You're Dr. Grimes? Uh, what if I am? Who wants to know? I'm Dr. Mark Donovan, World Health Organization. I just got in from Delhi. Uh, hey, well, now, that's a fancy introduction, laddie. That's worth the drink to you. Tea up, laddie. Go ahead, drink up. No, thanks. Ah, uh, dinner be the oil, laddie. Take it. No, thanks. Take a glass, laddie. Take it. We'll have a wee toast. Ha, uh, that'll be the ticket. Ha, uh, wee toast. I said no. <laughs> you didn't have to knock the drink from my hand, laddie. Dr. Grimes, how soon can you be ready to give plague injections? Ah, uh, there's no blasted plague here, young man. Get drunk. I say there's no plague here. No plague, you hear? That's what I say, and that's what I mean. Come on, Grimes, we'll get some coffee. Ah, you're insolent, young man. I'm in charge here. Let's go, Grimes. Ah, you come to send a bad report on me, have you not? Aye. Well, you'll not do it. I said, come on. Aye. I'm coming, young man. I ain't coming. <laughs> Put that knife away. Coming on. I got you, laddie. I told you to put that knife away. Get up. You want to send a bad report to me, laddie? Tell me, you want Get up. Hi, hi. Now, what is it you want from me, laddie? Meet me at the hospital in one hour. 
We're going to begin shooting serum. Uh, uh, anything you say, lad, you only hear police no bad report. Just be there. Uh, I, I'll be there. I looked back at him. He was standing propped up against the table, staring at me. And he was grinning like a great, evil cat. Grinning. I walked through the swinging doors into the street. Outside was silence. The cool silence just before dawn. I stood there, letting it surround me. Don't be rude, Mr. Wu. He stood barring my way. On his shoulder was perched a tiny black monkey. The Chinese leaned his face close to mine. Please to talk with me. And if you are kind, also with Mr. Wu. Uh, another time, huh? I, I'm in a big hurry. Mr. Wu is my greatest friend, the ruler of King Pus Pet Shop. I am Kung. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Please. but... No, Dr. Donovan. It is to save your life that I desire to enter into conversation. How do you know my name? I know many things. Please to talk with me. All right. To make it quick. To waste time is not called to waste. To hold time is his greatest ambition. This is not Mr. Wu. Go ahead, Mr. Khan. My father was Chinese. My mother, Mei Mei. What the Chinese and love poor choose not to tell, I learned from the family of my mother. Look, Mr. Kung. If you value your life, leave La Poor. Leave at once. What are you talking about? Why should I leave? What a pity, Doctor. Mr. Wu says it's time. Uh, no, ju just a minute, Mr. Kung. We haven't finished talking yet. Another time, Mother Doctor. Mr. Wu says he must go now. Take a line, Mr. Wu. He backed away from me, nodding and bowing, and the monkey on his shoulder doing the same. I turned and started for the hotel. Dawn was coming. The funeral fires were spent. The dirges finished. The melees gone back to their huts to sleep. It was almost daylight when I climbed the stairs and walked down the hall to my room. I've been waiting for you. Where have you been? What are you doing here, Miss Randall? I'm here. That's enough. I asked you why you're here. To help with the serum. You're going to need help, aren't you? Yes. Good. Well, do we get the serum? Remind me to ask you a question, Miss Randall. Like what? Like what brought you to Lepore? I'll remind you. The serum, Doctor. All right. Here in this closet. I... Yes? Doctor, what's the matter? Doctor. What? I said, what's the matter with you? The, the, the serum. What about it? It's been stolen. under the direction of Norman MacDonald, returns in just a moment. The new CBS comedy star, Frank Fontaine, will pay a visit to CBS's Jack Benny this evening. The young comedian who's celebrated for his impression of a sweepstakes winner and for his other impressions will be given a royal welcome, even though Jack believes in buying a sweepstakes ticket only when a single horse is in the race. Mary, Dennis, Don, Phil, and Rochester will be on hand, too. So join the fun that only the Jack Benny Show can bring tonight on CBS. And now, back to Escape. When they sent me from Delhi to Lepore, they said it was plague. And they said it was bad. Now I was here, and it was the way they said it would be. Plague and bad. Only from here on, it was going to be worse, because the serum I brought with me was gone. Someone had stolen it from the closet where I'd locked it. 
Someone who wanted to keep the plague in Lepore. I stood there in my hotel room, staring into the empty closet. How long are you going to stand there, Doctor? I can't believe it. Face it. There's no ceiling. Well, it was there. I put it there myself, right next to that bromoquinine. Cold tablets won't stop a plague, Doctor. I said I put it there. I heard you, but I don't have to believe you. I don't care what you believe. Maybe you sold the serum before you ever came to Lepore. Maybe you're trying to cover yourself. Sold it? Why would I want to do that? How do I know why you'd sell it? You would have an angle. All right, you said what you wanted to say. Get out. All right, I'm going. Wait a minute. I want to ask you a question. And I'll give you an answer. The police, Lieutenant. That's where I'm going. How long were you in my room before I got here? I'm going to the police, Doctor. How long were you here? You won't get out of it. How long? I don't know. Fifteen minutes, maybe twenty. Not very long. Long enough to take the serum yourself? Sure. I was here that long. Long enough to hide it and then come back here? You're forgetting something. Like what? I had no reason to take it. You've got a reason. Like what? What are you doing in Lepore? Maybe I write books. Maybe a steel serum. You'd better get that serum back, Doctor. There are people dying. It's your fault. Get it back. Goodbye, Doctor. And I had a couple of things to do. Ask the lieutenant to organize a search patrol. Cable Delhi for more serum. Four days it would take to get here. Four days of raging death. Because I had no serum, people would die before the sun went down. People didn't have to die. And Miss Randall had said it. It was my fault. All right, just a minute. Master, you no move. You listen. Who are you? Number one boy in chapel one, Conte. Conte. Oh, the, the old man with the monkey? That same, Conte. All right. You got a message? What is it? Conte say, Master Fire pay five dollars. Here, message. Here. Yeah. Now, what's the message? Conte say, he know Master have trouble. Conte say, Master, come to him, chop, chop. No come, chop, chop, too late. Is that all? Him say, come, chop, chop. Chop, chop, Master. Anything was worth a try, I found Kung Tae's pet shop in a narrow, musty street just off the marketplace. It wasn't difficult to pick out because there was a crowd jammed around the door. Holding them back were two melee police. I pushed through the crowd and up to the open door. Oh, good morning, sir. I didn't expect to see you here. Yeah. That's all it's about, Lieutenant. You haven't heard that? Or what? About the unpleasantness. What unpleasantness? What are you trying to tell me? You'd better come inside with me, sir. All right. Pleasant as you're talking about. Right over there, sir. In the corner. Conte. What happened, Lieutenant? Murder. A large caliber bullet, I'd say. Probably a forty-five. You want to examine him, sir? No, that won't be necessary. Quite right, sir. You know, I can't understand it. What? You see, sir, beside yourself. There are only three foreigners in that pool. Miss Randall, Mr. Ford, and Dr. Grant. Well? Well, that's it, sir. Why should one of them want to kill the old man? Uh, how do you know it was one of them? The weapon. Eight of skill with a knife for a rope. Mostly a rope. Never with a gun. Yes, that's interesting, Lieutenant. And there's something else I don't think natives do. What's that, sir? Steel serum. I meant to ask you about the serum, sir. Miss Randall mentioned it to me. There's going to be trouble, sir. With Miss Randall? With the native, sir. I told you they were waiting for medicine. And somehow it's gotten out of them. They know you don't have the serum. They're right, Lieutenant. It's been stolen. Look, I want all the foreigners in the floor at your office an hour from now. Can you arrange it? Yes, sir. You think there's some connection? Between the murder and the serum? Maybe. Can you have them there? If you don't mind my saying so, this sounds like a police matter. You're wrong, Lieutenant. It's medical. Strictly medical. I don't understand, sir. You will. You get those people to your office, hmm? Yes, sir. 
Miss Randall, Mr. Ford, and Dr. Grimes. You forgot somebody, Lieutenant? Who, sir? You? Me, sir? Quite right. I forgot, sir. I turned and walked out of the shop into the street. I had trouble getting through the crowd. It didn't mean much when somebody poked an elbow in my face. That could have been an accident. But not the man who jumped out in front of me and spat on the ground at my feet. <laughs> This was no accident. This was meant for me. All at once, they were silent, watching me. Then from the hills outside the town, the sound of a drum, slow, ominous. And from somewhere in Lepore itself, the answer, urgent, threatening. Finally, I understood. It had gotten out to the natives. Somehow the people had found out that I had lost the serum, and in their minds I was the medicine man who had failed, the man who was making them die. My plan for getting the serum back had to work. I picked up my medical bag from the hotel, hurried to the lieutenant's office, a one-room wooden shack near the edge of town. I had things almost set up when the first person arrived. It was Miss Randall. What's all this about? What are you trying to do? It'll take a little while, Miss Randall. Sit down. I don't want to sit down. She stood and watched me take things out of my bag and place them on the table. The hypodermic syringes needles, alcohol, and finally the little vial of colorless liquid. Then Dr. Grimes came in, cold sober. He walked across the room, sat down where he could look at me. The natives know something, Aladdin. Something you didn't want them to know. They are heading this way. All right. Take your hands off! I had a little trouble with this one, sir. And you're gonna have more, so help me. Sit down, Ford. Why, you little two-bit quack, I'm... I said sit down. Well, that's better. Well, Levy, you've got us all here. Now, perhaps you'll tell us why. There is an epidemic on. I'm going to inoculate all of you with plague serum. What are you talking about? You haven't got any serum. Just this one vial from my bag, Miss Randall. The rest was stolen. All right, Ford, you first. Roll up your sleeve. Yeah. That's right. Oh. Oh. That wasn't that bad, Ford. All right, now, you, Miss Randall? You're gentle, Doctor. Grimes? Aye, laddie. Get it over with. Yeah. Okay, Doc. Now we've had the shots. How we go now? Now, uh, just a minute. Nobody leaves here. Oh, oh no, wait, wait a minute. minute. I said nobody leaves here. Lieutenant, stand by the door. Mm, yes, sir. You know, what's the big idea? This morning, somebody stole plague serum from my room. I want that serum back. That's your worry, Doctor. Yeah. My worry and yours now. All of you. Because one of you took that serum. You're off your rocket, Doc. Maybe you took it for it. You got a rubber plantation. You could shoot your workers full of serum. Well, what would I want to do that for? Oh, efficiency, Ford. The workers on the other plantations would die, and you'd have the field to yourself. Uh, are you, Grimes? You were afraid I'd tell you I had office about you. I know you were wrong, laddie. You've had it pretty good till now, haven't you? No work, plenty of gin. You were afraid I'd spoil it. So you thought you'd make it look bad for me, too. No, no, Lady, you've got it wrong. All right, Doc, you've got us here. Now what are you going to do? Hmm? I've already done it. You've done what? That injection I gave all of you. It wasn't serum. That was plague bacteria. Straight plague. So, uh, what does that mean, Doc? Well, it means I have to get that serum within an hour. Otherwise, every one of you is going to get plague. That's right. You think about it. Plague. Pain a human can't stand. Then when you get used to it, you die. Each one of you. This is ridiculous. You're going to die, all of you, because there's no serum. Serum would save you. 
serum I haven't got. Look, Doctor. Those sick people at the hospital. They need me. Let me go there. You forget, Miss Randall. You're sick, too. You've got plague. You're going to die. I'm not forgetting. Let me go to the hospital, Doctor. Please. Now, what could you do there? Put cold towels on their heads? It doesn't help. It doesn't help much. I know that. They die just the same. But at least they're comfortable. Don't do it, Doc. Don't let her go. It ain't right. If she goes, we all go. You keep out of this. Doctor, please. I can't, Miss Randall. Mr. Ford says it wouldn't be right to let you go. Keep her here, Doc. Here with the rest of us. I told you to keep out of it. What a weasel on me, don't you? You're a fool. Fat and a fool. Yeah. I'd be a fool to let you get out of here. Doctor... You'll stay here, Miss Randall. But there's no point in... You heard what the doc says? Stay here. This is your fault, Ford. Ah. It's all your fault, the whole thing. I said shut up! You're going to say something, Miss Randall? I've got nothing to say. All right. We'll wait. We'll wait here as long as... Hey, look, lady, they're throwing up. Ford, what do you want? How do you feel? I... I feel all right. That's funny. You're sweating. Well, if you say you feel all right, fine. Because in a little while, you won't feel so good. And you won't feel anything. You'll be dead. Have anything to tell me, Ford? All right. We'll wait. Doctor. Uh Uh-huh. I... Nothing. All right. (laughs) You're going to die, Miss Randall. I'm sorry. Don't let me die. Where's the serum? Make him tell. Make Ford tell where it is. He's crazy. Tell him how you paid me to steal it. Don't listen to her. Tell him, Ford, you wanted the serum for your own workers. You killed Conte because he found out. You! No! No, Ford! Uh, uh, Leave him cover, Lieutenant. uh, All right, Ford, where's that serum? How do you like that? Trust the game. The serum, Ford, where is it? It's in my house, the living room. Under the floorboard. Get Get a doctor. I don't want to die. Please. Please. Lieutenant, you speak, Millay. Yes, sir. Please. Get out there and tell those people they'll have serum in 30 minutes. Right, sir. Pleasure. Please. And take these two with you. Aye, you're a hard one, laddie. You're ready for work, Grimes? <laughs> but, but, laddie, you, you'll be taking care of me first, will you not? Oh, you're taken care of, Grimes. Aye. I'm taking care of your film here full of plague. Oh, not plague. Water. Water? Yeah, water. Don't worry, it was distilled. the direction of Norman MacDonald, Escape has brought you Funeral Fires by Charles Israel. Lamont Johnson was starred as Mark, with Georgia Ellis as the girl Alice. Featured in the cast were Don Diamond, Ben Wright, Wilms Herbert, and Leon Lontock. The special music for Escape was composed and conducted by Ivan Dittmars. Next week, Escape with us to the barren wastes of northern Mexico and a story of a million dollars in cash to be had for the asking, if you live. As Anthony Ellis tells it in his exciting story, This Side of Nowhere. Wouldn't you like to help wipe out tuberculosis? Wouldn't you like to help those now afflicted with the dread disease and prevent others from getting it? All the wonderful work carried on by the National Tuberculosis Association is financed by the sale of the Christmas seals you buy each year. So don't forget, help to fight TB by putting a Christmas seal on every letter you write. Escape is one of the fine programs the CBS brings you every Sunday afternoon. 
On most of these same stations, you can also hear the New York Philharmonic Symphony, the Symphonette, the Arthur Godfrey Digest, the new Meet Frank Sinatra show, Earn Your Vacation, and Make Believe Town. Stay tuned now for Make Believe Town, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is CBS, where you spend an hour with Frank Sinatra every Sunday afternoon on the Columbia Broadcasting System. Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape with us now to the barren wastes of northern Mexico and the story of a fortune in cash to be had for the asking. As Anthony Ellis tells it in his exciting story... This side of nowhere. You want to know where you can pick up a quarter of a million dollars? Well, I know a place. The money's in hundred dollar bills. The last time I saw it, it was all in one place, and the people who had it were the friendliest people in the world. That is, if you don't mind their particular kind of friendship. There hadn't been much business in Missouri, too much competition, and the yokels were spoiled taking rides and the new stuff flying around. My old Stenson didn't look like much, and I couldn't risk doing tricks in it. With me, when the customer paid three bucks for a ride, that's what he got. A ride. So there wasn't much business in Missouri. I've been luckier in Kansas, though. In a couple of towns where a plane is still a fancy contraption. As I headed west, I was a couple of bucks ahead. About 50 miles east of Wichita, I put down in a grass field outside Willie. And I figured a day or so here would get me enough to buy a new tire for the right week. <laughs> Well, hello there. Is this your field? Hey, that was pretty. Coming down out of the sky like that, I've seen you from a long way. You like planes, huh? Sure. Is this your field? Yep. Down Spurs, Bogan Stream. Well, look, I'd like to make a deal with you. And so? I'll be here for a couple of days. Uh, Let me keep the plane here, and I'll give you five bucks. Five? Well... And a free ride. Mister, you got a deal. (laughs) My name's Bill Medu. Shake. I put up my posters in town and waited, and by 6 o'clock that night, I made 36 bucks. It looked as if the town of Willing would keep me around for maybe three or four days. I put the Stenson to bed in Bill Mayhew's barn and then started out to find a place for myself. The old man walked along with me. Say, have you got any suggestions where I can put up while I'm here? See that flying red horse sign up there? Yeah. Well, yeah. right across the street is Maydew's Willing Hotel. Nice and quiet. Two dollars a night. Breakfast, 50 cents. Oh, yours, huh? Yeah, it ain't fancy, but it's restful. Got a city woman staying there down from uh, Kansas City. No? Taking a rest. Oh, that sounds fine. Hey, we're having steak for dinner. I'll get the wife to put on an extra one for you. With the steak inside, I felt pretty good. About an hour after dinner, I got a look at the hotel's other guests. She was tall with a big city, dry, crisp figure, and special looking, too. She didn't seem to notice me as she went over to the desk and started to write a letter. I got quiet, and along about nine o'clock, I was ready to hit the hay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, yeah? You're the man with the plane, aren't you? Yes, that's right. Name's Gannett. Mr. Maydew told me about you. Oh? I'm Phyllis Naylor. Well, it's nice to meet you. I wonder if you'd do me a favor. Why, sure. 
I wanted to go to Witch's Hour tomorrow, but the bus service is so bad I'd have to wait until afternoon. Oh, uh, you want me to fly you? Yes. Well, that's uh, about 50 miles. I, uh, I'd lose business here. I'll pay you $50. 50? <laughs> well, I wouldn't lose that much. Let's make it 25. Is that what you want? Can we leave early? Anytime. Seven okay? I'll meet you down here at seven. All right. So long. Set, Miss Naylor? Shall I put your suitcase on the plane? Oh, no, thanks, Mr. Mayhew. I can manage. Uh, we'll miss you. Come visit us again sometime. Yes, I will. Well, let's go. I can <coughs> come along and keep you company, Mr. Gannett. Okay, it's all right with me. No, I'd rather he didn't. Well, it's your ticket. Anything you say. I'll uh, take you up when I come back, Bill. A couple of hours. Huh? I'll wait for you. I'll be up some business, huh? So long. <laughs> Have, uh, you done much flying? Quite a bit. Oh? Do any yourself? Yes. Oh, swell, swell. Would you like to move up here beside me and take over? Oh, no, thanks. Oh. Mr. Gannett. Yeah? How much would you want to fly me to Mexico? Are you kidding? No. Don't you think it might be nice? Oh, sure, but not in this crate. Short hops for me. Try the airline in Wichita. I can pay. I'll bet you can, but not me. The old windmill wouldn't take it. Five thousand dollars? Why? I could buy a ticket, but I prefer you to take me. Oh? Why? Maybe because I like you. I'm glad. Uh, look, are you in trouble? Of course not. Well, then why don't you use a scheduled line? That's not your business. I've got the cash. Will you do it? No, you better try somebody else. We're not going to land, Wichita. Now, that's what you think. I've got a gun, Mr. Gannett. Don't turn around. Here. Uh, hey, look, now be a good girl, will you? You've only got enough gas to get to Wichita. You're lying. The gauge says full. Well, it's, uh, it's broken. I'll take a chance. We can't make it in one hop. I'll have to come down sometime. That's all right. You don't want to get me in trouble, do you? No. I told you I like you. Just as long as you take me where I want to go. Head south. Go on. Okay. Where do you want to go? Sorry, um. Well, that's over a thousand miles. We'll never make that. I think we can. Where do you think you'll have to stop to refuel? I guess we can make Dallas if we don't blow up. All right. Please remember, Mr. Gannett, I'm quite serious. I can easily shoot you and fly myself. I'd rather not. Yeah. I'll remember. An hour later, we were flying over Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I turned around just once to look at her. She hadn't been bluffing. The gun lay in her hand, steady, and pointed at me. I began to think about Dallas. We'd have to come down there. It wouldn't be hard to get the gun away from her then, but there was something else. Five thousand bucks. I thought of what I could do with it, and the more I thought, the more I wondered if I was a sucker. Why fly with a gun in your back when you can make a deal just for the asking? She was in trouble. That was her business. I didn't know anything about it, and I didn't want to. I reached for the map. What are you doing? Don't get nervous, honey. I just want to take a look at the map. Oh. Torreon, huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I'd say that's about 300 miles below the border, southwest. I know. That's bad country in between if we had to come down. I know that, too. Were you kidding about that five grand? No. All right. Put away your gun. What happens when we land at Dallas? Gas up, check the motor, and go on. If you try any tricks, why I'll... should I? Good looker like you, 
Five thousand bucks. Can I sit next to you? Yeah, sure. Come on. There, there we go. Your first name's Deke, isn't it? You've been reading hotel registers. Yes. Yeah. You won't be sorry about this. I'll bet I won't. I was proud of the old windmill. I never thought she could make it, but by five o'clock that afternoon, we landed at a town a little north of Laredo. We talked about how we were going to get across the border. She still hadn't told me anything, but I knew that she wanted to get into Mexico with no questions asked. So we decided to steer clear of Laredo and border guards and hang around until it got dark and then take a chance. Took some extra gas aboard and went over the motor. Then there was nothing to do but wait for the night. We went to a cafe to eat. Oh, what's hot? <laughs> That's the American idea of Mexican food. Unless it burns your tongue off, it's not the real thing. You done much night flying? Oh, plenty. Used to be with a commercial officer. No. They fired me for fighting with a passenger. That was before the war. Flew B-24s out of England and came back. Now I'm too old for jets and too independent for commercial jobs. So I'm just a sky bum. <laughs> What's so funny? Oh, you. You sound so tough. I wonder. What? About you. I think you'd make love like a high school boy. You want to find out? No. How soon do you think we can take off the trail? Oh, about an hour or so. What about our lights when we cross the border? We won't have any. Good. Anyone ever tell you that you're good to look at? Yes, but you can tell me again. I like your eyes. They're soft sometimes. Hi, Mac. Hi. Sometimes mean. Want to the party? It's exciting, though. No, no. Got patrol. Hey, you're not uh, listening to me. Well, that's the first time I've seen that. What? You look scared when the cop came in. Come on, it's time to go. We took off soon after dark. I took her up to about 8,000 feet and we crossed the border. Next stop, Tarayon. Laredo was nearly 200 miles behind us when the Stinson died. Just quit cold. We went down nice and easy. I couldn't see anything below. All I knew was that we weren't going to make Terry on. Phyllis didn't scream. She just watched me. Then before we hit, grabbed a suitcase up and held it in her lap. I remember thinking then that it was a funny thing to do. And that was all for a while. <laughs> Escape, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, returns in just a moment. How well do you know the history of your army? For example, do you know when the U.S. Army's first dental corps was authorized? Your military history will tell you that an enlisted man, Dr. W.H. Ware, served as a dentist in the Philippines in 1898 as a member of the medical department. But it wasn't until three years later, in 1901 that the first recognized dental corps was authorized by act of Congress. In that year, the Army was given permission to employ contract dental surgeons not to exceed one to every 30,000 of said Army and not to exceed 30 in all. Thus, another page was added to the history of your United States Army. And now, back to Escape. <laughs> woke up. For a moment, everything was a surprise. I was alive. It was getting light. A lock of the girl's hair was falling over her eye. I reached out for it. Felt it. It was wet. Bloody. 
She was alive, but I couldn't tell how much. I looked at my watch. It's 4.30. As the gray light came through the broken window, I saw something else. A suitcase. It had broken open and spilled out four or five neat green packages. The oh. thing was full. Packages of new hundred-dollar bills. Must have been a quarter of a million dollars. Oh. Phyllis? Oh. Phyllis? Oh. Phyllis, you okay? Come on. Come on. Come on, now, can you sit up? Oh. You all right? Oh, my head hurts. I'll take it easy for a while. Here, now, give me your gun. No. Come on, come on. I want to have a look outside. All right. I'll be right back. So he'd come down in a kind of basin, and all around were ridges and low peaks. It was rough country, all right. From what I could see, mean. I had an idea water was going to be a problem. As far as you could see, there was nothing but cactus and yucca trees. I started back for the plane, and that's when I saw him. Sitting under a bush, his hat on his knees. Good morning, senor. He was round, and his face was the color of sand. And his smile were lots of flashing white and gold teeth. I guess he was mostly Indian. He had the happiest voice I'd ever heard. You've had a terrible accident, senor. I'm so glad you're alive. How long have you been here? Since earlier. How much earlier? Oh, much earlier, senor. Why didn't you try and get us out? If you were dead, one must await a reasonable time to allow the spirit to depart. (laughs) Oh. Well, I'm glad to see you. My name's Gannett. Gannett? Mm Mm-hmm. You're American? Yeah. Oh, good. I love the Americans. <laughs> They're so rich. I am Esteban. I will help you. There is another in the machine with you? Yeah, a girl. She's hurt. We take her to my village. There she will be taken care of. Uh, I'm so happy that you are alive, senora. Where are we? Uh, a little from my village. No, I mean how far from Torreon? Torreon? It is many days from here. Ah. What's the name of your village? El El Cielo. It means heaven, senor. You will like it. My people will be so happy to see you. Come, we must help your friend. When we got back to the plane, Phyllis was on her feet, and I noticed that the suitcase was closed again. She had a cut on her head, but otherwise she was okay. She let me carry the case, and we followed Esteban for about a mile to a little canyon. And there we saw El Cielo. A dozen adobe huts sprawled over the canyon floor. Let me take your suitcase, senor. I will put it where it will be safe. No, thanks. I'll take care of it. As you wish. Uh, won't you step in here? I'll bring you food and water. Thank you. Oh, it is a pleasure. I love Americans. You are our guest. We are happy to see you. How do you feel? Oh, much better, thank you. I'm not so sure about that guy. I've heard about these Indians. They're not usually very fond of Americans, or any strangers for that matter. Do you think he'll help us get to I don't know. The way he talks, it must be about 100 miles from here. Oh. Listen, honey, it's none of my business, but uh, that suitcase of yours. What about it? Well, there's no sense kidding. I know what's in it. Oh. It's a good idea not to let these people know. We've got a gun. The sooner. I'll have to use it. You want to tell me about the suitcase? No. Okay. We let it go at that. Esteban brought us food, and afterwards we met the rest of the village. They were very polite. Too polite. I couldn't figure it out, but nobody, nobody can be that happy to see a stranger. Well, they gave us a hut for the night, and after the dogs had quieted down, it got very quiet. You asleep? No. 
How's the head? Fine, thanks. I'm sorry about this. It's all right. We're going to have to get out as soon as we can. These people are... You think they'll make trouble? I don't know. They're just too happy. There's something wrong the way our fat friend looks at you. Maybe he thinks I'm pretty. Yeah, maybe. What are you going to do about it? Look, in the morning we're going back to the plane. There's a chance I can do something to fix it up. Just a chance. Oh. Yeah. Well... You were telling me something back at the cafe in Laredo. About me? Yeah, I was, wasn't I? I guess you're not very scared about all this, are you? I don't want to think about it. You ought to be thinking about it. Deke. Look, we're in a tight spot. I don't care. But I do. Maybe if we ever got out of here... That... All right, high school boy. Good night. The next morning, Esteban went with me back to the plane. It was still there. That is, most of it. Of course, they'd taken everything movable from inside, stripped the rubber tires off, stolen the prop. What about it, Esteban? Uh, it, senor? Nice hospitality. I wanted to patch her up. Senor, some dirty thieves must have come out of the night and done this yeah, thing. Yeah, you can say that again. Surely you you would not suspect my people. Oh, no, no, not your people. Uh, I'm so happy then. Well, we'll have to rent a couple of your mules. Maybe you'll guide us to a town that's got a bus or a railroad or something. You, you have money to pay for these things? I, uh... Little, yeah. Ah, we talk about it maybe tomorrow. Now we go back to the village. We didn't talk about it tomorrow or the next day or the next. Esteban always made some excuse. We weren't prisoners, but wherever we went, there was always one of them watching. Just watching and smiling. But there was something about those smiles. It was on the fifth day that things really went wrong. The villagers had left our hut alone, and I guess we got a little careless about the suitcase. Phyllis and I had been up to a ridge four miles away to take a look at the country and our chances for hiking up. When we got back, it was almost dark. The suitcase! What? It's gone. Well, I'll be... They've stolen it. <laughs> you think it's funny? Stop <laughs> I'm sorry for that. What's that for? Don't you see how funny it is? A quarter of a million bucks stolen by Indians. Where are they going to spend it? On what? Got to get it back. You help me. I'll share it with you. You will? Yes. Listen, you might as well know. Remember the bank hold up in Chicago last year? Yeah. Million bucks and security. That suitcase is part of it. A friend of mine left it with me. He got out of the country. Now he's in Torreon? Yes. I was to hang around in small towns until things got quieter. When you came along, it gave me a chance. I was to meet him in Torreon. I don't care about him now. It's you and me. Oh. He's got to get away from here. We can go to Mexico City or anywhere. How far do you think we'd get in this country? We'll take their mules. Now we can try. Esteban's the boy to find. You and me? Yes. Yes. Don't you know that by now? Okay. <laughs> What can I say? Uh, no one, no one has been in your house. It is unthinkable. Look, you know what this is? Uh, it is a gun, senor. Yeah. Only the rich can afford such things. I'm telling you to round up that suitcase or else. Now tell your friends. I mean it. Now go ahead. El americano dice que tenemos que devolver la maleta. Si no se van a dejar mucho y nos fusilará a todos, incluyendo a los niños. Well, 
They say they are very much afraid. Get me the suitcase. We've brought you here when you might have died in the desert. Surely you would not harm us. That's a lot of double talk. You brought us here to steal us blind. <laughs> so you, you have made a terrible accusation. We're very unhappy. Perhaps you would care to search the village. You get that so Now, oh, what's the use? There wasn't any use. I couldn't shoot them down in cold blood. I knew I'd never find a suitcase. I also knew that we had to get out of there. We'd lost the money, but at least for the moment, we still had our lives. I asked Esteban for mules. Senor, a terrible thing has happened. Last night, the mules strayed away. We have no left. It is a great loss. So I could call him a liar. He was, too, but I couldn't find the mules. That decided it. I'm afraid of them. Yeah, I don't like the way Esteban's been looking at that ring of yours. We're going to have to make it out on foot. Well, anything's better than staying oh, here. Oh, if I only had that map. Oh, well, I don't think they'll try to stop us. We'll start tonight when it gets cool. You better get some sleep. That evening, I heard the villagers moving around outside the hut. I kept our gun ready, but nothing happened, and then... About midnight, we took a couple of skins of water, some tortillas, and walked out of El Cielo. Nobody said goodbye. Nobody tried to stop us. But as I looked back, I saw in the moonlight a group of people huddled together, watching us. We walked for three days. Desert. Heat. Night and cold. Then the water was gone. How are you doing? Oh, all right. I'm thirsty. Just try not to think about it. Can we, can we rest a minute? Hey, better not. Not yet. Try to get to the hills. It's only a few miles. It'll be hotter. Now save your breath. Don't move. Don't move. The healer monster. All right now, fellas. Don't move. Just don't move and I'll blow his head off. Now keep still. That's it. Keep still. Ah! Oh, it's me! It's me! Oh, Dick! Ah! 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 lived on for about two hours, then died raving, cursing me, the money, and herself. A week later, I was picked up. That was six months ago. The Mexican police tried to find my plane, but I couldn't tell them where it was. They'd never even heard of El Cielo. So, somewhere in Coahuila, Mexico, there's a village. Maybe if you go down there, you'll find a suitcase with a quarter of a million bucks. Or maybe you'll just find kids cutting paper dolls out of hundred-dollar bills. Just crash your plane this side of Torreon. Under the direction of Norman MacDonald, Escape has brought you This Side of Nowhere by Anthony Ellis. William Conrad was starred as Deke, and Virginia Gregg as Phyllis, with Don Diamond as Esteban. In the supporting cast were Lou Krugman and Ralph Moody. The special music for Escape was composed and conducted by Ivan Dittmars. This 
is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Finding life rather dull, dreaming again of exotic places, wishing you were somewhere else, we offer you Escape. Escape with us now to a small freighter in the China Seas and a sinister traveler who brings destruction to crew and ship alike, as Ella St. Joseph tells it in his most unusual play, A Passenger to Bali. The papers in my pocket read Steamship Roundabout, 9,000 tons British registry. Master and owner, Captain English. Stamped across the face was the clearance of port authority. Uh, I'd be glad to see the last of Shanghai, its smell and its waterfront filth. Cargoes had been scarce. Now, with our hold filled for the first time in months, I didn't want to waste time. I wanted to get underway before morning. Mr. Slaughter! All right, Captain. Would you step up here to the bridge, mister? All right, sir. Are we ready to sail, mister? All secure, sir. All hands on board? All right, sir. Good. Let's clear port, Mr. Slaughter. Yes, sir. Mr. Wrangle. Head by the castle. Head by. Head by. Head the stern spring line. Hill there on the dock. Hike that line for it. Far as you lump of me. Yeah, 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 you can't board now. But, my good fellow, I am aboard. The ship is about to sail. Who is it, Mr. Slaughter? Oh, someone who insists he talk with you, sir. Stay there. I'll be down. Well, what is it? Have I the honor of addressing Captain English of the Roundabout? I am Captain English. Allow me to introduce myself, Captain. I am the... Reverend Walks, a missionary bound for Bali. What can I do for you? You can offer me your hand. Come to your point, Mr. Walks. We're about to sail. I am told your boat puts in at Butte along the port of Bali. Is that correct? Yes. Good. Here you will find my passport and papers of identification. If the papers and myself shall meet with your approval, we can settle the matter of money, and I shall sail with you tonight. You've been misinformed, Mr. Walks. The roundabout is a trading steamer with no accommodations for passengers. You'll find I need little. I'm sorry, but it's impossible. Good night, sir. Claim your price. Hmm? What's that? A customary fare from Shanghai to Bali is $100. I'll double it. Sorry, don't tell me there isn't room in your cash box for two hundred dollars. That's a lot of money, Mr. Walks. Think of the reward for bringing grace to the pagan Balinese. Let me see your papers. Well, your passport seems to be in order. The photograph, 
You? And the money, Captain English. The money is also interesting. Is it not? Where is your luggage, Mr. Walks? <laughs> On the dock. Two cases of Bible. I'll see to them. Mr. Slaughter, take Mr. Walks forward. Tell Mr. Wrangle to get the luggage aboard. Aye, sir. Thank you, Captain English. You, you won't regret your choice. And now, if you'll just lead the way, Mr. Slaughter. I watched him walk away, his monstrous bulk shadowing grotesquely in the foggy half-light, his great bull neck creasing into massive shoulders, his shaggy black hair wild and unkempt. I didn't like this man... His missionary, strange in his ways and manners. Yet I found myself thinking that, after all, he was a man of God. Perhaps later I would come to understand him. The fog was thicker now. I shook myself free of the depression I felt. Mr. Rangel! I can. Prepare to cast off. We sail immediately. It was the third night out of Shanghai when Mr. Slaughter brought the first trouble to my cabin. A fan early after, old sir. Come on board in Shanghai. Obviously, Mr. Slaughter. Come here, girl. I won't hurt you. Come here. What is your name, girl? I don't think she understands English, sir. Probably Chinese from the looks of her. I understand. What are you doing aboard this steamer? Must come on ship. What do you mean, must come on ship? Why? Must come. Now look here. Do you know what is done with stowaways? Stowaways? Yes. People who sneak on board a ship without paying. I do not know. There's no place to put her ashore, sir, until we reach your belly. I know, and yet she can't have the run of the ship. We could lock her in the empty cabin, sir. You forget, Slaughter. There is no empty cabin now. Mr. Walks is in it. Miss Walk. Miss Walk. You know Mr. Walks, girl? Oh, Miss Walk. Come um, Mr. Slaughter, would you ask Mr. Walks to step into my cabin, please? Hi, oh, sir. Hello, dear. Gentlemen, I couldn't help but hear my name being spoken. May I be of service to you, Captain? Are you ready for I don't appreciate eavesdropping outside my cabin. Eavesdropping? My dear Captain, you do me an injustice. I was merely passing by. It's as you say, Mr. Walks. Mr. Walks, do you know this young girl? Have you Have you ever seen her before? What a charming child. What a delight. I'm sorry, Captain. I'm afraid I cannot help you. I have never seen her in my life. Miss O'Walk, you tell me more. After all, Captain English, you could hardly expect a man like myself to know a girl from what must obviously be a... Well, a sordid livelihood... I have never seen this girl before. She came aboard this boat to be with you. Hmm? Did she tell you so? No, but it's obviously so. Even though I am dedicated as a missionary to aid and comfort the distress, I do not feel obligated to lie merely to smooth the path for another's crime. This girl is obviously far beyond any spiritual help or material comfort that I could give her. Good day, gentlemen. Girl, did you know this man in Shanghai? Yes. Did you know him well? Very well. He was my... Yes, very well. Slaughter and I talked with the girl for a long while, but he could learn nothing further. After more questions, useless ones, I had the first mate take her foreign, feed her and find her a bed. I would talk with Mr. Walks in the morning. Slaughter and I were eating breakfast and Mr. Walks came into the mess room. He sat down. His gigantic, obscene body overflowed from his chair across the table. Good morning, gentlemen. I trust your nights were pleasant ones. Mr. Walks, um, I want to talk with you about that girl. A girl? Oh, oh, yes, a tragedy, a tragedy. I want you to tell me all you know about her. Then I'll decide what's to be done. What's to be done? Captain, you're overstepping your bounds. 
This is God's work. Now. What do you mean? Oh, dear. Dear you, you haven't heard? Heard what, Mr. Walks? What is that here? About the girl, Mr. Slaughter, the poor, poor girl. What of her? It seems she met with an accident last night. Accident? Yes, at least so I presume. There is some small evidence that she has left our ship now to ride in a mightier, more wonderful vessel. Perhaps even now she is riding across the heavens in a chariot of flaming gold. What are you talking about? The poor, demented girl sought succor in the depths of water about her. What? Her pitiful torn shawl lies amid the hawsers at the stern. She committed suicide sometime last night. Well, must I eat alone, or will you gentlemen stay for a second cup of coffee? In my own mind, I knew what had happened, and I'm sure Slaughter did. I felt certain Walks had killed her and thrown her overboard. But there was nothing I could do. Four days later, we dropped anchor in the harbor of Bulalong. The ship's officers and I were anxious to get our cargo unloaded and to know that we were rid of Mr. Walks. I was in my cabin going through the routine of bills of lading and ship's papers with a port officer, Mr. Matsius, new at the job and overcautious. About your passenger, he is a missionary? Yes, yes, he came aboard in Shanghai. Uh, uh, Captain, uh, since there have been certain changes in Bali, we now have no need of such a person. Uh, uh, this man's name is, is what? Walks, the Reverend Mr. Walks. You do not usually carry passengers, Captain? No, no, we don't. Could I speak with this man? No, of course. Uh, merely a formality. Of course, I'll have the mess boy locate him. Be only a minute. Captain English? Hmm. Oh, I was looking for you, Mr. Walks. Right, for you. The port officer would like to see me. I overheard. But first, let me give you this. Two hundred dollars. What's this for? The use of a lifeboat. What are you talking about? A lifeboat, Captain. I need one to get ashore. You wouldn't have me swim. The port officer wants to talk with you. Come along. Wait, Captain. Walks, I'm as anxious to have you off my boat as you are to leave. You can only go ashore in the proper way at the proper time. This is your last chance. Yours as well as mine. Let me go ashore now and take the consequences. You'll search the four corners of the globe looking for this minute. Don't let it slip through your fingers. There's an eternity in it. Oh, you, you. Oh. Captain English. This man is not a missionary. His name is not Vox. All Indonesia is close to him. What? You mean he can't land? Oh, no, no, this is ridiculous, Mr. Matches. This man doesn't belong to me. I, I refuse to be burdened with him. You have no choice. He's on your ship. He belongs to you. <laughs> this man booked passage from Shanghai to Bali, and I refuse to take him further. I am sorry, Captain English, <laughs> but this is not my concern. <laughs> During the time you are in port, a police guard will be placed on this man. He will not be allowed out of his cabin. When you say, he will sail with you. <laughs> Who is this man? Call him a murderer, an anarchist, a revolutionary. It does not matter. During the recent trouble here, he fought on both sides and profiteered from both sides. As I said, Indonesia is close to him. Your papers are odd and stamp, Captain. Good day. I warned you, Captain. You should have let me go. You should have let me go ashore in the lifeboat. For now, in the time ahead, you are going to see a great deal of your passenger to Bali. <laughs> yes, a great deal. <laughs> Escape under the direction of Norman MacDonald is bringing you Ella St. Joseph's great play, A Passenger to Bali. It was the sixth week 
Forty-two days before, we had taken on a passenger in Shanghai, bound for Bali. Three days after he boarded the ship, he had murdered a young girl, a stowaway. We all knew he had, but we couldn't prove it. Now we were anchored outside the harbor of Bangkok. I was in the deck house, and Mr. Slaughter rapped on the door. Well, Captain, what's the news? Bad, I'm afraid. Walks hasn't been refused again. Again? Just as he was in Makassar and Lembang and Batavia. Same words, the same reasons as in Bali. If in English, mm. there was a fight in the forecastle this morning. One of the men hurt bad. And it was because of walks. Who were the men? Bible seamen Coles and Duncan, sir. Coles and Duncan? Well, they're friends. Yes, sir, they were. It's all Mr. Walk's doing, sir. The three of them were arguing about something, and sudden like the fight starts. Duncan was cut heavy in the chest. Walks just sat by. Where is he now? In the mess, sir. I'll be right back. Wait here. Mr. Walks. Mr. Walks. Hmm? Oh, Captain English, I didn't hear you come in. I was reading the Bible, as a matter of fact. Did you want to speak with me? I am told you are directly responsible for an injury sustained by a member of my crew. Oh, yes, that tragic episode between Duncan and Coles I'd almost forgotten. I could have you put in irons. For what reason? I did nothing. The men were discussing religion, and I was simply pointing out certain points to each. They went at each other with knives. <laughs> like children in the fever of the moment. Was there something else you wanted, Captain? Mr. Walks, I... Well? No. <laughs> Walks had dismissed me. Dismissed me on my own ship. I had to get rid of this man. His personality was infecting us all. In the past month, he had come to order about the lesser members of the crew. He had his meals served whenever and wherever he wished. He drank liquor from my own locker. As I watched the harbor traffic of Bangkok, I knew there was only one thing to do. Mr. Slaughter. Aye, right, sir. We will weigh anchor. How do we shape our course, sir? Southeast by east, three quarters south. Aye, right, sir. Southeast by... Well, that's Shanghai, Captain. Yes, Mr. Slaughter, that's Shanghai. <laughs> On the two weeks return trip to Shanghai, I began to feel myself a stranger on my own ship. The trim little China Seas freighter was becoming a floating prison. And the jailer was Mr. Walks. My Kanaka crew, emotional and superstitious, were in love with him. They worshipped him. Worshipped his massive body and his liquor-fed eloquence. My deck officers and I could feel control slipping through our fingers. And we were powerless to do anything about it. Then, finally, it was the last night. Tomorrow, we would anchor in Shanghai. And so we're back to where we started from. But at least we'll be rid of him. I hope there's no slip up this time. Uh, there won't be. They want him, eh? Oh, yes, Shanghai is as anxious to capture him as every other port was to reject him. They won't risk his escape. What's he done, Captain? Walks has been mixed up in something foul in every country he's touched. Heaven only knows what crimes he's committed. But shortly we'll be free of him. Now, let's have a drink to that. I don't mind, Captain. Get a new bottle out of the sideboard, will you? Yeah, uh, you're the keys, my nice, sir. Good. Uh, just put it here. Oh, uh, and two glasses. You should make it three glasses. Well, gentlemen, surely you'll invite me to join you. No, Mr. Walks. Will not. <laughs> then I shall have to help myself. I think I'd better get out on deck, Captain. He'll excuse me. Ah, wonderful, wonderful. Too bad poor Mr. Slaughter couldn't stay. Glad you enjoy my whiskey. You have good taste, Captain. Good taste in everything. Whiskey, boats, the roundabout is an ideal little steamer. Hmm. 
You might almost say I found a home here. Have you packed, Mr. Walks? A comfortable cabin, good food, now that I've schooled your cook. A well-stocked liquor cabinet. Are you packed, Mr. Wilkes? Oh, no. No, I am not packed. You haven't much time. Tomorrow we'll be anchored at Shanghai and you'll be taken away. My hope to jail? You could be wrong, Captain. It might turn out that I shall stay forever aboard your ship. <sighs> Until eternity. Walks. I've never liked you. Not since that first night when you came aboard in Shanghai. Oh. You're filthy. <laughs> You're rotten. Unclean. <laughs> You're a murderer by your own influence. This is no time for heated argument. Drink a toast with me, Captain. You got into the very core of the ship with your rottenness. A toast, Captain. You seduced the whole crew, the Kanaka deckhands, the mess boys. Every day they're becoming more slovenly, more lax. Very well, I shall drink a toast myself. To the roundabout, may the comforts I've come to enjoy be not lost too soon. I'd sink my ship before I'd allow you to stay aboard her one day longer. <laughs> Perhaps Shanghai will present an answer to surprise us both. When this ship leaves Shanghai, Mr. Walks, it will leave free of you. Now, good night, sir. It was in the sweltering noon of the next day that Mr. Chisholm, the British consul at Shanghai, was seated in my cabin, a long drink in his thin hands. Uh, Captain, uh, the Chinese port authorities have told me of your predicament. I am to handle it in my own way, uh, according to their instructions. I don't understand. Well, it's extremely simple. In every spot, every port, every town in which this man sets foot, some sort of trouble's broken out. Oh, I know this, sir. Well, I cannot be sure this man is responsible, but uh, well, after all, the, the law of averages... Look, Mr. Chisholm, I want this man off my hands. How soon can you arrange this? Oh, I'm afraid I didn't make myself clear. Shanghai does not want him. Neither does the British consulate. But this man is a criminal. Oh, oh Mr. Walks would certainly be arrested the moment he set foot on land. Uh, but he'll not be given that opportunity. Now, look, Mr. Chisholm, you've got to take that man ashore. Oh, I'm afraid your now famous passenger is a man without a country. Am I expected to sail him around the world the rest of my days? I'm sorry, Captain English. Uh, I'm sorry. You will depart at your earliest convenience. Good day, sir. And so we sail from Shanghai, the roundabout and Mr. Walks. In the weeks that followed, a great shadow lay over the ship. Wrangle, the second mate, fell ill, stayed in his cabin. Slaughter began drinking even during his watches. The ship seemed to smell of evil. Mr. Walks became the real captain of the roundabout. Then, sweeping in from the edges of the China Sea, came an even more destructive power. Typhoon. The barometer had been falling for three days, and it was on the forenoon watch that the storm hit with its full impact. For seven hours, the roundabout wallowed through the seething masses of water. Then an emergency call from the quartermaster brought me to the bridge. I went into the wheelhouse. The power unit and the rudder control has gone out. Where's the mate? One down, sir. Trying to connect the travel. We're on manual operation now, sir. You'll need another man to help you. Get help. But, sir, you can't... I take... can handle it till you get back. Hurry, man. If this thing gets out of control and starts spinning... The rudder will tear itself free in a matter of minutes. Now go on, man, hurry! Aye, sir. With the steam-powered gears to help me, each wave that hit the shuddering ship made the great wheel come alive beneath my hands. I stood, feet braced against the wild pitching of the vessel, shoulders and arms straining to retain control. I tried to gauge the monstrous waves rushing toward us. Tried to ease the groaning ship through millions of tons of lashing water. My muscles pulled and ached as each gray-green monster hit. I could hear nothing over the scream of the storm. I turned, looking for the quartermaster. And in that second it happened. Ah. 
I had been flung off the wheel like a marionette, and now it spun free, spinning one way and then the other with each roll of the ship. I tried to get to my feet. My leg was twisted under me. My ship! What have you done to my ship? What? Get a rope. Stop the wheel. I'll stop it. No, no, no. It will chop your hands off. Get a rope. No time. Get a rope, you fool. It'll kill you. What? Stay away from it. I'll stop it if I have to smash it. Never mind, Captain. It will not be necessary. What? What did you say? The rudder has just snapped. I'm holding nothing. The next morning, the storm was gone. Gone as quickly as it had come. Replaced by a thick, yellow, clinging fog through which the roundabout floated, broken, wrecked, sinking, her wireless gone, half her crew dead. She might go in half an hour, or she might last a week, but I had the safety of my crew to think about. My ship. I had given the order to abandon her. Like rats, we leave the sinking ship. Leave room for me up forward. I have need to stretch my legs. You won't be with us this trip, Mr. Walks. My luggage is not aboard the lifeboat. You're staying aboard the roundabout. I've left you a sextant. There's plenty of food and liquor. Even enough for you. I... I'm not going. No, you're not going. The ship is yours now. Do with her what you want. But... But that, 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 that's murder. You are murdering me. I have no idea how soon the ship will sink, or even if she will. You may be picked up today, or tomorrow, or you may float here for years. Captain English, we Stay could... where you are. But look, this Captain, gun I... can speak even above your voice, Walks. This is for the last time. Goodbye, Mr. Walks. Wait, Captain. Hey, it's not man's province to judge. No creature under your wings should be left to die. Cast without us, Mr. Slaughter. All right. Without then. compassion. Without. All right, then. Roll, you fools. Roll. <laughs> Even now, you may not have seen the last of me. Roll. <laughs> And so I left the roundabout. I left everything I owned. Everything except my freedom. The roundabout grew dimmer in the fog. And the figure of a man, standing well forward in the bow of an empty ship, was the last thing I could see before the fog closed in. Under the direction of Norman MacDonald, Escape is brought to you a passenger to Bali by Ellis St. Joseph, especially adapted for radio by Mr. MacDonald. John Daner was starred as Captain English with Lou Merrill as the Reverend Mr. Walks. Featured in the cast were Lou Krugman, Michael Ann Barrett, Wilms Herbert, and Bruce Payne. The special music for Escape was composed and conducted by Ivan Dittmars. Next week, escape with us to the Old West and the unusual story of a man who was a merciless professional killer, but who fought on the side of law. As Ernest Haycox tells it in his exciting story, Wild Jack Wrecked. Stay tuned now for Make Believe Town, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is CBS, where you spend an hour with Frank Sinatra every Sunday afternoon on the Columbia Broadcasting System.
You. Finding life rather dull. Dreaming again of exotic places. Wishing you were somewhere else. We offer you... Escape. Escape with us now to the Old West and the unusual story of a merciless professional killer as Ernest Haycox tells it in Wild Jack Rep. Red Mesa. A little town springing out of the hot, dry prairie beside the Chisholm Trail. A saloon, a hotel, two general stores, and a tiny church where the decent citizenry might pray for salvation while a wilder element, trail driver and teamster and buffalo hunter, restlessly searched out friend and enemy along the dusty main street. A small hill rose on the western edge of Red Mesa, plagued with a rash of graves, some marked and cared for, others sinking and forgotten. Man that is born of woman hath but a short time to live and is full of misery. He cometh up and is cut down like a flower. He flieth as it were a shadow. While we're praying, a couple of you boys start throwing some dirt on the sheriff. Mm -hmm. Oh, Lord, with whom do live the spirits of them that be dead, and in whom the souls are dead? And that same evening, a committee of the leading citizens of Red Mesa gathered together at Mayor Wayne's home to decide upon a new sheriff. All right, gentlemen, sit down and let's get this settled. Gentlemen, to make this town a decent place for our women folk and children, we've got to have a sheriff, Todd Mallon, and his kind can't kill. We need the toughest gunfighter available. And I want to propose... Uh, just a minute, Mayor Wayne. Let me speak. All right. Go ahead, boy, Ellen. I don't think we should get all upset just because we lost another sheriff. Jim Speed worked out fine for Red Mesa. All we need is another sheriff just about like him. I expected that, Bo Helen. Huh? All you look out for is to keep that saloon of yours full of anybody who'll buy whiskey and gamble. I still propose we reform this town by sending for a man some of you may have heard of. Jack Rett. Uh, gentlemen, I do want my saloon full. And full of the only men who'll bring any money at all into Red Mesa. Cow punchers coming up the Chisholm Trail with Texas cattle. Thirsty men on the prod from a long drive. But you give them Jack Red instead of a little fun, and this town will go broke. We'll chance that, boy, Helen. We'll chance that. What about Matt Travner? What's he got to say? I have nothing to say, gentlemen. As U.S. Deputy Marshal for the district, my job is strictly outside Red Mesa. You run your town any way you like. I'll handle the surrounding territory. Know anything about Jack Red, Travner? Just by reputation. Professional town tamer. And I've heard he's the most cold-blooded killer ever drew a gun. Ravner's right. We can't afford a man like that here. Let's put it to a vote, gentlemen. All in favor of sending for Jack Rett, raise their right hand. Five to one. The matter is settled, gentlemen. Good night. Yeah, good night. I wait. You'll wait and see Mary, Travener? If you don't mind, Mayor. Of course. Sit down. She'll be out in a minute. Well, poor Helen is pretty mad. But after Jack Red is here for a while, at least there'll be less gunfighting. Be less anyway if Todd and Mellon were out of the way. It sets a bad example. He's a hard man to catch. Well, it was all you can, Travner. There's just too much territory around here for Mallon and his gang to lose themselves in. He'll have to be taken by a town officer. And I think Red is the man to do it, if Mallon comes to town again. He'll come, Mayor. The word gets out that Red is sheriff here. Mallon will have to face him or lose his reputation with his own men. Good oh. evening, Father. Hello, Matt. Good evening. Hello, darling. Well, Matt Travener, aren't you going to kiss me? Oh, of course, sure. <laughs> here. Mary, 
<laughs> what a shameless wench you are. <laughs> oh, Father, you're old-fashioned. After all, we're engaged. Your mother, God rest her soul, didn't behave like that when we were engaged. The war changed things, Father. Uh, I know, but not for the better. <laughs> well, I'm off to bed. Don't stay up too late now. Good night. Good night, Good night Father. Man. You look worried, Matt. Do I? Tell me about it. Well, it's just that they're sending for a new sheriff. A legal killer named Rhett. He has quite a reputation, and there'll always be men to challenge it. That means more gunfighting. Is that it? I'm afraid so. It's a bloody way to peace, Mary. I know. Let's not worry about it now. Come on. I'll pick some coffee for us. Three weeks later, Wild Jack Rhett rode into Red Mesa. He was 38 and at the peak of his reputation. He stood well over six feet, better than 200 pounds of plain sinew. Tawny blonde hair grew long in the frontier style, and his features, fair and tinted like a girl's, were boldly aquiline. He was a picturesque man, till one looked at his eyes, which were large and pale blue, and had the disconcerting trick of remaining too steadily on people. There was to be seen in him the suggestion of inhumanity. He sent word to the committee that he'd meet him at the mayor's office that evening. There, it's eight o'clock now. Where is he? He's in town, and that's bad enough. Dear sport, boy, Helen. We took a fair vote on Rhett. Hey, here he comes now. My name is Jack Rhett. I have your offer. I'm Peter Wayne, mayor of Red Mesa. Do you accept it? Depends on what you want. Tell me. Well, Rhett, this is a difficult town. The Chisholm Trail lies just across the river, and we get most of our money from the riders passing through with Texas cattle. Now we want them to have a decent time for their money, but we don't like a lot of gunplay and killing. I have always been accustomed to complete authority, Mayor. I presume to know my job, and I won't have interference. That's agreed, Rhett. By the way, the last sheriff had a rule that riders leave their hardware at his office. He had trouble enforcing it. A poor rule. Let them pack their guns. That gives the wild ones a fair chance at you. I never give a man a fair chance at me. Is that all, gentlemen? Bo Helen's saloon was the usual deadfall, with a huge bar along one side of the room and gaming tables toward the rear. Next morning, Bo Helen stood tapping the mahogany of the bar with his fingertips, staring thoughtfully at nothing. Good morning, Bo Helen. It's noon, Samus. Huh? Oh, sure. Hey, draw me a beer, Mike. Yeah. Where's the new sheriff, Bo Helen? Over there at the corner table. Came in just before you did. Uh-huh. Barkeep, bring me a cigar, a glass of rye. Yeah, now he's going to clean and reload his six guns, one at a time. I got it, he is. How'd you know? It's an old gunman's trick to impress the citizens. But there's no one here except you and me. Then it's to impress me. I don't I... Well, uh... Goodbye, Bo Helen. Uh, Mike. <clears throat> You've got something to say to me, Bo Helen? Yes, yes, I have. You're smart, Red. I recognize that. But your record for killing is too severe, and my business depends on an open town. Now, the reform element got you, and I'll go along for now. But just remember one thing. I can break you, Rhett, any time. I was waiting for that, Bo Ellen. Well, and I guess we understand each other. Hello. Oh, any luck, Matt? Just a morning's ride. Uh, Matt, uh, here's Jack Rhett. Rhett, this is Mac Traven, a U.S. Deputy Marshal for the district. Glad to know you, Rhett. You're young. 
Don't be misled. Brett, your job is in town. Mine is everything outside. So I'll either back you up here in Red Mesa or I'll leave you strictly alone. I'll handle Red Mesa. All right. One more thing. I want Todd Mallon. If he comes to town again, he'll have to be taken. Will you do that or shall I? What is he? Outlaw. His main line is plain robbery. Now I want him for killing Jim Speed. Let me handle Mallon. Why? Killing's my trade. Man doesn't live with enough animal instinct to get me. Maybe. Killing you would build a man's reputation considerable. Just so? Well, good luck, Red. There was peace for a full week in Red Mesa. And then on Saturday night, Matt Travers' prediction came true. Jack Rett was at his customary post just opposite Bo Helen's saloon in a chair on the porch of the Chinook Hotel. Obscured by the shadows and watching the crowd, his cold, pale eyes half concealed by cigar smoke. Trouble found him thus. Evening, Sheriff. Good evening, ma'am. Getting an eye on the boys, huh? <laughs> Hello, cowboy. That's a lot of killing for one sheriff. Three men. I don't like it. Forget it, friend. Have a drink and forget it. You're Bo Helen, ain't you? That's right. Come on now, have one on the house. Now, Mike, fix him up. I can pay for my liquor. Yeah, I never gave him a chance. What kind of sheriff you got stands in a shadow and kills one man and then jumps 50 feet from his gun flash and shoots down two more? Those boys never had a chance at him. Yeah, just drink your drink, cowboy. That was the most merciless killing I ever seen. He's a butcher. I wish I'd gunned him up. This is my game. They were fools to play it. Never buck a man who's spent his life learning to kill, son. Get out of town. Get out now. Red? What if I don't... Don't try it, son. Don't let your anger destroy you. Drift. Go on. Drift. Blast your town. I can hold my thirst another 200 miles up the trail. Come on, boys. Yeah. We'll send word back to Texas to go around Red Mesa and let it dry to powder. Yeah, sure. It won't do, Rick. It'll do, Bo Ellen. Barkeep, bring me a glass of rye. On the house. Rhett stood with his back to the bar, holding his drink and a thin black cigar carefully in one hand. He stood there for about ten minutes. Then trouble came again. Todd Mellon, he's riding in with four men. How's the game? Open up the back doors. Well, Jack Rhett, now let's see you shoot down Todd Mallon and four men from the shadows. Good night, Bo Helen. Escape under the direction of Norman MacDonald returns in just a moment. Sorry, but if you think school teachers have it easy, you've got another think coming. Just ask our Miss Brooks, as played by Eve Arden, on most of these same CBS stations this evening. And now, back to Escape. When word came to Bo Helen's saloon that Todd Mallon was riding into Red Mesa with four men, Jack Rett simply walked out, 
crossed the street to his office, sat down and waited. Twenty minutes later, Todd Mallon had arrived and departed. Not a shot fired. Then Jack Rett went quietly to bed. But early Sunday morning, he was back in his office. Come in. Morning, Rhett. Well, Travner? There's talk, Rhett. I expect that. Now, Rhett, you told me you'd handle Mallon if he came to town. Yes, Travner. Well, they say Mallon rode into town last night with four men. Rode right up to this office, got down, came inside. That you and he stood here with this desk between you, talking. And that a few minutes later, Mallon left and rode out of town. I play the game my own way, Travner. And I don't want interference from anybody. People are saying maybe you and Mallon made a deal of some kind. But, uh... Well, now, somebody's breaking the Sabbath. Know who it could be, Travner? No, I don't. Well, it's a rifle. Sounds like one of those seven-shot Spencers. Uh, and it's old Hack Crow. Who is he? An old trapper. Comes to town every few months, sells his furs, gets drunk, goes a little crazy. Jim Speed always laid him away in jail to sober. Well, I'll take a look. You better stop him, Rhett. He's only got two shots left. That'll satisfy him. I doubt if he'll reload. And if he notices us and decides to shoot? Then I'll have to kill him. Hey, hmm? who's that coming out of Bo Helen's? You old bay. Gambler. He's a fool. Now he's getting his horse. You gonna stop him, Rhett? No. Let him go. Rhett, the town is your territory, and I won't interfere. But why did you refuse a fair shot at Hack Crow? He won't bay is dead. Which is the more useful citizen, Travner? Crow or Bay? West is full of gamblers. There was considerable talk that day in Red Mesa over Jack Rett's aloof and cruel calm in condoning a shooting that had occurred under his very eyes and within reach of his formidable guns. Then, mid-afternoon, a rider came up from the prairie and reported finding old Hack Crow dead in a coulee, dry gulched and robbed. Mayor Wayne heard about it and went to Bo Helen's saloon to hear more. Ah. Well, good evening, Mayor. Hello, Bo Helen. Got a brandy. And what do you think of your great Jack Rett now, Mayor? Uh, it looks bad. Now, look, Mayor. Everyone knew Hack Crow carried his profits in his pocket. Always did that. So Red allowed him to leave, and Todd Mallon and his men were waiting for him in the coulee. Just simple as that. You have no proof of that, Bo Helen. No? And why didn't Red take Mallon when he rode in here last night? Because they made a business arrangement, that's why. Well, it doesn't look good, but... There's Red now. Barkeep. Last ride. I don't want to talk to him yet. I'm leaving. Good night, Bo Helen. Good night, ma'am. Now, uh, Mike, uh, give me that ride. I'll take it over to the sheriff myself. Uh, here's your drink, Sheriff. Mind if I sit down? Game never changes, Bo Helen. I know what you're going to say. I warned you I could break your rep. It's an old story to me. Every town's got one insider who plays along with the outlaws. I knew you to be that one here when I first saw you. Running a saloon, you'd know when a cattle buyer was riding out of town carrying a specie, when the overland stage was loaded with gold. There was a quarrel over the split of profits between you and Mallon, and you fell apart. That's always the way. Very shrewd, right? It's an old story, Bo Helen. I know it by heart. Very shrewd. But you can't play the same game. All sheriffs are supposed to be crooked. You and Mallon had an agreeable little chat last night. Did he make you a good offer, Red? Maybe I should accept his offer, Bo Helen, just to keep you two split. Uh, maybe I should do that. Red, I've seen sheriffs come and go. It's a chancy trade. Sheriffs die. They all die. It's only a question of time. <laughs> You're a hard one, Jack Red. You might make your peace with Mallon. 
It'll have to be that way. Otherwise, you'll have little chance of getting rid of me, Bo Helen. It may be that way. I wouldn't be surprised. I always expect the worst of men. And I'm seldom disappointed. It was turning dark as Jack Rat left Bo Helen's saloon. Crossing the street, he walked into his office but continued on out through the back door. A few minutes later, he stood in the gathering shadows opposite the O.K. stable and watched Bo Helen ride out and drift into the prairie to the south. He knew now what to expect. It would happen soon, perhaps tomorrow. He returned to his office and slept the night there. Come in. Well. Morning. Brett, I want you to meet Mary Wayne. Miss Wayne, very proud. I, I, I wanted to know you. Hmm. To meet him, Mary, not to know him. Brett lives in a closed world. Huh. See that? I have no friends. Uh, we're to be married on Thursday, Mr. Red. I should like you to be there. I'd be most happy. Thank you. Now, Mary, would you wait outside? I've got some business to discuss with the sheriff. Of course, Matt. But don't be long. Goodbye, Mr. Red. Bye, Miss Wayne. Brett, this afternoon I'm leaving to find Todd Mallet. You had your chance, but you let him go. Wait, Travner. Wait. I've tried patience, Rhett, and I'm a poor hand at it. Travner, you have a fine girl. If it's not presuming, let me congratulate you and compliment her. Thank you. Was that all? Um... I'll take care of Mallon. Give me a little time. It's my job. Retta, I want to believe you. No man wearing a star should believe anybody. It's a weakness. Haven't I told you? Blessed if I quite understand you, Red. And understand this. Every man has his time. When it comes, he knows it. There's no turning back. Nothing makes any difference then except to stand up to the finish and go out in decent style. And yet you're the man never believes in giving another man a break. Don't try to understand me. You want help with Mellon? I have no faith in help. Mel? Come in, Mary. Oh, wait, uh, tra- Travener. Hmm? I'll suggest this much. Take one man. Ride due north to where the cattle trail crosses Tempest Creek. Be there tonight. Understand? Red, I... I'd hate to oppose you. If you did, you'd lose. I've been 15 years at this, Travner. Which is five years beyond average luck. That evening, Jack Red took up his post on the porch of the Chinook Hotel. Dressed in his best. A hard white shirt a blood-red Windsor tie, and a suit of black broadcloth swelling around the big, uncompromising shoulders. He sat there calm behind the smoke of his cigar, waiting. Uh, full moon tonight, Sheriff. That's right. Uh, no offense, mind you. <coughs> Good evening, Rhett. Hello, Mayor Wayne. Uh, Mayor, have you seen Travner? He rode north this afternoon. Back tomorrow, he said. Good. Where's the sheriff? Here I am. Red. Red, listen, I just come up South Creek and Todd Mallon and six men were only a quarter mile behind me, heading into town. All right, friend. Take cover. Yeah, yeah, sure. sure. Yeah. Red stood up and moved into the shadow at the end of the hotel porch. Across the street, Bo Helen appeared in the full glow of the doorway of his saloon. Come out in the dark and meet your friends, Jack Rat. What are you afraid of? It's only Mallon riding in to see you. Thieves fall out, but the urge for profits brings them together again. You should have known it, Rick. Nothing surprises me. Well... Oh, there you are, Red. Surprised to find you exposing your great reputation out there in the middle of the street. Every man has his time. You want to try it, Bo Helen? 
Or will you wait for help? I'll wait. The arriving horses came up into the moonlit street and halted at the corner of the saloon. Bo Helen's hand lifted toward the group, and at that order, the horsemen spread out until they were flank to flank all across the street. Todd Mallon advanced from the line and stopped, square and alert above the saddle. Jack Rett stood alone in the middle of the street, his eyes flashing a hard fury. Then he dropped his cigar and ground it beneath the boot. It was a final gesture. How are you, Mallon? Goodbye, gentlemen. Next day, Red Mesa buried some more men out on the hill and talked of Jack Red who was more of a mystery to them now than when living. To all of them but one, Matt Travner. Nobody knows a killer's world, Mary. Wasn't any room in Jack Rett for much pity. But he sent me away to save me from what he knew was coming. I think that was a kindness, although I had no fear. It was a fine thing for him to do, Matt. But they say he stood in the middle of the street to face them all in the moonlight. Why? It wasn't his style. As long as he was sure of himself, he never gave anybody an even chance, Mary. But killers live and die by instinct. And somewhere along the evening, he got the warning. After that, it was just a matter of pride. He killed Mallon and Bo Helen before he died, standing up and in good style. And that's sort of a, a greatness, isn't it? Under the direction of Norman MacDonald, Escape is brought to you Wild Jack Rett by Ernest Haycox, especially adapted for radio by John Meston. Jack Rett was played by John Daner, with Larry Dobkin as Matt and Lou Krugman as Bo Helen. Parley Bear was the narrator. Featured in the cast were Junius Matthews, Russell Simpson, Gene Bates, Paul Dubov, and Sam Edwards. The special music for Escape was composed and conducted by Ivan Dittmars. <laughs> Next week, we escape with the story of two small boys who discover the most fabulous Christmas ever dreamed of as Anthony Ellis tells it in his delightful tale, The Cave. Stay tuned now for Make Believe Town, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. Roy Rowan speaking for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. You, finding life rather dull, dreaming again of exotic places, wishing you were somewhere else, we offer you Escape. In the spirit of the Christmas season and its magic effect on all men, Escape brings you a charming fantasy about a small boy who discovered a delightful new world and lived forever after in its enchantment, as Anthony Ellis tells it in The Cave. It's on days like this that I remember how it used to be before I found the cave. This day in particular. Of course, it's hard to see everything as it really was. Time has a habit of distorting the memories. Memories. Christmas. Christmas Day. Oh, what a long time ago that was. I was ten and an unpopular uncle had distinguished himself by giving me a flashlight. And it was enormous. Four batteries and a most incredible gleam to its metal case. I couldn't wait to try it out. And because it was still early afternoon, 
I could think of only one place that was dark enough for the exciting test. The cave. The big cave whose mouth was near the sand dunes and whose recess was rumored to be mile deep. George Fennell and I had never ventured more than 200 yards or so inside, but, but on that Christmas afternoon, I knew that the cold darkness of the cave would have no fears for George and me. We met near the dunes, as arranged, to compare notes on our respective Christmas presents. It was quite warm, and the snow was beginning to melt in patches. A few gulls were wheeling about nearby. It was as I have remembered it all my life. Hmm. Listen, I better work like a searchlight tonight. I guess it would, all right. Maybe they'll let us stay up tonight. If it doesn't get cold, we could play pilot. I use my new gun. I thought we might go in the cave this afternoon. Hey, that's keen. Oh, maybe they'll get sore. I had to get all dressed up today. Oh, get dirty. Besides, we could go a real long way inside and fish. I wouldn't want to go in too far. They say the cave goes off in a lot of tunnels. You can get lost. Maybe. You haven't got a flashlight. Sure, that's right. And with my gun... Sure, we can explore. Come on. I'll raise you to the cave. I won the race. And we stood at the entrance of the big cave. The arch had a span of about 25 feet, but just inside, it widened until the walls were 70 feet apart and the ceiling was over 50. As we passed from sunlight to shadow, I turned for a moment and looked down to the sea. At the water's edge, a gull stood, motionless, looking up at us, and then solemnly, <laughs> as though with disapproval, it, too, turned about and gazed out over the water. The opening of the cave receded and became small, and we went deeper and deeper. Find it up there, Dan. Way up. Okay. Gee, I bet that's high. A mile, I guess. You're dearly a mile. Maybe a hundred feet. Bang, bang. Boy, that's king. Just like a real gun. Come on, let's look. Let's look the cave down here. It looks like a turn, see? Well, okay, but we'd better not go too far. My, are you scared? Heck no, but... Well, I gotta get back for dinner. They'll get awful so if I'm late. Oh, you won't be late. Come on. I wanna see what's around here. Okay. Hold the light on my gun. I gotta reload. <laughs> heard of fish in a stream like this. Where'd they come from, huh? Where? I don't know. I say there are fish in caves sometimes. Blind fish. That's silly. What are you stopping for? We gotta go back now. Why? Because it's late. Besides, how do you know which tunnel we took? How? Maybe we could get lost. Listen, maybe if we keep on going, we'll find treasure in here. Treasure? Sure stands to reason. Maybe like in the pirate book. Somebody came here and buried treasure. Henry Morgan or somebody. No. Oh, sure, it stands to reason. Everybody's like you. They say no, but just suppose. If no one's looked, how'd they know? I think we'd better get back. Maybe tomorrow we can look. Kay's getting awful narrow. We might even find old pirate bones and swords. Ah. Uh, you got too much imagination. I heard them saying so at home. I don't want to go any farther. I'm going to. Okay. Give me the flashlight. No. You want to go back? You go back in the dark. Oh, uh, they'll be mad. It's late. Just for a little while. If we don't find anything, well, then we'll go back. All right. But only a little while. I'm thirsty. You better not drink out of that water. 
probably poison. Why? Hold the light. I'm going to have a drink. There you are. See, I told you. Now you'll probably die. Poison. It's like the ocean. Hey, look. What? There, coming down the stream, that white thing. Yeah. Looks like a piece of paper. I'm going to get it. Hold on my hand. You'll fall in. Oh, I won't. I got it. What is it? Oh, no, it looks like a handkerchief. That's silly. It's too small. Who do the handkerchief like that? My mother died. Gee, I'd hate to blow my nose on that. You can almost see through it. How'd it get down here? Who cares? Maybe it's a message. Huh? Like from someone in distress. I'm going home. Like a damsel in distress in the pirate book. Hey, we gotta find out. Give me my flashlight. We'll follow the stream. Uh... We followed the stream. We walked by it as the cave twisted and curved. We didn't notice the passageway, which had been getting smaller all the time, suddenly widen out in the stream, which was becoming a river, and the river... The river. Hey, what? Where's the other side of the water? There isn't any. It keeps going. It's like a lake. Or maybe a sea. There's little waves. Then, huh? Turn the light around. The walls are gone. There's no walls. There's got to be. It's a cave. There's no top to it either. It's just too high to see, that's all. Let's go home. Let's go home right now. What are you afraid of? I'm not, but I'm hungry and it's Christmas. Well, I got things to play with. Come on, Dan. Come on, I want to get outside. What'd you do that for? Turn on the light. Turn it on. Don't you notice something? You turn that on. Give it to me. Oh, wait a minute. Don't... I want you to see something. I'll turn it on. You give it to me. I'm not going to play with you anymore. You give it. See what you've done? It's all your fault. I didn't want to come in here anyway. How are we going to get back? It's dark. No, no, it isn't. That's what I wanted you to see. Look up there. I don't see anything. You will. Oh. It's like stars. Way, way up. That's what it is. It's stars. We stood there, George and I, ten years old. And for a moment, no longer afraid because of the wonder of the thing. It was light from a sky, a sky that I knew I had never seen before. Yet I knew I was still in the big cave because when I spoke, the echo of my voice returned. It's beautiful. I can't find it. The water's too deep. Dan? Dan? That's funny. You're always saying that. It's not going to be funny when we can't get home. Dan! 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 Now you do it. What for? It's just an old echo. Go on. Uh, George. 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 There. How can there be an echo when there's no cave anymore? You're trying to scare me. Well, I'm going. You can come too if you want. Dan. Oh, but nobody's ever been in here, ever. I bet we're the first. Except for pirates, maybe. I wish we could see more. If my mother hadn't taken away my matches, we could find our way out okay. Golly, it's night. Come on. Please. I'm hungry. Somebody's here. Somebody else. Sounds like it's over there. No. Don't go there. Dan. I'm scared. I don't like this place. Go home if you want to. I can see someone. Look. Gee. He's, he's digging in the sand. Don't let's go any closer, Dan. Let go of me. I want to see 
What are you doing? Look, look. There's some other people. They got swords. Not you, Nandy, you scurvy wretch. Look on him, bully. No. Don't hit me, Captain. I just wanted to see if the treasure was still there. It's the truth, I did. I'll show you what's there, you pot belly toad. No, Captain, no. You're killing me. No, please, no. I won't touch in the treasure. Don't hit me again. Don't kill me. I have been started to kill you yet, Nemez. Come on, bullies. Lay on. We'll exercise our appetite for the feast. Escape under the direction of Norman MacDonald returns in just a moment. There's nothing quite as depressing as being hungry. Hunger is the hand which crushes the will to work. Hunger is the enemy of hope. And there are many, many hungry people today in the war-anguished lands of Europe and the Far East. You can restore that will to work. You can restore hope by combating hunger. And your weapon of combat is a care package. For $10, you can send a care package today. Keep sending them until those people can take care of themselves. And now, back to Escape. In that faint light from the stars of another world, the world of the big cave, George and I watched. We could only see shadows until someone lit a lantern. And then I knew that I'd been right. Pirates! Pirates! I want to go home. Pirates they were. The most glorious, the, the gaudiest pirates to sail under the Jolly Roger. The leader was a huge man with a fine, bushy beard and a, a voice like the trombone in the village band. How shall we cook him, boys? Royal or steam? No! No, Captain, no! It's too tough a morsel for that, Captain. I say, roast him. I shall. Roast it'll be. Nothing like roast Nambi, I always say. No, no, no! We'll cut out his heart first and feed it to the dog. Yes, yes, yes. Nambi, you little live at aggravation. Say your prayer. He's going to kill him. I don't want to watch my heart. <laughs> Who was that? I don't know, Captain. Sounded like a boy. A boy? A boy? My aunt was the Lady Alicia. Bill, she's in the dungeon, Gunparron. Aye, that's true. It came from over there. Oh, the lantern eye, she Go get us, Dan. We gotta run. Don't be afraid. If you're not afraid, nothing can happen. Do you see anything, Gunparron? You know it, but oh. save us all. Tis a boy. There's two of them. We'll stop him. Boy! Oh, the little demon. Thank you. I should have turned you inside out. How the bliss of blethering jaw. I can't miss it. Why, I? Boy, what's your name? Ben Embry, sir. On oh, that one. George. George. He's my friend. George. George Finnell. His father's a policeman. <laughs> Where'd you come from, boy? Greenfield. That's outside the cave. Cave? What cave? What do you do here? 
Who spies are you? I'm Sarah! Just exploring. We got here, that's all. Exploring? Where's your ship? We didn't come in a ship. What now, ship? They're boys, Captain. What harm can they do? Come, it's Christmas. I say feed them and send them on their way. What's Christmas got to do with it? If they're spies, it's the blame for them. Hey, hey, we're hey, not hey. spies. Honest. We look into this further. Meantime, the goose and sucking pig should be ready. I say it's time for the feast. How are you, with it? Are you hungry, boy? Yes, sir. And him? He's hungry, too. Then join us. And Merry Christmas. For no man can say Captain Blackton lacks the Christian spirit. <laughs> My right, member? You're right, Captain. <laughs> right as right. I'd have slit your gullet had you said me nay. Merry Christmas. And break out the rum barrel. <laughs> I remember that day, that long ago, the great dining board set upon trestles, the fruits, the wine, roast goose, pig, the pirates rough in their colorful patched clothing, the songs, the drinking, and stories, stories of home and sea. Such Christmases are dreamt of, and I had dreamed it to come true. George sat next to me, eyes wide and unbelieving. And after the plum pudding, we were called on to sing a carol. And as we sang, they became quiet, and each sat lost with his own thoughts of sweetness and sadness. The little man Namby, bird-like and asleep, Don Fallon, thin as a twig, a patch over one eye and the other kindly and wise. Jill and the captain with tears coursing down their cheeks. <laughs> These were my pirates, my own. day with us. Let's share with those less fortunate. Less fortunate? Who? Oh, we're all well met. The lady Alicia. No. She is our prisoner. Until ransom is paid, so she will remain. Oh, what matter if she grace our table for the evening? It has been long since a woman's been with us. Aye, aye. Very well. Send the prisoner here. Bring her from the dungeon. Then I thought of the fine lace handkerchief we had found in the stream. Would this prisoner, the Lady Alicia, would she have sent the message of distress? And how? They brought her in, and to me, she, she looked as she should have looked, the most beautiful lady in the world, gowned in silks, the pale but proud face. I fell in love with her, and I was ten. As the night wore on, the pirates grew drowsy. One after another, their heads drooped, and soon all were asleep. Even George, sitting small in his great chair, nodded. I went to the Lady Alicia's side. It was your handkerchief we found in the stream, wasn't it? Yes, I had not dared to hope. But they have you locked in a dungeon. 
Beyond my window is a running brook. I prayed that when I dropped the kerchief, it would by some happy chance be discovered. Oh, I found it all right. You are very brave to have come here. How long have they kept you in prison? Six months now. We were sailing to the Indies. Our ship was taken, and I, I alone survived. Now they hold me for ransom. That's terrible. Gosh, I wish I could do something to save you. There is nothing. I know I'm not very big, but... Maybe I could fight there them. There are too many for you. Yeah. They're all asleep. Come on, we can get away now. Let's go home. Who? Sure, our folks are going to be mad. George, we've got to save her. You could but escape and deliver a message to my father. Sure, okay. Where does he live? London. Lord Basingstoke. He will reward you well. Sure. But we got to go now. I don't want to leave you. They'll be angry when they wake up. My hope will rest in you. I shall pray for your safety and return. Gee whiz, Dan. Come on. Now go ahead. I'll be right along. Okay, but hurry up. I'll wait by the water. Will, will you be all right? Yes. Suppose I come back and you're not here. I shall try to leave a message. I'm Dan. I know. When I get older, I'll marry you. You're beautiful. I'll wait for you. You must go before they awake. I don't want to go. You will come back to me. Here. I love you. Hurry up, Dan. Gee whiz, I want to get home. They'll be mad. Mother said not to be late for dinner. We've got to save Lady Alicia. Don't forget. Okay, but hurry up. Dark. Do you know which way to go? I know. I don't want to fall in the stream and get all wet. I've got my good clothes on. You won't. I'm sorry I dropped your flashlight in. I'll save up and get you another. I don't mind. I bet it's awful late. I'm glad it's Christmas. Maybe they won't mind. We followed the tunnels one to the other. The stream flowed with us, urging us on. It was dark, but I knew the way. We felt along the damp walls of the cave. And at every step, we moved further away from my world. Suddenly, from a great distance, we saw a tiny circle of light, a dot which grew and grew until it was the size of a gold sovereign. There it is, Dan. It's the entrance. And it's still light off. I won't be late for dinner. And I was afraid. I was afraid because I knew that if I stepped out into that sunlight, I should never be able to find my way back again. Never. Hey, what are you stopping for? Why? George. If we run, we can be home before the sun goes down. For Pete's sake, Dan, what's the matter with you? I'm not coming with you. Oh, gee, what's the... I gotta go back. Go back? What do you want to do that for? I got to. I don't want to leave her. The pirates. I want to go back. Pirates? Who? Lady Alicia. Gee whiz, Dan. Come on, it was only a game. Come on. You've forgotten. I knew you would. I'm not going with you. You better. I'm going to tell your mother. You'll get it. Goodbye, George. Dan? Dan! Come back. Dan, what's the matter with you? Dan? You'll get lost. Dan! Dan! Don't go in there again. We played long enough. Come back. Come back. Dan! 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 
turned away from George and the speck of light that was outside. His voice followed me, plaintive and lonely. And then as I found the stream again, there was no sound but that of gentle water and my own steps. And the stream became a river, and the river broadened, the walls of the cave fell away, and I'd found my pirates again. It's on days like this that I remember how it used to be before I found the cave. This day in particular. Sometimes I wonder what happened to George and what it's like outside the cave. But I don't really mind. After all, the Lady Alicia kept her promise and waited for me until I grew up. Now, everything is as I'd always dreamed it in the books. Oh, Captain Blackton, well, he's still here, a little less ferocious, perhaps, than 20 years ago. Uh, Captain? Yes, Blackton. If you and my lady are ready, sir, the turkeys are cooked, and the men are waiting your pleasure. Very well, Blackton. Thank you, and a Merry Christmas. Thank you, Captain. Thank you, sir. And a Merry Christmas to you, sir. Under the direction of Norman MacDonald, Escape has brought you The Cave by Anthony Ellis. Featured in the cast were John Daner, Georgia Ellis, Peggy Weber... Jay Novello, Charlie Lung, Lou Krugman, Wilms Herbert, and Eileen Erskine. The special music for Escape was composed and conducted by Ivan Dittmars. Next week, escape with us to a placid English village and the company of an equally placid little old man who one day shook the world as H.G. Wells told it in his delightful story, The Man Who Could Work Miracles. Where does the world stand? Where is it heading as 1951 approaches? Next Sunday, CBS will bring you an exciting, timely appraisal of the world situation and some of the answers when ten top CBS News correspondents are heard in a special broadcast entitled The Challenge of the Fifties, Years of Seas. Remember, that's next Sunday afternoon on most of these same CBS stations. Now, stay tuned for Make Believe Town, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. Roy Rowan speaking. This is CBS, where you spend an hour with Frank Sinatra every Sunday afternoon on the Columbia Broadcasting System. You, finding life rather dull, dreaming again of exotic places, wishing you were somewhere else, we offer you Escape. Escape with us now to a placid English village and the company of an equally placid little man who one day shook the world, as H.G. Wells told it in his delightful story, The Man Who Could Work Miracles. Now... I might say, right in the beginning, that I ain't the kind of chap who has a naturally argumentative disposition. Oh, no. Quite the contrary. I'm a reasonable man who always takes proper thought before he speaks. And one who has a due respect for scientific truth. Why, I ain't never opened my mouth to utter a word that wasn't a pure, undiluted effect. 
That's what you say. Howsoever, when a man of inferior intellect, such as Toddy Bemis has showed himself to be more than once, when a man like that insists upon airing his ridiculous opinions in a public place such as the Long Dragon Bar, then I've got no choice but to confound him with the superior knowledge which I possesses. So you say. That's right. So I say. And if you can't contribute nothing but the same three words to this discussion, I'll thank you to admit you're defeated and shut your mouth. Well, now, Mr. Fulfinger. Easy, hey, lads. Easy does it. Well, I ask you, Constable. I'm only trying to enlighten the man from the bog of ignorance he's a-floundering in, and he keeps coming up with his infernal, so you say. Well, I'm a-wasting me words, that's all. It finds it half and half flowed across this bar the way words do. They're not a retired years ago. <laughs> hey, speaking of half and half, I'll have another of the same if you don't mind, Miss Bridges. Quite hmm. well, Constable. By Wish. all rights, Toddy Beamish, I shouldn't be wasting my time on you. But out of the goodness of my heart, I'll do it anyhow. Suit yourself. Hmm. Now, let's take, for example, that pint of hail that you're holding in your hand. It's pretty nigh empty. <laughs> well, now, supposing, for instance, if that hail was to turn into wine. I never cared much for wine. Always like ale, Betty. <laughs> now, if that hail was to turn into wine, then you'd have a miracle. So you say. So anybody says. Or, or, or take that master padlock on Miss Bridges' cash box. Now, if anyone could open that without a proper key, that'd be a ruddy miracle. You keep the <laughs> long wagon out of this. Or perhaps you ain't even aware of the proper definition of what a miracle is, her Mr. Beamish. Well, some is one kind and some is another, in a manner of speaking. If anybody left so much as tuppence on the bars a tip, that'd be a miracle, all right. Well, be that as it may. But a miracle ain't of one kind or another, oh no. A true miracle is something contrariwise to the course of nature, done by the power of will. Something what couldn't happen without being specially willed to happen. And miracles ain't possible. That is a lot, is you know. Well, I wouldn't go so far as to say they ain't. It's your ignorance that's talking. Now, look. You see that lamp sitting there on the end of the bar, burning as bright as you please? I see it right in there. Well, now, that lamp in the natural course of nature couldn't burn like that if it was turned upside down and hanging in the hair. You say it couldn't. Mr. Beamish, do you mean to tell me... All that... right, all right, maybe it couldn't. And if it did, that would be a miracle. But it will. Now... Supposing somebody was to come along, that take me, for instance, and he pointed his finger at that lamp like this and said, Turn upside down. <laughs> now, if it... Oh, 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 now. Turning and in there without no visible uh, means of support. Oh, I can't keep it up there much I longer. It's remarkable, it's highly remarkable. Uh, stop it now, Mr. Father and Gage. Stop it immediately. Uh, That's my official order. Well, look out, Constable. Look out. There uh, it goes. Uh, uh, oh. Oh. Now I'll see what you've done, Mr. Fotheringay. Uh, My best lamp chimney. Clean no more than an hour ago. Smashed to smithereens. But I, I didn't try to do it. Oh, you know, you might have caught the place afire. Most irregular. And illegal besides, like as not. No more of it now. Do you understand? But I told you, I didn't mean for you it You and to... your silly conjuring tricks. But all i done was to point my finger at it like that there, and stop I... it now. Don't you dare. Well, that's all I've done. In that case, Mr. Fulvengate, you defeat your own argument right out of your own mouth. And how is that, might I ask? If it weren't caused by some form of trickery, then what happened to that lamp was a miracle. Now then, I ain't a hold him with no blooming miracles. Held with him or not, as the case may be, Mr. Fotheringay. But you just stood right there and performed a real, true, honest, genuine miracle. <laughs> It weren't a matter of being asked to leave the Long Dragon, you understand. I'd already had me mind set on going anyhow. A place what's full of ignorant superstition ain't the kind of place for a man of rational intellect to be doing his thinking in. And thinking was just what was called for. On the one hand, I wasn't ready to swallow no miracle theory. But, on the other hand, 
I wasn't able to recollect no scientific principle that might account for that which had occurred. As you might say, the question had dissolved itself into a uh, dilemma. Well, my landlady, Mrs. Tetherington, was sitting up in the parlour when I come in. Good evening, Mr. Fotheringay. But I can't recall saying anything to her. Very well, Mr. Fotheringay. I went straight to my own room, closed my door and lit the candle. Then I sat on the edge of my bed, grappling with the problem in a heroic fashion and trying to puzzle out the ultimate solution. Well, now, that wasn't no easy thing to do. It couldn't have happened... But it had happened. Which ain't logic, no matter how you look at it. Why, it'd be the same situation if I was to point my finger at that candle there and say, be raised up in the air. <laughs> hey, me. Hanging there like a blooming firefly. But it's contrary. Was it? Whoop, there it goes. No, no. Black as you're at. Oh, dear, now where in the tarnation did that confounded thing get to? <laughs> Well, at any rate, there should be some matches around here somewhere. Oh, here. Maybe I could... Yes. Let there be a match in me, hand. <laughs> well, now. Just like that. Oh, the safety match. Not a blooming good that scan. Oh! Oh, dear, a half a mona. Uh, maybe I don't need a match. Maybe I could... Yeah. Candle, wherever you are, be lighted. <laughs> Here now, not in the middle of my bed. None of that now. <laughs> well, open it up. It isn't locked. Mr. Fotheringay, might I inquire what's going on up here? Can't you recognise a man who's got his hands full of troubles? Mr. Fotheringay, why is smoke coming out of that bed? Because it caught on fire, that's why. Oh, I wall comforter with all burned in it. Taking lighted candles to bed with you, indeed. I'm not taking no candles nowhere, and I'll thank you to leave me the privacy of my own bedchamber. You've been drinking. On the contrary, I've been cogitating upon matters of science, which is far beyond the range of your feeble uh, intellect. Well... Mrs. Tetherington, I might remind you that good steady rumours such as a man like myself ain't so easy to come by nowadays, with which I will bid you a highly a respectful a good a night. Well... <laughs> My old vulture... Don't know who she's talking to. Me. A bloke what's only got to point his finger and say, B? And it is. Oh, blimey. If I ain't suddenly got the power to perform miracles. Real, genuine miracles. <laughs> Escape, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, returns in just a moment. Tomorrow, New Year's Day, CBS will bring you exclusively the broadcast of the Rose Bowl game between the University of Michigan and the University of California. Don't miss this colorful, exciting event, the Rose Bowl game. Michigan, the Western Conference champions, against California, fighting for the West Coast's first victory in the present series. It'll be here tomorrow, New Year's Day, on most of these same CBS stations. And now... Back to Escape. Well, next evening after work, I went walking down the lane that leads around Millsdale's Pond, attempting to put me mental processes into order, as you might say. Mostly, I kept trying to cogitate on some honest to Betsy miracle that I might up and perform. But it ain't such an easy matter for a chap who's unaccustomed to goings on of that nature. No, what I wanted was the genuine article. You understand? No, no little shenanigans, but one to make people stop and say, Blimey now, if that ain't a real downright miracle for you. And then, all of a sudden, I had it. I just happened to recollect a chap somewhere who stuck his staff in the ground and commanded it to blossom. So, I poked my walking stick into the edge of the turf, I backed off a wee bit, I pointed my finger at it and said, Walking stick, 
become a blooming bush of flowering posies. <laughs> ah, roses, by heaven. I've done it. Just like that fellow in the opera. Now then, what's all this here? Oh, Constable Winch, confound that man in here. Cease and desist, whatever it is. In the name of the law. Uh, here, you, you there, Rosebush. Go back now, fast. Have a mind there, who it is you're throwing. Bramble bushes, that. It... There. Oh, confound you, blundering idiot. Uh, Who's conducting nefarious activities under the cover of darkness, assaulting an officer, engaging the pursuit of his natural... Well, so it's you, Mr. Fotheringay. The fact being self-evident, Mr. Winch, I will not bother myself to answer. So you'll not bother yourself to answer, eh? And maybe you'll also deny that you just threw a great heavy mass of foliage at me? I do deny it. Then no doubt it just up and flew through the air, all by itself. A Constable Winch, you have just hit the ruddy nail right on the head. Oh, oh. some more of them blasted anky pan conjuring tricks of yours. Is that it? On the contrary, it was merely a small miracle. You don't say so. In which case, his honour might enjoy hearing you tell about it. So come along. I'll do nothing of the sort. Oh, oh, oh. resist you, <laughs> officer. That'll be another charge against oh. you. Charge, indeed. <laughs> Mr. Winch, you can yes. take your charges and, and go to Hades. <laughs> hey. Hey. Um, Constable. Mr. Winch. Oh, blimey, if he ain't gone and disappeared complete like. Now, I wonder if he... Hmm. I'm thinking this miracle business is a bit touchy. Why, a man might find himself in a whole peck of trouble before he learns the knack of the thing. Oh, I'd better go and get myself some real professional advice right away. <laughs> Hmm? Ah. Oh, good evening to you, friend. A very pleasant evening to you. <laughs> and the same to you as many of them, Mr. Maitig. Uh, that is, uh, your reverendship. Oh, no, no, no formality now. None at all. You just call me Mr. Maitig. Oh, well, now, thank you kindly, your uh, Maitigship. Won't you step inside? Uh, I'm much obliged to you, Mr. Reverendship. Uh, this way, Mr... Oh, I can't say that I caught the name. Fotheringay. A George, a W, a Fotheringay. Oh, yes, yes. Not from my parish. Well, uh, yes, yes, I attended services <coughs> last Christmas. Indeed. So many people did last Christmas. Well, here we are, Mr. Fotheringay. Uh, take a chair. Uh, it's uh, a Fotheringay. Oh, no, 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 not, not that one. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's weak. I've often thought of doing something about it uh, sometime. Uh, yes, yes, that one's fine. Well, uh, yeah. if you remind me before I leave, Mr. Mayship, and I'll put that little piece of furniture to rights for you. Oh, then you're a carpenter. Well, only in a manner of speaking, as you might say. Mm, well, now, uh, Mr. Motheringsay, feel entirely free to lay your burdens upon my shoulders. Uh, well, the fact is... Uh, the matter which I come here to talk about might be considered of a somewhat uh, a delicate nature. Oh, no, think nothing of it. Uh, please feel free to speak, uh, uh, Will, uh, freely. My housekeeper retires very early. Oh, oh, no, your reverendship. Nothing like that. Well, then, uh, like, like, like what? Uh, well, the subject about which I'm inquiring is miracles. Oh, miracles, yes, yes, indeed. Miracles? Uh, any special kind of miracles? Oh, yes. The kind which I perform as myself. I see. And what sort of miracles do you perform? Well, for one thing, I've uh, just finished sending Constable Winch to Hades. Hades? Oh, 
Indeed. Of course, when I realised what had happened, I had him transferred to San Francisco, uh, wherever that is. I'm sure he'll like San Francisco much better. Uh, I see you don't believe me. I can't say I blame you either. Well, after all, Mr. Dothering Ray. Uh, Fothering Gay? Well... Very well, there's nothing else to do but for me to up and perform a few miracles before we go any further. Well, that's, uh, that's very interesting, I'm sure. Well, now, now, you take that jar of tobacco there on the table, for instance. Now, suppose I just point my finger at it like this and become a bowl of violet. <laughs> well, that's very interesting. Ah, oh. see? A bowl of violet. Gore blood. <clears throat> I mean, uh, so it is. Of course, it ain't nothing very spectacular, Your Reverendship, but it's the sort of miracle a man can pass without tangling himself up in a mass of trouble. It's extraordinary. Very well, well extraordinary. Uh, uh, you can see for yourself there are uh, real violets. Indeed. Uh, 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 indeed. Now, mm. uh, you take this for example. Um, become a bowl of fish. <laughs> Mm. No, 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 not that kind. Live fish in a goldfish bowl, swimming around. Now. <laughs> ah, well, that's better. It's amazing. Uh, how did you do it? Just told it to. That's all? That's all. When I tells a thing to do it, it does it. It's incredible. Come on me sudden, like you might say. Um, well, I'd like to know if it's real, genuine miracles or if it ain't. Well, uh, uh... Well, well, seeing as our miracles ought to come under your reverendship's special province, more or less. Well, uh, yes, yes, indeed. Um, uh, more uh, academic fashion. Uh, these are more, well, uh, more astonishing. Well, as far as I can tell, there ain't no limit to it. Like, for instance, uh, a, a bowl of fish. Turn into a pigeon. <laughs> oh, good heavens. Oh, look at the thing. I say. Well, you know, none know. of that. You stay away from Mr. Maydick now. Well, perhaps I'd best uh, hey, hey, become that same uh, uh, jar of tobacco again. <laughs> well, Reverend, what do you think about it? It's amazing. It's the most extraordinary thing I've ever seen in my life. I ever expected to see. I I've got to think about it and consider the possibilities. Well, I might come back in the morning. Oh, no, 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 I wouldn't hear of it. Um, look here. I was about to dine when you rang. Uh, wonder if you'd join me. Of course, I'm afraid there's only cold mutton. Well, now, uh, perhaps there's something else you might like uh, better. Oh, anything. Frankly, I've grown to hate the sight of them. But you don't mean that... But why not? Just name it. Um, <laughs> a pheasant. I haven't tasted pheasant in years. Oh, then now is the time. Let there be a pheasant on the table. <laughs> no, 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 not, not like that. Let it be dead and roasted and ready to eat. <laughs> oh, look at it. Oh, it's beautiful. Mm, smells good, too. Perhaps we'd better, uh, yes. Let there be two pheasants. <laughs> and, uh, and, and truffles. And truffles. <laughs> and maybe some uh, oysters. Two dozen oysters. Oh, I love oh. Yeah, well, we better make it three dozen. <laughs> oh, uh, and, and some cheddar. Oh, we must have some cheddar. Oh, yes. A pound of cheddar. <laughs> and now, what to drink, your reverendship, uh... Champagne? <laughs> well, well, I really shouldn't. <laughs> well, perhaps a small bottle of Moselle. Six bottles of Moselle, oh. a keg of star, <laughs> and a case of champagne. <laughs> <laughs> There wasn't no mistake about it. I'd come to the right place for certain. Once Mr. Mady got over his first astonishment, he turned out full of ideas for brand new miracles. Things I might never have thought of, like as not. Well, we polished off that meal in no time at all. And an hour later, we was out walking in the dark streets of the village, turning out miraculous jobs so fast I fairly wore out my finger a pointing with it. I couldn't begin to tell you all the things we'd done there in a couple of hours, but... Well, we installed a new railway line, we drained Flinders Swamp and turned it into a meadow, we cured the vicar's warts, 
paved all the roads, eliminated taxation, reformed the Lord Mayor, and made all the girls in the village beautiful. Oh, these weren't any of your eighthly miracles. All of these, these were big. And we went right on turning them out, one every two minutes, just as regular as clockwork. Well, by midnight we passed clean through the village, and we were walking along the lane by Millsdale's Pond, fairly tired out by all of that thinking and pointing and performing of miracles. Uh, Mr. Fotheringay, I've just thought of another one. Oh, indeed. And what might it be? Uh, the village clock. Uh, listen to her. Oh, it's terrible. Oh, that's true enough. It hasn't got a very melodious sound to it. Well, then, let's give them a good clock. A great, rich, booming one, shall we? All right, Mr. Maydig. Uh... Let that there clock become a genuine London-style cathedral clock. <laughs> oh, that's much better. Much better. Oh, the people of this village are going to have a big surprise when they wake up in the morning. After all we've done for them tonight. Well, I might say that there's one or two things that we've done that I ain't so sure about, like... Uh... Turning every drop of alcoholic beverage into plain water, for instance. Oh, well, there's nothing to worry about, Mr. Fotheringay. You can always turn out a miraculous pint or two for your own purposes, and, and, and it will reform all the drunkards in the village. Well, perhaps so. At any rate, we might as well wait and see what comes of it. Well, what do we perform next? Well, I really don't know. I can't think of another single miracle that we haven't already... Well, half a moment, Mr. Maydig. Yes, yes? I just thought of one of my own I'd better take care of. Oh? Yeah. Let Constable Winch be right back in San Francisco again. <laughs> See, he might be catching a boat or a train or something. You understand. I mean, I, I thought the best idea is just to keep sending him back there every once in a while. No, mm -hmm. oh, I doubt that you have anything to worry about. San Francisco is some distance away, you know. Uh, I, I, I keep trying to think of one more miracle. A big one. Something worthy of ending the night with, but I... Oh, that's well, no. Huh? I say, there is one, you know. Oh, such as... You see that moon, Mr. Fotheringay? Well, naturally. Nigh on to full, by the looks of it. Remember Joshua? Joshua? Hey, Joshua? Oh, now, come off it now. <laughs> it would be a wondrous thing to see. Well, now, that's a pretty tall order, making the moon stand still. Well, actually, it only appears to stand still. What really happens is that the, the Earth stops rotating. But well, I think we'd better not go monkeying around with the universe. Well, you probably don't have the power to do it anyway. It's really a superior class of miracle, you know. Oh, I've got the power, all right, but I'm not so sure it's a good idea. I could do it if I wanted to. Oh, oh, yes. Yes, of course you could. Well, perhaps we'd better get along home. Well, half a moment now. I, I might just leave it stop for a little while. If, if you could stop it at all. Oh, well, now, if that's the way you feel, you just take a look at this. Eh? The whole blinking world? Stop rotating! <laughs> yeah, now, what's all this? I, I didn't order no wind. Bothering girl! What have you done? I don't rightly know. Look out, things are starting to blow loose. Oh, you confounded, blundering idiot! Oh. Uh, duck your head! Here comes the Lord Mayor's sheep! Uh, duck yourself! Here comes the Lord Mayor! Oh, oh you better lie down in the ditch before we get blown away. Oh, it's getting worse all the time. I can't see to pull my wits together. Oh, I got it. When the earth stopped rotating, everything on the surface kept right on moving. Why? Six hundred miles an hour. Houses, cows, the wind, everything. It's a scientific principle. And a lot of good that does. Stop it, man. Do something. Do... Woo! Mr. Maydick. Wow, Mr. Maydick. Oh, blimey, if he ain't blown clean away. Gone. Oh, now I've got myself a fine... into a fine kettle of fish for certain... If only there weren't so much confusion, perhaps I could... Ooh, now, that's it. It's, it's the only answer. All right, now. Let, let nothing happen until I say the word go. And when I do, let everything go back exactly like it was just before I turned that grooming lamp upside down to the long dragon bar. 
And at the same time, let me lose this here miraculous power complete light. Just forget all about it. You got it now? Everything just as it were. No more miracles. Just let me forget the whole thing. All right then. You ready? Go! <laughs> That's only what you say. And the same as anybody else might say who's got the least bit of scientific knowledge inside of their thicker heads. Aren't I right, Constable Winch? Uh, couldn't I actually say, Mr. Fotheringay? The subject ain't exactly in my province, you know. <clears throat> now that are the same as the... Right you are, Constable Winch. Irregardless, Mr. Beamish, miracles ain't possible. So you say. Perhaps you don't even know what a miracle is. Perhaps if I was to point my finger at that lamp there on the bar and tell it to turn upside down, I suppose you think it might do it. Well, I wouldn't say it wouldn't. You wouldn't say it wouldn't, Mr. Toddy Beamish. You haven't got a brain in your head, and I'm only wasting the time trying to enlighten you. There you are, Mrs. Miss Bridges. Thank you kindly, Mr. Fotheringay. I'll be dropping in again when the place ain't quite so crowded. And so I bid you all a respectful, good a night. <laughs> well, Tuddy, I'd say you got the best of the argument tonight. Glory be, will you take a look at this? What's up, Miss Bridges? Sixpence. He left me sixpence right here on the bar, big as anything. And so he did. The like of it ain't never happened before. Saints preserve us if it ain't a downright blooming miracle. That's what it is, a downright blooming miracle. <laughs> Under the direction of Norman MacDonald, Escape is brought to you The Man Who Could Work Miracles by H.G. Wells, especially adapted for Escape by Les Crutchfield. Ben Wright was starred as George Fotheringay. Featured in the cast were John Daner, Lou Krugman, Eileen Erskine, and Wilms Herbert. The special music for Escape was composed and adapted by Del Castillo. Next week, Escape with us to the windswept peak of Mount Everest and the story of a man who sacrificed everything to climb it. As Leonard Lee tells it in his gripping story, Conquest. This afternoon, CBS presents a one-hour-long program for all who are wondering where the world is heading. It's called Challenge of the Fifties, Years of Crises. And it will feature Edward R. Murrow and Ted Outstanding CBS Correspondents. It follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is CBS, where you spend an hour with Frank Sinatra every Sunday afternoon on the Columbia Broadcasting System. You, finding life rather dull, dreaming again of exotic places, wishing you were somewhere else, we offer you Escape. Escape with us now to the windswept peak of Mount Everest and the story of a man who sacrificed everything to climb it, as Leonard Lee tells it in his gripping story, Conquest. You want to know what it's like up there? I'll tell you. It's a constant torrent of wind and snow. It's jagged rocks, iced as slick as a knife blade. No man has ever set foot on the place. It's as bleak and barren and lonely as the moon. But it's Everest. Mount Everest. And when you stand on its peak and know that every inch of the world is below you, there in the palm of your hand 
lies the final conquest. We're not going to make the mistakes Norton and Somerville made. We'll spend the first night at Camp 5 and the second night at Camp 6. That brings us to 26,800 feet. Are you going to make the north face to the coal wire, Mallory? No, that's what they did. We're going to make a frontal attack, direct. We'll follow the crest of the northeast ridge to the peak. Now, that's tougher climbing. The only chance, Hamilton. And we'll take oxygen on the last dash. Well, best of luck, Mallory. Thanks. Watched them as they left Camp 4, 23,000 feet on the face of Everest. Mallory and Irvine, stocked with their provisions. Pitons, carabiners, hammers, axes, packboard snowshoes. Two diminishing silhouettes against the powder snow of the Rongbuk Glacier, finally disappearing behind a jut in the North Col. We watched them and prayed for them, and we hated them. Because we weren't part of that final run to the top. Two days later, June 10th, 1924, a man crawled toward us in the snow. We ran out of the tent to get him. It was Odell, our geologist from Camp 6. He could hardly speak. Challoner, brandy. Yes, here. Here, Odell, drink this. Thanks. What uh, happened? I saw them. I, I saw the top. Did they make it? I don't know. They were about 800 feet from the peak. Mallory and Irvine. At the last step. The last step. Then the mist closed in. It's only a matter of time. They'll make it. Hamilton. No man can live up there. There's nothing to breathe. And that was the last word. Somewhere in that jungle of ice, their frozen bodies lay. The peak was still unscaled. We looked out at the expanse of desolation stretched out before us. We looked out and up. The calm arrogance of the summit was wrapped in mist. From that moment on, there was only one purpose to my life. To climb that mountain. Sorry, Hamilton, no more money. Look, Ben, I can make it. I know I can. I've been up there. I know every crevasse. I know every rock up to Camp 6. So what's the point? So you reach the peak. So what? The bear went over the mountain. What did he see but the other side? All right, all right. I don't expect you to understand why people climb mountains. It's a kind of insanity. Let's let it go at that. But from your viewpoint, look at the publicity. Grisham sports equipment used on the first ascent of Mount Everest, the highest mountain in the world. It'll be worth a million dollars to you. You have a point there. The initial expense, including everything, will be about twenty-five thousand dollars. Twenty-five thousand? It's out of the question. Best I could do would be fifteen. I knew you'd say that. The what? Fifteen thousand is plenty. Well, what do you say, Chaloner? Are you with us? Well, the last time it was pretty rough, but I. I'm always fool enough to try again. Fine. Uh, who have you got lined up so far? Langmuir. He's pretty young, but he's got a lot of energy and a lot of experience for his age. Uh-huh. Newt Revere, you know him. Oh. Four of us will lead. That sounds pretty good. How about financing? The Mount Everest Committee can't supply it all, so I got most of what we need from Grisham. He makes sports equipment. It's a publicity deal. I see. Well, it's March now. We ought to have our base camp established by mid-April, and then we'll have about a month of climbing before the monsoon hits. Yes, that's what I planned. We'll be leaving in about ten days. Can you be ready? Yes, I'll be ready, Hamilton. And so will Everest. We arrived in Darjeeling on April 2nd. We hired Sherpa porters and Tibetan guides. Bought more tents and scientific equipment and headed toward Everest, a hundred miles away. But it was almost three times as far snaking through the gorges of the eastern Himalayas... Our second night out, we camped in the sweltering swamp jungle of Sikkim. Uh, 
I can't sleep. Try a wet towel on your head. I've tried everything. Hamilton? Yes? Can you sleep? No. If you ask me, we should have taken the south slope. Gets more sun, less ice. Do you hear me, Hamilton? Yes, I heard you. Well, why didn't we try the south slope? Because the north slope is explored and possible. Besides, Nepal won't grant permission. Uh, let's try to sleep, hmm? Can't sleep. Too hot. Can you sleep, Revere? I could try if it weren't for all this talk. Hold it. There's somebody outside. Yes, who is it? The head porter. Oh, you better tell him to come in, Hamilton. Come in. Yes, Teach Bear, what is it? Not go. Not go to Chomalungma. What? Signs very bad for mountain. Death. Death, I see. What signs? Bend of the trees and the stars. No good. Not go to mountain. All right, Teach Bear. How much? Huh. I do not understand. The bend of the trees is worth how much? Oh, signs are bad. Five hundred dollar. Get back to your tent. Four hundred dollar. Four hundred dollar. The blessing from Holy Lama of Wrong Book. All right, but that's the last holdup. You understand? <laughs> I'm sure signs will be better. Now get back to your tent. Oh, gladness! <laughs> gladness. <laughs> There's a good girl for you. The sheriff has one come around for more money in the middle of the night. Well, good night, gentlemen. It's too blasted hot. Enjoy the heat, Langmuir. In another 48 hours, you'll wish you had every steaming bit of it. We pushed on through the Sikkim to the Tibetan Plateau. The mercury plunged to zero. The wind and snow lashed at us. We'd begun to climb... We stopped at the monastery on the wrong book for the Lama's blessing to satisfy the porters. Moved on up the glacier. Twelve below now. And then, in a momentary clearing of clouds, I saw it once again. Everest and the white plume flowing from its peak. We were at 16,000 feet. It was at this point we established our base camp. All right, Chaloner, tell them what we've decided. All right. Camp one will be at 18,000. Camp two will be at 20. Camp three at 21. Camp four at 23. I will each carry oxygen. The tanks are light, but we'll have enough to last us for about a week if we use it right. When we get near the top, the routine will be 15 minutes of climbing, one hour's rest. We're not making the mistakes Mallory did. Are there any questions? Yes. How do we pair off, Hamilton? Chaloner and Revere, Langmuir and myself. We'll travel together up to Camp 4, then we separate into doubles. The rest of the men will be dropped off at the camps as we move along to maintain relays. Anything else? Yeah. I think we're going to make it. We climbed over the icy slopes, establishing camps as we went. Finally, after days of driving forward inch by inch, we reached the North Cow, just seven feet, 7,000 feet from the summit of the mountain. The wind hurtled down in the slopes and a sweeping gale, hard and cold as rock. Mallory had camped here just days from his death. Night closed in. The lack of oxygen had numbed the mind and fired the temper. Our civility was suffocated. We were savages, nothing more. We sat around an alcohol flame, the four of us, breathing hard, staring at each other's bearded faces, while outside the wind beat at the tent flap. Gotta to have oxygen. You've had plenty. Can't breathe. You can't breathe. Just take it easy. Any more oxygen, your body will stop regulating to the altitude, then you won't be able to do without the stuff. My heart's going like a trip, Emma. It'll get worse. I gotta have some, I tell you. Sit down. Uh, stay away from that tank. I can't breathe. Hamilton, I can't breathe. I said stay away. Uh, All right, come on. Now, get up. Oxygen. Please. Sit up and behave yourself. I'm the leader of this expedition, and you'll do as you're told. Here, Langmuir. Give me a hand. <laughs> no. Let him lie there, Chaloner. 
You'll be all right in the morning. In the morning, Revere and Chaloner set out to establish Camp 5 at 24,000. Langmuir and I watched them go, chopping their way up the ridge to the northeast shoulder. When we lay down, waiting, trying to conserve our strength, Langmuir stared upward, his lips moving in prayer, deep sunk eyes, chest heaving. The next day, we set out, following Chaloner's marks. boosted him to the narrow ledge. He grasped for the edge, his fingers clawing at the smooth rock. I felt his foot slip from my shoulder. I grabbed for his leg and missed. Black space sank below us, and he fell. I won't die! Escape under the direction of Norman MacDonald returns in just a moment. CBS wishes to call your attention to the debut of three programs today. Bill Goodwin's entertaining Dollar a Minute, a new 15-minute news program featuring Eric Severide, chief of CBS Washington Bureau, and Charlie Wilde, private detective, which has moved to CBS from another network. And now, back to Escape. As Langmuir fell, I braced myself against rock, waiting for the rope around my waist to pull taut. And when it jerked, it burned into my flesh and tore me into space. I scrambled under the double weight, lunging desperately for a hold. I drew my arm around the snub of rock just at the edge and started to pull up. Slowly, I reached the ledge, gasping for air. I looked down. Langmuir was swinging at rope's end and a small arc above the yawning emptiness, just a hundred feet below me. The wind tore at my face. My arms were aching. I felt them slipping from the rock, and then I saw Langmuir grab a handhold and start to climb. And the rope loosened, and I relaxed. He was all right. I sniffed at my oxygen, but it made me drunk. Three hours, I told myself. Three hours to show him. Hamilton. Hamilton, are you, you all right? Uh, it's Chaloner. Are, are you all right? Uh, yes. Yes, I'm all right. How, how did I get here? Langmuir brought you in. Uh, I must have passed off. Yes, you certainly did. Where's Revere? A rock fall. He must have been killed instantly. Three of us. Three of us left. We haven't even established Camp Six. Look, Hamilton. I'm not a young man anymore. I'm, I'm 38. That's fine for selling shoes in a department store. Not quite up to this kind of thing. I just about reached my limit, Hamilton. You, you and Langmuir. You two will have to climb alone from here on up. I think we can do it. I'll stay here at Camp 5. All right, Chaloner. I hope I get a good sleep. Because tomorrow I've got a date with a mountain. Ah, it's quiet outside. It's a wonderful day. It's the best we've had yet. What do you think of cutting the north face across the couloir? Making the final ascent directly up the western part of the north side. No, no, we'll take Norton through it as we planned. 
So what about Camp 6? Well, if we can establish it at 27,000, the final dash will be short. That'll double our chances. Well, Langmuir, what do you say? You want to go on? Look. Look up there. What? The mist is beginning to clear. There it is, Hamilton. The summit. The top of the world. We started up again, up toward the summit. Our altitude was 25,000. We planned to camp at 27, leaving only 2,000 feet for the final spurt. We hunted desperately to the sheer face of the mountain, the freezing wind whipping up from the great couloir, tearing at our grasp. All the next day, we inched upward, our hearts pounding. By nightfall, we had only reached 26,000. We had to camp or die. Oh, and Paulus found a small recess. We pitched our tent over it, fastening the stage with pitons. We huddled together in the cold darkness. Langmuir was exhausted. Oh. I heard him gasping in the weak air. <sighs> my arms and legs were swollen with pain, my lungs bursting. The top seemed miles away. Every ache in my body urged me down, down to the firm, warm earth. But the peak, only 3,000 feet. The white plume peak. Twenty-six thousand. Only twenty-six thousand. We'll never make it, Hamilton. You can see it in the daylight. The peak, Langmuir. We'll go like, like Mallory went up there. Suffocation. We'll make it. Suffocation. No air. Nothing to breathe. Stop it, Langmuir. He's got to go. Go back. We're not going back. We're going to the top. We've got to go back. 3,000 feet, that's all. 3,000 feet and we're there. Mallory, he couldn't breathe. He's here somewhere. Dead. Frozen dead. We'll make it. Tomorrow morning we're going back. Langmuir, we've climbed tougher ones than this in the Rockies. The slopes aren't hard. From here on it's simple. We'll Hamilton. make it, Langmuir. We've got to go back. We're not going back. You understand? We're going to make it. Hamilton! Listen. Listen to me. If you try to turn back, I'll kill you. The mountain wasn't ice and rock to us anymore. It was a human force, an arrogant, wild challenge. Defiant, fighting conquest with choking cold and the constant earth pull downward. Death didn't matter. My life a Langmuir. That was the top, and we were going to reach it. In the morning, we started up again. We moved like automatons, not daring to think or feel. Moved up by instincts. And then it happened. Langmuir slipped again, and I plunged my pickaxe into a crack and waited for a sharp tug on the waist rope. It came. I pressed myself against the rock, waiting for the slack that told me that he'd regained his foothold. And suddenly, above the high wind, I heard a massive rumble. I felt the earth shaking itself to pieces. Avalanche!
Everest. I'm going to beat you, Everest. I'm going to the top. I'm going to the top. There was no time. There was no space. There was only the mountain and me. I climbed. I kept climbing. The sky darkened. The wind rose. The air was like a blade in my throat, but I kept going. And when it was too dark to climb, I dug myself into a hollow place. And I lay there, thinking of home, of the sanity of the open fire, of the comfort I'd left behind. Night on Everest. <laughs> Night on Everest and the terrible wind. Morning broke milder and clear. I left the hollow and looked upward through the glare of the sun. The slopes were more gentle, the holes easier. It was as if Everest had suddenly relaxed its guard, for there, just above me, lay the few yards of level terrain which formed my goal. I started again, moving upward, senseless to pain. Hours later, the ground leveled and I stopped crawling. I lifted my head, and around me, in every direction, clouds and peaks. Below me, the black outline of the earth. I'd made it. I was the first man ever to reach the peak of Mount Everest. I forced myself to my feet, weaving dizzily. All the pain, all the intense agony of the altitude and the climb was forgotten now. I looked down at the magnificent peaks of the surrounding Himalayas. I couldn't believe that I'd done the impossible. There was a small camera in my knapsack. I took pictures of every horizon. I walked around the summit my summit, drunk with the knowledge of what I'd done. And then, suddenly I stopped. For there, wedged into a crack of rock, something bright and gold shone up at me. I bent down and pulled it out. It was a cigarette case. It bore the initials G-L-M. George Lee Mallory. <laughs> I stood there trembling, the cigarette case in my hand. An instant before, I'd experienced the elation of the greatest possible triumph. And now there was only defeat. Defeat and the indescribable hate for a dead man. Oh, how he must have smiled as he went to his death, knowing that the second man to reach the top would find his proof. The second man to reach the top. I was only the second man. And then it came to me. Why must anyone know? Why must I tell the world what I'd found? Mallory was gone. He wouldn't hear the applause. It would be me, Chase Hamilton, the man who had conquered Everest. I took a small plate of metal from my wallet and wedged it into the rock. It read, Hamilton Everest Expedition, 1925. Then I strapped on my sack. I looked below me. It would be a difficult descent. But there was only one direction to go now. Down. you at about a thousand feet from the peak. Is that right, Mr. Hamilton? Yes, that's right. Challoner found me. He brought me back to Camp 6. Uh, how come Langmuir didn't go to the top with you? He died, gentlemen. The rope broke and he fell. 
Langmuir deserved a lot of credit, though. Without him, I never could have gotten near the summit. Well, how does it feel, Mr. Hamilton? How does it feel to be acclaimed as the first man to climb the highest mountain in the world? Well, gentlemen, I feel as if... As if... If you could just give our papers a statement of some kind of... Uh, how does it feel to be the very first? Yes, sir. We want to hear that. You don't climb a mountain just for fame and glory, gentlemen. You climb it for something more personal than that. And you can't lie to yourself. I'm afraid I don't understand. You were the first. No, gentlemen. Not quite the first. George Lee Mallory reached the top last year. I found his cigarette case wedged in a rock on the summit. This cigarette case. Smoke, gentlemen. Under the direction of Norman MacDonald, Escape has brought you Conquest by Leonard Lee, especially adapted for Escape by David Ellis. Bill Conrad was starred as Hamilton. Featured in the cast were Larry Dobkin, Ramsey Hill, Lou Krugman, Jack Crucian, Larry Thor, and Ben Wright. The special music for Escape was composed and conducted by Del Castillo. <laughs> Next week, escape with us to Western Europe and the story of a futile attempt to save a beautiful girl from the clutches of the most cold-blooded political organization on earth as Anthony Ellis tells it in his exciting story, A Bullet for Mr. Smith. Next Tuesday evening, CBS has a big treat in store for all of you. Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy, Amos and Andy, Bob Hope, Mary Martin, Judy Garland, and a raft of other stars will be on hand to salute Bing Crosby, who is celebrating his 20th year in show business. Be sure and join them on Tuesday. This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Finding life rather dull? Dreaming again of exotic places? Wishing you were somewhere else? We offer you Escape. Escape with us now to Western Europe and an exciting story about the most murderous group of men on Earth as Anthony Ellis tells it in A Bullet for Mr. Smith. I've been asked to take the job because as a freelance correspondent in Europe, I could travel anywhere and talk to anybody without arousing suspicion. I would be working for the French intelligence office. And since I was unmistakably American, it was hoped that enemy agents would be slow to discover me as a danger to them. Five days after I accepted the job, I was told to go to a little movie on the left bank in Paris where I would make my first contact. I went, bought a ticket, and found my way to the 15th row, fourth seat from the aisle. Uh, excuse me. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, uh, excuse me. Hello. Uh, 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 excuse me. Yes? Could you tell me the time? The time? Please. 
Nine o'clock, monsieur. Nine. Exactly? Nine, exactly. <laughs> the man we are looking for calls himself Smith. He may be English, but we don't think so. Where do I find him? We don't know. He was in Paris two days ago, but we have an idea he's headed for Switzerland. Any description? Very meager. About six foot, 180 pounds. Dark, small triangular scar on upper lip. Okay. There is a tobacco shop in a village called Devon. It's on the Swiss border. Honest name is Mont, one of our men. Better go there. Get Smith. Kill him if you have to. Right. <laughs> <laughs> It concerned the plans of one of Western Europe's greatest defenses against invasion, the new rocket bases in France. Somebody had gained access to all the details of those rocket bases, but it remained to find out who, and then to stop him before he could get them out of the country. By midnight, I was on my way to the Swiss border. The next afternoon, I reached Divun and found the tobacco shop of my contact, Mark. I'd like some tobacco, something different. Of course. I make a blend. Perhaps oh. you will be good enough to judge it. Ah. Blend de Mont. You are the Mont? I am, monsieur. Um, you've been highly recommended in Paris. I'm buying the tobacco for a friend of mine, Mr. Smith. Uh, Mr. Smith. One moment, please. One must be so careful. This way, please. All right. You have credentials? Yeah. Right here in my wallet. You are Mr. Hickok? What? No. no. That's the man who made the wallet. Oh. I'm Alan Rogers. Of course. Thank you. Now we talk business. Sit down, please. Thanks. First, who is Mr. Smith? I don't know. Uh, that's a help. Let me explain. We know there is a Mr. Smith. But as to his true identity... Okay, we'll get to that later. You think he's got the information? No, not yet. Otherwise, he would not still be here. Where is he now? Across the border at Nyon. He appears to be a very rich Englishman, spending his time at Lake Geneva. He was in Paris a couple of days ago. Perhaps he was. What do you mean? Perhaps he was. I am not trying to be mysterious, Mr. Rogers. I said... Perhaps he was because Mr. Smith may be a number of people. Or a number of people may be Mr. Smith. Oh, wait a minute. Let me get this straight. Are we looking for a gang who call themselves Smith or one man? I don't know. All I can tell you is that he or they are very clever and very dangerous. We had one operative working in Nyon. He became friendly with a Mr. Smith. They went boating on the lake. Our man did not return. An accident, said Mr. Smith. Ah. Wait. Stay here, please. Yeah, sure. Good afternoon, mademoiselle. How may I serve you? A pack of Demurier cigarettes, please. Demurier? I'm afraid, mademoiselle, that I do not stock the bread. It's awfully hard to get here. All right, a uh, player, please. Certainly. Any luck, my dear? I'm afraid not. Only players. I, uh, I just remembered. Du Maurier, was it not? There may be some in the back room. <laughs> I ran 
into the front room, but got only a glimpse of the man as he jumped into a closed car. He was tall and wore a mustache. I, I, I couldn't see the girl. Mark lay beside the counter, a package of players clutched in his dying hand. I knelt beside him. He was trying. Trying hard. Go on, go on. What is it? Say it. No. Yeah, yeah, Neil. Mr. Smith. Grand Hotel. He was dead. So I notified the local police and then took a bus the seven miles to New York. I signed the register at the desk of the Grand Hotel and turned to follow the page to my room when oh, I... oh, 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 I'm so sorry. Oh, it's my fault. I never look where I'm going. I hope you didn't break the mirror. Oh, no, it's... You're American. Yes. New England? Vermont. Wonderful. I went to Bennington. Oh? My name's Mary Donnelly. My name is Rogers, Alan Rogers. Oh, I'm so homesick for some good American <laughs> talk. Will, will you buy me a drink? Why, sure. There's something about meeting someone from home when you're in a foreign country, especially a girl, that is, most girls, but not Mary Donnelly. I'd never met her before. But I knew her voice. She was the girl in Mont's tobacco shop. She'd been with whoever killed the French agent. And I had a hunch. That was Mr. Smith. And so my parents, being filthy rich, decided the best way for me to forget the cab was to send me to Europe for a year. So, here I am. Huh? Nice way to forget a cab. What about you? Hmm? What are you doing in Switzerland? Vacation. I had a job in Paris and got tired and decided to come here. I wanted to see the rest of Europe before it blew up. Oh. What? You sound disappointed. Oh, no, not really. I thought perhaps you might be a secret service man or something. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being romantic. You do look the type, you know. Oh? Is there a type? Oh, yes. Handsome, square jaw. No, that, 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 that's a broken jaw. I got it in a football game, uh, along with the name Whiz. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a candy bar, remember? Hey, you're right. I never thought of it before. Uh, uh, but the jaw looks very distinguished. Yeah. Well, it, it, it aches when it rains. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Uh, oh, looks like we've got company. Oh, so here you are, Mary. Why, sir, I hope I'm not interrupting. Of course not. Mr. Rogers, I'd like you to meet Mr. Warwick Smith. Mr. Smith. It happened as quickly and uneventfully as that. Mr. Smith. The same man I'd seen leaving Mont's tobacco shop. It was all very chummy and well met. We had cocktails. We enjoyed one another's company. And to look at the three of us, you wouldn't have thought that espionage and murder sat with us. You mean to say that you haven't seen Geneva yet? No. Well, that's capital. We must take you, hmm, Mary? Uh, of course. Fine. Will you both join me for dinner? Oh, well, I... I hate to break up any plans, but oh, I... Not at all. I insist. And then afterwards, we can take the launch down to Geneva. It's a lovely trip. Monsieur Warwick Smith? Hmm? Oh, oh, here, boy. Uh, excuse me. Uh, telephone call, monsieur. Thank you. Will you take it here? Uh, no, no, thanks. Uh, shall be a moment. You order another round, Rogers. Right. Merci, monsieur. Oh, he seems to be a nice fellow. Hmm? Oh, were we? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, Mr. Rogers. Yes? Would you do me a favor? Well, I can try. I know it sounds strange, but please, don't go with us to Geneva tonight. Why not? Please, just leave the hotel. Go back to Paris. I... I, I can't tell you anything else, but do as I say. Please, go away. Suddenly, she wasn't putting on an act anymore. The cocktail hour was over, and so was the small talk. Mary Donnelly wanted me out of the way, and yet I was pretty sure she didn't know what I was after. 
I was trying to make it add up when Mr. Smith came back. I say, I feel perfectly uh, septic about this, but I'm afraid our little jaunt is off tonight, old man. Oh, it's too bad. Have some other time. Hmm? Sure. A frightful bother, but that telephone, well, it was rather urgent. Uh, Mary, it was the uh, matter we spoke of earlier. Oh, yes. Uh, do forgive us, Rogers. Oh, it's all right. Forget it. Maybe we can get together tomorrow. Yes, rather. Uh, come along, my dear. Goodbye. I'll see you later. Oh, uh, uh, please forget what I said before. I was only trying to be romantic. Oh, sure, I know. You've been reading too much Eric Ambler and John Buck and spies and stuff. Goodbye, Mr. Rogers. Goodbye. So, they were on the move. Mont had said that they didn't have the plans yet, which could mean that Mr. Smith and his girlfriend were expecting to get them tonight. I followed them out to the lobby, watched them go upstairs, then sat and waited. They came out of the elevator together and left the Grand Hotel. I followed. It wasn't hard. They headed straight for the Neon Railroad Station. Hey, monsieur. Say, a uh, couple of friends of mine are taking the train tonight. They just bought tickets. A tall Englishman and a pretty girl. So, uh, yes, of course, to Basel. Wagon Lee number six. You are seeing them off? No. I'm going with them. I stayed out of sight behind the baggage carts, waiting for the train to pull in. Mr. Smith? Mary Donnelly walked up and down the platform. Just a couple of nice tourists seeing the sights of Europe. Then a man came along. Smith shook hands with him. They went on walking. As they passed me, I got my first good look at the stranger. There's something familiar. Something. It took a few seconds to register. The man we are looking for calls himself Smith. He may be English, but we don't think so. About six feet, 180 pounds. Dark, small triangular scar on his upper lip. Then I remembered. This man on the platform fitted the description the French intelligence office had given me in Paris, even to the triangular scar on his lip. I had found myself another Mr. Smith. Escape under the direction of Norman MacDonald returns in just a moment. The Trojan horse worked out pretty well. It got the Greeks in through the walls of Troy so they could take the city. Well, false ideas can be used the same way. We're being invaded, so to speak, when we get hold of mere scraps of information or depend upon just part of the truth. Actually, there's very little difficulty in finding out for yourself what's right and what's wrong. All you have to do is keep well informed. And you have the advantage of the greatest and most accurate news sources in the world. The American techniques of gathering news, of culling the truth from the false. You'll find all the right information by following the newspapers, the magazines, the books, by listening to newscasts and radio roundtable discussions on vital subjects. They're all available to you. Find out the whys and the wherefores. You'll be glad you did. And you'll be a better serviceman and a better citizen. And two, remember, the more you know, the higher you go. It's as simple as that. And now, back to Escape. <laughs> sat in my compartment and tried to figure on my next move. With a dead certainty that Smiths 1 and 2 were in possession of the rocket base plans, the fact that they were headed for Basel told me that. Just across the Swiss border was Lorach in Germany. That's a matter of six or seven miles from Basel, and once inside Germany, it would be easy going for them to points east. I had to stop them before we got to Basel. 
I was on a Swiss train, and the Swiss are the most neutral people in the world. They can get real tough about their neutrality. I knew I couldn't get anywhere trying to hide, so I went to the lounge car to let them know I was aboard. Mary Donnelly was sitting in an armchair looking out into the darkness. Hi. What are you doing here? Going to Basel. But I... I know, I know. Let's, let's say I'm, I'm romantic. It would have been very dull and neon without you there. I don't believe you. Um, where's Mr. Smith? Let me alone. Well, they didn't teach you much about manners at Bennington, did they? Please. What's the matter? Nothing. Oh, I thought you'd be glad to see me. Listen, please. If they know you're here, they'll... They'll what? Don't you understand? Mr. Smith isn't what you think. Really? You must believe me. It's serious. They'll think you're following them. I am. You... Well, I'm following you, too. Oh, you fool. Why can't you... Well, well, Mr. Rogers. Mary, you didn't... Uh, just... Christ, uh, Mr. Smith. Christ. Um, I'd like you to meet Mr. Tall Chief. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Tall Chief, how do you do? Why, uh... Why don't we all have a drink to celebrate? I mean, we only just said goodbye to Mr. Rogers and me on... Uh, yes, a happy reunion, eh? You didn't say you were going to bar for Mr. Rogers? No. I didn't, did I? Well, I'll order at the bar. Is uh, Johnny Walker all right? Fine. I'll go with you. I like my drinks just so. That's the trouble of these boys. Oh, nice fellows. You know, when you're, you're traveling, you really... You're an American agent, aren't you? No. Nope. You are. No. Just working for a country like you. They know it, too. I didn't think my being here would fool them for long. They'll kill you, you know. Oh, in a Swiss train? <laughs> That'll take some explaining. If it were Czech or Hungarian... Don't do it. That... It'll be an accident. Like the others? Like the tobacconist at the fun? How did you... I was there in the back room. You... You knew who I was all the time. I knew what you are, too. <laughs> What's the matter? You homesick? Oh, shut up. Where are you going? I don't know anywhere. I can't stand it. They might try jumping off the train... It'll be quicker than a long trial. I thought she was going to faint, but she got hold of herself and ran down the car. I sat back and waited for the drink. It was going to be quite a game from here on. They knew, and I knew. And the question now seemed to be who carried the stolen plans? Smith? Tall Chief? Or was Tall Chief really Smith? It was beginning to sound like a who's on first routine when Scotch and Soda arrived. Well, here we are. Oh, thanks a lot. Where's Miss Donnelly? Hmm? Oh, she... I don't think she felt too well. Must have gone to her compartment. Rather sudden, wasn't it? Must have been. Look here. Why don't we all go to my compartment? That's wonderful, Tall Chief. We can play some cards. I imagine the poker's your game, eh, Mr. Rogers? It's a good game. But not tonight. Oh, but you must. I mean, well, we can hardly take no for an answer. No, no. I don't feel like it. Compartments are stuffy. I, I stay out of them as much as possible. This won't do at all. I mean, three is such a good game. Sorry. Mr. Rogers, do you know what this is in my pocket? A pipe? Mm hmm. Try again. Uh, gun. Well done, Mr. Rogers. Come along. Um, aren't you afraid it might go off? Make a lot of noise. The conductor down there might wonder. <laughs> Come on, Smith. We'll pop in on the girl and then play some euchre. Yes, I do, huh? Perhaps Mr. Rogers will join us later. I'm sure he will. I'd won that round. They tried to bluff me and they lost out. But that still hadn't got me closer to what I was after. So I finished my drink, had another, and then I went to Mary Donnelly's compartment. Yes? Rogers. I don't want to talk to you. I'll bet you don't. Open up or I'll break the door in.
Mr. Smith is in the next compartment. And we'll keep it quiet. Can he get in? Is there an adjoining door? Yes, but it's locked. What's the matter? Would you trust him? They're angry with me. They think I had something to do with your being here. Well, that's tough. You don't know. You don't know what they're like. I've got a rough idea. So did Mark. I couldn't help it. I didn't know Mr. Smith was going to kill him. Why did you go to Divon? He said he wanted some cigarettes, a special brand. They didn't have them in neon. Go on. Later, Mr. Smith told me they, they found out he, there was a French agent in Divon who knew about us. He said he had to kill him. We were so close to getting the plans, nothing could interfere. Which one is the real Mr. Smith? Paul, Chief? I don't know. Are there others? Yes. Is it... It's a code name. Okay. Doesn't matter, then. Who's got the plans? I don't know. Where are you crossing into Germany? Laura? I didn't want to go. I, I didn't know what they were like. Well, uh, now you know. It was like a game at home at college. We, we used to sit up drinking Cokes and tearing up democracy. I didn't know. Sure, sure, honey. You didn't know they play real rough bullets and everything. Let's go. Please don't. I was wrong. I was wrong. You sure were. Listen. Listen, I'll help you. I will. You expect me to believe that? Yes. I don't know what I can do, but trust me, I'll help you get the plans back. You know what it means if they find out? I know. I want to help you. It's not me you're helping. It's a lot of other people you don't even know. Okay. Come on. Smith's compartment? Yes. Okay. I'm going to take a chance on you. And if you double-cross me... Well... Hi, hello, Mr. Rogers and Mary. Hello. You're feeling better, hmm? Come in, come in, come in. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, both of you... What? Go back to the wall over there. Go on, go on. Oh, now, look Let's here, old cut boy. That. You can do better in your own language. Get back. Now, I want those plans. Guns make noise, Mr. Rogers. Not with a silencer, brother. You should know. Hand them over. I'm sorry. All right, Mary Donnelly, or whatever your name is. If you're going to make a sucker out of me, now's the time. Here, hold the gun on them. I'm going to tear this place apart, and if they move, shoot. Yes. Mary, quick, give me the gun. No. I'll kill you if you don't stand still. <sighs> That's what I wanted to know. While she stood there holding the gun, I ripped the place up and down. Their suitcases, chairs, light fixtures, carpeting, everything. Anywhere that a microfilm or shredded paper could be hidden, but it wasn't there. I searched the two men, and I searched them thoroughly, but there was nothing. If one of them or both had memorized the rocket base system, I was sunk. And they wouldn't talk, so there was, there was nothing to do but wait. We waited. Waited the whole night as the train crawled northward, sitting, watching each other. The girl sat staring out the window. Tall chief read a newspaper and then handed it over to Smith. I held the gun. And we waited. We'll be in Basel in three minutes, Mr. Rogers. Isn't this rather ridiculous, Mr. Rogers? Obviously, you're beaten. Why don't you go back to your own compartment? We change at Basel for Laura. If I have to, Mr. Smith, I'll kill you as the train stops. I'm going to get those plans. My dear fellow, if you kill us, do you think for one minute that another won't get through with the plan? I don't think so. You've got them somewhere. And you know you can't get another copy. It was a shot in the dark. But as soon as I said it, I was sure I'd hit something. They were getting nervous. The tall chief's eyes started to twitch. I kept up the pressure by tightening my finger on the trigger. Mary Donnelly just stared at them. Once the train stopped, I was finished. Either I shot them down or gave up. The train was beginning to slow down, and I saw the headline on the newspaper lying at my feet only a second, but it was enough. Mary, 
Hold the gun. What is it? Right under my nose. I've got it. English paper dated January 13th, night edition. Well, that was last night. That's right. I I don't... Don't you move, boys. That was a neat trick. Your paper, I'll bet, tall chief. What of it? Nothing much, except the paper came out last night at 7 o'clock in London, and you got on this train at 7 in Switzerland. That'd be some delivery service, huh? Let's see. What? What? The whole thing. Two columns. Not even in code. <laughs> what nerve. A nice printing job, too. Yes! Yes! <laughs> She'd taken her eyes off them just long enough. Tall Chief was wrestling the gun away, and I was going down with Smith on top. I managed to roll out from under just as the gun went off. Then I got my arm around Smith's neck and held him against me as a shield, my back to the wall. Now, Mr. Rogers, let go of him. You're finished, and you know it. Sure. Sure. You can have him. I'll take the gun. I'd open the door, Mr. Tall Chief. You've got some explaining to do. There was nothing to do for Mary Donnelly. She'd been hit when the gun went off. I'd like to have told her that everything was okay, but... Well, I guess she knew it. I'd fix it so that in the reporter family would never know. That's the least I could do. The Swiss authorities in Basel were tough. They had Smith and Tall Chief for murder. Me? Well, I was an innocent bystander. They let me go. I went back to Paris with a newspaper under my arm. My job was finished, and I turned it over to the country that hired me. Under the direction of Norman MacDonald, Escape has brought you a bullet for Mr. Smith by Anthony Ellis. John Daner was starred as Alan Rogers with Gene Bates as Mary Donnelly and Ben Wright as Mr. Smith. Featured in the cast were Larry Dobkin, Harry Bartell, Edgar Berrier, and Jack Crucian. The special music for Escape was composed and conducted by Del Castillo. <laughs> Escape. You've been listening to Escape, adaptations of the world's finest tales of adventure and mystery. Escape comes to you each week at the same time through the facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. Finding life rather dull, dreaming again of exotic places, wishing you were somewhere else, we offer you Escape. (laughs) 
escape with us now to England and the story of a hard rock miner trapped in a deserted mine beneath the icy waters off the Cornish coast, as Hammond Innes tells it in his gripping tale, The Killer Mine. <laughs> Rain had stopped when I reached Penzance just before dark. At the waterfront, there were men dressed much the same as myself in seamen's jerseys and jackets. Nobody took any notice of me, and I suddenly felt at ease for the first time since I landed in England. I lit a cigarette and fished out of my pocket the worn and dirty bit of note paper which bore Dave Tanner's address. Two Harbour Terrace, Penzance, Cornwall. I read the note again. Dear Jim, I hear things aren't what they were in Italy. If you're getting tired of it and want a change of air, I can fix you up with a job in England, no questions asked. It's a mining job and right up your street, your old chum, Dave. (laughs) Well, up to now, I'd been lucky. No questions had been asked. So I went to meet my old chum at number two Harbour Terrace. Mr. Tanner in? Who? Tanner, Mr. Dave Tanner. Oh, nobody of that name lives here. Oh, well, he's no friend of mine. I've come a long way to see him. Uh, uh, Look, here's the letter he sent me. Oh, I'm sorry. But look, you don't have to be afraid. I'm not a cop. He's a Welshman. Dark hair and eyes, a bit of a limp. Oh, it's... uh, Maybe it's Mr. Jones you're wanting, but he's not here now either. Do you know when he'll be back? No, I, uh... Hello. Uh, you were hurt. Oh, no, I... That's blood on your hands. Oh, one of the lodges. He cut himself on glass. Dave, he's here, isn't he? He's here and he's hurt. No. You can't come in. Move over. You... Where is he? I tell you, you're mistaken. What the devil are you doing, girl? Come and fix his arm before I lose any more blood. Who was it, anyway? It's all right, Dave. It's me, Jim Price. Jim Price? Fine time for visiting, you've chosen. Well, come on up, man. I'm bleeding to death. We went upstairs, and inside his room, Dave was sitting, white-faced, on the edge of a bed. He winced as the girl daubed iodine into what was obviously a bullet wound. Then the bandage went on. Hey, not too tight, girl. Well, what happened, Dave? Nothing. It's all right. Tell you later. I'm glad to see you, Bach. Sil. Yes, Davy. Wrap up some food. Find another raincoat. But you can't go out. You... Don't argue, girl. It's time to go now. All right. It's better. Now we can talk. You've come over for that job, eh? Yes. Got a show with no questions asked? I managed. It cost me my last farthing, though. I've got no papers. <laughs> you got a show. That's what matters. Well, Jim, it's a mining job, as I told you. <laughs> Here, help me on with my coat. Yes, well, uh, Easy. Easy. Though. Easy. There. I want to be shut of this place. Your way is the same as mine. I'll tell you about the job as we go. Where? Where do we go? Cripple Z's tin mine. But there's more to it than that. Oh? Come on. We'll meet the girl downstairs. I've got to get out. Come along. Daddy, your sandwich isn't an old raincoat of father's. Give it to him. Now listen, Seth. Those clothes upstairs burn them. Yes. Clean up everything. Anybody comes around asking questions, tell them you haven't seen me. All right. Not for three days. Where can I get in touch with you? You can't. You'll come back? Indeed, I will. But remember, you haven't seen me. And you don't know where I've gone. I don't know. That's true. You'll hear from me. Now open the door, see if anyone's about. Yes. The street was deserted. And the rain had started again as we slipped out. We kept to mean, badly lit streets as we made our way out of the town. Then, at the top of the hill, we left the lights of Penzance behind us. We hadn't said a word until then. We'll separate at Lunyon. How far is that? Oh, eight, nine miles. Oh. Oh. Where are you going? A farm. Be hiding up for a bit. Oh, the police, David? 
In a matter of speaking, I had a fishing boat, Isle of Mull. We were carrying goods. <laughs> Liquor? Of course. Yeah. Picked it up from an Italian boat. A revenue cutter bought us. They insisted on taking the hatches off. They warned them not to. It was their own fault. I jumped for the other boat. That's when I got this bullet through the heart. And how did you get away? We booby-trapped the hatches. When they opened them, she went up, sank. Just like that. How many were killed? What does it matter? They're after me, though. What about me? Oh, job. I told you, if you want it, it's yours. Where do I go? Who do I see? Cripple's ease. Just down the road from Butler. Ask for Captain Manick. Tell him I sent you. Show him my letter. Mm, that's all? That's all. Mm. He'll tell you what it's about. <laughs> Come on, I'll step out. I need to rest soon enough with this cursed arm. It must have been nearly midnight when the little Welshman and I parted. He pointed the way to Cripple's Ease a mile further along, and then turned away, disappeared in the driving rain. Half an hour later, I found the huddle of abandoned mine buildings. And then against a crackle of lightning, I saw a house. I had reached Cripple's Ease and the job that was waiting for me. What do you want? I want to see Captain Manick. I be Captain Manick. What do you want? Dave Tanner sent me. Who? Dave Tanner. He told me to show you this letter. Ah. Hmm. Come in. All right. My name is Jim Price. Dave, he said you had a mining job for me. I'm a miner. I was working in Italy. Come in here. It's a fire. You can get warm. How long have you known, Dave? You're in the army together? Where? Italy, mostly. Casino. Mm. Sit down. You're the deserter chap, aren't you? Oh, it's all right. Uh, Davey told me about it. We don't ask questions here. Does anyone know you're in England? No, only Dave. Uh, this job you've got, how long will it take? Not being a miner, I wouldn't know. Might take a week. I'll give you a flat rate of 50 pounds. And another hundred if you can do it in two days. A big tin strike? No. Well, I don't see where... All right. Just a minute. Yeah. Now, uh, have a look at this chart. These mines are finished. There's nothing worth working in them anymore. I've got another use for it. You see that long gallery running down under the sea? Yeah. It's called the Mermaid. Nearly half a mile long. Now then, what I want you to do is to blow a hole in the seabed at the end of it. Blow a hole in the seabed? Yes. You see the slope of the gallery? It starts about a hundred feet below the sea level. Mm -hmm. Then at the end, rises to, well, by my figures, uh, 20 feet under the bed of the sea. My job is to drill through that 20 feet and let the sea in, huh? Yes. I can tell you it's getting risky running liquor into England through the usual channels. I see. Yes. This will be safer. Our boat spots a buoy which marks the entrance of the underwater mine. Lowers the cargo and we haul it through the mine up to the shore. Well, how? A carriage drawn by a horse. Oh, oh it'll work. Even underwater it'll work. Oh. I've had two men working on the shaft for a year now to straighten it out. All we need is a miner to finish the job. That's you. It's nasty. Suppose the entrance gets jammed with rock after she blows. No, I'll go down in a day at Ivy suit and clear it. Mm. Nasty. I haven't done undersea stuff. But you know explosives and rock? Yeah. And there'll be nothing to it. I don't know. What about Davy? Was he doing a job for you? Suppose the police get him and tie you up with him. What happens to me? Huh? Oh, don't worry. I don't like it. A man is sensible. You're a deserter from the British Army. You return to England without papers. If not here, where would you work? 
I'd be offering you 150 pounds. I should have stayed in Italy. But you didn't? No, I wanted to see Cornwall again. It was a mistake. Not at all. Ah. Do what I ask and I'll see that you get a passage back to Italy. No. That's too dangerous. I'm sorry, I'll take my chances somewhere else in another job. Oh? And you leave me no alternative. What do you mean? I shall have to telephone the police in Penzance and inform them that a deserter has shown up looking for a job. After what you tell me, now make me laugh. I'm quite a respectable man in these parts. I doubt that the authorities would take your word against mine. You're bluffing. Nobody can force me to do anything. You think not? No, stay where you are, Mr. Price. I wouldn't hesitate to shoot you. You see, I'm in rather a desperate position. It's taken me a long time to find a miner to do this job. I couldn't bear to see you refuse. You still have a moment to change your mind. Hello? Would you ring the police station for me, please? He wasn't bluffing. I knew that I owned only a few seconds to decide. It was a choice of arrest, conviction as a deserter, doing a job which might mean my life. I had run away from death once before. I suddenly realized that I'd been running ever since. I had to stop. I looked back at Manic. Smiling and sure with his pistol pointed at me. Well? All right. Hang up, hang up. I'll do it. I'll blow up your bloody mind. Escape under the direction of Norman MacDonald returns in just a moment. Boy Scout Week is now being celebrated across the nation. The scouting program is well known to almost every American. It includes character building, physical fitness, and citizenship training that enriches the lives of boys and young men in all walks of life. Get your son or your neighbor's boy to join this worthy organization. And now, back to Escape. Manick put down the phone, opened a desk drawer, and took out some pound notes. Handed me ten and suggested that I get some sleep. We were to start work at five in the morning. I was pocketing the money when the door behind us opened. I looked around and saw an elderly man had entered. I didn't know you'd anybody here, Henry. It's all right, Father. This is Jim Price. He's going to work here a bit. He's a miner. A miner, is he? Well, my boy, it's just good to know there'll be a miner working here at last. Uh, I knew you'd say it my way sooner or later, Henry. At least we can make a start now. Price is working for me, Father. Working for you? Nonsense, he must work for me. I'll prove to the world that the Cornish mining industry isn't dead. You may as well understand. I'm letting the sea into the mermaid gallery. Your ma, you can't do it. I won't allow it. That's what I'm going to do. I won't allow it, I tell you. I won't. You've no alternative. Mr. Price... Perhaps you'd better leave us now. Go to the kitchen across the hall. One of the men will show you to your quarters. All right. I went to the kitchen. Could hear the argument raging through the hall. There were two men sitting by a fire with mugs in their hands. One like a diminutive monk with a pot belly and rosy cheeks, and the other a long, cadaverous-faced man who looked at me solemnly as I entered. Blow me another one. Sit down, chum, sit down. I say, you staying or passing through? I'm going to work here. I'm a miner. Blow love a duck. Yeah. Hear that, Slim? Now we don't have to worry about the ruddy roof falling in on it. My name's Fryer, Fryer O'Grady. You call me Fryer. And this here's Slim Matthews. Jim Bryson. That excited you to blow through the seabed? Yes. Does the old man know? Yes, I just left him. Thought I heard Oggy Boggy. It's going to be trouble. Well, I don't understand. The old man's been working these mines all his life. Now he says he's found the richest tin strike in corn. Kept him dry, though. Kept him dry. Running liquor is tax-free. <laughs> if you follow me, 
too expensive to operate in mine these days. I shouldn't want your job, Mr. Price. We've been sweating for a year down here. Funny feeling with all that sea over your head. Oh, well, every man to his trade, I say. Come on, mate, I'll show you to your digs. Imagine you'll want to be up right hand. Thanks. See you in the morning, Mr. Price. The little cockney showed me to my room. It was about a uh, half hour later that I heard the tap on my door. Yes. Mr. Manick. I was afraid you might be asleep. Look, I want to... I got something to show you. My son tells me you're an experienced dinner. Have a look at this rock. Maybe you'll believe me. Hey, that's tin, all right. This is fabulous. The richest seam in the history of Cornish mining. Look at it. And my son, curse him, doesn't see it. He's going to let the sea into the mine. And he's brought you here to do it. You're the man who's going to wreck my life. I'm sorry. It is a job, that's all. You can't. You mustn't. I'd, I'd give you 50 pounds more than he's offered if you don't do it. What difference would it make if you'd only get another miner? But that would take time. Don't you see? We would be rich. I'm afraid... It's, it's, that... it's all right, it's all right. Think about it. I know he holds something over your head. He does with everyone. Think about it and give me your answer tomorrow. All right. I will. Good night. That's it, Mr. Price. What's the pit for, Captain? Yeah, underneath the scaffolding there. To catch the rock when you make the final blast. Oh. Well, it might work. As I told you, if it doesn't, I'll come down in a diving suit to tear it away. You say there's 20 feet to get through? Yes. There's quite a bit of water seeping in now. It'll be touchy, all right. Granite basalt from the feel of it. Oh, that's what I thought. Well, if it cracks, anything might happen. Yes. Uh, by the way, my father spoke to you last night, didn't he? Yes. Showed you the tin. Probably offered you more not to blow the mine. I hope you refuse, because if you didn't, I can still notify the police. I didn't tell him anything. Good. Then you can start to work immediately. I'll send Friar and Slim down to help you. Uh, and by the way, don't go wandering around too much. Some of these old tunnels run for miles that you can get lost. And stay out of the shaft that parallels this one. She's the old come-lucky mine. There have been a lot of falls recently. If she caves in, she'll take in the sea and break through here. I'll be careful. I've worked mines most of my life. It gives you a funny feeling to be standing under the sea a half mile from shore and protected by 20 feet of rock. Rock that you're going to be drilling and blasting until there's only maybe 10 feet. Then you pray that it doesn't cave in until you're out of the way. Friar and Slim came down and I started to drill holes for the explosives. As the rock fell away, little streams of water fell, soaking us. It was nasty work, all right. Did you jump? That's enough for the first blow. How many do you think you'll need? Three, maybe four. Depends. Uh, give me the charges. Oh, Here you are, Price boy. Who? Uh, oh, Dr. Walter there. There's nothing to worry about yet. I hope. You and Slim better get up the tunnel when she goes. I was hoping you'd say that. I'm off. Good luck, Jump. The two men disappeared up the gallery, and I was left alone to explode the charge. I connected the wires, moved the exploder as far as it would stretch into the tunnel, and then I... I pressed the handle. Ah. The roof still held. A bit more water trickled in, but... He still held. 
I went back to the entrance for a cup of coffee before starting again. As I approached the cage which served as an elevator to the surface, I saw Captain Manick talking with another man. It was Dave Tanner. Oh, bloody fool! Why of all places did you have to come here? I told you. They got it talk. I heard it on the wireless. I knew they wouldn't be thinking of looking for me here. It would be safer. Safer? In broad daylight? Somebody must have seen you. The police will be all over us. Nobody saw me. How do you know? Price, you've got to be through that seabed by tonight. Well, it's impossible. I can't do it. Nothing's impossible. I can get you out of the country as soon as you've finished the job. You don't finish tonight and the police come. Well, what do you know? What does that mean? Well, it can't be done. There's too much work for one man. I'll put Friar on the drill with you. He knows something about it. Tanner and myself will be clear of the rock after each blow. Well, I'll try. Good. You, Dave, stay out of sight. Down here. And keep my father out of here. Shoot him if you have to. You understand? All right, all right. We worked like madmen all day, drilling, blasting. We blew the rock three, four, five times. And still it wasn't enough. The water was coming in fast, filling the pit. Manic and Slim went back for new drills and charges. Friar and I stayed on the scaffolding. And I don't like the looks of that. What's up, mate? Rock. Weaker up here. Dangerous? Maybe. Fetch me a pick. All right. Hey. Hey, let that do. Broken the end. The last charge must have done it. I'd often get another shot for you, I sat on that scaffolding, smoked a cigarette. Water streamed down the slimy walls. And I waited for fire. Five minutes passed. Then... Mr. Price! Huh? Mr. Price! Mr. Manick! You've got to stop. You've got to. Make in! If you've not the gallery, I'll never get it. I'm sorry. I won't let you, do you hear me? There's nothing I can do. It is mine. You're going to destroy it. I'll kill you. I'll kill you all. But you, you better go to the surface, Mr. Manick. is not safe here. Ah, you'll find out. You'll find out how unsafe it is. He was gone. And I knew he was up to something. I wanted to follow, but I remembered Captain Manick's warning about the tunnels. The old man knew them every twist and turn. And if he wanted to get rid of me, he could lead me to a maze from which I would never find my way out. So I stayed there until the captain and Slim came back. We're getting ready to go, Price. Your father was here. What? He's up to something. How did he get by day? I don't know. You let him go. Come on, hurry. We've got to stop him. What do we do? He's going to make sure that we can't let the sea in here. He's mad. The come lucky. Ah, that's what I'm afraid of. He knows that mind like a book. Come on. The old man was somewhere in the mine which paralleled ours. If he knew of a fort in the wall, he could allow tons of seawater to rush in, breaking down the walls and flooding our tunnel. We had to stop him. Friar joined us as we made our way into the adjoining galleries. If he's got dynamite... Don't say it, Captain. I should have locked him up long ago. Hey, what's that down there? A uh, safe. It looks like a light. It, it is. That's him. I, he's working on something. The wall. Father. Father. Stop it. Stay where you are. Stay there. Do as he said. Don't come any closer. Listen to me. Don't do it. You'll be killed. He'll drown us all. Let's get out. Say you let me have me tin. Let him have it. Let him. Look. He's not in a match. Say it. Say it, my son. No, you old devil. Kill yourself. Go on. You're not getting me killed. Get it. No. Come on, come on. Come on. Captain Manick lay on the wet tunnel floor, blood streaming from the wound where Friar had struck him with a pick. We ran, the three of us, and behind was the mad old man with his charge of dynamite. We reached the mermaid gallery when it went off. We could hear the water pouring down as though from a great height. And then the more terrifying sound as the tons of sea swept through the maze of tunnels. We ran, ran for the elevator which could take us to safety and the surface a hundred feet above. 
and the water followed. You could, you could hear the roar until it's deafened. No, no, wait. Wait, give me a hand. I've twisted my ankle. Sorry, Tom. Tom, stop now. I could see that blessed elevator so close. Slim and Fire were almost there. Then the gate clanged and it started up. No, 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 wait, wait. Wait, don't leave me. Use the ladder. Use the ladder. Somehow, I reached the ladder, painfully started up the runs. It was a nightmare, and the water was the monster that you couldn't escape. Halfway up, I heard them in the cage. It's stuck! It won't go any further! Oh, 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 I'll join! But it won't! It won't! Cross! Cross the clear! Cross, are you not the ladder? Christ, we don't get in the eye. We'll get it down. I'll get I kept climbing. And the voices faded. Faded until I heard a gurgling scream. And then silence. And the water stopped its terrible sound. It had found sea level. When I got to the surface... I saw Dave Tanner. He was standing, looking down at me with frightened eyes. And with him were three men in uniform. They were the police. I fell into their arms, crying. I tell you, I cried. I was so happy. I got away from that killer. That killer mine. Under the direction of Norman MacDonald, Escape has brought you The Killer Mind by Hammond Innes, especially adapted for Escape by Anthony Ellis. John Daner was starred as Jim. Featured in the cast were Eileen Erskine, Tony Barrett, Ray Lawrence, Wilms Herbert, Jay Novello, and Lou Krugman. The special music for Escape was composed and conducted by Del Castillo. Next week, Escape with us to Mexico City and the story of a woman caught up in a terrifying web of murderous intrigue. As Patrick Quentin tells it in his exciting story, The Follower. If you'll stick around, you'll find a lot of laughs and some deep human interest. Bill Goodwin is about to pay his regular Sunday afternoon visit with his Dollar a Minute program. Bill will be selling CBS airtime at this modest rate to more people with things on their mind. Dollar a Minute starring Bill Goodwin follows a mini on most of these same CBS stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. You, finding life rather dull... Dreaming again of exotic places, wishing you were somewhere else, we offer you Escape. Escape with us now to Mexico City and the story of a man caught up in a terrifying web of murderous intrigue. As Patrick Quentin tells it in his exciting story, The Follower. My name is Lydon, Mark Lydon. I'm a petroleum engineer just back from three months in Venezuela. I hadn't cabled my wife that I was coming home to New York because I wanted to surprise her. We'd only been married two weeks, Ellie and I, before I went on the trip and... Well, I was crazy to get back to her. Three long, empty months. And now, in a matter of seconds, we'll be together again. Ellie! Ellie, it's me, Mark. Ellie! Huh. 
Ellie, are you here? Oh, let's cut out the comedy. The... Hey, who are you? What's the matter? What's wrong with you, anyway? Corey. Good Lord. It was the guy Ellie had thrown over to marry me, Corey Lathrop. And he was dead. I saw the two bullet holes in his chest. Turned sick. He'd been dead quite a while, maybe a day or two, and... He didn't look much like the socialite man about the club's member of the state parole board society lawyer. He just looked dead. I recognized that torn piece of negligee in Corey's hand. I ought to. I'd seen it often enough. On Ellie. First thing I had to do was locate her fast. No. No, not the police. Not yet. Not without knowing what it's all about. Who else, then? Certainly not her society friends. They wouldn't tell me if they knew. I was an outsider, big prospects, but no money. The dark horse who'd rushed Ellie off her feet. No, no chance there. Maybe some of her other friends, though. She messed around with just for thrills because she was rich and bored. Maybe the gambler, Victor Dottorio. Yeah, that was it. If anybody knew what had happened to Ellie, Victor would be the guy. really beat the odds, Mr. Lytton. Very few people I'd let come back here to my private office. Oh, thanks, Victor. Of course, you're different, though. You're married to little Ellie. I'd do anything for Ellie. How is she, by the way? Well, I was hoping maybe you'd know. Oh? Huh? Now, why would I know anything about her? Well, you're a friend of hers, aren't you? Why, sure. I knew Ellie long before she met you. She's a great little kid. Too much money for her own good, but still... You know where she is, Victor? No, I don't. But she wasn't here a couple of nights ago. Saw her at one of the roulette tables. <laughs> Ellie sure has a weakness for roulette. Yeah. Well, look, can't you I tell me... I remember you... now. That was the night she got into me on credit for $20,000. $20,000? I guess the guy she was with was bad luck for her. <laughs> that nose in the air. What was his name? Uh, Lathrop. Uh, Corey Lathrop. Lathrop? Yeah, somebody ought to smash that guy. He's just too good to live. Yeah. Yeah. Look, Victor, about that money Ellie lost. Oh, don't I... worry your head about it, Mr. Lytton. Ellie's a friend of mine. She'll pay when she gets the dough. These little cafe cookies understand gambling, how it works and all. They always pay off. <laughs> you know, every one of them pays in the end. Back at the apartment again, I sat in the den, smoking one cigarette after another. Tried to think it out. Started to get dark, and I still sat there, not knowing where to turn. Stopped cold. Uh, hello? Uh, may I speak to uh, Mrs. Lidon, please? Uh, well, she isn't here right now. May I take a message? I'm Mr. Lidon. Oh, well, uh, this is Franchot's originals, Mr. Lidon. We have those two new suits ready to send out, and I find a note here with him. It is a request to forward the suits by air mail to Hotel Granada, Mexico City. Mexico City? Oui. Miss Lidon evidently telephoned the message, but I did want to confirm the address. Is that correct, Mr. Lidon? Hotel Granada, Mexico City? Uh, uh, yes, yes, uh, that, that's right. She flew down there for a few days. Ah, oh, nice. I do hope she enjoys her trip. Well, I, I, I'm sure she will. Goodbye. Mexico City. So that's where she'd gone. Well, whatever the game, I was sure of one thing. I was on her side, win, lose, or draw. And that meant following her on the next plane south to Mexico City. From the airport, I phoned the police, told them where they'd find Corey's body, and hung up. I beg your pardon. Is the desk clerk around? Pues si, senor. I am the desk clerk. Can I help you, senor? Uh, yes, I believe my wife is registered here, Mrs. Mark Lydon. Lydon? That is not a very common name, senor. Uh, no, I guess it isn't. Well? 
That is a very nice jacket you are wearing, senor. Soft and warm like the breath of a senorita. Thank you, thank you. It must take many pesos to buy a jacket like that. I really don't remember now if you'll be kind enough to... It must be very nice to have many pesos. Look, what are you after, a tip? Senor! How much? Well, so when a pobrecito has five sisters to support and only one very small job, uh, 20 pesos? 10. 15. It is only pesos, senor, not like dollars. All right, all right, here. Gracias. Now we are friends. The senorita is registered in room 522. 522. Okay, thanks. But wait, senor. What? She is not there now. Oh? Well, where is she? The senorita is going to the bullfights, I think. But no matter, senor. You are her husband. You are my very good friend. So I let you wait in her room for only ten pesos more. Look, if you like golden eggs, don't kill the goose. But, senor, you do not look at things the right way. For only twenty-five pesos, you now have Oscar for your very good friend. Oscar sent a bellboy up to let me in the 522. When he'd gone, I opened the two traveling cases in the closet and searched through a mess of clothes and the usual feminine whatnots. I don't know what I'd expected to find in L.A.'s luggage. Blood stains, a gun, I... I don't know. And then I heard the key in the lock. I didn't move. I didn't say anything. <gasps> Ellie, baby... Who the devil are you? I could ask the same question, and with a lot more reason, too. Will you get out now, or shall I call the manager? Now, look, there must be some mistake here. There certainly is. This is room 522, and my wife's clothes are in those bags You've there. been going through my things? Your things. Not unless you happen to be Mrs. Mark Lydon. That's exactly who I happen to be. Oh, now, wait a minute, honey. I'm Mark Lydon. Oh, please, that's a real old one, and I'm just not in the mood. I'm Mark Lydon no matter what, and you're... Impersonating my wife. I'm Mrs. Mark Lydon, and you're trying to impersonate my husband. Now get out or so help me. I'll phone the manager. Wait, let me make a call first. It just so happens I know the Spanish words for police and American embassy. You, you wouldn't. I wouldn't, huh? Hello? Wait, no, don't. Okay. Now, what's the game? Where's Ellie? Uh, I, I don't know, Mr. Lydon. I've never met your wife. I was desperate, that's all, and... When the chance came along, I took it. What chance? What were you desperate about? Well, I'd come down here for a week and got stuck. I didn't know you needed papers to get back across the border. Proof of citizenship, I mean. You see, I've lived in New York all my life, but I was born in Czechoslovakia. Go on. Well, I was broke, too. I didn't know what to do. That's when I ran into this bartender, George. And he fixed everything up. Fixed it up? How? Well, he said this Mrs. Lydon, your wife, had just got in from the States and wanted to disappear for a few days. She was looking for somebody to take her place here at the hotel, so... So George arranged the whole thing. He brought me here, gave me her tourist card. That's all I know about it. What were you supposed to get out of the deal? Just the tourist card. I could use it to cross the border. Mrs. Lydon was going to say later she'd lost it and get a new one. Anyway, that's what George said. George, huh? Where does this George work? Well, it's one of the American bars. He's off duty now, though. Where can I find him? Well, sometimes he hangs around the Salon de Lisboa. It's a... Cantina over near the plaza. Look, if this is all the truth, how come nobody here at the hotel noticed the switch when you took my wife's place? Well, she checked in during the night and stayed out of sight. No one's seen her but the night clerk. Oscar, I think his name is. Oscar, huh? That boy really gets around. He's the day man now. Mr. Lydon, what are you going to do with me? I don't know yet. What's your name? Frankie. Okay, come on, Frankie. Let's go find George. <laughs> Mr. Lydon, he just came in. Oh, the short blonde guy? Looks like a Ben and Rooster? Yes. George! Over here, George! Cocky and tough. I know the type. George, we've been waiting here for you. Huh? I was beginning to think maybe you'd been called back to work no. at the bar. No, no, I'm off duty. This is Mr. Lydon, George. Mr. Mark Lydon from New York. Oh. Okay if I sit down? Sure, George. That's the idea. Hey. I suppose you're looking for your wife. That's right. Where is she? You've been away somewhere, haven't you? Out of the States? Yeah. And your wife wasn't expecting you back so soon. No, she wasn't. Well, I'm afraid you're out of luck, Mr. Lydon. 
She took a plane to Guatemala this afternoon. Dispénsame, jefe, pero el cantinero quiere saber si ustedes desean algo que tomar. No, no, no. You wouldn't be lying, would you, George? Uh, don't push me, Mr. Lyndon. Your wife's missing and you're all upset about it, but don't try to push me. Where is she, George? I just told you. That's all I know about it. I'm just a guy who helped her out of a jam. What kind of a jam? All I know is what she told me. Said she'd run out on a big gambling debt in New York. And they were sending a gunman after her. She had to get away. You see, that's where I came in, Mr. Lyndon. She wanted someone to take her place here, cover up her trail. How did she get out of Mexico when you got her tourist card? She had a passport with her. She didn't need the card. I see. Well, I still think you're both lying. Oh, Mr. Lyndon, I warned you about... Shut up, trying... George. You can do your talking to the police and the American embassy. That's who I'm going to talk to. Oh, don't be a fool, Mr. Lyndon. I'd be a fool to believe this story of yours. You don't know what it's all about. You're not going to do anything with this blundering around except get your wife killed. Go back to New York and stay out of it. Skip it, Frankie. When I want your advice, I... What's the idea of the gun, George? The idea, Mr. Lyndon? That all three of us get up from this table quietly and walk out of the cantina. I see. You're not going to the police, Mr. Lyndon, nor to the American embassy. You're coming with us. Suppose I don't? You will. Shall we go? Sure. Why not? Uh, quietly, Mr. Lyndon. Just like three friends, huh? Sure, George. I'll go quietly. Come on, George! Come on, George! All right, now, give me that gun. Give it to me. All right, now, get up on your feet. Nice going, Frankie. Come on, George, let's get out of here. Wait, wait. Give me that bottle. He's still conscious. There. George, you didn't have to hit him again. Shut up, Frankie. We're in it too far to turn soft-hearted now. Come on, let's go. Escape, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, returns in just a moment. The Book of Etiquette loses a lot more pages tonight when Jack Benny tries to ingratiate himself with the suave, oh-so-social Ronald Coleman's. Yes, Ronnie and Benita will be Jack's guests on CBS tonight. And on the Charlie McCarthy Edgar Bergen Comedy Hour, Charlie will try to enlist in the Air Force and end up as a skywriter advertising pumpernickel bread. Red Skelton, Amos and Andy, Corliss Archer, and Eve Arden, as our Miss Brooks, will also be on hand on most of these same CBS stations with their famous brands of CBS Sunday Night Comedy. And now, back to Escape! When I came to a half hour later, Frankie and George were gone. The only lead to Ellie I had, gone. And I left the cantina and flagged a taxi. In the whole picture, there was only one man who might be able to help me now. I headed for the Hotel Granada and Oscar. Too bad, too bad. It is most unfortunate that you have such a very bad accident, senor. You should come to me. I would have tell you. This Salon de Lisboa is not a good place for tourists. Oscar, you're a chiseler, a liar, and a crook. Senor, that is a very bad way for friends to talk to each other. You'd sell out your own mother for ten pesos. You are what they call a very cynic man, senor. I would never do such a thing. Not for ten pesos. Why didn't you tell me there was another woman living here posing as my wife? But you are her husband, senor. And one must be very careful with husbands. Oscar, I've played along with you as far as I'm going to. I think it's time you talk the whole thing over with the police. The police? Senor, now you are not speaking like a friend. And just when I was going to tell you about something for free... Tell me about what? About the lady who is pretend to be your wife. She has come here while you are gone. What? She reads a telegram which has come for Mrs. Leedon. Then she has checked out of the hotel. I didn't think she had the nerve to come back here. Uh... Maybe you like to know what the telegram is said, huh? It was not sealed so tight. Of course I'd like to know what the telegram... All right, all right. How much? Two hundred pesos. For free, huh? Okay. Here's a hundred and fifty, and that's all you get. <laughs> Gracias, amigo. The telegram say, plans changed. Go to Hotel Casa Miranda, Acapulco. Acapulco? Who was it signed by? It was only the one name, Victor. Well, 
I hit my first lucky break in Acapulco. I came in from the airport and went to the Casa Miranda Hotel. And halfway across the lobby, I ran into Frankie. Mr. Lydon, what are you doing here? Looking for you. How did you find out? Easy. I'm one of Oscar's very good friends. All right, now tell me, where's George? In Mexico City. Oh, please, Mr. Lydon. Don't try to interfere. Leave. Right now. You're going to ruin everything. I hope so. Where's Ellie? She's not here. She's in Mexico City. Oh, please, I know you're trying to help her, but you don't understand. You're only making things worse. You mean worse for you? Worse for everybody. Ellie, too. You don't even know what it's all about, and you're going to get yourself killed. Where's Ellie? I promise you, in a week, everything will be fine. Where's Ellie? You've got to believe me. You have to... There you are, Mrs. Lydon. Are we ready to go? Yes. Yes, I'm ready any time, Senor Gallus. Very well. Uh... Uh, Aren't you going to introduce me, darling? Introduce you? Yes. Why, yes. Senor Gonzalez, this is my husband, Mark. Oh, a pleasure. How do you do, Senor Gonzalez? He just arrived unexpectedly. Oh, I see. And are you planning to go out to the villa with us, Mr. Lydon? Oh, I don't think he Oh, was... sure, 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 definitely. I'm in on this, too, you know. You uh, know what is involved, then? <laughs> well, naturally. The little woman always tells me everything. And uh, you have uh, no objections? Well, if it's all right with her, it's all right with me. Oh, you are a very broad-minded man, Mr. Lydon. Uh, shall we go? Senor Gonzalez made a brief phone call at the hotel desk, then we got into a black chauffeur-driven limousine, headed out along the shore highway, skirting the sea. About three miles out of town, we turned into a private roadway. Stopped in front of a large Spanish villa. I uh, regret the necessity of asking you to wait here on the veranda for a few minutes, Mr. Lydon. Uh, but I believe it is better that you don't come down to the boathouse with us. Right. Sure, sure, that's fine. fine. Uh, just make yourself comfortable, Mr. Lydon. This uh, shouldn't take long. All right. Baby, what are you doing here? Mark. Mark, it's wonderful you're here. Oh, darling. But you shouldn't have come. What have they done to you, baby? Nothing, nothing, Mark. I'm all right. But you're not, darling. They'll kill you. You've got to get out of here. Uh, We'll both get out. We've got time. Frankie and Gonzalez have gone on down to the boathouse. Yes, I know. You know? Yes, Gonzalez phoned from town. They won't do anything to you if you leave right now. Victor promised me. Ellie, what, what are you talking about? I didn't want you to get mixed up in it, Mark. I wanted it to be all over before you came back from Venezuela. I I think you'd better tell me what this game's all about. I I had to do it. Victor made me do it. I I lost a lot of money at his club, and he said if I didn't, he'd kill me. If you didn't? If you didn't what? Bring a load of dope across the border for him. Dope? That's another one of his rackets, along with gambling. He gets it down here from Gonzales. So... Victor hasn't been after you. You've been on his side all the time. But then, what if Frankie and George come in? They're both working for the police. They kidnapped me from the hotel, gave me drugs so Frankie could take my place and meet Gonzalez. They planned to get the dope from Gonzalez, deliver it to Victor, and then have the police move in on everybody. I got away, though, and phoned Victor. He came down here. So that's why Frankie was impersonating you. George used to be one of Victor's boys. Then he got sent to prison. He just got out on parole. It was through Corey he began working with the police. Ellie, tell me the truth. You killed Corey, didn't you? I I had to, Mark. He was going to turn me in. He was on the parole board and George reported to him, so so he found out about me. He was going to turn me in. All the time you've been in it up to your neck. It'll be all right, Mark. Victor will fix it. About Corey, I mean. We'll pretend it never happened. Just another thrill, huh, Ellie? Mark. I've been crazy about you, but I guess I haven't known you very well. You know, I thought this fooling around the clubs with Victor and the others was just bored little rich girl stuff. Mark. But it goes a lot deeper than that, doesn't it? But, darling, I had to do this. Don't you understand? What was I, Ellie? Just another thrill? Something different for a while? No. Huh? No, that's why I did it. For us, I mean. Victor was threatening me. He'd have told you all, all kinds of bad things about me. That's why I had to. Is Victor down at the boathouse? Yes. What are they going to do to Frankie? 
I don't know. They're going to kill her, aren't they? Why, I suppose. I don't know. What's the difference, anyway? Who cares? She doesn't matter. Don't you see that? It's us that counts. That's why I did what I... Mark, where are you going? To get her out of it, if I can. That's the least I can do. No, come back. Goodbye, Ellie. Mark, no! No! I ran down the driveway toward the boathouse. I was sick. Sick inside and all over. Sick from seeing Ellie the way she really was for the first time. Dazed with a shock. They looked at me startled when I burst through the door. Frankie, pale but defiant, sitting in a chair against the wall with Victor and Gonzalez bending over her. Well, uh, this is quite a surprise, Mr. Lydon. You're supposed to be escaping. Yeah, I know. I talked with Ellie. Generous of you, Victor. Letting me go? Oh, we do anything for Ellie. She's a great little kid. Right, Gonzalez? Oh, yes, indeed. A most charming young woman. She wanted us to let you go, so we said okay. That's too bad you had to blunder on down here. That's all right, Victor. I wanted to see Frankie. I tried to keep you out of it, Mr. Lydon. I guess now you know. That's right, Frankie. Now I know. That's too bad, Mr. Lydon. But you ought to have taken Ellie's advice. No, and... no, Victor. You're all mixed up. I'm in on this, too, now. Hmm? You know, any game Ellie plays, I play, too. Well, uh, we figured you for one of those moral guys. Real gone on the kid, huh? Yeah. Yeah, real gone on the kid. Well, fine, Mr. Lydon. <laughs> Join the party. Thanks. We're trying to get this little cookie to tell us where George is. If she doesn't, I'm going to count to ten and then... Well... How about it, honey? I told you. I don't know where he is. Mm -hmm. It's too bad. One. Two. Better talk, Frankie. Three. I stood there watching them trying to figure a play. Victor held a gun pointed at Frankie's head, and Gonzalez was probably carrying one, too. Whatever the play, it had to be fast. Seven. Eight. Nine. Victor! Don't hurt him, Victor! Ellie! He doesn't know what he's saying about trying to help Frankie. I mean, he, he's out of his head. This is a little new fool. So that's a game. Victor! No! Oh, you! No! When Victor swung the gun toward me, Ellie jumped and grabbed his arm and hang on. Oh. Oh. Gonzalez was just drawing his gun when I hit him. And we both went down. As he scrambled to get up, I drew back my foot and kicked him in the head. I fumbled on the floor for his gun, and from the corner of my eye saw Victor turn his own gun point blank on Ellie. <laughs> He turned toward me. I was up on my knees, Gonzalez's gun in my hand, and I let him have it. Are you all right, Mr. Lytton? Yes, Frankie. I'm all right. My... My... Yeah, baby. Mike, it would have worked out all right. No, it would. Sure, Ellie. Of course it would, Ellie. We'd better get her to a doctor, Mr. Lydon. I wanted it to. Please believe me. I've done bad things, Mark, but I could have changed. Would you? Sure, honey. I know. Mark, I... I can go up to the house and phone for a doctor. No. Thank you. She doesn't need a doctor. She's dead. Well, that was it. Whatever Ellie was, whatever she'd done, I'd loved her more than anything else in the world. A love like that becomes a part of you. And even when it gets diseased, it has to be cut out. It leaves a deep wound. It takes a long time to heal. If I'd known more about it, I may have acted differently. She might still be alive. I don't know. But as it was, I'd done the only thing I could. I'd followed her. I'd followed her 
clear to the end. Under the direction of Norman MacDonald, Escape has brought you The Follower by Patrick Quentin, especially adapted for Escape by Les Crutchfield. Bill Conrad was starred as Mark Lydon. Featured in the cast were Georgia Ellis, Harry Bartell, Virginia Gregg, Lou Krugman, Sidney Miller, and Don Diamond. The special music for Escape was composed and conducted by Del Castillo. In just a moment, we're going to ask you to stay tuned for Bill Goodwin and Dollar a Minute. But that reminds us that starting next Sunday, Dollar a Minute will move back a half hour and be heard on most of these same CBS stations at this time. That is, the time you've been listening to Escape Today. The new addition to the CBS Sunday afternoon lineup next Sunday will be Rate Your Mate, the comedy quiz starring Joey Adams. So now, stay tuned for Bill Goodwin and Dollar a Minute, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations today and will be heard a half hour earlier next Sunday. This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. You. Finding life rather dull, dreaming again of exotic places, wishing you were somewhere else, we offer you Escape. Escape with us now to the outer limits of space. And the terrifying experiences of four men who penetrated it. As Ray Bradbury, famous science fiction writer, tells it in his gripping story, The Earthmen. Ready, Pedro? Yes. Communication number one. Mission accomplished. Yes. You better make sure you pause after that. Give them a few seconds to get over their excitement down there. They'll go crazy. Be bigger than New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve? Be bigger than the armistice. Only one celebration will top it in our lifetime. What's that? The one they throw when we get back. All right, now, where was I? Um, Mission accomplished. Yeah. Uh, First rocket expedition to Mars landed upon Mars 1203 Earth time. Estimated position of landing, approximately longitude 345 degrees, latitude minus 7 degrees. Okay. Landed without incident at edge of forest. Atmosphere, uh, what's a good word to say it's all right for breathing? Optimal? Uh, yeah. Found atmosphere optimal. Descended from rock. Uh, Captain Williams. Uh, yeah? Uh, Prescott, sir. I see Prescott. He's running this way. Running? Something after him? Uh, no, he's just loping along. I think he's smiling. Keep your binoculars on him. Found off. It looks like he's in trouble. Uh, descended from rocket. Sent Lieutenant Prescott on reconnaissance mission. Uh, Dugan, Prescott, all right? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, want me to yell to him? No, just stay up there and watch him. Uh, morale high. Commend efficiency and discipline of the entire crew. Lieutenant Prescott and Dugan, Sergeant Clitheroe. Thanks, Captain. Uh, there's enough glory for all, Sergeant. Any chance of sending that in now? Not for two hours. Channels won't be clear for voice communication until 3 o'clock Earth time. They don't even know yet that we made it. I'd like to be down there when they get that message. You what excitement. Sirens, bands, playing, artillery salute. Uh, here's Prescott, sir. Good. Come on down, Dugan. <laughs> Prescott, you all right? People. Here, sit down, sit down. Catch your breath. People. Mars has people. All right, now take your time. You want a drink? Mars is in heaven. It's people, just like home. Any women? Let him talk. What sort of people? <laughs> Ordinary-looking people, men, women, kids. Hostile? I don't think so. I came down a road, a country road, followed it to the right angle to do a paved highway. Yeah. Before I could decide whether to go right or left, 
I heard a buzzing sort of sound. I ducked behind a bush. Vehicle rolled past. One wheel must have a gyroscopic balance of some sort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Inside was a man and a woman. What'd they look like? Just like us. Hair, eyes, nose, mouth, body, clothes, and everything. Mars inhabited. Wait till they hear that down there. Well, after it passed, I followed it. I came to a hill. And when I got to the top, there it was, a little town. Buildings, streets, just like home. And then I hurried back here. People. And just like home, huh? Yeah. You suppose they're really friendly? Well, I don't see why not. You heard what he said? Civilization up here resembles the one down there. What would they do on Earth if Martians came down and established contact? You'd make a pretty big thing out of it. Yeah, the people up here will probably treat us the same way. Even so, we're not going to take any chances. We'll be armed. We're going into town? Right. As soon as we camouflage the rocket. All right, start cutting some of those branches and gathering leaves. Covered up good. I don't want anybody monkeying around while we're gone. Right. We can't be gone long, Captain. Channel's open at three. We'll be back by then, if everything goes well. Oh, can you imagine their reaction when they see us? Come on, man, make it fast! All right, men, dress it up. I'm going to knock on the door now and keep smiling to show we're friendly and let me do all the talking. Understand? Yes, sir. Right, sir. Yes, what do you want? You speak English. I speak what I speak. What do you want? Martian speaks English. Uh, we're from Earth. I'm Captain Williams, commander of the first expedition to Mars. And you are the first Martian we've met. Martian? What I mean to say is you live on the fourth planet from the sun, correct? Well, everybody knows that. Well, well we're from Earth. Where? It... It's never been done before. What has it? How is it you speak such good English? I'm not speaking, I'm thinking. Telepathy. Now, what is it you want? We're from Earth. From Earth. Some other time, Mac. I got my own problem. How do you like that? He didn't look very bright. I, I, I know, but... Well, well uh, but try it again. Uh, knock on the door. I'm in command here, Dugan. I'll do all the thinking. Yes, sir. I'll knock on the door and try it again. Yeah? Oh, excuse me, ma'am. Was that your husband I was just talking to? Yeah. He shut the door so quick I never got a chance to explain. Oh, I'm it. sorry, but he is busy. Uh, can I help you? Are you uh, strangers in town? <laughs> I'll say we are. We're from Earth. Earth? The planet Earth. Maybe you have a different name for it. The third in order from the sun. We came in a rocket. Almost 60 million miles through Don't come near me. I just want to see you can. You and your husband are the first people on this planet we've don't seen. Don't come near me. You don't understand. We're from Earth. We we came in a rocket. We came in a rocket. <laughs> What'd I do, Captain? Don't you think we'd better get away from here, maybe? Well, all I did was... Was... How far is it to town, Prescott? Quarter of a mile. I just... I just wanted to shake hands. What was it that scared us? Button your buttons, do whatever you want. Doesn't seem to make any difference. Nobody's paying any attention to us anyhow. You'd think these people had visitors from Earth every day. Nobody even turns around to look at us. And can I say something, Captain? Yeah. We can't blame them for ignoring us, sir. We look just the same as they do. For all they know, we're just a few Martians ambling through the town square. We ought to take a chance and try telling someone else. We've told three of them already. Back at that farmhouse, the man ignored us and the woman screamed and ran away. And that girl we told fainted. Uh, Captain, looks like a bar or a soda fountain in here. Would it be uh, all right if we went in and had something to drink? Well, why not? Any 
Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Could we get something to drink here? Got some nice fruit crystal. Uh, it's all right. The same for everyone. It's all right. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen you fellas around. You strangers? We're from Earth. Where? Earth. Third planet from the sun. Oh. Clumsy of me. Earth, huh? Well, what do you know? You mean you... You understand what I'm trying to tell you? Sure. Sure. That we're the first men from Earth ever to reach Mars that has never been done before? That we came 60 million miles in a rocket? Uh, sure, sure. Sixty million, huh? Rocket, you say? Well, I'm, I'm proud to make your acquaintance. I'm Captain Williams. This is Lieutenant Prescott, I... Sergeant Clitheroe, and yes. Lieutenant Duke. Well, I'm honored. I am, I'm honored. Do you mind if I bring my son in to meet you? This is an occasion. <laughs> sure, uh... sure. Bring him in. Son, son, come in here. Rocket, eh? All the way by rocket. Say, now. You uh, understand what we went through, the chances we took. Sure, sure. Why, you're real heroes. Uh, let me shake hands again. Can you call me, Doc? Son, these men are from Earth. From Earth. Understand? Yes, Pop. We're the first men from Earth ever to reach Mars. Isn't that wonderful, son? Think of it. It's wonderful. Go tell everyone. You don't mind if he tells people, do you? <laughs> mind? <laughs> I should say not. Oh, we'd <laughs> like him to. <laughs> as many as possible. Go ahead, son. Hurry. <sighs> think of it. All the way from Earth. There were times in there when I didn't think we'd make it, I can tell you. Hey, I'll bet there were. <laughs> the turbine conked out when we hit the stratosphere, and I began to sweat the big drop. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> the turbine, uh, it's pretty serious. Well, even before we left, we were told we only had about one chance in three of making it. Hey, I don't see where you found the courage. We didn't even know what we'd find when we got here. Bye. You oh, see, my. It, it's never been done before. Never. Uh... Let me shake your hand again. Lots of men were killed trying, but they never succeeded. What an, what an honor for our little town. <laughs> You're the first to know, really. The very first. Oh? Your name will go down in history of all the school books with ours. Right. And the monuments on both planets. Hey, what is your name? Hey, wait a minute, man. Hold on. What's up, Skipper? Outside. All those people. Looks like the whole town. Why, 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 they, they must have heard the news. The glorious news from my son. Yes, they, 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 they come to welcome you. Hey, Hold your fire, I'm men. Going. Welcome. It doesn't sound like they've come to welcome us. What is you? What? Uh, that's the man we first spoke to, the one whose wife got scared. Hey, gentlemen, please don't shoot. There must be some mistake. I'll just ask them why they're behaving in such a... Here, come back here. Come back here, you old... Come back here. Grand Hollow. What do you make of that? Captain, I don't understand this and I don't like it. Do the, the back way out. See if it's clear. Prescott, you fire when I say fire, not before I lower your gun. They're all around us, Captain. You'll make a break for it. One volley at my command. Captain and... Williams. Yeah? Look, there's a little guy out there giving them all what for. What? They're starting to disperse. Let me see. Come here to the square immediately. Immediately, I say. Go on now. Go on, all of you. Go on home. He's coming in. Now, I'll do all the talking. Put your guns away, but stay on your toes. Dugan, let's keep our eye on the back, huh? Gentlemen, uh, may I apologize for the unforgivable actions of my fellow townspeople. They've acted barbarously. Barbarously. We didn't do a thing. We were as friendly as we could be. Well, they're ignorant. Ignorant. Just ignorant. No reverence for science. None whatever. We're yes. from Earth. Did they tell you? Oh, yes, yes. A great honor, sir. This is without a doubt the most memorable moment of my life. As a man of science, I greet you. What have we done to make them so hostile? Well, oh, no, please, put it out of your thoughts. They are adults, idiots, simply because two women were stupid enough to be frightened. <laughs> my apologies, my sincere apologies. Believe me, sir, I would never have forgiven them if they had harmed so much as a hair of your head. It's scientific marvel, and they would do you harm. Unforgivable. Oh, my. We're wasting time. The members of the Institute are waiting. <laughs> Institute, the Institute of Science. We have sole jurisdiction in such matters. The members have already been informed and are eagerly awaiting your appearance. It 
will cause a sensation. Well, that's a little more like it. This way, if you please. I have transportation waiting. And have no fear of these rustics. You're in my care now. <laughs> I'm Captain Williams, sir. Who are you? I am president of the Institute. My name is Dr. Boo. In this way, gentlemen. In this way. Escape under the direction of Norman MacDonald returns in just a moment. How the gambling machine works, the far-reaching effect of legal and illegal gambling, domination of entire areas by racketeers. That's this week's topic on The Nation's Nightmare, tomorrow night on CBS. And now, back to Escape. <laughs> I won't make a speech, you understand, just a few informal remarks. Well, the members of the Institute will listen to you with the greatest interest, no matter how informal your remarks. Go right in and make yourself at home. Thank you, Doctor. I'll keep it short. We have to be back at our rocket by 3 o'clock our time in order to... To communicate with Earth. Yes, you <laughs> told me. Yes, yes. Go right in. I'll join you very soon. Thank you. After you, men. He's a nice fellow. Wow. What an auditorium. Must be hundreds of people. I wonder how they managed to get them together at such short notice. Straighten up, men. They're looking at us. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I am Mr. O. And I'm Captain Jonathan Williams of New York City. On Earth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, one and all, on behalf of myself and my crew. Thank you. Well, it's good to see another man from Earth. I am from Earth also. How was that again? There are many of us here from Earth. You? From Earth? Yes. But, but is that possible? Did, did you come by rocket? Has oh. space travel been going on for centuries? What, uh... What country are you from? Tui, Rio. <laughs> I came by the spirit of my body years ago. Tui, Rio? I never heard of it. What was that about the spirit of your body? Well, what do you mean there are many of us here from Earth? <laughs> Not only from Earth. He's from Jupiter. He's from Saturn. Jupiter? Saturn? Wait a minute, this is confusing. Where... On Earth is this Tuirio? A Tuirio? Is it near America? America? What is America? You never heard of America? No. You say you're from Earth and you never heard of America? Earth is a place of seas and nothing but seas. There is no land. I am from Earth and I know. Earth is a place of all jungle. I am from Orion Earth, a civilization built of silver. Silver? Men, come over here a second. Do you realize what this is? What, sir? This is no celebration. These aren't members of the Institute. This isn't a banquet or a surprise party. Huh? Look at their eyes. Listen to them. Now I understand why the woman screamed, why the girl fainted, why the old boy in the soda fountain ran out on us, why the crowd was hostile, why they've brought us here. Oh, where are we, sir? In an insane asylum. They think we're crazy. Clitheroe, try the door again. I just tried it, Captain. It's still locked. Go right in, gentlemen. The members of the Institute will listen to you with the greatest interest, no matter how informal your remarks. <laughs> I'll bet they've been listening, all right. I bet they've had us under observation ever since we entered this building. Uh, Captain, look. What? You ought to take a look. 
That woman who said she was from Earth, too. A blue flame is coming out of her mouth and then turning into the shape of a small naked child. You think that's something? Huh? I've been watching one of them change into a crystal pillar and then into a golden statue and then into a staff of cedar and then back into a woman again. Never saw anything like that. Magician. No. Not magicians. Those are hallucinations. They pass their insanity over into us, and we see their hallucinations too. Telepathy, auto-suggestion, and telepathy. Well, look, Captain. If hallucinations can appear this real to us, to anyone, if hallucinations are catching and almost believable, it's no wonder they took us for psychotics. If that woman can produce little blue fire children and, and that one can change into a pillar, how natural if normal Martians think we can produce our rocket ship with our minds. I've been thinking along those lines, too. If someone came up to you on Earth and said he was from Mars, just came in by rocket, wouldn't you think he was crazy? I would. Heaven help me, I would. What time is it? Uh, 2.35. The channel's open in 25 minutes. Where's that doctor? Where's that doctor? I said, where's that doctor? I'm here, Captain. I demand our release. I demand an apology for this outrage. My government will certainly hear of this. All the governments of Earth will hear of it. I shall tell them of the indignities heaped upon their representatives. Yes, yes, of course. Don't yes. humor me! Are you going to release us or must I take steps? What sort of steps? I'll kill you. That's very interesting. Excuse me a moment. Dr. Lowe. Yes, Dr. Did you call me, Doctor? Yes, the case is developing along classic lines. I thought you might be interested. He's just threatened to kill me. Yes. Uh, proceed, please, Captain. I wasn't joking, I tell you. Are you going to stand aside? No. All right. Jan. <coughs> Most interesting. What do you suppose the next phase will be? A denial of insanity, reaffirmation of sanity. But we are sane. We are. You see, classic men try to think of something. He thinks we're insane and he won't understand that we're not. No, 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 not at all. I do not think all of you are insane. Oh, no. Uh, just you, sir. The others, the ones you persist in referring to as your crew, they do not exist. They are secondary hallucinations. Secondary... Hallucinations. But you can touch them. You can hear them. Go ahead and touch them. They would prove nothing. My patients have come to me with snakes crawling from their ears. When I cured them, their snakes vanished. We'll be glad to be cured. Go ahead. It's unusual. Not many want to be cured. Uh, the cure is drastic, you know. Cure ahead. I'm confident you'll find we're all sane. He persists in referring to the others. Oh, they never stop. You know, Captain, such cases as yours need special treatment. The others in this hall are simpler forms, but once a patient has deteriorated as much as you have with primary, secondary, tertiary, auditory, olfactory, and lingual delusions, as well as tactile and optical fantasies, it's a pretty bad business. We may have to resort to euthanasia. Euthanasia? You're crazy! Now, listen... My crew and I left Earth three days ago in a rocket. We landed here yes, in Mars. Yes, 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 you've already told me, Captain. Most detailed dream fantasy I've ever heard. But uh, I can show you the rocket ship. I'd like to see it. Can you manifest it in this hall? No, certainly. It's over there on the corner. I don't see it. Of course you don't. It's not there. Why did you tell me to look if the rocket isn't there? I was joking, idiot. Joking! Really? You have an odd sense of humor. If you give us transportation and come with us, I can show you the rocket. It's in a small forest near that town where we first saw you. Be rather interesting to observe his reaction at the failure to show it to us. Oh, yes. Would you care to accompany me, Dr. O? Oh, I'd be delighted. Very well, Captain. Lead us to your rocket.
Here it is. Here's the rocket. Now are you satisfied? Now are you convinced? I see nothing resembling a rocket. Dugan, Prescott, clear the road. Clear away the camouflage. Hurry! You'll see, Doctor. You'll see. All right, there. There. Okay, men, that's enough. There you are, Doctor. That's the main hatch. Now, are you convinced? Wonderful manifestation. Wonderful. But like the manifestation of your gun when you threatened to kill me, they're completely unreal and non-functional. See, I've been thinking about why your gun jammed, Captain. I think it's a change in atmosphere. I suppose he allows his hallucinatory companion to offer the rational because the reality is too painful for him to offer it himself. It's precisely, Doctor. It's a rocket. It's a real rocket. See? I can touch it. Uh, may we look inside? I insist that you look inside. <laughs> Come along, Dr. Lowe. This is one of the most... Captain, it's three minutes to three. If we can keep them here until they open the channels, they'll be able to hear the reaction to our report on Earth, and then we'll be able to... I know, I know, I know. What a suspicious bunch of louts. Two cents, I'd tell the people back home not to bother with more. I've never seen anything like it. All right, now do you believe? Why, this is the most incredible example of sensual hallucination and hypnotic suggestion I've ever encountered. We went through your your rocket, as you call it. I tapped it, and I heard it. Auditory fantasy. I smelled it. Olfactory hallucination induced by sensual telepathy. I couldn't even taste it. Lingual fantasy. Allow me to shake your hand, sir, and congratulate you. You are a psychotic genius. You have done the most complete job by the task of projecting your psychotic image life into the mind of another via telepathy and keeping the hallucinations from becoming sensually weaker is almost impossible. Those people in the house usually concentrate on visuals or at the most visual and auditory fantasies combined. But you, but... Captain, have balanced the whole conglomeration. Your insanity is beautifully complete. My insanity? Yes, yes. What a lovely insanity. Metal, rubber... Foods, clothing, fuel, nuts, both, 10,000 separate items we've checked on your vessels. Uh, never have we seen such complexity. Why, there were even shadows under the bunks and under everything. Such a concentration of will. Let me embrace you, sir. <laughs> I'll write this into my greatest monograph. I'll speak of it at the Martian Institute next month. Uh, doctor, <laughs> he's incurable, of course. Of course. You poor... Wonderful man. You'll be much happier, Dave. What? Have you any last words? Wait, no, no, don't you. Oh, you poor, sad creature. I'm afraid you are far beyond any psychiatric therapy. You're an incurable kid. No. I shall put you out of this misery which has driven you to imagine this rocket and these three men. I did not. It will be most engrossing to watch your three friends and your rocket vanish once I've killed you. Doctor. And then I will write a paper on the dissolution of neurotic images from what I observed here today. I'm from Earth. My name is Jonathan Williams. And these yes, men are... Yes, I know. <laughs> From Earth. On his... Captain. Captain Williams. They continue to exist. Superb. Hallucinations with time and spatial existence. I wonder how they will react to a bullet. No. Oh, no. Oh, Put on that gun. No, no, don't. An auditory no. appeal. No. Even with yeah, a patient day. No. Ah, run, run, run. No. They still exist. And so does the rocket. Phenomenal. Such persistence of the psychosis. First time I've ever observed it post-mortem. But it will fade. It will all fade. Interesting, wasn't it? Well, shall we be returning to the Institute? I should like you to explain certain aspects of the case to the members of my department. Oh, gladly, my boy, gladly. You see, this patient... Earth to Mars. Earth to Mars. Calling rocket expedition. Calling rocket expedition. Do you read me? Do you read me? Come in, Captain.
Captain Williams. Come in, Captain Williams. Earth to Mars. Earth to Mars. Under the direction of Norman MacDonald, Escape has brought you The Earthman by Ray Bradbury, especially adapted for Escape by Walter Newman, starring Parley Bear with Harry Bartell, Hans Conrad, Larry Dobkin, and Lou Krugman. Featured in the cast were John Daner, Sidney Miller, Georgia Ellis, Jack Crucian, and Byron Kane. The special music for Escape is composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. <laughs> Escape with us to an island off the northwest coast of Africa. And the story of a man whose quest for happiness was blocked by a giant, a madman, and a beautiful girl. As Millard Kaufman tells it in his exciting story, The Gladiators. It's all fun each and every weekday when most of these same stations bring you CBS Radio's Arthur Godfrey time. This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is CBS where you hear the FBI in peace and war every Thursday night. The Columbia Broadcasting System. If you want to take it easy and you want to take it light, then you'll get a regal pail and you'll always know you're right. It's the light and better. Better, better. Mellow, mellow brew, regal pail. Never fail. It's the better, better brew for you and you and you and you. It's the better, better brew for you. This is KNX Los Angeles.